house on Schloss Street. It was one of the last weeks of my Christmas holiday in Australia, and my family was getting ready to move out of our Queenslander. For those who don't know what a Queenslander is, the experience happened within a week. The last two days, Tuesday and Wednesday, I had two mates over for a sleepover. The first day of this experience, previous Friday, my grandfather was looking after me. The house has a general layout. There's a long hallway, four bedrooms, and two bathrooms that branch off from said hallway. At the bottom of the hallway, there's the kitchen, lounge room, and dining area. There's a second small hallway leading from the kitchen out to the back deck. This deck sits far higher up than the backyard, like a giant balcony looking over at the backyard. It's worth mentioning that a spare bedroom branches off from the top of the main hallway. This is where the ladder of the story is. I should also mention that I had a fascination for electrics, still do, so I had electric train sets, and I also had a security system, only three security cameras because I liked playing around with the switchboard. Friday. My mom and dad had left early for work, so I woke up to the smell of crispy bacon and egg breakfast sandwiches. My grandfather always believes that the breakfast is the most important meal and never settles for anything that doesn't have sausages, eggs, or some sort of breakfast sandwich. I slowly stumbled into the kitchen, still half asleep, gazing up at my steaming hot meal on the table. Well, are you going to sit down and eat? It isn't going to eat itself. Per my grandfather's query, I sat down and ate. So did he. We had a bit of a discussion. He said that we would go to the corner shop in the afternoon, but he wanted to watch the midday races, which was code word for he wanted to sleep for three hours after lunch. After breakfast, I played with some Lego and played with my dog. Nothing really happens until after lunch and my grandfather's asleep. So let's skip to then. With my grandfather snoring loudly and reclined in his chair, and me, bored with the races, decide to go down into the backyard and say hello to the cockatoos. My neighbors at the time had a pair of silver-crested cockatoos. Their cage was outside, down in the middle of the neighborhood boundary, but we didn't mind. I walked down to the cage that sat under two huge avocado trees. Hello, Bluey. Hello, Bluey. The pair knew my name as I visited them often. They were honestly quite cute. I sat on my little wooden stool I had there and just admired them for five or ten minutes as well as listening to the magpies flying high above. Then I got that feeling, that feeling of someone watching, that feeling that something is going to happen. Out of instincts, I looked behind me and up towards the deck, just barely able to see the back door due to the perspective. After seeing nothing there, I turned back around to the cockatoos. This is when things become hectic. Only 10 seconds after I turned back around, the crests upon both cockatoos rose simultaneously to their full length. They flattened their body feathers and stood up straight. Cockatoos and cockatiels do this behavior when they're mostly curious, shocked, surprised, or worried. They started to absolutely scream. They started to shout my name, their owner's name, and also started to sort of native scream. I was now in shock. I didn't want to turn around. I was frozen until I felt an icy cold breath on the back of my neck. I instantly turned around from feeling this. I see nothing. While looking behind me, the front legs of my stool just snapped. I fell forward, face planting into the ground. At this point, the cockatoos have started to fly around in their cage. I stand up quickly, frozen again. Then, in the side of my ear, I hear, Bluey. It was quiet and sounded like an old, angry man felt his breath touch the outside of my ear. I started to sprint. I got no more than a meter when I slipped and fell down into the ground from a fallen rotten avocado. I 
tried to get up, but of course I had badly rolled my ankle. As I tried to stand up, I heard a scream, and I mean a full-on scream, burst into my left ear. Bluey, run! Yet again, it sounded like the same old creepy man. I was stumbling, almost hopping towards the stairs to get up onto the deck. I was probably going a little faster than walking speed. After reaching the top of the deck, I made the last hobble towards the back door. It was locked. I started to absolutely scream for my grandfather. I was banging on the door, just yelling as loud as I humanly could. I saw my granddad through the large glass pane rushing towards the door. He pushed it open, but it slammed back into his face, causing the glass pane to shatter into huge shards. Then it stopped and let the door open. Nothing really happened after that. However, my granddad thought it would be best if we spent the rest of the day at his house. Tuesday to Wednesday. I was still in shock from Friday, but today was the day that two of my good friends came for a sleepover as I was moving cities. Lucas and James arrived around one o'clock. We did the usual things, played in the backyard, hung out with the small wooden tree house with my dad built us, or that my dad had built us. It sat about halfway up on one of the many avocado trees that we had in the backyard. I did get that creepy feeling that I got on Friday. I wasn't totally comfortable playing around in the yard, but I had my friends there, so I thought it was okay. It was around six o'clock when my dad told us to come inside for dinner and to bring Fletcher inside. Fletcher's my dog. We always bring him inside for the night. We went and fetched Fletcher. He was sniffing around some dirt holes, as lots of schnauzers do. We came into the kitchen and sat down for nachos. We decided to watch a couple of movies, play some Wii, and then go to sleep in the spare bedroom. It was probably 11 o'clock. My parents were in bed and fast asleep. The three of us had just finished watching our third movie and decided that we should probably head off to bed too. We shambled up the long, narrow hallway with Fletcher guiding us. We finally reached the spare bedroom. Inside sat a TV, my switchboard for the cameras, a queen and a single bed. The three of us sat on the queen bed as James wanted to have a look outside, so I turned on the TV and the camera system set up. I switched to channel one, the front camera. They had night vision, but as you can imagine, this was around 10 years ago or so, so it wasn't the best night vision, but it wasn't very clear. I continued to switch to the second camera, channel two, and pointed down towards the driveway, then to the third, channel three, which looked down into the backyard. James thought it was awesome. Lucas just wanted to sleep, and at this point I was so tired that I really couldn't care. James took control and switched through the channels, thinking he was some sort of security guard. Then some static took hold of channel two. Bluey. What was that, Bluey? It's just a bit of static. It happens sometimes, James. Fletcher at this point was next to Lucas, the both of them pretty much asleep on the queen bed. I was in the single, making sure James didn't stuff up the setup or my desk. It was at this point where I got that feeling again. I desperately wanted to turn on the bedroom light, but I didn't want to seem like a wuss. So instead, I leaned in closer, now watching each camera very carefully along with James. Fletcher, what are you doing? I'm trying to sleep. I turned around to see Lucas disgruntled and Fletcher no longer sleeping, but instead standing up on the bed. His ears were pricked up. He was slightly leaning forward, putting pressure on his front legs. Again, this is common defense or attack stance for a schnauzer. He started to growl. I was now fully alarmed. So was Lucas and James. Static had not taken over the camera system, or rather had now taken over the camera system. Lucas put a chair up against the doorknob. James got up and shut the blinds. James scrambled up from the office chair. Lucas grabbed one of the two chairs at my desk and quickly put it up against the door. I sat down and rebooted the system, quite a panic if I may add. After rebooting, there was no longer any static. I 
quickly put it into channel 3 to look at the backyard. Sure enough, I could barely see the cockatoos flying and going wild in their cages. I mustered, oh no. Me saying this absolutely freaked the hell out of James and Lucas. They turned to a puddle of mush. Well, what's wrong, Bluey? Well, I'm pretty sure we're going to find out soon enough. Static no longer filled the camera system. No, instead the lenses started to fog up. I could no longer see out of channel 3. Quick, quick, go to channel 1. There's no point, James. They all have condensation on them. At this point, Lucas was quiet until he said, Guys, someone just poked me. Lucas was on the queen bed. James was on the single. I was sitting in the office chair. James and I went into the queen with Lucas. The three of us sat huddled. We grabbed Fletcher, still growling towards the door. The three of us watched the camera. We could see faint shadows moving around. I went to turn on the bedroom light. You guessed it, it wouldn't turn on. Then the camera went to static. I changed the channels. Nothing. All were static. I rebooted it. Twice. Nothing. Then a cackle was heard. I jumped back into the bed. The cackle went again. At this point, James was on the brink of tears. I felt another breath on the back of my neck. It sent a spine-tingling shiver throughout my body. Lucas peeked through the blinds. The window had condensation all over it. But that wasn't the problem. Lucas mumbled, Oh my God. Written on the outside of the window was E-N-D. That window has nothing beneath it except the ground, which was three-quarter meters below. Three or four meters below. Lucas quickly crawled back from the window, back to the middle of the room. Fletcher stopped growling, but now instead was whimpering. Just as he started to whimper, we heard a single tap at the window, then nothing. Fletcher quickly looked towards the door, and sure enough we heard footsteps, slowly coming closer from the hallway. Then the footsteps stopped, right in front of the door. Silence for ten seconds. Fletcher began to absolutely cry, and for good reason. Three loud knocks were hit a large amount of force on the door, then again silence. Until rapid tapping on the window took place, a rock then got thrown at the window, smashing it. We started to absolutely scream, moving the chair trying to pull open the door. Then the same voice screamed in the room, You're wanting to leave so early? I'm that bad of a host? The door flung open. An inertia effect happened and we fell flat onto the ground. We got up and ran screaming down the hallway. We bolted past a mirror that shattered as we went past it. My parents were now awake and as soon as they stepped outside of their room, it all stopped. James and Lucas went home early and thankfully we moved out of that house three days later. However, the next morning, we saw the true aftermath. All three cameras had been ripped out. Only thing left were wires coming from the roof. We never found the cameras. The window had somehow been smashed, and the two-meter-long mirror was in ruins. I never really found out who the spirit was, but he was definitely aggressive. The house wasn't too old. I think it was built in the 1940s from what I can remember. Both experiences were terrifying. And I've never owned security cameras again due to the fear of what I may see on them. It was lunchtime. We were watching a movie quietly downstairs while the baby napped. There were noises upstairs, like something dropped to the ground. We listened for a second before my mom ran up. She thought the baby had fallen out of his crib. We opened the door and found him asleep. There was some weird shit on the floor. 
took us a while to figure out it was drywall or something. There was a crawl space to a small attic where the AC and insulation could be reached. It was barely big enough to get into and a good nine feet from the ground. It also had to be pushed up and slid over to open. There was a visible gap. The carpet was a really ugly dark blue, so we could see white fucking spots on the ground like something was dragged from one side of the room to where the crib was. It stopped right in front of it. My mom checked the closet and called my stepdad. He couldn't leave work, so we stayed downstairs until he got home and checked the crawl space. We've never had animals. It's really difficult for most things to live in Arizona, so wildlife is pretty rare in that area. He didn't find anything or signs of anything living up there. This happened every other day for two weeks. We really didn't know what to make of it. My mom thought it might be the AC sort of suctioning the opening up. It stopped and didn't happen again for two and a half years. When my baby sister was born and stayed in the same crib, again it happened on and off for a few weeks, and then never again. The AC never popped that opening. To keep my own solo experiences brief, I had a period of three months where I straight up didn't sleep. I went crazy. Every night I felt like my bed was shaking. The instant I laid my head, just it would vibrate. The metal frame would sway. I'd feel like someone was pushing the mattress between the baseboards or sitting on the corner. I had my brother touch the frame one night to tell me if the shaking was in my head or not. He said it wasn't, but I'm not sure if he was just playing into it. I thought I might be having seizures or something. At one point, I got so frustrated I started sleeping on the couch downstairs with the dog. I started hearing whispers, too. Not a noise that sounded odd, but someone calling my name. My name has three fucking syllables. I would be in my room, door open, doing something at night after my parents went to bed. It was a female voice, but it sounded off. I don't know how to explain it. The downstairs really scared me after the lights went out, so I never went down, but I did walk to the balcony to look down. I never saw anything, but the whispering would stop when I got close. My brother started hearing it too. He's kind of weird. His life's dream has been enlisting in the army, so his reaction was always getting his knife and walking right downstairs to confront it. He'd turn on the lights and look around before coming back up. He slept on my floor for a few nights because he was convinced that she wanted me. We had prior haunting experiences which led to my parents making jokes that the ghosts follow us. They didn't pay much attention to it at this time when it was quiet. One night my parents went out with the babies. My brother and I were in our rooms, doors open as usual. We started hearing something weird. I thought it was the wind. It got louder until it was clear that it was a woman fucking wailing. I know it sounds crazy, but it was so clear. We hid in my room for what felt like hours calling my mom. For some reason, it didn't occur to us to call the police. The crying stopped. We hatched a plan to run for the stairs and out the nearest door. All of the lights were on in the house, and my brother had his stupid knives. It's like it knew we were going to leave. We heard shuffling outside the door and maybe breathing. It could have been the air conditioning. We kind of decided that we were ready to die, unlocked the door and booked it. The crying started again and it was clear it was in my parents' room. We stood outside the property line for an hour waiting for them to come home, watching the house. No one could have gotten out without us seeing. We had huge windows lining the upstairs hallway that showed everything with the lights on. My parents made fun of us and still do about that night. A few
few other incidents include my baby brother talking to the man, quote-unquote, upstairs. He'd stand in front of the balcony and talk up to someone. He told us the man was hiding in my room. He talked about the man in the window and would ask, who's that? Directed at the doors at night. I don't want to talk about all of it, but there were so many instances of voices and doors slamming and things being knocked over in my room that I thought I was losing my mind. I moved out at 18 and came back occasionally, usually to babysit. Apparently, my reluctant believer mother and absolute skeptic stepdad watched a coffee pot jump off the counter. They also were sitting outside having a fire on an open evening when they saw a figure in the balcony window of their bedroom. It was a tall man, but my stepdad still needed the urge to go upstairs. It appeared a second time, closer to where the nursery door was. My mom said that she had horrible dreams about a man in the corner of her room after that. She was present for many of the times that we heard footsteps upstairs, doors slamming when the AC was off she always denied there being anything wrong. My parents left town with the kids for a week. At this point, I was 19 and living happily an hour away. My mom begged me to check on my brother and stay a few nights for the weekend. I arrived during the evening after I got off of work. I asked how I, you know, how it had been alone, and he said it was fine. He just didn't go upstairs at night and minded his own business, as he says. He said if he ignored it and tried not to get scared, then it ignored him. He felt safe with the dog. We were watching YouTube and eating when we started to hear a deep noise. At first I thought it was a biker, one of the small buggies people drove out there. Then I noticed it was holding a tune. It was humming. The dog had a weird thing about staring into the bathroom if the door was open, which was scary at night. This time, the door was closed, and he still stood up and stared. The noise was so deep it sounded like it couldn't be human, but it was definitely melodic. There's nothing I could figure out to explain it. My brother and I just kind of looked at each other. Then a door slammed upstairs and we decided to fuck off and go on a walk. When we got back, I decided I would sleep in my parents' room. It didn't feel right to stay in the kids' room, but looking back it would have been best to stay close to my brother. I fell asleep surprisingly easy. I guess about two hours passed before my brother slammed the door open. The house smelled like it was burning. Not really like a fire smell, but like a burning plastic and trash smell. I was panicked. I was the adult, and I didn't know what to do. We checked the house. I turned off the air conditioning, thinking it might be on fire, and we opened all the windows and fell asleep on the couches downstairs. The next day, the smell was still lingering, but less overwhelming. The air conditioner was fine when I turned it back on, like usual, the day was fine. That next night, my brother and I went on a jack-in-the-box run. It might have taken 30 minutes. We arrived home to a mess of blood, vomit, and shit. The dog was sick all over the living room. We immediately took him to an emergency vet, certain he was dying. They checked him for everything that they could and gave him a clean bill. When we got home... All hell broke loose. My brother and I were cleaning up a mess with the doors open for airflow. There was absolutely insane banging noises from upstairs. We hadn't locked up on the way out. My brother thought someone had snuck in and was trashing the upstairs. He went up to check and I hung downstairs ready to call the police. Nothing happened. Nothing even seemed out of place. We kept cleaning, but the noise started almost immediately. It kind of sounded like someone was shouting behind a wall of cement. I couldn't tell the gender. My brother told me that he had been fine until I got there, that I could leave if I wanted. 
I totally did, and I didn't go back. My parents sold the house this year. During the interim of the move, they stayed in an Airbnb. My brother lived really close to his work, so we stayed in the house with the dog for a few weeks. This story is just his own, so I'm still not sure if I believe it. He's kind of weird, but not one to embellish. He had been hearing the usual things, even his name being called in the night, but ignored it all. His friends had been coming over to keep him company. The last day he was supposed to finish moving, he brought a friend. He says he felt that they were being watched the whole time they cleared the place out, and his friend left him to lock up. They got into the car facing the house when they noticed the blinds were open. They were definitely closed on the way out. His friend claims that he saw them open from the side of his eye. My brother says there was a woman squatting in front of the downstairs window close to where he had just left from. She was pale, her nose was hooked, and her hair was black and stringy. Again, classic horror movie ghost. He said she had black eyes with visible white dots in the middle inside, inside out eyes, as he called them, and she was smiling. He says it took him a second of shock to realize she was looking right at him. He felt sick, like she could walk right out and get him. The burned rubber when his friend snapped out of it and they screamed at each other all the way down the road about what they saw. He called me right after to explain it, but I was with friends and not really willing to listen. What fucks me up is that my mom thought he had a psychotic break. He went into his room and cried all night at the Airbnb. She thought something happened with his girlfriend. My brother is not a crier. I haven't seen him do it since we were little. When we got together and talked about it, his eyes teared up then too. He said he didn't know why, he just knew she wanted to kill him. He drew a picture of her. Let me know if you're interested in seeing it. It's not great, but it still fills me with the deepest foreboding. It took me a while to realize that I saw her too, just once in my bedroom almost five years ago. Seeing her suddenly made sense. I knew it didn't feel like a woman, but it felt feminine. It felt like something pretending to be a woman. Anyways, I know this is long. Feel free to offer your own opinion. My ex brought this up today. We dated all through high school and had a few experiences together that she recounts as her only paranormal encounter. I would love to still think this was my own delusion, but it was shared by too many people to be. Maybe a few things are explainable, but most of it isn't. It's affected me so deeply I'm still terrified that if I think too much about her she'll follow us a state away. I also forgot to mention that we heard word from neighbors that the previous family had 12 people, Mormons, living in a house that we could only fit six into. They were really weird according to multiple families, and they moved in with five kids and left with four. We heard a toddler drowned in the upstairs bathtub. No idea which one, or if this is true. We couldn't find any documentation. The most sinister entity I've ever encountered. As a clairvoyant, I've had my fair share of weird and wonderful encounters with spirits and entities. Most have been good, some bad, but I've only ever dealt with a few evil ones. This is a fairly long read detailing my encounters with the witch who tormented me for five years in the most horrendous ways. I do not know how she found me, or why she hated me, but I will tell you the first time I ever saw her. I was dreaming I had entered into a small country pub. The ceilings were low, and it had that fusty smell of beer and thyme. 
Outside the windows was a quiet rural lane surrounded by hedgerows, and what looked like farmer's fields beyond that. It was a lovely warm day, but the scene was eerily quiet. There was two sections to the pub, one side which was devoid of anyone and what looked like a working bar, and the other side was closed off to the public and looked like it was being used to store old furniture. I found myself wandering around the furniture admiring a beautiful antique writing bureau when I suddenly felt disoriented. My legs started to give way as my head began to spin out of nowhere. My center of gravity was thrown out of whack and I stumbled onto the floor and a fear I could not explain started to overcome me. I knew something was wrong and I had the feeling of being circled by a predator one I could not see. In state of panic, I shuffled back on the floor until my back made contact with something solid, an old dusty chest of drawers. And I tried to calm my breathing, not making any sense of why I felt like I was in so much danger. Then I heard a noise above me, a disturbing, croaky, death-rattle-like sound. I was terrified but I found myself slowly raising my head to see what was there. I couldn't help it. I shouldn't have looked, but that macabre sound drew my attention like a moth to flame. Slowly, leering over the top of the drawers directly above me, my face came into view of another face looming down over me. It was a woman, strikingly beautiful if not cold-looking, pale blonde curls pinned on top of her head, icy blue eyes, young, no more than thirty, but her mouth was what was the most terrifying. It was stretched open into a gaping black hole with torn cracked flesh stretching even further, making her face into a disfigured, warped, horrifying mess. The rattling was coming from within that cavernous abyss. I've never felt a fear like it, the sort which strips your brain of any normal function and sends your gut plummeting. I could barely scream I was that scared. It was more like a high-pitched hysterical whimper which barely left my mouth as her face came closer. Then I woke up, sweating, and still trying to scream. As disturbing as the dream was, I thought it was just that, a nightmare, although I've never been able to get her face out of my head all these years later. Roughly six weeks later, I had another nightmare in which I was involved in a vicious assault on the street outside my home. In this dream, the police came, and as I was being pinned to the ground and arrested with the assailants, I noticed a figure walking around the periphery. The periphery of the circle of police and people. As my face was being pushed into the ground, it was hard to see who it was, but they were getting closer and closer to the tangle of bodies on the floor. As the police pulled me up, I saw it was a crooked old woman, bedraggled and dirty hair hanging in her face, full of debris and dirt. She was in an old-fashioned white nightdress. My stomach lurched, and although she looked different, I knew it was the same woman I'd encountered in my nightmare weeks before. As if she sensed my realization, she rapidly lurched forward between the police holding me in place and sank her teeth into my arm and disappeared, leaving my arm in an immediate septic mess crawling with maggots and decaying. The pain is what woke me up. I bolted upright, expecting to see teeth marks on my forearm as it throbbed, and although there were none in the area, it was red as if it had been pinched. I suspected then that these were not ordinary dreams, and that she was a separate entity, not some reoccurring imaginary figure. I didn't know yet that she was a witch, but the more she encroached into my dreams and life, the more I psychically saw snippets of hers. She had a knack for showing herself.
and she would do this in two different ways. One, the young beautiful woman, although never again with that hideous deformed mouth, and others a stereotypical hag. Every few weeks I would encounter her in my dreams, which was where I figured out that she was a dreamwalker, as I called this gift, not sure if it's the correct term, a spirit or entity that can manipulate someone's dreams. In another dream, she was just standing by my bed, and she was wrapped around my throat, slowly squeezing until I couldn't breathe, until I woke up violently gasping for breath. I had that same experience several times. Another time on my day off work, I woke up and I was feeling lazy. I decided to lounge in bed a little longer, and I was in and out of sleep until I became acutely aware of someone very close to me staring at the back of my head. I knew it was her, and everything inside me screamed, do not turn around and look at her, so I stayed still, face pushed into my pillow, and then something peculiar happened. As if I was stood in the corner of my bedroom, I could see everything. Me lying in bed covered up and face down, and hovering about two feet above my body parallel to me, there was an opaque brown swirling humanoid mass. Other times I would dream she was hovering above me, and in a half-sleep, half-awake state, too terrified to move, she would reach inside my chest, and I could feel an odd pressure around my heart squeezing, causing it to beat out of rhythm. All I could do was lie there and pray that I didn't have a heart attack as the thumping of my heart inside my chest would speed up rapidly and then slow down. There were seconds between each beat. I tried putting a protection boundary around my home, but it never seemed to keep her out. In the end, my spirit guides shut me down entirely to protect me from her. I guess being psychically open was what kept the link going between us. The complete radio silence I had for three years was eerie to say the least, and not something I was used to as having random spirits popping in and out. They've been popping in and out of my life for years, since I was 11 years old. It did the job. I didn't see her again for three years. When I became pregnant with my daughter, I unintentionally started to open up again. I only had two more experiences with her after this, although I was disheartened to know that she was still linked to me. The night she showed herself again, she entered my dream as usual. I was laying in bed, and in this dream, I woke, and my quilt was hovering a few feet in the air above me. Through the gap in the dark between myself and the floating quilt, I could see someone shuffling around the edge of my bed back and forth. The familiar feeling of fear that came with it held me in place, scared shitless of what was going to happen next. To my absolute horror, the figure climbed underneath the hovering quilt at the foot of my bed, slowly worked its way up over my body until she was on top of me, and her face was in front of mine. Her hair trailed across my skin, and she smelt of damp earth. Then she spoke. You thought I was gone, she hissed at me, and all I could do was try and scream myself awake. Suddenly the quilt dropped back onto the bed and I bolted upright, finally awake. My quilt, which is usually cocooning myself, was stuffed down on the floor between my bed frame and the wall with the window that looked out onto the street. I refused to sleep at my home that next night, telling my friend I couldn't believe she was back after all this time had passed. My last encounter I've ever had with her was odd, to say the least, as it seems as if she couldn't get as close to me as usual. Again in my dream I awoke and she had me by the throat, both of us dangling the air over my bed. Here she was her younger self with porcelain skin, fair hair, and all just staring into my soul as I struggled to breathe. I can't explain the look that she had on her face. It wasn't anger. Disgust. 
I don't know, just a cold indifference to me with maybe a hint of defeat. It felt different, and although I woke up struggling to breathe and with a sore neck, I don't think she had actually been inside the room with me. The last I ever saw her, and hopefully ever will, I questioned myself early whether it was a form of sleep paralysis, but I don't know if that wasn't it. I've never suffered with it before or since, and that explanation just didn't seem to fit. I suspect she was trying to stop my heart, or physically scare me to death, but why? As I said, I saw glimpses of her life. I know she was a healer woman in a small community, but over time she seemed to get treated with more suspicion and hatred and shunned out of the area until she was living on the very periphery of society. Maybe once respected, then feared. I have no doubt she was immensely gifted in life, but unfortunately, she's passed over with them the same gifts, fully understanding how to manipulate energy. Hands down, one of the few spirits which straight up terrified me. Ghost or toast, what do you think? This one is a weird one. I'm still not sure what to make of it, and it seems everybody has different thoughts on it. Some of my friends that were there didn't believe me at all at first, but it freaked me out when they told me their side. This takes place on a hike around Arlington, Washington, in 2022 with a big group of friends and I'll explain a few different theories at the end, including ghosts, of course. Of course, no signal in the area. We all went to the same high school, and all, except the youngest brother, and obviously the kids, are in our 30s. It was myself, three brothers, youngest to oldest, B, J2, and Z, a married couple, J1 and S, and their two little girls, one being a baby. They were also smart and bought a little red baby carrier. I also explicitly recalled the shirt S was wearing because while they got the kids ready at the cars, I commented on it because I liked it and we talked about it. And I paid a little bit more attention to what people were wearing that day than I would otherwise. By the time we got to the area, I already had a coffee and also bought two giant water bottles. On top of the long drive, but there were no bathrooms, obviously, so I had to hold it. Thankfully, it was only supposed to be a quick two miles in and out of sort of a trail, and it was supposed to be pretty easy according to the app that I used. I hiked solo regularly. Once everyone arrived, we all started heading down the trail, which started pretty easy, but then we quickly started to regret our decision. The app was definitely not accurate about this trail, it was pretty steep going downhill and zigzagged quite a bit. Later it evened out again, just for a while, and then it went really steep and made us jump over some rocks and a small stream, I think. It certainly was a challenge for my friend's kid and my very full bladder as we exceeded 2.5 miles. And following that there was also a giant fallen tree which I really didn't look forward to climbing over between my bladder and nausea, probably in part from also chugging so much water on the hike. I decided this was it for me. After scaling the tree, I didn't want to go any further at that point, so I let them go ahead of without me. There was a big discussion. I was leaning against the fallen tree with all of them looking at me, and they knew when I go on my hikes I like to sit by rivers or waterfall for a while and just in the middle of my hike sort of a thing. B, Z, and S all found a very steep way down to the flowing river beneath us and told me that I could go down there. I declined and told them that I'd just hang out by this tree and wait for them. They asked if I was sure, and I told them yes. J1 and S, especially J1, probably since I'd known him the longest, were trying to make sure that I wouldn't go leave to go back to the cars alone. I reassured them that I'd stay there and I'd wait for them to get back. I have no reason to leave without them. 
Shortly after they left, I had a few moments where I felt like I could try to make it down, so I did try to go down to the river. As challenging as it was since my hiking boots provided no ankle support, I succeeded and found a rock to sit on and watch the water rush past me. After a few minutes or so, I suddenly heard my name being yelled from a distance to my right. So I looked over and saw everybody waving a bit above, and probably another, maybe quarter mile, half a mile away. I waved back at them, but I was enjoying my time at the river. Normally I have a really loud metal music sort of a thing blasting on my hikes, and then I take out my earbuds at the river or the stream when I'm secluded in a small area away from others to hear the water, birds, squirrels, or just nature in general. It makes it more refreshing to me, but it was still good. When I looked back, I saw everyone was gone, so I was now on guard, making sure I didn't miss them at the top of the hill from the river. After about half a minute, I decided, putting my backpack on and realizing how steep it was having to go to the bathroom, maybe I should probably start heading up at least so they're not waiting on me. I could see it in my head already. They'd be sitting there telling me to hurry up while I'll be trying not to pee all over myself and climbing back up, especially as clumsy and uncoordinated as I am. Why didn't you just pee outside? But I then heard people walking, so I hurried to, to I guess, a clearing of trees. That's where I tried to climb back up, and I caught just a glimpse of a few people. One was a girl with hair, in the same color shirt as S, and another guy that looked like B, and another guy that looked like J1. But I was at the bottom of the river and they didn't even stop. None of them. I didn't see J2, Z, or S. And J1's oldest kid, but none of them stopped or anything. I was really confused because they told me to wait and not go back to the cars. But I figured maybe they saw me or something and knew I'd just catch up. I started scrambling to get to the top of the little hill back to the trail. No one was there. I jumped back over the fallen tree to head back and ran back down the hill over the rocks and stream and as I ran as fast and as far as I could but then it, I just stopped because I had a feeling that something was just feeling weird. I stopped for probably five minutes in this really open area that was surrounded by like straw. I had a big internal struggle debating if I should wait, go back, or if I should keep going towards the cars to try to catch up, quote-unquote, and even ask other people if I was on the right track if they passed. Eventually, I decided that they wouldn't come if they were behind me. And that really looked like S, J, 1, and B up on that hill. And even on what I thought logically to be a 3% chance that it wasn't them, I was sure that they knew me well enough to know I'm experienced enough solo with hiking to know that I'd be fine. And they could just meet me there, obviously. I would go hiking every weekend for years by myself to different trails and different areas. And my family used to go when I was young, too. Plus, my bladder was going to burst at any moment, so the sooner I could make more progress, the better. I did eventually pass a group going the other direction, so as I came up on them, I thought, lady with a dog, few guys behind her, but she's in front and not talking like they are. This is the perfect opportunity to ask somebody. She'd probably know. As we were passing, I quickly asked if she had seen a big group of guys and a girl with two kids, one in a red baby carrier. She told me, yeah, they're right ahead. You're hot on their trail. I thought to myself, that was perfect. I was right. It was them that passed me on the trail. I tried using every burst of energy I could whenever I didn't have that immediate urge to squat over a bush to pee. Eventually, I neared the end of the trail, where it zigzagged probably at least five times. And they weren't short either. I made it around the corner before I heard someone yelling my name from behind, but I had to stop because my bladder was going to burst at any moment. I turned around and saw the youngest brother, Z, running up for me. I looked at him in confusion and asked him why he was back there. He was confused. What was I talking about? I asked if everybody else was at the cars, and he told me everybody else was out looking for me. Everybody was behind. I was thoroughly confused now. If everybody's behind, 
Who did I see at the top of the trail? Who did the lady see? This trail is definitely not child or dog friendly with trees like that, especially small dogs like that one she had. I told Z the lady with the dog and the group of guys said that they were all right ahead and I was hot on their trail. He said, what lady with a dog? They didn't pass anybody on the way back, and I didn't see them returning either. They didn't fork off anywhere either. They couldn't have gone anywhere else. He ran back to the group and I had to press on ahead with any moment I couldn't spare otherwise. I'd never make it back to the cars because I had to go like now and the steep hills were making it harder to hold it and hold my balance too. It had been hours at this point. Everybody else caught up and asked about what happened and I told them I thought that they already went ahead and they thought I was making it all up. When we eventually got back to the cars, we decided that it was well past lunch and we were all getting hungry, and we had a long drive home. J1 and S also had a small, or sorry, sorry, these acronym names jump me up. <clears throat> J1 and S also had a much longer drive home. J2 lived pretty close, B, Z, and I all lived near the high school that we all went to, so we still lived between everyone but we decided to go get food. At the restaurant, I explained in detail what happened, and the more everyone denied having seen any of the people I'd mentioned passing them, the weirder it was. They told me they stayed and looked around everywhere for me. They looked for any traces of my hair or bag, thinking that I may have fallen into the river. How was it possible five other adults didn't have any of these sightings of these people that I saw? I described everything I could recall about the lady and her dog, and the little I recalled of the guys behind her. I've heard multiple theories. One of them told me that I was just making it up. One person told me, and I thought it could have been maybe, a very long and weird hallucination. I've been told that it could have been ghosts. And one friend I've known for years told me that because I'm chaos, quote-unquote, He's not the only one to tell me that I'm chaos. And just everything around me is always just chaos by no fault of my own. Even my partner feels that way. He told me that he's been trying to do research on missing 411. I hadn't heard of this, but abductions of people that seemingly disappear usually in the middle of nowhere. And he thought I saw people that weren't people. But due to the fact that I basically exude chaos, I was lucky and escaped. My friend and I were hexed by a crazy guy living in an abandoned villa. I'm a 22-year-old university student. a male. I live in Fez, Morocco, where the university that I study in is located. A few days ago, I was at a public cafe studying for exams. And as I was leaving for home, I ran into my friend. Spelled M-E-H-D-I. The narrator's going to go with Mehdi. After the usual, hey, how are you? He told me something weird had happened to him. As he was walking to the cafe to meet me, he passed by an old abandoned villa situated on a small street behind the cafe. The villa is old and is surrounded by a 1.5 meter long wall that is further supported by a 2 meter long steel fence on top of it. The villa itself can only be viewed partly, mostly because of the vegetation behind the fence, old trees, untrimmed plants, and usual horror story stuff. As he was walking past the villa, my friend was called by a weird, creepy guy from behind the fence. When he approached the guy, he gave him a piece of candy rolled inside of a piece of paper, as well as another piece of paper folded neatly and covered entirely by scotch tape. My friend thought it was weird, but didn't think much of it. As he continued to walk, he unwrapped the piece of candy, just to check if it was actual candy, and threw it away. Then he moved to the scotched up piece of paper. After struggling with the tape for a bit, he managed to open and unfold it. 
He was surprised by a weird assortment of letters, symbols, and hard-to-decipher words in Arabic. In my culture, these things are taken very seriously, and the majority of Moroccans believe this stuff is real and works. So my friend who studies Islamic jurisprudence, jurisprudence, excuse me, was very surprised to know what it was. A hijab, not to be confused, oh, not to be confused with a hijab. They're both spelled the same way. It's a sort of magic charm that veils its users from harm and protects them from evil spirits. And in some occasions, it could also work as a bringer of love, appreciation, and service from other people. When my friend told me the story, I was instantly intrigued. For all my life, I've been curious about these things. Although I do not believe in them and still don't to this day, I wanted to see if the spell would work. I took the piece of paper from him, gave it a quick scan to see what it was all about, gave it back to my friend telling him to keep it until we go back home and in fact see what it's about. When we did get back home, we opened it again and read it another time, more closely together. The wording of it is quite weird and hard to decipher, not to mention it has some weird symbols. One in the shape of a cross, and the others in the shape of an Othana rune. Othala, excuse me. And the other two are in a shape that I couldn't decipher, but they looked like unequal signs only with three horizontal lines in the middle. I have the picture of the spell on my phone, and I'll post it here as soon as I figure out how to do that. Upon closer inspection, the words that we could manage to decipher translate to something like, O oh God, I have sacrificed this unborn child for you to bring your servants. O oh, most great one, to bring unto him acceptance, love, and victory. The servants referred to here are the jinn to whom whoever made this spell wished to appoint the job of bringing the man who gave it to my friend good luck and fortune. When Mehdi read that, he interpreted the supposed sacrifice of the unborn child as bringing the crazy man the love that children get from others. Mehdi was scared, but was unbothered, seeing it as nothing but pointless words that have no meaning. But since my friend was really scared because the spell was given to him, he consulted with his roommate, psychology student. He advised him to burn the spell to break it, if it had any real effect, and to relieve himself from the unwelcome thoughts that it would invite into his mind if it was kept on him. Mehdi and I went out into the roof of the house and burned the spell together. Skip forward a couple of days. Mehdi and I were walking together back from the usual cafe that we sit in. And for some reason, he told me to go down a path that we never took together before. And it's completely on the opposite side away from where we live. I said yes, and we went for a walk until we arrived at the same villa that he got the piece of paper from. And we saw the same guy that gave him the spell standing behind the fence with his face between bars of steel and staring aimlessly at nothing. At this point, Maddie and I no longer cared about the supposed hex or curse that he cast upon us, so we jokingly agreed to approach the guy and speak to him. The moment he saw us, he called us as we were approaching him, and we started talking to him. He introduced himself as Hamid. The villa he's in is supposed to be his uncle's. And so is another cafe in front of it. We didn't believe him as he was obviously not all that sane in the head. He can speak and understand well enough, but something about his empty, emotionless gaze and the super relaxed posture, as if he doesn't have a single care in the world, as well as the way that he speaks completely spontaneously, without even thinking, kind of screams insanity. We asked him about the little piece of paper that he gave us. He said a police officer gave it to him. An obvious lie. We told him that we took the piece of paper to a, excuse me, F-Q-I-H. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Fuck. F-Q. 
Q-I-H. A key. Fki? <laughs> the Moroccan Islamic version of a priest. Excuse me. And he simply answered something akin to, Yes, yeah, sure you did. He saw right through our lie. As we were talking, he started giving us commands as if we were his servants. But in doing so, in a completely straightforward, non-condescending way, as if it's just natural for him to speak and ask people for things and just get them for free, he asked us to go get him a simple soft drink from a nearby grocery store, to which we declined, but he insisted. So we told him to wait until tomorrow, and we'll get it for him. Fast forward till tomorrow. We go past the villa again, and he's there, his head between the steel bars of the fence, staring aimlessly at nothing, his big round eyes and toothless mouth gaping open. We saw him, said our hellos, and immediately he started giving commands. Go get my drink now. His commands became more assertive, but still non-condescending and straightforward the way that he speaks is kind of like that of a child. So we told him to ask us nicely and we'll get it for him. He did, and we went to go get him the drink. When he got it, he simply threw it to the ground and asked us for a bar of soap. We asked him what he wants to do with the soap. He said he'll be going to a traditional bathhouse and he needs soap to clean himself. So... We got him the soap. He threw it on the ground next to him, too. We asked for something else. Or sorry, he asked for something else. And we said, that's enough. We'll be going back home. And we did. I'm writing this at the usual cafe I sit at, waiting for my men, waiting for my friend Mady to come over so we can visit this guy again. My friend and I joke about the hex having actually worked on us. That's why we bought him that stuff yesterday and are going to visit him again tonight, too. But something deep inside me questions me about it actually being true. What if we did get hexed and now we're servants to this crazy homeless guy living in the abandoned villa? I actually bought some pizza earlier that I only ate one slice of and now I'm keeping it for the crazy guy when we go meet him. In fact, it's very likely that the spell didn't work, and we're just doing this because we think it's fun and like talking to the guy. But I can't help thinking that the spell did work. Sharing an old experience that still haunts me to this day. So... I grew up with toxic parents, and I developed depression through the years, and cried a lot in the corner of my room. I attempted suicide twice there, too. I shared my room with my younger sister, who was badly abused by my mother. A lot of beating and crying happened in that room from her side as well. This is to say that it's a very negative era in our life during that time and I had multiple sleep paralysis and also believed that I experienced astral projection even though at the time I thought a spirit was trying to pull me out of my body so the story started when my younger sister went to visit my cousin and my cousin told her that she was possessed by a demon and showed her what the demon told her to do a ritual to break up a couple in the neighborhood, among other things that included a mirror and smoke. My cousin was acting strange during that period, and her mother was moving from psychiatrist to another to try to explain her behavior and treat her. The conclusion was that my cousin was schizophrenic because she saw and talked to somebody that didn't exist. Just as a side note, our family is the type of family that even if they witness a demon face, a demon, sorry, even if they witness a demon face to face, they won't believe it and will try to get a medical or scientific explanation for it all. So my sister, 15 at the time, comes back from visiting my cousin terrified. And she told me, she was 22 at the time, that 
all about what had happened. And I'm like, okay, this is bullshit. But I listen to her and comfort her as much as I can. She swears that she will sort of feel a spirit during the rituals and brushed it off saying that it was just a psychological sort of a thing and that my cousin is probably crazy and seeing a doctor for that, actually. Moving forward, my sister becomes convinced she's possessed by a spirit. She tells me the spirit tells her things to help her, warn her about things, and guide her. She starts not eating as much as she usually would, and starts avoiding the bath. After a while, the whole room starts smelling like rotten flesh. I concur, Gecko. I would push her into the bathroom and force her to take a bath every week or so, and deep clean the room every week moving furniture and scrubbing the walls. And the smell was only getting worse, and it was mostly coming from her side of the room. I was convinced her hormones and the lack of showers were the reasons, so I was making sure to shove her into the bathroom at least twice a week, deep clean the room and provide all kinds of deodorant and perfumes to her. The smell was getting worse, and her behaviors were getting worse. She would know when would my father come home, exactly by the minute. She would know if she had a pop quiz. She would know where someone's going and why. And she would be able to talk to anyone into doing anything that she wanted. And a lot of other weird things. She would wake up tired have the deepest black eyes and a lot of bruises. I run all kinds of blood work on her to fix it, but it all came back normal. She would find dead rats in her purse and other weird things. Now the experience. That night my little sister, aged five at the time, came to sleep with us in our room, and I was in the living room studying until really late. By 2 a.m. or so, I decided to go to sleep. I had this feeling that I should avoid my room and that I should just stay away, but I brushed it off. I went into my room. And when I opened the door, it smelled horrible, like somebody died in there, and there was no air, like no more oxygen. I opened the window to let some air in, but I felt no change. I stuck my nose in the window to breathe some fresh air, but there was none. I had decided to just try to sleep anyway. My body was screaming at me to leave the room. I grabbed my pillow, and I was going to go to the living room. And then I thought, no. Spirits and ghosts are not real. This is all my sister being terrified. The smell must be from furniture being damp, and we need to replace it. And just figure it out in the morning. So I stayed. I felt the air become very heavy when I lied down. I moved and felt like my hands aren't mine, so I touched my body and I felt... felt as if somebody else was touching me. I was super scared. I opened my eyes and I saw this black giant figure standing at the edge of my bed. It was so big and so black, like no light could be shed on it. I blinked, and it didn't go away. I was like, okay, I'm very tired from not sleeping enough. This is all in my head. So I turned my back to it and slept. I was sleeping when I transitioned into what I believe was a dream. I woke up and the demon was there, very black, and an evil feeling was coming out of it. I run to wake my sister, but the demon blocked me. So I run to the door to find my mother. I knocked on her door until she opened. I told her all about what was going on. She didn't care, and the demon was coming after me. So I run to the bathroom to hide. And there, I saw a flame in the mirror. So I run back to my room, but I couldn't open the door. So I kept banging on it until I forced it open. And then my night lamp exploded, and I woke up. When I woke up, I was terrified, but the room didn't smell as bad as before I went to sleep, and there was more light in the room instead of the pitch black before. I didn't go back to sleep. 
I stayed awake all night until morning. When everybody woke up, I noticed that my sister was barely walking. She said she was extremely tired and was bruised more than usual. I also noticed that the room door wouldn't close anymore. It was moved horizontally. And somehow, it doesn't fit the door frame anymore. And no one knows why. My lamp had exploded, and my curtains were on the floor, and I noticed that they were pulled from the walls as if someone used a hammer to knock the hanging rod off. It was very weird. But I kept saying to myself that everything must have an explanation. Until I went to have my breakfast. My five-year-old sister saw me and said, Hey sis, there was a fairy just messing with your tummy and playing with it like it was Play-Doh. I asked, what fairy? She said, the flying black fairy. He's a fairy because he can fly. I asked her to describe the fairy and she said that it was scary. So when she saw it, she just closed her eyes and started praying to God. More things happened afterwards, like knocking on the walls, someone choking my mother for a few seconds. She was speaking about it randomly in dinner. My sister got even weirder until I moved out. I heard that my cousin who was diagnosed schizophrenic at the age of 19 had a religious exorcism performed on her, and that afterward she wasn't seeing anything weird or talking to any invisible beings anymore. Her psychiatrist couldn't keep her on medication, and she said she was spontaneously cured from schizophrenia after having more than two years of being diagnosed. My cousin reached out to my sister and took her to the same exorcist, and now she's fine. The smell left the house. We never talked about what happened. The house was blessed. We're not a religious family, but it was like trying everything just for the sake of it. And I'm an agnostic. My mother talked about things she experienced in the house, but we never shared our experiences with her. What do you think that was? Ask Reddit 2 My mom is usually away from home quite often, and when I was younger, like 10 or 15 years old, she would make me stay over at my grand's house. My grand's house is extremely old. 300 years old, in fact. And the interior is very old-fashioned. Entering it always gave me a sinister feel. It wasn't just me being scared of the dark or anything, because I'd still have this fear even during the day. The house is quite large. Well, huge in my opinion and with quite a lot of land attached. My gran has had her heating system redone many times, as the house for some reason never ever even heats up. She eventually gave up and uses a gas fire thing. There's no Wi-Fi in the house, only in the kitchen, which my granddad built as an extension when they moved there. The kitchen is the only place in the house that feels safe, the rest of the house, the walls are too thick for Wi-Fi to reach, which is why it's only in the kitchen. I think anyway, but this means I don't have access to the internet and my phone is pretty much useless in the rest of the house, because there's also no reception. Anyway, I'd stay there usually every weekend and sometimes during the weekdays. I had my own large room too. I am an active sleeper, meaning I often sleep talk, but I very rarely sleep walked, until I started sleeping there. I'd often find myself waking up downstairs in my grandfather's chair, or in the fancy sitting room in the back of the house at like 1 to 4 a.m. I had no recollection of going there, so obviously I sleepwalked but I didn't even remember falling asleep. 
I always had a tough time sleeping in my grand, as I'd just have a fight-or-flight instinct constantly stopping me from sleeping. But then I'd wake up in a different room with no memory of where I had slept or anything. The scary thing is, there are no street lamps nearby, so the house would be pitch black, and it would be so cold that my phone would die from the cold so I'd usually have no light source and I'd wander back upstairs stumbling in the dark. When trying to fall asleep, I'd always hear strange sounds, and it wasn't just me. My mom used to when she slept here, her friend, my aunt, my cousins, everyone heard these sounds, and they had weird experiences. The wallpaper would move as if animated, and it would be like someone was walking outside my door in the hallway and then turning on the tap in the bathroom and creaking open the doors. My gran always had them shut at night, not sure why. Quite often, though, I'd stare at my door and suddenly it would be pushed open. Not enough for me to see the other side, but just the tiniest crack open. I stopped closing my door after a while because I fucking hated it. Things escalated, however. I'd get so scared. I'd close my eyes and I'd pretend I was dead or asleep. I couldn't even breathe due to the fear of being noticed by whatever was walking around. But whatever it was, it started coming into my room. And it was like... as if I was noticed by whatever was walking around, but... I don't know, it was just getting braver and trying to approach me, or maybe toying with me. Anyway, I'd have my eyes tight shut, and I'd be as still as a corpse. And suddenly I'd feel extreme pressure and weight on my upper legs and chest, as if a full-grown human had sat on them. This happened quite often, and the freaky thing is, my mom told me that she also experienced this when young. It would also feel like something was breathing on my face and touching my hand. It was extremely creepy. Not just in a paranormal sense, but as a young girl it felt really weird and uncomfortable. As if this thing had very wrong intentions, if you know what I mean. Anyway, this went on for ages. It would either lay on me or just sit on me, and I'd still be sleepwalking or waking up in those two rooms. One night, however, I was done. I didn't want to deal with this crap anymore. And my boyfriend had suggested to me that there might actually be someone living in the walls. And I wanted to get the cops involved or literally anyone to help as I was genuinely terrified. So I started being at the ready with my camera. I had a battery pack for my phone and I'd just have it on charge constantly as my phone battery would jump from 70 to 20 to 50 to 5%. Constantly in that house due to the cold, I guess. I think this made that thing mad. As it started being more active and more loud after that. At one point it even pushed my wardrobe, which wobbled a lot and it was terrifying. I started seeing weird shadows on the ceiling, as if something was moving on it at high speeds, and I'd constantly be taking pictures everywhere but with no luck, until one day that is. I took a picture of my ceiling, and in the corner of the picture there was a weird white thing, like a foot or a limb or something. It had no details like toes or nails that I could see. It was just a pale white and slightly blurred as if it was moving at high speeds to avoid the camera. I showed my mom, I showed my boyfriend, I showed quite a few people. My mom started to let me sleep alone at home because of this. My boyfriend was scared shitless. I only stayed a few nights there after that and barely anything happened to them. Only the noises from the corridor and the bathroom, but no interactions with me or my room. Then that was it. Never slept there again. 
About a year after that, my grandfather passed away in the house. The fancy sitting room at the back of the house was turned into a room for him, as we didn't want him spending his last days in the hospital. He had a motor neuron disease. Something to note about him. He was very strict with how many lights we had on in the house at one time. He'd get angered if too many lights were on, and he was kind of crazy about saving energy and money. Anyway, when he passed away, he had nearly all of the lights on in the house as the whole family was there. But when he passed, all the lights turned off. It was only my grand's house that had this power cut too. The nurses and doctors were so stunned that they left instantly and left the body in the house. After his passing, the sinister feeling I had in the house had gone. Well, not entirely, but it was definitely dulled down. I haven't slept there since, so I don't know if this sound still happens. My gran is usually fast asleep and has medication that helps her sleep deeply, so she wouldn't know either, but yeah, that's my experience. I've experienced a few odd paranormal things in my life, but my gran's house was by far the most terrifying and extreme. I'm not religious at all, but honestly, what I experienced in my gran's made me pray to God out of fear. My Father's Village This happened about 11 years ago when I was a child. Don't really remember the exact age, but I remember it was during the summer holidays. I live in Central Europe, and my father comes from a village in a neighboring country. The village has a population of about 1,000, so basically the whole village knows each other. And the village is a little bit well, weird. It doesn't really have to do much with people. They are all really nice and like to see our family when we came there every summer holiday for two weeks. We didn't really go there for about four years because father and uncle had a big fight about grandmother's heritage after she had died. But I plan on going there alone once this whole COVID thing is over. So I guess I'll start with the stories. First, the village in the house of my grandmother, where I also had my own experiences. So the first story is one that was told around the village when my dad was little. Once there was a church celebration or a mass, or how it's called. And it's about this one man. I don't really know much about churches, but this one has that tiny balcony where you can observe things from above, and it has some extra seats. He went there because it was the last place with empty seats. He sat on one in the corner, but had fallen asleep. He woke up some time later, and the church thing was still going, but something felt off. Apparently, after some time, he realized that the people there were already dead and buried behind the church and everything was silent. He was scared, so he tried to open the front door, which was unfortunately locked. By the way, the spirits were staring at him this whole time. After some time, he had an idea to go up and wake up the village using the church bell. It worked, and the village gathered and unlocked the door so he could get out. The ghosts were not there anymore, and his hair went from gray from all that fear. I heard other stories, but I don't remember all of them, so if people who read this want to, I can ask my father about these stories. So now to my dad's experiences. It's nothing special, but I'm just kind of surprised at how many of them there are. First, when he was a teen... There was a celebration and he and his friends were messing around on the edge of the forest. <clears throat> At one point, they both saw a light deep in the forest. They decided to investigate. My father is really brave about these things. 
so they took a bucket of water in case of fire and went up. When they arrived, no light was to be seen. It was just pitch black like it tends to be in the forest. Slay looked around for a bit and then went back. After some time, they again looked up the hill and saw the light again. But this time, they were too scared to go there. So they kind of forgot about it, and the light disappeared after some time. Then, when he was older and was in high school, this one is probably the creepiest and always seems too fake to me. So I later thought it was just some kind of a bedtime story that my dad made up. I joked about it a few years back, and my dad started to shout at me and was really angry with me for some time afterwards. That made me believe that he was telling the truth, because he seemed genuinely angry that I was making fun of it. So, he was in high school in a nearby city, and would always arrive home pretty late. This one evening was in winter, and it was around 11 p.m., from the bus stop, you have to take quite a long road to the house. Then it's just a few more houses, and then the forest. So he was walking towards his house. A few hundred meters away, there's a turn, so you cannot see very well what's further down the road. But then, there arrived an old lady, and she was coming right towards him. He already knew something was off, because... What would an old grandma be doing outside at this time? She was pretty normally dressed. She had a skirt and a headscarf. But after they get closer, they noticed something. She was normally dressed, but instead of a face, there was nothing. Just a black hole. He was obviously really scared, but continued to walk towards her. They crossed each other but she didn't seem to be aware of his presence. So she kept walking towards the village, and my dad ran home and went to a troubled sleep. Those are the two that I remember. There are, of course, a few more. And now to the house stories. So first, my dad, when he was already an adult, slept there for a few nights. His grandmother used to live with them when he was little, he had a room on the second floor, and his bed was facing the door. Every morning, his grandma would look through the glass. And this was on the door to see if, you know, he was awake. And then she would open the door. So now that he's an adult and sleeping in the same position like when he was little, it was close to midnight, and he was looking at the locked door. At one point, he asked himself, What would you do if the doors opened right now? And just a few seconds later, the doors would creak and open. He was staring at them for a few minutes, waiting if something would happen. Then he got up and locked them again, went to sleep. The second one is from my uncle when he was about 11 years old, home alone at night. The stairs to the second floor always creak incredibly loudly. He was about to go to sleep when the stairs started to creak, as if someone was walking on them. He was scared, but managed to put the blanket over his head and fall asleep. And now to me, my twin sister. We recently talked about this, and I told my sister I always felt weird and scared on the second floor. And when I had to go up there, I would be super quick and then sprint back down. I was surprised that she told me she felt the same. So here's her story. Me and my dad were sleeping in a tent in the garden. We were about nine years old. The grandma and mom were sleeping downstairs, and she was sleeping on the second floor. She told me that she heard the door open and someone was walking around the room. She suddenly felt cold, like someone was hugging her. This lasted for about a minute. Then it stopped and the door closed again. And finally, my story. It's pretty similar to my uncle's. I was quite addicted to video games when I was about 10 years old. So once there was some kind of celebration and everyone from the house went there except for me because I wanted to play. 
So it was around 5 p.m., and I was playing downstairs in the living room when suddenly I heard the stairs creak incredibly loud like someone was stomping on them. I waited for nothing and bailed from there to the garden where I spent the next two hours before everybody got back, and I grew even more scared of the second floor and the stairs. Recent events that made me question my skepticism. Last winter, my wife, daughter, and I were staying at my wife's parents. They live in a pretty old and pretty small house, and notably the only one on the street that hasn't been rebuilt within the last 20 years or so. It's still an original brick construction, as opposed to more modern wood build, and this is in Arizona. The house is very cozy and homely, but my wife and her sisters have always had various creepy feelings about this house. I believe they meant homey, not homely. M.I.L. is also very religious and superstitious and has a few ghost stories about the house. I've always loved ghost stories, but never been able to believe a word of them. I like that spooky feeling of the but what if it is true? But well, I can only hold on to it for a moment, and I've never been able to convince myself that the porn, sorry, that the paranormal is real in any physical sense. Anyway, on to the story. I work fully remote, and I'd rented a local co-working space for our stay in Arizona. The main office is on the East Coast, so I was routinely up at 6.30 a.m. to get to the office space in time for their 9 a.m. calls. One morning, the co-working space was randomly closed. A leak in the building or something. No big deal. I just drive back to the house and set up in the kitchen table. During my morning Zoom call, I hear my mother-in-law leave the room to head to the bathroom, and she gives me a cheery good morning. Can't exactly remember why, but I just ignored her. I think it was a combination of being tired, coffee not kicked in yet, and also trying to concentrate on the call. Also, she has a habit of not understanding what a Zoom call even is, and will just strike up a conversation when you're mid-meeting, and I wanted to avoid that too. Don't blame you. I waited to hear the bathroom door close, or the TV turn on, or something, but didn't hear any of the follow-up. I suddenly got this disgusting feeling of being watched, Presumably because I'd heard the good morning, but no follow-up on the movement of my mother-in-law who said it. My head snapped 90 degrees to my left to look down the corridor. It's just slightly out of my peripheral vision from where I was sitting at the kitchen table. Nothing there. The only rational explanation for this is that my mother-in-law had to come out of her room. She said good morning and then immediately went back in, but that just felt unlikely to say the least. She has trouble sleeping typically and goes to bed at 3 or 4 a.m. And we see her about noon. And remember, it was like 7 a.m. at that point. The feeling was too creepy to ignore, despite being a supposed skeptic. I repositioned myself entirely on the kitchen table so my back was to the safety of the corner, with my eyes straight down the corridor. Needless to say, when I quizzed my mother-in-law when she woke up, she said that she definitely hadn't come out. She definitely didn't say good morning to me. And also nervously laughed and declared, Yep, there's a spirit in this house, that's for sure. She's really superstitious, so it didn't surprise me that she said such a blanket statement. But for the first time, I couldn't really disagree with her. Nothing happened for the rest of that working day. And these experiences have an eerie half-life, almost like the further you get from them, the more you question if it actually happened. Has anyone else experienced this too? The next oddity occurred later that evening. At around 5.30 p.m., I was lying on the couch with my wife watching Family Guy. I was just drifting off to sleep. I'm no stranger to sleep paralysis, and I typically suffer from it when I fall asleep on my back which I was doing on the sofa. 
the next thing I know, I'm in sleep paralysis. My typical experience with this is to take a very few deep breaths. It's the only thing I can control while I'm paralyzed. And it usually shakes me out of it. The typical experience for me also has never involved the demon. My sleep paralysis episodes, if you can call them that, are always just black, as if my eyes are closed. This time, though, for the first time ever, I could actually see the room. I see a little boy walk in, climb on the sofa, then sit on my chest, just like how my daughter would do if she wanted to play or something. I couldn't make out a face, but I know that he had shorts and a blue-collar shirt. He was maybe three or four years old. It didn't really feel creepy or anything, and I was hyper-aware that I was in sleep paralysis, too. So my logical brain was kicking in, I guess. But it was still very weird that it was happening. Considering, like I say, my sleep paralysis is always just blackness, no hallucinations. After a few more of my deep breath tactics, I woke up. The instant I woke up, my daughter ran in. She's not even two years old yet, and says, Oh, anybody here? and then ran out back to her mom, making her scared whine noise. At this point, I'm actually spooked. My daughter's vocabulary is hello, please, and cookies, yet she formed a whole sentence for the first time ever. I know kids pick up on new language all the time, and as a parent you can't keep track of where they pick it up, but in that moment it really freaked me out. I now had this growing narrative of some kind of an evil mother who tries to bait you in with pleasantries, and then a sad child looking for comfort or help. That shit really fucked me up to think about. I had to really try hard to squash paranoia for the rest of our stay there. Because for the first time ever, my logical brain had no comeback for the events that happened. If it wasn't for that sleep paralysis event, I don't think I would have thought anything of it. But the good morning incident from when I was very much awake really connected to some spooky dots for me. I'll give one final related anecdote from my mother-in-law. That will allow me to sort of tie this together and throw out our theory. When my wife's older sister had moved out, there was finally a spare room. Mother-in-law had always been looking to move into a spare room because father-in-law snores too loud. This spare room was always the aforementioned quote-unquote creepy room, the one that my wife and her sisters always had terrible vibes about. No further information about that, mind you, just a feeling. So when mother-in-law first moved into the spare room, she started having the worst sleeps of her life, and nightmares, paranoia, lying awake until the sun came up, shadowy figures in the corner, but I guess that could easily just be her sleep paralysis, huh? One night she had such an overwhelming sense of dread that she threw herself out of bed and shouted, Whatever you are, I'm not afraid of you. Go and find the light. My heavenly father and always will be protecting me. In that moment she felt an enormous weight off of her shoulders and had the best sleep of her life, according to her. I'd heard that story before, and I took it with many grains of salt. But given my experience, here's my theory. Did she direct some evil presence from her room out into the corridor, where it still remains? Yungabura Fog This story happened many years ago around the months of July and June. My family and I often vacationed up in a cabin in Yungaburra Cairns, Australia, and this was during winter. We do this as we miss the cold days and we would get from our hometown in Toowoomba during the winter, as Cairns is tropical. So it's summer 24-7. Yungaburra is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that, if you blink, you miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical, with about 150-plus years of heritage. 
It's usually with rich heritage and small towns that local folk legends form over the years. One of these legends came true. We rented this cabin that was on brink of the bushlands and was next door to an old farmhouse that has quite a bit of land, including some of the bushland in the cabin back dip into. To get to the cabin, you had to walk up a somewhat steep dirt road that also leads to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium-sized pond that ran along it. This dirt road came off of one of the main streets of Yungaburra. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungaburra. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He, on the other hand, did not have to drive anywhere the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. It got to about 11.30 p.m. and I decided I better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15-minute walk away, so after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized not driving was a dumb idea, as it was about 5 degrees Celsius or 41 Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper, and that was all. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder. I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway. God, did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was up. After I had my flashlight on, the fog started to roll in. At first, it was only light fog, but it continued and developed into heavy fog. Then it surpassed heavy fog. Thereupon, I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, here we fucking go, something's about to happen. Get it over and done with. On recollection, I believe I actually said that out loud. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom. The last thing I wanted was to fall in it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance. A small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard... Son, is that you? Come out here out of the fog. Follow the lamp. It was my mom. I couldn't see her yet, so instead I followed her light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up steps and I heard a door open, so I knew I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction I saw it last. I was calling out to my mom to turn it back on and there was no reply. Until I finally ran into a wooden guardrail and some steps. I walked up the steps and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swinging open in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There's three things you do in this type of situation. The three F's. Flight, fight, or freeze. I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mom's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then I realized I would rather be out in the fog than standing in the doorstep of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs. I heard the voice now yelling, My son, where are you going? I started to sprint, but I was running and I smashed my foot and leg against some stone and fell flat onto the ground. I took a chunk out of my knee and cuts all along my hands still have the scars. I turned around and realized I had not tripped over a stone, I had tripped over a tombstone. At this point I screamed, I got up and I started to run even more. I was screaming out for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped, 
thought I got far enough from the house until a little amber light, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and I ran for it. Yet again, I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the metal at the end was my life. Before I knew it, slam, I ran straight into a wall with my head being the contact point. I blacked out. And for what I can remember, I was woken up by my dad, who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently, when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night. And any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me time to rest. This also gave me time to ring up my friends so we could come over and perhaps give me some insight into what I saw and what my dad saw. Me and him sat out on the patio. I could see the farmhouse only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first built in the late 19th century. During the 1910s, a well-known mother, Anne, her apparent name, let her son play with some of the mates down in the main stretch of town that one day. It started to get late. As it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go out looking for him. As soon as she walked down, she could hear his footsteps. She told him to follow the lamp. When she made her way back to the house, she was not accompanied by her son. It was not until the next morning that they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently her son's. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late cold darkness, mistaking them for her own lost son. My life as a sensitive person. To start off with, I've always been a sensitive person to the point that I'm highly susceptible to migraines, sun sickness, and car sickness. Not only are my regular senses heightened, but I could be sort of having a sixth sense. I always say that this is a family thing, but I can't actually remember who told me that, when or why. That said, I've always been able to kind of feel people's energy in the form of emotions, and had a bit of an awareness of electromagnetic energy. I was able to tell when a CRTV was on anywhere in the house. But most relevant to this subreddit, I've always been sensitive to the supernatural. I also usually don't dream, though dreaming has become more common in adulthood, but I attribute that to a less consistent sleep, as I most often dream only if I fall back asleep after waking up. As a kid, I remember I was afraid of the dark because I always felt like I saw things in it. But that was very likely my imagination as I remember that I didn't have a strong ability to differentiate my imagination from reality until I was about eight. I remember around 12, I had an out-of-body experience, but that wasn't really ghostly. Around 14 or 15, I had a very active autumn. On Halloween, I saw three shadow people in one night. One watching me from a fence, one behind an above-ground pool while playing hide-and-seek. I can't remember the third, but I remember there was three. This all happened at my father's best friend's house during a Halloween party, and I remember people saying I must have saw someone in a costume. But the more you think about it, the dumber that sounds because shadow people really just don't look like people in costume. A week or two later in November, I was out late at an appointment with my mother, and we were walking back to the car. The building had lights on the sides, 
and I was trailing a few feet behind my mother. It was a short walk, but at one point I just looked down at my shadow and noticed a second one next to mine. Almost twice as long and maybe a foot wider. I looked over my left shoulder to see where it was coming from, but as I did, I heard a rustling in the bushes about five feet to my right. Turning around, I didn't see anything there or in the bushes, and the shadow was gone. I freaked out and ran with my mom to the car. I can't remember clearly if I definitively saw shadow people any times in the future after that, but I think I did. The next major things I experienced, though, were with my Uncle Frank. He was a very well-respected man, and not just my godfather, but felt like the godfather with the way that he treated everybody and the way that he carried himself. He had a position high up in American Airlines, and when he passed away in 2012, I remember being told that the plane carrying his body back to New York made two trips around the city before landing. I think he landed at JFK. I don't know for sure. During this time, though, I was 17 and attending Stony Brook University, so I had to get picked up and brought home for the funeral. I only had one pair of dress pants that I brought with me, and before we threw it in the wash, we emptied the pockets. But when I took the pants out of the dryer and stuck my hands in my pockets to open them up, I found a freshly minted $20 bill. I still have it pressed into a book in my pocket. Every time I saw Frank, he'd give me money, just like that. So finding that 20, I just started crying. Frank is an active spirit, and I know he's doing a few other things, but only one other stands out in my memory. This spring, my cousin Gina got engaged to her longtime boyfriend, Rory. Rory knew about Frank, of course, but I don't think they ever met and he said that after Gina said yes, they had commented, I wish I could have asked your grandfather Frank for permission. They swore that immediately after they said that, a rainbow appeared out of nowhere. When I spoke to my mom about how I can't remember more Frank stories, she assured me that people like him are always around, and she said she still feels her father around all the time. I asked her about this because she's never mentioned this to me before, and she was surprised she hadn't. So I'll share what she said now. Whenever I'm looking for something in the garage, I usually have trouble. So if I can't find something after a moment, I just say, Okay, Dad, where is it? And suddenly it would appear. I found this to be a very interesting story for a few reasons. One, my grandfather died long before we got their current house, so kind of funny he'd know where anything in that garage is. Two, my mom has always had a talent for finding things no one else can, and I've joked about her being able to find anything for years. I wonder if that's just because of her dad. This last thing I have to mention is not really fun at all, and I still don't know how to explain it. So me and my fiancé moved into our apartment last June, and we went to her family's Thanksgiving together for the first time ever that year. So on the way there, we went through a neighborhood that I've never seen before. And the second we entered the neighborhood, something very, very wrong. I'm starting to cry and sweat cold, just remembering this, but I can't explain it very well. I was just sitting there, and all of a sudden I got a chill. Something was focusing on me, a very strong presence. I couldn't say where or what, but something was in that neighborhood. It took us about seven minutes to get from one side to the other, and my fiancé was terrified. Not because she felt anything, but because I was crying, a horrified mess complaining to her about something watching me. Something felt like it was out to get me, and I'd never been so scared in my life. We went to my parents after we left her family's house, so we've never gone back to that neighborhood. And I wasn't paying attention to where it was going, so I'm not sure where it was. But I don't want to ever go back there again. 
It's a really hard thing to explain, that sudden sensation of not being watched but almost hunted. I'd never felt anything like it before, and I never want to feel it again. I never saw anything. It was about three o'clock, so not even dark out. And it seemed like a normal neighborhood, but I swear on my life that something was there, and it felt like it was out to get me for the entire time we were there. Ghost trying to make contact with me. Long story. I had some crazy experiences when my family and I moved into our new house. I was eight years old. The first time I noticed something wrong was the day when I was playing with my new RC car. I played with it in the living room for a few minutes, then took a break to use the computer. I left the controller with the toy car behind me. I then started hearing an odd sound that was happening in bursts. It sounded like a small power tool coming from beneath the house. I sat there confused, looking around, but it stopped. A few minutes later I heard it again. I turned around and noticed that the long antenna on the RC car was wiggling back and forth. The sound was the car moving by itself. Then there was a time not too long after that, I had another odd experience, and the thought of this one still makes me uncomfortable. One day I was in the family room watching TV. There was a computer swivel chair to my slight left in the room. Suddenly, the chair slowly turned and faced me. It wasn't like the chair had slightly turned. It made a good, decent-sized turn. What's even more odd is that that room is known for having an uneven surface, whereas the floor is at a slight slant. The chair swiveled up against the slant towards me. A few months go by, and there was a day when I had family come over and visit. It was at night, and my family was in the family room across the house. I was watching TV with my brother in his room with the TV to my left and the doorway to the hall in front of me from where I sat. He told me he was going to be hanging out with the family, and I told him I would June as soon as the episode finished. He leaves and I enjoy my time. But a few minutes go by, and I start noticing something. The doorway is in front of me, and it's dark with no light. And when I look at the TV, I can see the doorway from the corner of my eye. As I'm watching TV, I seem to notice a human-like figure standing in the dark doorway. I immediately turned my head and saw nothing there. And I figure it's just my eyes playing tricks on me. I go back to looking at the TV, and suddenly I see this figure again. But this time I wait slightly longer before turning to directly look at it. I noticed it was shaped like a woman who was wearing a dress, but no details other than a white shape. I look and it disappears. And at this point, I'm kind of freaking out, but I'm trying to convince myself it's not real. I turn to face the TV once more and the figure reappears, but this time it's moving her hands and arms making a shape, making some gesture. After that, I bolted out of the room and ran to my family. After that experience, I still wasn't 100% sure if what I saw was real, and a few weeks went by. One night, I was hanging out with my sister in her room. Out the doorway of her room, you can see the doorway into my room on the immediate right. We were talking and joking around until something caught my eye. There was a shadow of what seemed to look like the bottom of a dress on the floor in my room, with the rest of the figure being hidden by the edge of the doorway. It looked like the bottom of a window curtain slightly swaying in the wind. Then it moved up out of my eye's view around the corner of the doorway. I immediately went into my room to check if it was empty. I had no curtains, nor anything fabric that could cause that shadow. I went back to my sister's room and told her what I saw. She didn't really take it seriously and brushed over the topic. 
Soon after she looked at me concerned and told me, Man, you really did see something, huh? She said that my face was extremely pale. Finally, about a year goes by. One morning I awoke. I opened my bedroom door and my sister came up to me with a deep concern on her face. I ask her what's wrong. She begins to tell me the story of what happened overnight while I was sleeping. She tells me that in the middle of the night, she heard what sounded like our mom outside the hallway, softly calling out my name. James. My sister found this unusual and called my mom via cell phone to ask if it was her. My mom awoke with a groggy voice saying it wasn't her and that she's asleep in her room. My sister got freaked out and went to my mom's room where she slept the rest of the night. Later on in the same night, my grandmother and grandfather, who live in the back house, went to my mom's room and woke up my mom and sister. They said that they heard a woman crying and screaming in the backyard. After hearing that story, it was like it confirmed everything that I had experienced. Mind you that I kept most of these experiences to myself, didn't share them much. That was the end of it for a while, never heard or saw anything for years. But there was one last experience. It was 2011 and I was all grown up now, still living in my mom's house. One morning I woke up and went to the living room and began opening the blinds on the window to let the light in. As I'm opening the blinds, I hear my mom calling out for me from across the house. I told her to give me a second as I finish opening up the blinds. I walk to the family room where I heard her and she's not there. I assume she went back into her room and I check. Not there either. I then checked my grandparents' house. She's not there and not in the grandparents' house. I went back to the living room and looked out the window, and I realized that all my family's cars are gone. I was home alone. I called my mom to further confirm that she wasn't home, in fact, and she indeed was not. The voice I had heard calling my name was as clear as day. Didn't even question it in the slightest. That was the last time I came in contact with what seemed to be a woman who had interest in me. I'm not a religious man. Rather, I am a man of science and reasoning, always trying to pick out possibilities before jumping to conclusions. But everything I'd experienced leaves me puzzled. Everything you read actually happened. And even if, you know, I guess even I'm having trouble believing it sometimes, it's simply overwhelming. Ghost Cat Messenger About 12 years ago, I had been to visit my grandfather, who had been in the hospital for quite a few weeks, and didn't seem to be getting much better. I was sitting up on my roof thinking about him, after I had come back, as I was just having this nagging feeling that it would be the last time that I saw him. I was trying to wrap my head around the fact that I was probably going to lose him soon. I see this chubby ginger cat just standing there watching me with this intense look in its eyes. The cat looked a lot like one of the cats that we had fostered back when I was a kid, which we had originally named Ginger as well. Somewhat distracted, still thinking about my grandfather and knowing full well that it couldn't be my childhood cat, I don't know why I just called out to it going, Hi, Ginger. And it just stared at me. I started feeling a little bit unsettled as it literally went towards what the grandfather's bedroom was and just squatted on the top of his roof, still glaring at me, but not really engaging with me in any way aside from that creeped me out a bit, so I just decided to go downstairs, as it was soon going to become dark anyway. That night, I dreamt that I was walking along the balcony, 
where I had been earlier that evening with my mother. And she says, I have something I need to tell you. Ginger passed away. And I seemed to have quite a strong emotional reaction to that news in my sleep and woke up. Tears in my eyes and ran to my parents' room to tell them what I had dreamt. As I get to their room, I see that their lights are on and my father's on the phone with the hospital. Apparently they had rang us to tell us that my grandfather had indeed passed away just minutes before and my mom was sitting next to my father in bed crying. I just shared a look with my parents who nodded, no words were exchanged, and I just knew that he was gone. I couldn't stop thinking about the cat that night before, and the way that it was sitting on my grandfather's roof just glaring at me, and how in my dream my mother told me that it was the cat that passed away and not my grandfather. But overall, I chalked it up to just a weird coincidence and moved on with life. Fast forward a few months. I am again sitting on the roof. Yep, it was my go-to place to think and unwind. Anyway, I see the cat again. This time walking around on my elderly neighbor's roof. Again glaring at me while doing so. And I remember thinking to myself in passing, Oh God, it's the cat. I hope everything's okay with them as I remembered the last time I'd seen it, right? But I didn't think too much of it, and I just went back to thinking about why some boy I liked in high school didn't like me back or something silly like that. Anyway, next day I find out that her elderly neighbor had passed away in hospital, and the time of death would have been roughly right around the same time as it had seen the cat hovering over their roof. This gave me the chills, but I still didn't really want to think that this cat was some weird omen and just brushed it off as a coincidence again. Again, fast forward a year or so, and third time I see this cat, I'm walking along with my other neighbor's roof, and it's just glaring at me and I distinctly remember looking at the cat and saying aloud, what the fuck Ginger, who's gonna fucking well die now? And sure enough, the next day I find out that my neighbor, who I was good friends with, and still am. Her cousin, who was born with MS, had passed away the evening before. Not in that house, or anywhere close, though. But would have been the same time again as I saw the cat. This time I was quite exasperated, and just way too many coincidences, and I got really creeped out. I started always looking out for the damn cat every time I would go up there which was pretty much every evening, but would never see it except for these instances. Fourth and final time, which I think was probably the scariest of them all. A few months after the last incident, I was up on the roof with another friend of mine. I wasn't extremely close to this girl, but we had a group of friends over and the others had gone to pick up some food for all of us. So it was just me and let's call her Haley for this story. And we were all talking about friends of ours who we have in common and just making small talk. Really as there really wasn't much to really talk about because we weren't all that close. She was telling me about how she heard from one of her exes and how it was so out of the blue that we were laughing at how weird it was when suddenly I see the fucking cat again. This time walking right next to us, again glaring at me. This time it even sort of hissed at us. I almost crapped myself and Haley noticed I looked horrified. She was like, what's wrong with you? Are you scared of cats? So I told her about how every time I see this damn cat, somebody dies. She looked quite creeped out, so I went, sorry. Continue, I'm probably just being paranoid you were telling me about. Let's call her her ex, Martin. So she continued telling me about what she said to Martin when he contacted her, etc., etc., etc. And we moved on and our friends got back and we all had a great night. Sure enough, the next day Haley called me up, bawling her eyes out, telling me that she had just found out that Martin had died in a terrible car crash the evening before. 
right around when we had been talking about him and seen the fucking cat. And she was freaking out and crying, and she was like, it's all that fucking cat's fault, you need to kill that cat. Martin had been in a different city than us at that time, and the only thing that stood out was that we had been talking about him when the cat appeared to us. I didn't go back on that roof for a good couple of months after that. Although, I was pretty fucking shaken up about it, and understandably, Haley literally never came to my house ever again. I got up the courage a few months after to again start going up there. That was when I got over it. But thankfully, I never saw that cat again, and haven't since. A year or so after that, I moved to Australia and barely go back home since then. But even now, when I still do, I go back on that roof, and whenever I do, I always think about the cat, and it still gives me goosebumps. I still think about it often and honestly wonder what it was. Was it like a ghost or a reaper or just a series of crazy coincidences? I don't know. The Pretenders For some sense of understanding of this huge house and the layout, I lived in this house between high school and college, and had the basement to myself, with a mother-in-law's apartment basically. I had a bedroom, huge front room downstairs, kitchenette and bathroom. The previous owners had built a kennel to breed terriers around the corner in the hall from the stairs just outside the door from the downstairs front room. At the bottom of the stairs, where the portal was located, and there was another small room in there, some storage areas on one side of the stairs, and the garage was on the other direction of the kennels. Up at the top of the stairs was a door, and it locked from the upstairs. The upstairs had another large front room, a large kitchen, a dining area, dining room, large laundry room, three bedrooms, and two bathrooms. This house was from the 1940s, and it was sold to the government for one million to be demolished for a new development around 2012. We rented it for a long time when we moved from my home state. So, unfortunately, we did not partake in the one mill, but we were able to appreciate the space inside the house, as well as the size of the property and the privacy. The Pretenders One evening in college, I was on the couch in the downstairs front room, alone of course. The front room was so large that you'd be able to see even a decent sized TV, you'd still put the couch in the center in the front room. So there was plenty of space behind the couch. I always kept the downstairs front room door closed because of the portal and the kennels around the corner in the hall at the bottom of the stairs and the door at the top of the stairs was also always closed. Everyone kept it closed, but that's how I'd come upstairs to the kitchen and whatnot. My kitchenette door was also always closed, and my bedroom door was too, if I was in there. This evening I was watching TV downstairs on the couch in my front room, all the doors closed with my pillow and blanket. I heard the door at the top of the stairs open and close, and then I heard my mom's footsteps coming down both flights of stairs and across the hall. When my mom thought I was sleeping, she would quietly touch the doorknob and try to quietly open it, which even if I was sleeping would automatically wake me up every time. I was not actually sleeping. I was wide awake. But I heard her quietly touch the doorknob and try to quietly turn it. Then, as usual, open it just barely and quietly whisper my name. It was the same as every other time. I didn't answer, continued whispering my name repeatedly, thinking I was asleep, because I faked it. I distinctly even recall a Wendy's commercial, followed by a George Lopez intro while this whole thing was happening, as weird as that is. I decided it would be better to listen to that, in that moment for some reason, my mom whispered my name over and over, asking if I'm awake. She opened the door more. Then I heard her footsteps getting closer as she walked all the way through my giant front room. 
I don't mean just 12 feet long, I mean that they were at least two to three of the giant industrial long fluorescent lights in this house that lit up that front room. She repeated the same thing over and over until she got up behind the couch right above me, still asking if I'm awake. She repeated the same thing over and over. She eventually gave up, though, and I heard her walking back out the front room. She didn't shut my front room door, though. Pet peeve of mine everybody knew about. Not that anybody really came down. But something odd. Her footsteps stopped halfway up. Not that odd, either. She probably was texting, or maybe she got stopped by something, or maybe sensed that I was awake and I was going to get scared when I came, I don't know. I feigned a sleepy voice and said, What? Nothing, Mom. Still no response. Mom, I heard you. I'm up. What do you want? But still, she didn't say anything. I just saw my door open. I was annoyed at her lack of response after such persistence and leaving my door open. I decided to get up and go see what she wanted, irritated with her. Although, as I started walking towards the door, my sort of irritation faded into anxiety and fear, but I kept reassuring myself, it's just her, I'll find her, it's just another time she's going to jump out and scare me. As I got out of the front room, I started to run up the stairs. I felt something come from the shadows of the kennel behind me, almost like something was going to grab my ankles. But this was par for the course. I hated that whole area, as did my gecko. I didn't like my front room downstairs, but I hated the hall down there and the stairs and the kennel more. I ran up the stairs as fast as I could. My mom wasn't there as I circled to the next flight and got to the top. I tried grabbing the door and turning the knob, but it wouldn't open. I started banging on the door and crying. I felt like something was with me, behind me, glaring at me. I sat there for what felt like forever. It was probably only minutes. Eventually, my family came to unlock the door. They were all laughing at my expense. I started yelling at them, telling them that it was not funny to lock me down there, knowing how terrified I am of it down there. And especially since I only came up because mom was coming down and calling my name and leaving my front room door open. Everybody looked at me, and they told me that she had been with them the whole time, watching TV. I told them no. She came down and whispered my name. I heard her footsteps. They all told me with all sincerity that they had all been upstairs watching TV together, repeatedly. I told them the full story, and they apologized for locking me down there and never did it again. I was extremely freaked out by the fact that not only did they know my name, or did it know my name, it knew exactly how to mimic my mom's footsteps, behavior, and it knew best how to get my attention. And not only like it felt like I was intentionally baited by it to go up the stairs and then I started questioning what would have happened to me if I had responded to it when it pretended to be my mom. What would have happened if I hadn't pretended to be asleep that night? But also, was it just trying to scare me? Because it had an opportunity on the stairs. Why didn't it close the door when it left? Or continue back up the stairs? And how did no one upstairs hear the door at the top of the stairs open or close? I've had all these questions all these years, and they're all still unanswered. Welcome to Paranormal M, where reality meets the unexplainable. Subscribe and hit the notification bell to join us on a quest for answers to the most perplexing stories that challenge our understanding. My parents' house is haunted, and they refuse to believe it, even though the ghost is affecting us. This story is about the current house my parents live in. My parents' house, Ziz, apostrophe S, have always been haunted. I've always been sensitive to ghosts for as long as I can remember. Every house that we've lived in has been haunted, 
and I have been haunted and a few of those ghosts are attached to me still. Even though I moved on to things, they still occur. Most of the ghosts attached are good. I make sure of it, so don't worry. Anywho, backstory time. I will probably be referencing multiple houses, so I'm going to name the current house that they live in as the Shelby House. When I was younger, we lived in the same neighborhood that we live in now. We moved out of our first house and moved to a couple of different houses, and now my parents are living in the same original neighborhood I grew up in. It is a house a few houses down from our first house. The Shelby House has had a few different owners, and being a small town, we knew most of the owners. Well, the previous owners, Thomas and Grace, fake names for privacy, were a couple with an empty nest. I'm not sure how long they owned the house before us, but they were the couple that my parents bought the house from. Yes, Gekka, I know. They aren't there now, but when we moved in, the mailbox and the curb across from it had rose bushes at the end of the driveway. They've been there for a while. As I said, we knew some of the previous owners of this house, so the rose bushes were there since I was a kid. I remember seeing them when we would go visit sometimes. Now the driveway is horrendous. It is so hard to get out of. That's very important in this story. Back to the story. So there were a lot of different incidents of this happening to this point, and Grace would make jokes to us about it. When my parents bought the house, Grace said, Be careful of the rose bushes, they're cursed. The roses caused Thomas to die. She made some joke like, Just make sure you don't run over the roses, and laughed. My parents are super religious, so they didn't believe her. They didn't really believe in ghosts or curses. Well, every time somebody related to Thomas and Grace, themselves, friends, family, or anybody, and they would run over the rose bush on the curb opposite the mailbox, and they would have the worst luck for an entire week, and the people would tell Thomas and Grace about it. Now, this is where the story takes a turn. Thomas ran over the rose bush one day, and a week later, he sadly had a heart attack and died inside the house. That's what leads Grace to sell the house to my parents. It's important to note that Thomas was six foot. I have no idea if the previous owner had stuff happen to them because of the rose bushes. Okay. Now, to how the roses take effect on my family. We haven't even lived in this house for a month. And my father accidentally ran over the rose bushes one day. That week, he got some rare type of food poisoning, went septic in the middle of the night, and had to be rushed to the hospital. He passed out at home while in the kitchen and fell and broke his ribs because he hit the floor so hard. The doctor said it was a miracle that he even survived. He was in the hospital for at least two months or more and also had to have some type of surgery. Then my mother ran into the rose bush on her way to work and she had someone rear-end her. Everyone was fine in the crash, but still, like, what the fuck? So after those two things happened, my parents decided to take the rose bushes on both sides up and just replant different flowers. My parents were too busy to do it, so they told my brother-in-law and sister to do it. My brother-in-law's mother helped them. They all had bad luck and had catastrophic things happen to them for almost a month can't remember what they were because it was one day after another almost every single day. They replanted different flowers and the new flowers died almost immediately. No matter how many flowers my family replanted, they would all die. Now I lived in that house for about a year or so before I moved out. I would always hear footsteps and voices when no one was home. I also had nightmares of me being haunted and possessed and bad things happening to my family. I would constantly have sleep paralysis. It was to the point that I wouldn't sleep because I was scared to have nightmares or I would sleep in my car or sleep when I would come home from school around lunch. Well, one day I was home alone and I was eating lunch in the living room and I was on the phone with my boyfriend at the time. 
From the couch, you can see into my room and the hallway at pretty much any angle. I was on FaceTime and just watching GMM like every day when I get home from school. I remember I was eating ramen and all of a sudden I see this six foot dark figure just walk into my room from the hallway. And then I heard someone go into my room. I saw my door open and I said, Okay, your boyfriend's name is spelled E-O-G-H-A-N, and I have no idea how to pronounce this. Yogan, I think somebody's in my house. And he said, okay, go get the pew-pew and stay on the phone. If something happens, I'll call the cops. I grab a knife from the kitchen and I walk into my room and I check it out. And my brother's room in the bathroom and no one's there. A couple of days go by and the same thing happened. It kept happening. So I told my brother about it, and he said the same would happen to him. The day I moved out of that house, all of the nightmares of me having possessions and being haunted and bad things happening to my family and sleep paralysis all stopped. My brother tells me he has them now, and most nights he won't sleep in the house, he'll just go to my sister's and sleep. Every time I go to my parents' house now, I go home with a giant migraine and I just feel like my entire energy was drained out of me. A doppelganger? I've told this to family and friends and I'm always given a skeptical look or it brings chills to their spine. It sounds far-fetched, but honestly, it was as real as it can get for me, and that's all that matters. I was around 10 or 11 at the time, and I was in my old home in Millmont, Pennsylvania. It was after school, and I spent a few hours just gaming on the first floor living room. It was only me and my older brother home at the time, since my parents worked the second shift until about 11 p.m., it was around 7 or 8 p.m. when I began to crave one of my favorite snacks. I walked in the kitchen, opened some blueberry Pop-Tarts, and sat down at the kitchen table. I was facing away from the living room at the end table. Now, I need to explain the layout so you better understand this. Before entering the kitchen, there's a small archway with no door. It leads straight from the kitchen to the living room, extending to around two feet of open space on either side after the archway. From the living room continuing straight, there's a staircase to the left, facing away from kitchen view. I was mid-bite of my Pop-Tart when all of a sudden I began feeling what I can only describe as dread, mixed with the feeling of being watched kind of shook it off because of it being so random. It made no sense as to why I felt that way, so I just kept eating. I was a few more small bites in when the feeling intensified and I only had a gut instinct to turn around. I decided to do so when I should have not. I'm going to try my best to describe the finite details of what I saw. When I turned around... I was immediately focused on three-fourths of a face peeking out completely sideways on the right side of the archway. Now this face was completely solid and not transparent. Not transparent at the least. It was the face of my older brother, Jonathan. His eyes were opened wide, unblinking and staring directly into my own. His face had an absolute sinister smile an ear-to-ear -ear smile that was almost too far stretched out to be normal. My brother's skin was normally pale, but this face was an extreme pale. Extremely pale for sure, a few shades lighter, almost like a slightly cream porcelain. The face's eyes were the same color as John's being bright blue, but it seemed almost glossy. It made no noise and never attempted to speak. It just stared at me, unmoving. 
Now, I have a condition where I get heart palpitations from a murmur I've had since birth. If I'm surprised or get excited too quickly, I get several quick palpitations. I've had it for as long as I can remember. When I suddenly saw that face, I had to clutch my chest as an immense immediate fear and surprise was causing my heart to palpitate several times. I also got a huge lump in my throat. I couldn't scream, I couldn't yell. I just stared widely back in paralyzed horror. What was around five seconds felt more like an eternity. The face then pulled back behind the archway at an angle that you wouldn't think possible. For a few seconds, I was terrified, but then I just began trying to rationally think of what I saw and attempt to pull myself back to Earth. In my own mind, I knew it was my brother. It's just his features were a bit oblong, and that smile was more sinister than anything I've ever seen before. I was already used to him pranking me on a weekly basis, so I convinced myself that it was another one of his stupid pranks. I thought to myself that I can also sneak to the archway myself and scare him back, since he didn't walk back to the living room. I knew he was just hiding on the right side of the archway. So I slowly and silently got up from the chair and sneaked my way to the right side of the archway from the kitchen. I reached the edge of it, waited a few seconds, and then jumped out and yelled, Boo! However, to my confusion, there was nothing there. There was no way that my brother could have moved away from that position without me seeing, as that part of the hall only came out about two feet. I still had visible access to the rest of the living room from the kitchen. I was in shock and confusion when all of a sudden I hear quick walking coming from the staircase on the left side of the living room. I slowly turned towards the staircase and looked up at the sight of my older brother looking back at me with a confused expression. Dude, who the hell are you yelling at? My brother said as he peeked over the stair rail at me. He was 13 at the time. I was just in utter shock. I tried to make out words, but I just couldn't. My lip was only quivering. I instead just turned back around, went back into the kitchen, sat down at the kitchen table again, just staring into my Pop-Tarts for about a minute or two. My brother came down the stairs and into the kitchen and saw the blank look on my face and pressed on his questions told him everything that I saw, and he somehow believed me, maybe due to the fear and panic I had when he first saw my face. I was researching online what could have been possible there, and I've only been pointed to what is known as a doppelganger. But I saw that they're an exact copy of a living person, and that thing was very close to being exact, but it wasn't 100%. I would say 90% at best. With that stretched smile and the skin tone. Also, my research showed that they're not sinister or evil, but can be a sign of bad luck. But I swear the only feeling I got off of it was dread and a sense of sinister evil. I never saw it again after that day. Man appeared out of nowhere to help me when I got stranded. There was a day I finally had off work, and I decided I'd head to the beach. The closest beach is about an hour and a half away, and I decided to book it down and try to get there on time to see the sunrise on my own. Just a bit of background. I wasn't in a very good mindset back then. I always truly felt alone kind of lost and hopeless in my life. I really felt there was no purpose in living, really. I'm a person that likes to run away from my problems and tries to find things to keep me distracted and constantly busy. That's why I work a lot and don't have many days off. I dreaded having a day off and being alone with my thoughts and figured I'd just get away from where I was even a little bit. I was only going to be a half-day trip where I'd go see the sunrise, 
take in my surroundings, meditate, and find some inner peace before going back to my mediocre life. I ended up getting there once the sun rose, which was a bummer, but it wasn't going to stop me from enjoying watching the waves. The location I went to is technically an island, but there's a massive bridge that you can use to drive over there. Once you get on the island, it's basically the shape of a long strip and it goes for miles if you drive north of it. So I decided to drive a good 8 to 10 miles out by car where I knew there would be no people and I can just be alone. Some people drive down that way more to go deep sea fishing, but while driving I didn't see any cars. Once I got to an access point on the beach, I made a really dumb move and decided to drive into the sand. I have a Kia Optima, so in no way is my car capable of driving through sand. <laughs> no way. Don't ask me why, I was kind of in a fuck it, what could go wrong moment, and within five feet of getting into the access point, my car got stuck. No signal since I was way out there. No people, just me and my sunken car. Surprisingly, my mentality was just, well, I've been through a lot in my life, and it's been way worse, and I felt way worse, so this isn't so bad. I calmly went and checked what I was dealing with, and yeah, car was mega stuck in the sand. I shrugged, rolled up my sleeves, and started to dig in attempts to get the tires out of the soft sand. I figured I could do that for some time before I get tired, and if it didn't work, I'd just leave my car there and go enjoy the day. Figure out things later. It was probably 7 a.m. at the time, so if I had to go do an 8 to 10 mile walk, then no biggie. Probably in about five minutes of me just digging, I all of a sudden hear a voice behind me that scared the jeebus out of me. I turn to see an older gentleman in fishing gear with a big 4x4 Ford truck, standing a few feet away asking me if everything was okay. The most distinct feature on him was his shirt had his name embroidered on it with an M. Zuniga. He was probably in his 60s, white hair and I could tell by the tips that it stuck out from under his beige cap. Round glasses and a bit tanned. He looked like a normal old guy to me, ready to go fishing. It was strange though, I didn't hear his car or even notice him getting out and walking up to me, and I was the only person there. There wasn't much at all really any background noise since I wasn't remotely close to the ocean, so it would have been hard to miss him coming up. He asked me again if I was okay. I said, yeah, perfectly fine for the most part. You're crazy to try to drive this car in there. It wouldn't have made it, he told me. I kind of laughed and told him, yeah, it was pretty dumb move on my part. He started inspecting my car and told me that he can use his truck to pull me out. I obliged. After a few minutes of tangling around some wires and maneuvering my car, my baby was out. I thanked him again for the generosity. What's your name? He asked me. I let him know and he said it was nice to meet me. He looks around a bit, kind of peering into my car. And what are you doing out here all alone? I told him I had a day off work and I just wanted to enjoy the day. He stares at me for a few moments, then introduces himself. My name is Mario Zuniga. Where are you from? I tell him the city I came from and his eyes lit up. Oh, I'm from there too. I have a clinic in that city. I'm a veterinarian. After some small talk, I mentioned where I worked, and he knew exactly where I was talking about. Oh yeah? The one off there. He seemed to be very familiar with the city. After all, he did say he lived there. After a bit more of talking, he stuck out his hand and I shook it. He clasped my hand with his other hand and just held it. And he told me, I really hope you're doing okay. I like to look out for people. I just want to see how you're doing. I'm actually going fishing, but I'm heading out for a couple miles from here. I'll probably be out all day. I'd love to invite you, but... I don't know when you'll have to leave. I told him I appreciate the offer, but it was okay. I wasn't planning on staying long. He told me that if I wanted to hang out on the beach, it's probably best if I head south instead, where I can park in an actual parking lot and just walk my way up to the shore. I agreed. He wished me the best and reminded me that things will be okay. 
and went on his own way. I don't know if I gave off that solemn kind of energy and he felt it or thought that I may have wanted to do something extreme while alone out there, but his last words of reminding me that things are going to be okay really stuck with me. I ended up going to the south side and hanging out on the beach there for a couple of hours. I decided to Google him, since he said that he was a vet in my hometown. The city I live in is relatively small, and I only know of three vet clinics in the area. I did a real extensive search of his name and looked up a majority of vets that worked in those clinics. Couldn't find an ounce of this man anywhere. It was really as if he didn't exist. Almost because even if I then felt like he appeared out of thin air, and on top of that I was the only person that saw him. Ask Reddit. We live in rural East Texas, and it's what's considered to be the Bigfoot capital of Texas. My family's lived on our property for over a hundred years now. In the late fall of 2020, we began having what most would consider to be odd activity on our property. Now to preface, our property is mostly woods and swamp and it butts up against more properties that are even less visited, and they're also forced in swamp. Some of the neighboring properties only have people visit for a few days each year in deer season, and they're otherwise just vacant of humans all year. And some of the waterways get into pretty dark and isolated stretches of river bottoms. In the evenings around sunset and into the early hours of the night, we began to hear on occasion odd bird-like whistling noises coming from the woods across from the road in the forest and swamp area. Our homes are on the other side of the road from the underdeveloped property, and these weird noises would come from in the wood line near the nightfall sometimes. It sounded like birds whistling and chirping, except it didn't sound exactly like birds. It sounded like something doing a really good job of mimicking bird whistling and chirping. This went on for months, but sadly I never got any audio recordings of anything. My father, an experienced hunter and woodsman, said that he kept trying to locate the source of the noises. But when he would get closer to the woods, the sounds would move away from him further into the woods. He said it would continue to do so for pretty much almost as if his whatever was making these noises was trying to lure him deeper into the woods. Having seen too many movies, he opted out of that situation and went into the house. This all climaxed in January of 2021 when I went out of the vehicle and I was just trying to get something from out of the back of the vehicle. And suddenly, from not far into the wood line, I heard the most chilling noise I've ever heard in my life. As I was retrieving my bag, a loud animal-type roar erupted from the wood line near the gate. This gate accesses our property, which is located just opposite of the road of my driveway. I've spent my entire life studying and working with animals, namely exotics and the best I can compare the sound to was a large male silverback gorilla roaring. I want you to understand that this sound was a primal sound and alarming. I actually mildly pissed myself reflexing. I searched for days on YouTube, and the closest, I guess really, the closest sound I could find was a video of a male gorilla at a zoo suddenly roaring to intimidate some onlookers. And it gets weirder from here still. Not being one to simply assume my family's being haunted by some monster, I decided to grab my headlamp, sidearm, and AK-47 rifle and head down into the woods to see what was making these sounds. I wish I could say I saw a huge Sasquatch and had some epic shootout, but I didn't. I sat in my vehicle in the woods in total darkness for some time. I even played the Sierra sounds over my vehicle speakers to see if anything would show up, but 
Sadly, and perhaps thankfully, nothing did. However, before leaving the woods, I headed back up to our cabin to make sure everything was normal around the cabin. We've actually had people break in before, so I wanted to make sure everything was as it should be. I searched the immediate area with my headlamp and rifle, and while there were some large animal that stayed just out of my line of sight due to thick undergrowth, I'm mostly certain that it was a feral pig, which can get very large and quite dangerous, frankly. The oddest part of all of this is that when I checked the slough, a semi-permanent body of standing water, near our cabin, there was an animal in the tree I still cannot identify. This small animal was about two feet tall sitting on its haunches, and about a foot wide. It had no obvious or visible tail, and appeared to clearly have four appendages. It was invisibly some sort of mammal, but since the water was higher than normal due to the wet winter, I couldn't get a better angle or get close to it without wading out into the icy water. This animal had silver-colored fur with texture rather similar to that of a chinchilla, and for all of my attempts, it would never show its face or paws as it kept all those distinguishing features tucked into its body like it was sleeping, despite it clearly reacting to the sounds I made on the ground. I've tried for everything that I can think to identify this creature. It was not an opossum. It was not a raccoon. It was not an owl or young owl with downy feathers. I cannot explain this animal with any of the local species of fauna, even if it had some health issues like mange. The closest thing that I've been able to find is a silvery gibbon, which are obviously not native to eastern Texas. My wife still half-jokes that I found a baby Sasquatch tucked away in a tree by its parent, and I honestly don't know what to think about all of this. But after that night, we haven't had any more strange activity that I'm aware of. I'm a very open-minded yet rational person. I've grown up in these woods. I've studied and kept numerous animal species. I've helped with government ecological projects in our area. I have taught biology and ecology classes. But this will baffle me for the rest of my life. Did I find a baby Sasquatch? What happens when a loved one dies? This happens in Mexico. Me and my family are from a small town at the outskirts of one of the biggest cities in the country. And that has become semi-urbanized since last century. So people here still have strong folklore about the supernatural things in comparison with the rest of the city. So the paranormal stuff is seen here as something more accepted between the people. To the story. It happened at the beginning of last year, when the second wave of COVID really hit the country. Making almost all of the hospitals get overwhelmed. One of my uncles works as a nurse in the hospital. So unfortunately, he caught the virus and ended up infecting his family and parents, as well as my grandparents, even before presenting symptoms. His father and my grandfather were brothers, and all of the three houses are next to each other. The problem started when my grandpa and his brother started to get worse after they presented symptoms. So my parents decided to take my grandparents to our home in order to take care of them. Fortunately, my grandma didn't present even symptoms, but despite her best efforts, my grandpa was not getting better. Taking him to a hospital would have been a death sentence due to being overwhelmed, as I mentioned before, due to him being already dependent of oxygen tanks because of the virus. So, transporting him was really difficult and a risk for his health. And even if he would have been accepted, the personnel inside of hospitals weren't enough. We have more family members working inside hospitals, so we knew what was really going on inside of them. After two weeks and all of our efforts, 
he did not make it. So as you can imagine, it took a really big toll on us all. As for the brother of my grandpa, he ended up dying as well, both of them being at their 80s. Now one of the usual things believed here is that when somebody dies, the person stays around for a few days. I've never been someone who believes every story about paranormal stuff. I try to judge things from a more rational side, despite experiencing some things that still make me wonder about what we can really assure about what we know about paranormal things in general. This was my first experience with the belief that I mentioned. The brother of my grandpa died a few days before him. The weird thing started the very same day that his brother died. It started when I was in another room of my house, as I was getting ready for something to eat. So I was not in the same room as my grandpa, when all of a sudden I saw a shadow for a brief moment exiting the kitchen. But I really thought it was my imagination due to the fatigue. My parents and I took turns taking care of grandpa, so he never was unattended. Even at night being my turn when this happened. So I ignored it. But after I heard a voice of Grandpa's brother coming from the same room Grandpa was, and I have no doubt about that one, it was clearly him. Obviously, I freaked out because it was impossible that it was him, because we were not in the same city that he lives in, and he was also in a delicate condition. So I went to check on Grandpa, but there was no one there, and my other family members were not there at the moment. I gave it not that much of an importance until a few hours later when we were informed that Grandpa's brother had just died a few hours before. Even worse, after my Grandpa started asking the condition of his brother any time that he could, he had not until that day, despite not knowing he had died being impossible because we knew that if we told him he'd probably just get even worse in his health. So everyone just kept it a secret, even my Grandma. Even till the last days, my grandpa asked about him, and we just told him that he was better. I don't know if he believed it, because he said that his brother came every now and then to visit him, and as you can imagine, that being impossible. The day came when my grandpa did not resist anymore and passed away. Just a few hours after his brother... One of the most common things that happened here is that it's said that after someone has died, some other person who doesn't know that person died sees them, like if they were making their daily lives for one last time. I didn't believe in that before all of this happened, but the news of my grandpa's death took a while to spread as we were not in the same city that we lived in. And as I said in the beginning, being from a non-completely urbanized area, People still knows almost everyone in town, especially old people. When we went back to my grandparents' house to stay with my grandma, fortunately parents took off work, so still could be done at home, we found some friends of the family who were really surprised about grandpa's passing. As they said they had seen him just a few days before, still after his passing, and even had a brief chat with him, and knowing them, I don't distrust them, as they're not the only ones who attribute everything to paranormal stuff, and also their reaction was complete shock. Maybe I believed more easily due to what I experienced with my grandfather's brother. Even for a few days after we arrived, my grandpa's rocking chair swayed at random times. I would have known if the wind or a minor earthquake were causing this because I know that house like the palm of my hand. I used to live there for a few years when I was younger. Sometimes plates would appear out of the kitchen without any logic, but we never really felt uncomfortable. I guess that's what it means when people talk about feeling their loved ones still being with them. This started to fade away slowly and in the end, everything returned to being as normal as it could. Some lurked in the shadows. Something else might have been protecting me. 
from a cloaked man in a hood without a face to someone with an affinity for a certain room, as well as several other sightings in between, the Holy Family Parish Church in Maine is haunted with a lot of activities. The Stillwater Montessori School rented out two rooms and utilized a good part of the building for their interests. From 1990 to 1997, I went to this school. Its layout was fairly simple. The door to the school was the ones closest to the road. It opened up to a long hallway immediately in front and a hallway to the right. This right hallway was where the school resided. This shorter hallway on the right side had a classroom that we used as a dining room, then two classrooms, Terry's and Al's. Past those three rooms was a large open coat closet. Around the corner along the adjacent wall was a large kitchen with a few tables. On the left side, a catering hall across Terry's classroom and bathrooms across the coat closet. The Kitchen in the large kitchen, something lurked. This room, us students weren't allowed to play in, and we used it only periodically, if the church needed our normal dining hall for an event, perhaps. I saw it lurking throughout the day. I always saw whatever this was through the half-length window of the closed door. It looked like a man with a head with long, dark hair. Every time I saw him, he walked past the door, I never saw a face. Being a curious, somewhat mischievous kid, I had to check to see who else was misbehaving. Often the door would be locked. I'd peek through the window and see no one inside the room. When the door was unlocked, I stepped inside. I wouldn't be greeted by anyone. The room was always empty. Well, it always looked empty. It didn't feel empty. It didn't sound empty. There was an authoritative energy in the room. It was strict and cold. I was a little nervous that if I stayed there for more than a minute, I'd get a good beating. The minimal moments I poked my whole body in the room, I could faintly hear dishes rattling by the sink and a general mixing cooking sounds. Sometimes we'd have to eat lunch in this room because our normal dining room was occupied. I was the only student not excited to eat my lunch here. Upon finding out that we'd be guests in this room, I'd dread it and lose my appetite. I wasn't the only one eating there, so that made it a little bit better, but I still didn't feel welcome. I'd constantly hear extra noises that didn't match students who were eating packed lunches. It was unsettling. I was always glad lunch was over in this room. The Reception Hall The school used the catering hall for potlucks throughout the year. The potlucks would include a theater show put on by the students. The energy in this hall was somewhat ominous due to the kitchen and bathrooms jutting out from an otherwise large rectangular room. There were three sections of this room. The open area in front of the bathrooms, the large area overlooking the kitchen, and the smaller area that faced the entrance. This smaller area had a dark corner where the paneling was different. It looked like a booth or nook that maybe a cash register might be placed. Behind the counter, there was a weird room in a closet that didn't feel right. Other than this section, light brown paneling, a suspended ceiling, and white-gray speckled vinyl adorned the room. In the center of the longest back wall hung a large crucifix between two large windows. There were two potlucks a year. Rehearsals took place in the hall on a makeshift stage between the two windows. This is where all the shows were performed. I always felt an audience of two extra people watching us. In the height of this feeling, Whenever I'd look over by the kitchen wall directly across from where I was standing, I'd see a faint shadow of a man in a top hat. The man wasn't letting off a whole lot of emotions. He was just there, like an overseer, sending wide bits of compassion in a slightly ominous way. 
Meanwhile, over by the darker paneling, an angry energy lingered behind the shadows, invisible to the eye. But I could feel it, sorrowful anger looming. As long as I stood clear of this dark area and never ventured there alone, I knew I was safe. Midnight Mass at Christmas Growing up, it was a tradition to go to Midnight Mass on Christmas. My Aunt Claire, my brother Josh, and I would nap in the evening and get up at 11 and head to Mass. Often the church that would host the Mass was the Holy Family Parish Church. One Christmas while I was in high school, probably 2003, we arrived at the church and entered the church by way of the main entrance overlooking the road. The three of us walked down the alley to sit in the pew that we wanted, towards the middle of the floor. We sat down as the mass went on. Eventually I caught a glimpse of a man on the stage. Anger and confusion added to the overwhelming, gracious, peaceful Christmas atmosphere. He was wearing a black cloak. The hood was over his invisible head. It just stood there for a few seconds before it just turned around and disappeared behind a red curtain. Even though this hooded figure scared me, I never mentioned it to anyone. I knew it wouldn't be able to hurt me. Usually, all Catholic churches have some energy. None of the energy is anything like what looms here. Help Needed with Crystal Ball I don't believe in magic, but a few times in my life I've seen things, things I can't explain, and I've come to believe it's not so much about what you believe, it's how hard you believe it. Indiana Jones Anywho, back in the 70s and 80s, my grandfather did a lot of work in auction houses, in and around Central Florida. You name it, he had a hand in it. From importing Rubik's Cubes to ballpoint pens. One of the auctions he attended was in Sarasota, when the Ringling Brothers and the Barnum Bailey was clearing out a warehouse. So as a kid, there was definitely some fun stuff around in my grandparents' house. More often than not, I'd spend hours just digging through stuff. Towards the end, the house was reminiscent of hoarders and part of their failing health. Anyhow, I remember going through a drawer with my grandmother, and I pulled out a glass crystal ball. Yeah, like the ones you'd see a fortune teller use in a tent. I thought it looked cool, and my grandmother instantly snatched it away and put it back. She said that it wasn't to be handled. Odd, right? Curious, I later asked my grandfather about it, and he got uncomfortable and told me that he'd bought it from the Ringling Brothers and the Barnum Bailey at one of their auctions, and that it had in fact been used by their resident fortune teller, Lady Zindra, Rose Edelstein Lewiston. Cut to some years later, my grandmother had advanced Alzheimer's, and my grandfather passed away unexpectedly. In short, the aftermath was a complete shit show, and a story, better or not, told another time. But in the chaos, I was able to take a few items from the house. One of which was said crystal ball. Why? My aunt is a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad person, and I didn't want somebody potentially dangerous to end up with her hands on it. As a teen, my aunt played with a Ouija board, and I'm told that the experience not only scared her, but dramatically changed her as a person, in the wake of how malicious she had become. So why talk about some stupid crystal ball? Well, I believe it's got some seriously bad juju, and I don't really know what to do with it now. Like it belongs in the Warren's Occult Museum or some shit. I don't think it's hyperbole. I've kept it wrapped up in a rag and in a drawer since 2012 because it gives me the willies. And I swear, every fucking time I handle this crystal ball, all hell breaks loose around me. 
and for a while, I thought it was all in my head. But now I'm not so sure, and it's really freaking me out, and I don't know what to do. I've talked to a few people in the past, including a psychic friend, Paula, that does professional readings who had told me I should try to cleanse the crystal ball under the light of a full moon. And Mike Burton, a lifelong family friend, Vietnam veteran, and retired sheriff, he's an expert on the occult who trained under the real Ed and Lorraine Warren and has investigated over 2,000 paranormal cases and even assisted in real exorcisms. Mike is afraid of the crystal ball, and he's told me to protect it, but not to get rid of it or destroy it due to what's held inside. Whatever evil spirit or entity that might be. As such, I haven't physically brought the crystal ball to him since he declined to handle it. For additional context, this is a man who refuses to host his own reality show for Sci-Fi Channel because they wanted him to fake findings like Ghost Hunters for dramatic effect. But like, what the fuck do I do with this thing? I was cleaning about a month ago, and took it out of its drawer. Stupid me, I unwrapped it from the rag and handled it and put it into a velvet-like bag with drawstrings. So that I don't have to worry about it ever being exposed on accident. I then put it in a bin, and took it to my storage unit, and I swear the shit in my life has been hitting the fucking fan ever since, and other people in my household have been seeing dark shadows for the past month, often described as a fox or cat-like blurs, which have happened every other time that I've ever handled the damn thing. What's worse and really freaky is that nobody else knows that i had been handed this crystal ball but me, but everyone sees the same things afterwards. It's like a spirit or manifestation or some crazy shit like that that I can't explain in any rational way that's being collectively and independently experienced. I'm afraid to leave it out on a full moon to cleanse, like was suggested, as I don't want to leave it unattended and fear that it have the opposite effect thus supercharging as opposed to neutralizing. I've thought about contacting the Wrigling Brothers and Barnum Bailey to donate it back to them in their museum, but all I have is the story of where it came from and no proof or paper trail, so I doubt they'd even be interested. And again, I fear that it'd end up in the wrong hands, with or without a disclaimer. I can't get a renowned paranormal or occult investigator who I know to help. I'm literally stuck, and the longer I have it, the more I feel I inherited a century-old problem with no clear solution available to me. I watched someone get possessed when I was in middle school. Went to middle school, or junior high, whatever a small town and community. There honestly was nothing, like absolutely nothing to do besides go to the mini mall or to the community rec center where they would hold these teen dances and play horrible early 2000s music. Ew. Ended up going to one of these teen dances per usual with a group of friends. And per usual said group of friends got into it with the preps or jock kids. Fight breaks out. Police are called. Everyone scatters. Me and this kid, who I'll just call Nate, end up walking back to his house on this bike path that runs along the backside of this rec center. It's nighttime, and there's a skate park to one side of us, and for a while, then nature trails, and a river on the other side. We keep walking along this path, and suddenly Nate stops and says, Do you see that? pointing into the pitch blackness as he faced the direction of the nature trails in the river. Now this kid was admittedly at times not always too nice to me, and I thought he was just messing with me at first. So I say, See what? There's nothing there. 
But at this point, this fool is walking towards whatever he thinks he sees. I see him walk right up like he's approaching a person, looks back at me and just crumbles. It was like he fainted or something. So now I'm in the middle of this path completely alone, and there may or may not be some type of presence that just caused my friend to pass out. I'm scared to death at this point, obviously, and this is all becoming too much for my 13-year-old brain to handle. I'm half Hispanic, and I grew up around very religious elders, and was always told when I had nightmares or even if I felt evil that I needed to pray. I started walking towards my friend because I didn't want to leave him there. But I also didn't want to be alone, and I began praying. Now as an adult, I am not religious, but at this time I was doing whatever I thought would help. I went to try and pick my friend up, and he was so heavy, abnormally heavy. I was big for my age, and he was much smaller than me, height and weight-wise, and it was like I was trying to pull a grown man. I know dead weight, but this felt different. He also was ice cold to the touch, despite it being in the middle of summer. I started to drag him and was praying and focusing on this one particular star as I did so. Not really sure why, looking back, but I focused on this star and prayed and prayed repeatedly. My initial thought was to drag him to the hospital, but I swear the more I prayed, the brighter this star got, and it was like he was revived or something. He woke up annoyed that I was dragging him and scuffing his inversion, and just confused about what had happened. He said that he saw an old man near the tree line when we were walking, and that he motioned for Nate to come towards him. He said once he got close to the old man, this thing put out its freaking hand inside of Nate, which is what apparently made him pass out. I was happy he was okay, and that I wasn't alone, and we ended up walking back to his house like nothing happened. But I believe something did happen to Nate that night. Flash forward a month or so later, and per usual, I'm meeting up with my friends to once again go to one of these teen dances because, per usual, that's the only thing going on. I get to Nate's house, and the whole feeling is just off. Hard to describe, really. I go downstairs to Nate's room, and he's not in there. But this is something that happened. You know, we were good enough friends that I would just wait for him to pop in, which he would do normally. But this time, there was nothing. I go back upstairs, and every single animal this dude had which was like a cat and two or three small dogs, if I remember right. They were all standing, hair raised, with their backs to the front door, staring up. And I see my friend Nate sitting over this banister that he had in his house in a weird way, feet dangling. Didn't see him there when I came in, and he's just silent, scribbling and mumbling something. What's up, man? I asked him nervously, not really knowing what the hell was going on at this point. Nate looked up at me, and looked like he hadn't slept in a few days, deep circles underneath his eyes, and he says, I ain't fucking scared. Confused, I asked, scared of what, bro? And he jumps down from the banister with the paper in his hand and gives it to me. The paper has the word death and then just black scribbles, like he had been sitting scribbling the same circle in the same place for a long time. Instantly got all the bad vibes and nope energy, and I just flat out told him, I'm going home, man, and opened the door, leaving his terrified animals in the corner and wondering if they'd be okay. Long story longer, Nate eventually got into a lot of trouble, dealt with some pretty crippling vices, and though he's still alive now, looks like a shell of his former self, or just not what you would have expected this kid to grow up to be, say the least. I think I witnessed a possession happen to him. Haven't told many people this story, and I don't think I've ever shared this in detail.
Waking up covered in blood. Even though it's been years since it happened, I've finally plucked up the courage to actually write about this because I want to know if there's an explanation for what was happening to me. I'll try my best to be as detailed as possible, despite it happening when I was seven. When I was little, I shared a room with my sister. We had bunk beds, with my sister on the bottom and me on the top. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. When I turned on the bottom light in the bathroom, I looked down to see me covered in blood. And by covered, I mean covered in blood. Starting from the very top of my neck all the way down to my feet. The front plane of my body was red. It looked like I put on ten bottles of red lotion. You couldn't see my skin at all. It was even between my fingers and my toes. What was even stranger was that the whole front of my body was covered in blood, but there wasn't a speck of blood on my clothes. I was wearing a nightshirt and underwear, but there was no blood on them. There was blood on my chest, arms, and stomach underneath the shirt, but none on my actual shirt. My mom heard me get up and saw the bathroom light on, so she came to check on me. I remember her telling me to take off my clothes so she could wash me off and then sent me to bed to take off my bed sheets, because they would have had to have blood on them. I remember not really freaking out because my mom seemed so calm. So I climbed back up on my bed to take off the sheets. Well, guess what? There was no blood on the sheets either. Not a single drop of blood on my white sheets or white blanket. I told my mom and she checked herself, but she didn't see any blood. So she told me to go back to sleep. Years later, I asked her about this night, because at that point, when I thought about it, I thought it must have been a dream because her and I were so calm at the sight of me bathed in blood. When I asked her, though, she told me how terrified that she in fact was. She told me that she tried not to freak out for my sake, but she honestly thought that I got stabbed with how much blood there was. She told me that right away she was looking for wounds, but she couldn't find any. She thought either there was an intruder in the house who stabbed me, which there wasn't because she checked every door and window, or she thought my sister somehow woke up and stabbed me, which was also very unlikely because she has cerebral palsy and wouldn't have been able to climb the ladder by herself. She told me that once I went back to sleep, she checked on me every ten minutes while I slept for two weeks. She told me she couldn't sleep because she got so terrified, and it looked like I stepped out of a horror movie. Over the years, I never really thought about what could be the explanation, but the more and more conspiracy videos and paranormal videos I watch, I'm starting to think that I had to have something paranormal be happening. When I look back at my childhood and put all the little things together, it starts to make sense. For example, when I was little I used to have horrible nightmares. They were either about the devil or about me dying, sometimes both. I still remember a lot of these dreams, despite it being years. I was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder at eight, so I thought maybe the dream stemmed from my stress or something. I also have sleep paralysis quite often. Normally I'm very chill about it because I've had it so many times, so I tell myself, you'll move when you wake up again. So I would just fall back asleep. The last time that I had sleep paralysis though, long story short, this dark creature jumped on me and started clawing at my chest to get to my heart. It was so painful and when I woke up there was actually pain in my chest. Whenever I pass by a cemetery I get physical shivers up my spine, which people have seen and commented on before. 
My mom told me that one time she was driving her old car and it stalled, so she pulled to the side of the road. The engine lights on the dashboard started flashing and the speedometer started spinning. And when everything turned off, the speedometer landed on 66666. She then proceeded to freak out and run out of the car and call my aunt to pick her up. She got rid of the car not long after. I would have thought that this story was fake, but my mom isn't really a religious person, despite raising me in a Catholic household. So she would have no reason to make this up. So basically I got very sidetracked at the end of this post, thinking of all the weird things that's happened over the years. But my major question is, does anyone have an explanation for me waking up covered in blood when I was seven? And the question to bounce off of that is, could that have been part of a bigger issue based off of all the other things that's happened to me and my family growing up? Is it actually more serious than I think? To be honest, I'm sort of shaking as I'm writing this. I'm recalling all these moments and potentially linking them all together and it's kind of terrifying me. Lived in a haunted apartment for 12 months. Lots of things happened that I couldn't explain. When I was in my first year out of school, my older brother and I moved into a small two-story apartment in Scarborough, Western Australia. It was relatively cheap and in a great location, with the only drawback being that the apartment seemed half-finished in places. There were quite a few outdoor areas that were crumbling away, and even some of the walls in the upstairs area had sections of the wall unpainted. We were apparently the first tenants since a renovation. Our parents would come and stay with us from time to time, and we still talk about our weird experiences in that place today. It always had an eerie feeling to it, with random rooms at odd angles and very uncomfortable aura for want of a better word. The biggest feeling I had at the time was that I always felt like I was going to look down the staircase from the top living area and see someone run past. I don't know why I even thought that, but my parents said that it was one of the first things that I said to them about the place. It all started one Friday night when I was staying home with my mom. We were both sitting on the couch watching TV at about 9 p.m., with only the lampshade and the kitchen light on. We both felt something really odd that I've never felt before or since. Like all of the air was getting sucked out of the room, or there was a pressure change or something similar. We felt like we couldn't move, and it was like we were stuck in place. A shadow then appeared on the wall to the back left of the TV, about the size of a small person, but almost just looked like a blob in a vague shape of a human. It moved diagonally up the wall to the left, as if it was climbing a set of stairs. It then disappeared, and we spent the rest of the night in hysterics, leaving the house until my brother and dad returned a few hours later. What must have been a few weekends later, another encounter occurred. I had just been at the cinemas watching a film with some friends. The film was White Noise, around 2005. And it was based on hearing ghosts speak to you through the static of an untuned radio. It was a pretty average movie, but an interesting idea. That night while asleep in bed, my clock radio turned on max volume right next to my head at about 1 a.m. It was 10 seconds of chaos as I tried to turn off the radio alarm, but nothing was turning off the sound. In my half-asleep state, I didn't think to pull it off the wall. After about 10 seconds, it finally turned off. I somehow went back to sleep, but... I remember at the time knowing that it was the scariest thing that had ever happened to me, 
and that I had just encountered something. The next morning I woke up to find the cord for the alarm clock in the middle of the room underneath the bed, nowhere near the wall. Not long after that encounter, we had some friends around for some drinks in our main living room and had another incident. An old CD player of my brother's was sitting on the table and turned on max volume all of a sudden, playing with weird Indian sitar sounding music. Needless to say, it scared the hell out of everyone in the room, if not only because of the loud noise just happening from nowhere. At another point during the night, the sound of a girl's scream came from upstairs and was eventually explained away by one of my friends as coming from a neighbor's house, even though it felt like it was directly above us. Another instance occurred on an evening when my mom was staying with us, and my brother and dad were away. We had a table tennis in our garage, and that was connected to the house through the laundry. I had fallen asleep on the couch and woke up at 2 a.m., I went to the laundry to have a drink of water from the tap, and I could hear people playing table tennis beyond the door to the garage. I was basically frozen in fear. I put my ear right up to the door, and I could hear the sounds of a game being played, but I knew that myself and mom were the only ones in the apartment. I retreated and went to bed, knowing that I was too weak to open the door and confront whatever was in there. and. I somehow fell asleep. The next morning I woke up and went downstairs for breakfast. The first thing mom says to me is, How late were you and your friends up playing table tennis last night? I got up to go to the toilet at 3 a.m. and I could hear a game going on in there. So that was pretty spine tingling. The last story that I can think of at the moment is when I was at a friend's house one night. I received a phone call from my brother at home. As I answered, he said, How drunk are you? I can hear you rattling the keys in the door. I explained that I was at a friend's house, to which he replied, Shit, and hung up. He calls me back five minutes later and explained that as soon as he hung up, he heard what sounded like a large animal run along the side of the house from the front, along the side fence, and within seconds was knocking aggressively at the back door. He went to the back door, and there was nothing there. My haunted hallway experience. Not safe for work. You've been warned. During either my junior or senior year of high school, my dad moved into a new house after a divorce from my ex-stepmom. I had two younger siblings, between the two of them a younger brother and a younger sister. Since I lived with my mom a majority of the time during high school and stayed on campus during my first college semester, I shared a room in this house with my Anna, my younger sister, who is about nine years younger than me. Alex, my younger brother by six years, had his own room down the long hall. This incident takes place in the upstairs hallway. For context, the hallway comes off from the kitchen. Going down it, you'll pass us kids' bathroom on the left, with Alex's bedroom door across from it on the right. Continuing down, the hallway ends in a small square, with the entrance to Anna and I's room and Dad's room sitting catty-corner to each other. Hope that's not too confusing. One night the summer before I started college, I was coming home late, and I was on a date with my, at the time, boyfriend. It was about 2 a.m., so everyone in the house was asleep. Coming in the house, I knew my dad was dead asleep, because I could hear his snoring. I went upstairs and walked to my room. Alex and Dad's door were shut, meaning that they were both asleep. Anna was asleep in our room. I threw my phone onto the bed and went to the bathroom to get ready for bed. I shut the bathroom door and started getting dressed for bed and brushing my teeth. As I was finishing up and brushing my hair, I heard a noise from outside of the bathroom door, in the hallway. 
This didn't really surprise me, since Alex usually got up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. I went to open the door to tell him that I would only be just a second. But before I turned the handle, I stopped. The first noise I heard had been the creaking of the wood flooring in the hallway. But now I heard a different noise. It was breathing. Now that doesn't seem scary in itself, but it wasn't normal breathing. It was a heavy, not labored or anything, just heavy. I don't know how to explain it, but there's a difference between the sound of kids breathing and adults breathing when you hear it in the dead silence. But the breathing definitely sounded like an adult. I could still hear my dad snoring, so I knew it wasn't him. It couldn't be Alex. That's why I stopped in the first place. That and the footsteps moved to the kitchen, and they too sounded heavy, like a grown man walking around heavy. This was when I started panicking. My first thought was, well, an intruder. There was a sliding back door in the kitchen that led to the backyard, and our fence was by no means unclimbable. I worried that one of the kids must have left it unlocked when they had went to the park behind the house and no one noticed. I knew for sure that I locked the front door when I had come in, but since I didn't use it, I hadn't checked the back door. Since it all made sense in my mind, I started panicking even more. I locked the door and held my breath, and I could hear the breathing start to come down the hallway. The creaking of the floorboards signaled how close it was to the bathroom door. I held my breath, frozen in absolute fear. The breathing was heavy and crystal clear, like a man was standing directly on the other side of the door. I was shaking with fear. My dad always locked his door at night, so he couldn't help my siblings. I didn't have my phone on me, and I was in my room on my bed. I didn't have any sort of weapon in the bathroom. I hadn't heard any more movement from outside the door, and that breathing was still there. I slowly and quietly knelt down so I could look underneath the door. I was looking for feet. I was so scared I could hear my heart beating in my ears. There was nothing. No feet. And suddenly no breathing. The creaking was gone too. I got up still trying to be quiet and grabbed my hairbrush. I figured that was the best thing I'd have for a weapon and I was just going to have to make a mad dash to my phone on my bed. I held the hairbrush and quietly unlocked the door, then held my breath and listened. Nothing. I whipped the door open and looked up and down the hallway. Nothing. I ran to my room and grabbed my phone and called my boyfriend, that I was just on a date with hours prior. I even asked him if he could come inside after he dropped me off. I was so sure that there had been someone in this house. With him on the phone, I went through and checked the whole house. There was nothing. I checked the back door in the kitchen, and it had been locked. Alex and Anna were sleeping peacefully, and I could tell by Dad snoring he hadn't woken up either. I went to bed that night with my door locked. The next morning, I told my dad everything that had happened. He could tell that I was genuinely scared, so he checked everywhere, too. Apparently, we had an alarm system, and it hadn't gone off that night. It wasn't an intruder, or at least not a person, but it was so real and so terrifying that I didn't go visit my dad for a while after that. And it was the first few months before I spent a night at that house again. Experience on the Big Island of Hawaii I was living in Hawaii temporarily on the Big Island. I was working on an organic farm in the Hawaiian jungle for a witch doctor. He was such a wonderful guy. I had no cell service in that part of the island unless I climbed this huge hill for one bar. This hill was made of cinder and lava rock and created by a lava flow back in the 60s. 
It was about 100 feet high, maybe taller. The climb was difficult, but feasible. One night, I was very distraught because someone I was traveling with and had trusted became extremely abusive and controlling. I had been keeping my husband informed back on the mainland and frequently checked in with him. I had suspicions that my friend was trying to trap me on the island with him and break my husband and I up. He'd been trying to gaslight me and wipe out my self-esteem. The other people I was traveling with were too scared to stand up to this guy. We got in a huge screaming match, and I basically put him in his place, and I told him that I wanted nothing to do with him. I started making plans to ditch him and go work on a different farm. The witch doctor agreed. After dark, I go to the room that I was renting, laid down and tried to calm myself to sleep. I woke up and I realized I had dozens of little fire ants in bed with me, and I had gotten stung all over. Little fire ant stings suck. That was really the coup de grace these crappy few days. Against my better judgment, I slid out of bed, shook the fire ants off, grabbed my headlight, and began to truck up the treacherous hill to go talk to my husband. It was pitch black, and if when I looked up... I could see the Milky Way. It was pretty cool. I took the meandering path to the base of the hill and climbed it. When I got there, I dialed my husband. Hawaii was six hours behind my hometown, so it was in the early morning hours for my husband. During the day, people mine the lava rock there and sell it to customers to decorate their yards. While I was talking to him, I suddenly got the horrible sensation that I was being watched from afar. I got the feeling that someone or something was up there with me. Something felt very wrong and my intuition screamed that I was in danger. Thought it was somebody living up there that was investigating me at first. I listened for footfalls. Nothing. I'd been up there during the day and I'd gotten a really bad vibe before that and I just brushed it off as the unknown. The hill was like a narrow cliff and it was easy to slip off the other side because of the unstable lava rock. The feelings I got were unusual because I felt like it hated me and wanted me dead. Almost like it wanted to scare me or even push me off that cliff. I was no stranger to this feeling because I've had other experiences in my hometown that gave me similar sensations. This is where it gets odd. The air became very heavy and thick. It was suffocating. The insects went silent. The frogs stopped chirping. I could have heard a leaf fall. It was that silent. My breath caught in my chest as I froze. It was like the normal sounds of outside all went silent at once. The feeling of being watched felt closer and more intense. My headlight dimmed, and this massive black thing engulfed me. It not only engulfed me, but my surroundings as well. I couldn't see the trees or stars. The only thing I could see was a few feet in front of my face from the feeble light coming from my headlamp. I was totally surrounded. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe was terror unlike anything I had ever felt before. My light got dimmer and dimmer and this thing felt like it was closing in. Gradually closer and closer, I got the feeling that it was going to push me off of the precipice I was standing on. The anxiety felt was pure fight or flight. I felt wave after wave of adrenaline surge through my body. I began to shake all over and my knees became weak. I was totally surrounded by and engulfed by this black thing. It was the blackest black I have ever experienced. The blackness looked alive somehow. I had never seen anything as black as this in my life. It felt sentient. I felt like it knew what it was doing. I could barely think. I felt like I was being embraced by death. If I so much as breathed, I would die. Finally, it was just too close for comfort. 
I whipped around in circles and snarled, Leave me alone now! Get away from me! In my most aggressive, bigger-than-I-felt tone, I tried to sound as mean and threatening as possible. I know the sound of my voice had to carry on for miles in each direction. In a split second, I felt the heaviness and suffocating sensation disappear. My light was no longer dim. I could see the trees and the stars again. The frogs and insects started gradually chirping too. Whatever it was had gone. I hauled ass down that hill, slipping and sliding most of the way. I went back up there during the day over the next few days, and in some parts it still had a bad vibe. I believe I banished an entity. Intro. I, a 24-year-old female, believe I banished an entity. Let's rewind back a few. In 2021, I rented my second apartment, which happened to be above a vacant store in a rundown old building in Queens, New York. Upon seeing the place, it was quite old, unkept, and the energy was very heavy and eerie. However, this was during the height of COVID, the only apartment that I could find within my price range at the time, so I jumped at the offer. My first night there, I was very uncomfortable and uneasy. It seemed as soon as I set foot in that apartment, the atmosphere changed and was weighing me down. I brushed it off to just being the fact that I was in a new space. Nonetheless, I always felt I was being watched and that I was not wanted there by something or someone. It wasn't long before these things began occurring, which began confining me into one room. It started with the door slamming, knobs turning, footsteps, and progressively got worse from there. First example. On one instance I was in bed on my phone scrolling, and I was interrupted by deodorant flying off my dresser and hitting the wall. It scared me tremendously, but I tried to make excuses in my head on what may have caused it to ease my own mind. Second example. Another instant I'd fallen asleep on the couch while watching TV. I was woken up by three taps on my shoulder. Once again I convinced myself that my mind was just playing tricks on me. I ended up getting up at that point being too freaked out to go back to sleep and I decided to grab a soda. I was mildly irritated that I hadn't put any in the fridge. I opened the can, took a few sips, and sat it by my coffee table. Then proceeded to lay back down on the couch and watch TV. After a while, out of the corner of my eye, I see the can moving, and hear as it drags against the table, scooting from one side to the other. I'm terrified at this point, and frozen in fear. I try not to acknowledge that I saw it in hopes of not making it a reality. Third example. Another incident I recall is being asleep in bed and suddenly being woken up by my blanket being slowly pulled off of me. At this point I was sleeping with my TV on, too scared to be in the dark with all this stuff occurring. Anyway, I'm the type of sleeper to have sort of a comforter over my head because it's just soothing so the feeling that my blanket is no longer over my head made me wake up. But I was paralyzed with fear as I watched my comforter slowly pull down by my feet. Eventually I jumped up and slept in the living room. Now I could go on and on about all the weird things that I experienced, but I'd be typing forever and a day. Fourth example and conclusion. However, I was still trying to convince myself all of these incidences I had were just a logical, just had a simple logical reasoning and explanation for how it happened. Until my best friend came over one day. We laid in bed together on our phones, not saying a word. Our silence was interrupted by a bottle of lotion that was sat on top of my dresser, flying across my room and hitting the wall. We both stared at each other, and we say nothing for a moment. She then proceeds to tell me, I know you've seen that just now. You have a fucking ghost in here. 
and I informed her that I knew that, but I was in denial about it, until that being that someone else finally witnessed it and experienced what I had been. She then proceeds to tell me that she felt a weird, bad energy the moment that she stepped foot in my apartment, and that gave her confirmation on why she felt that way. Now after that occurred, I finally realized that what I've been experiencing wasn't in my head, and I was tired of being terrified in my own apartment and needed to do something about it. Context Before I'd moved into my second apartment, I was helped by some wonderful nuns that assisted me on getting my first apartment when I was homeless. That was after being kicked out. They took me in and showed me their way of being Catholic. They were the kindest, sweetest people pretty much ever, and were the first people to show me how genuine love and support is supposed to feel. Being that I often prayed with them, they gave me travel bottles of holy water as well of one of their rosaries. Confrontation With my rosary in hand and holy water in the other, I put on a brave face and a strong voice as I made my way through every inch of my apartment, shouting to whatever entity was there that it was not welcome in my home and needed to leave. That I was banishing it from these walls, and whatever force held it here, it was to be uplifted and withdrawn, that it needed to prosper on elsewhere, and I doused my holy waters I spoke. Aftermath Needless to say, I immediately felt relief after I was done, and surprisingly I had no more issues after that. The energy in my home was lighter, and I had no more encounters. I no longer live there and hope whatever was there has gotten some peace. Who knows if what I did actually worked or if I just scared the entity yelling like a crazy woman throwing water around, so it didn't bother me anymore. Something is attached to either me, a 22-year-old female, or my boyfriend, a 28-year-old male, and I need help. So I've had sleep paralysis since I was like 15. It's just something I grew used to. Other than the initial shock and fear, it didn't really bother me. When I was 19, I was living with my aunt, and I could just feel there was something in the house. That could be a whole post itself, but there was one experience that changed my perception entirely. I was working in Ulta at the time, just relevant to the story. Most of my job was just showing customers products and swatches. I normally used to get sleep paralysis when I was laying on my back, but this specific night before I worked, I had fallen asleep on my stomach and ended up having a really bad episode. And she, my sleep paralysis demon was always the same woman, was sitting on my back this time, pinning my wrists down. I could paint the picture of all the details, so this was far, really by far, the most intense skin crawling episode I ever had. My wrists were throbbing, I thought I could feel her digging her fingers into my skin. I could feel her legs squeezing my ribs and even her hair brushing my back. It was so vivid. I came to and of course there was no one actually in my room, but my skin was crawling. While I went into work the next day per usual, went through my normal day. I had been washing my arms off from all the swatches and my coworker pointed out this weird brown shade that wasn't coming off. I brushed it off, but when I was showering later, I tried scrubbing it off, and although it didn't hurt, it didn't budge. It was identical bruises on both wrists where she had been holding me the night before. This changed my perception of sleep paralysis entirely. I no longer felt like it was just bad dreams, as it became very real. Moving out of that house seemed to halt. I hadn't had sleep paralysis or negative spiritual experiences for about three years until last night. 
so I moved in with my boyfriend about two months ago. This house has never felt bad or negative to me. Same with the boyfriend, obviously, or I wouldn't be with him. Me and my now four-month-old puppy have been doing pretty great. Brutus, the puppy, has had a couple of weird incidents. Barking in an empty room, waiting in front of doors with no one inside, randomly going nuts. I figured I'd sense something awry, so I chalked it up to him just being a crazy puppy. I saged the house regardless when I moved in. It's just part of my personal anointing process. I light incense pretty regularly, and things have been really good. Until last night. I get home a little after 2.30 in the morning. I wasn't super tired, and me and my boyfriend stayed up for a while talking. I decided I probably needed some sleep, so we went to bed. He fell asleep holding me in a very specific position. I fell asleep, but it was kind of like a weird half-awake, half-asleep kind of feeling. I was asleep with my eyes closed, though. It was weird because it felt like I was awake. It was so vivid. In my quote-unquote dream, I was looking at my boyfriend in a different position than I saw last. And right behind him was a woman. Not the same woman I used to see either. Her image shook me to my core. All the stereotypical sleep paralysis demon features. Dark hair, pale skin. The thing that freaked me out the most was its eyes. They were wide open, staring at me from behind my boyfriend's head. I couldn't see her mouth, because only the top part of her head was peeking over him. But it looked like she was smiling. It took me a solid 15 seconds to force myself awake. I physically had to pry my eyes open, which is why I don't believe it was sleep paralysis, and I could move as soon as I actually woke up. When I looked and saw that my boyfriend was now in a completely different position, the one that he was in in my dream, I instantly felt nauseous. This did not feel right at all. As soon as I woke up, I sat up hyperventilating and crying because of how bad this energy felt. My boyfriend just tried to comfort me, telling me it's just a dream, and all that. But this was different. This felt demonic. I ended up shaking and crying in the bathroom last night, dry heaving from the image. Her face is burned so deeply in my mind I can't sleep. I'm cleansing the house again today. But something's telling me this is deeper than that. My boyfriend believes in the paranormal and doesn't have a problem with the way I handle things. But he's one of those, if I don't see it, it doesn't bother me kind of people. I thought it was fake, but here I am on Reddit. A couple of months ago, me and my dad, my stepmom, went to Loa Nina, specifically on the island in the middle of the lake, in Greece, where I lived at the time. Correct me if I'm saying that wrong. There I bought a cool-looking yet cheap dagger. It's not sharp, I just bought it to look cool on my desk. When I went back home the very same day, my friend who's into witchcraft and all those other such things, told me that I could use it for spells and stuff. So without believing in these things at the time, I tried a ritual in which you talk with spirits. It's basically like a Ouija board, but with a lit candle and some thread. I won't go into detail about how the ritual is done, but you basically just talk with spirits. I didn't believe it would work at the time, so I messed around and did everything my friend told me not to do. That was definitely not a good idea, though. Because apparently, it's all real. Ghosts, or rather spirits, beings beyond our senses and comprehension, and even demons. I know unknown beings are real ever since other paranormal experiences, but I've posted about that before. 
but I was not expecting ghosts and demons to exist as well. Anyhow, after I messed around with the ritual, I had angered the spirit that I'd communicated with. When I asked it questions, it told me it was a 42-year-old man from the UK, named Gayoff, who died in an accident at the supermarket. After I finished talking to him, I unknowingly ended the ritual incorrectly, and then I headed to bed. As I was trying to sleep, though, Gayoff showed me some concerning signs. As I was in bed, I could hear footsteps in the room with me, but when I looked around, there was no one there. When I finally fell asleep, came the worst part. Gayoff haunted my dreams. I saw that I was in a family gathering at my grandmother's house, where I lived at the time this whole thing happened. In the dream, I recognized everyone there except one guy. He appeared to be a cousin of mine, with which I'd gotten along pretty well. His name was Jason. As I was playing around with him, I decided to mess with him a little. He was pushing me through the hallway, and I thought it would be funny to suddenly let go and let him fall but he fell kind of diagonally and hit his head on the kitchen doorframe, dying in the process. To say the least, this dream left me unable to forget it. Anyway, I was so scared that I ran away out of the house. I ran across the road and turned randomly when suddenly I realized I was outside my old house, where I once lived with my parents. I took out my keys and looked at them, and in the dream, I still had the keys to the place. It's an apartment building, so there were two keys. I opened the door to the building and then entered the elevator. There were originally four floors, so there were five buttons on the aged elevator, including the ground floor. But in my dream, there was a sixth button with no number beside it, between floor three and four. Out of curiosity, I pressed it and waited for the elevator to stop. After I got out, everything got a bit darker, as if I lowered the brightness in a video game. The floor itself was almost identical to the second floor of the building down to the smallest details, except there were strange pieces of wood as decoration on little shelves in the building hallway. I grabbed one for some reason and went upstairs expecting to see the third or fourth floor, hoping for the darkness to disappear, since this was some kind of weird version of the second. I saw the third floor, but the darkness was still there. I put my key in the apartment front door and opened it. When I walked inside, it was completely identical to the real apartment when I lived there. Besides the place itself and the darkness, there were small, dark entities floating around, like little black ghosts. They had faces, too, but it was as if they were made of smoke. When I swung the stick I took earlier at one of them, its face got all distorted like a bunch of smoke when you swing at it. After that, I took a short pause to evaluate the situation and realized that all the little ghosts were singing Every entity was singing a different melody, but they all had the same voice. The creepy female text-to-speech, almost whispering, like the ones in the old analog horror videos. After that, I curled up scared in the corner of the living room between the couch and the TV. After a few seconds of fear, I woke up at 5 a.m. to a brief image of a very scary face staring at me, and then reality. Believe me, I know this sounds casual, but ever since that incident, I believe in both witchcraft and spirits. Never messing with this kind of stuff again. During my childhood, did I meet the ghost of a girl or... question mark... However, the roof was technically not the exclusive use of our kindergarten, as it was shared between our building and the next. And their penthouse also had access to said roof. But the family that owned the 
apartment, let's just say, had an agreement with the Babar to let them use it. Said family also happened to have a daughter, whom we were told was sick. But once she made a full recovery, she would join Babar and be able to study and play with us. This girl, by the way, she's the protagonist of this story. After noticing her looking at us from inside her home, and having taken as much of a liking to her as a little kid of that age can, I asked her to come play with us, to which she replied she was not allowed to, as her parents told her that it could make her more sick. However, after a few days talking from her window, we found a way to cheat the system. She would leave the door of her house open and would throw a ball at me, which I would then throw to her in return while we talked, which her parents thought was cute, so our caretakers kind of did too. So much so that they told my parents, which wasted no time to tease me and claim that I had a girlfriend, which embarrassed and angered me, and would tease me almost daily whenever they would come fetch me and would find me playing with her. This detail will be important later. After a few months, the girl stopped showing up. I was told by one of our carers that her health aid had gotten worse, and thus she could no longer play with me, and I never saw her again. While I was very upset about it initially, my parents and I moved away during that summer, and soon I was too busy making new friends in my new school to remember about her, as kids won't, you know, kind of do. And so ten years passed, until one day, after I told my mother that I had gotten my first girlfriend, she decided to tease me and claim that she was the second, as the girl in the kindergarten came first. This tease made all the memories of that girl come rushing back, and after a few weeks of not being able to take it off my head, I decided to return where Babber used to be, and with some luck find the girl and see if she would remember me. Luckily for me, the family still lived in that house, and after I introduced myself and told them a very abridged version of the story through the speaker, they invited me to come up and talk. The father explained to me that sadly, the girl had passed away all those years back. But not to worry, as rather than inconvenience them, it made them happy to meet somebody else who remembered their daughter. After all those years, although he did say he didn't remember her ever playing with me, he did, however, confirm that they did not let her come out to play with kids. Her health was just very bad, and they feared it may get worse if she runned around or anything. Her mother, however, seemed somewhat bothered, as she mostly just stared at me silently. And once her father began showing me pictures of the girl that they still conserved, which, by the way, was indeed the girl I remembered, she suddenly asked me how old I was, to which I replied that I was indeed sixteen. And this is when the story turns weird. The second I mention my age, both her and the father were visibly shook and disturbed. The father quickly asked me to confirm my birth year, which is 1986. After looking at each other, and then at me with bewilderment, the mother, which I mentioned had mostly been quiet, began telling me, visibly upset, that it was impossible that I had met their daughter, because their daughter had passed away in 1986. That made no sense, because my mother remembered her just as much as I did, and I do remember our carer mentioning that she was ill and could no longer play with us. So that's two adults and myself that remember her. Yet her parents insisted that she had passed away in 1986, and her father even borderline angrily threatened with showing me her death certificate. Things got very tense, and I felt extremely uncomfortable, and so did the family. So I excused myself, which they did make no effort to stop and left never to return for another ten years. By the time I was nearly twenty-six, 
I decided to return to the house once more, despite feeling extremely uncomfortable about it, because as silly as it sounds, I could almost not believe my own experience, and I wanted to find out the truth, but by then the apartment belonged to someone else. I'm now nearly 36, and I still cannot forget this story, which keeps coming back. Usually after I have a dream about it at random every couple of years. My only paranormal experience. Rural Alabama Cemetery. Let me start by saying that I'm an 18-year-old male. I fully believe in the paranormal. I've always believed in stories and fully welcomed the opportunity to experience, especially happening to me. Despite this, I never had a paranormal experience until two years ago, and I haven't really had one since. For context, I live in ultra-rural Alabama. When I say ultra-rural, I mean even the closest Dollar General is almost 20 minutes away rural. I live at the foot of a heavily wooded mountain. The further you drive up, the less populated it becomes. Even though I lived in this spot for my entire life, I've never really driven up the mountain, just because there was no need to. The city was in the opposite direction of the mountain. From what I knew about growing up, you just drove up and passed a few houses and eventually hit a dead end. Then you'd have to turn around. Well, one day I had a friend over, and we decided that we wanted to hop on a golf cart and take a little joyride up the mountain. We drove for about 30 minutes. Granted, this golf cart only goes like 25 miles an hour max. And we only really seen some beautiful forests and passed a couple of properties. But at this point, we came upon a spot in the road with a clearing off to the right. As we got closer, I realized it was a cemetery. I pulled over into the cemetery and turned my golf cart off. The main reason for this was curiosity. I had no idea there was a cemetery up the mountain, and it was strange to me, considering that we barely had anybody living on the mountain, much less this far up. So my friend and I hop out of the cart and start walking towards the graves. Like I said, I fully believe in spirits and being respectful towards the dead, but my friend didn't at the time. So I'm respectively looking around, reading the markers, attempting to say, you know, my peace and stay a six foot distance from the headstones. So I wasn't walking on top of the graves. Well, here my friend goes, on her phone, walking all over the graves. I think she even cracked a couple of jokes about the names on some of the headstones. Some of them were kind of weird, considering the people died in the late 1800s and early 1900s. After I've sufficiently explored, I start walking back to the car. Aloud, I declare, half-joking. Thank you, ghosts, for letting us walk around your space. Sorry if we walked all over your graves. My friend yells at me. Fuck them ghosts. I just rolled my eyes, but honestly, I felt a slight shiver down my spine after she said it. I was kind of nervous at this point. We both hopped back in the golf cart, and I turned the key. Of course it wouldn't start. I turned the key multiple times, but it seemed like the battery was dead. For the three years I've owned this golf cart, I've never had an issue with it. So in my non-skeptic brain, I immediately felt that this was happening because of what my friend said about the ghosts. But honestly, at this point I was just scared. I didn't want to believe what I was thinking, so I decided to call my dad for help. I checked my service and I had two bars, so I was good on a signal cell. I called him and the phone rang five times before he answered. 
I heard nothing on the other end, so I said, hello. And I could hear this heavy, raspy breathing in response. As soon as my brain slightly processed what it was that I was hearing, my dad hung up. I tried to call him back, but my cell signal had now dropped off completely, even though I hadn't moved at all. So at this point, even my friend looked scared. We're both thinking the same thing. I'm beginning to hyperventilate and I lay my head down on the steering wheel. And I just begin to pray out loud for protection. Maybe to help the car start running. I tell my friend to pray as well, but she says, Please let the cart start. I'm sorry for what I said. I turn the key. The cart starts and I peeled out of there as fast as possible. When I get home, my dad is outside working on one of his projects. My friend and I walk up to him, and I ask him why he hung up on me, because I needed help. He said he never received a call from me. I told him that's impossible, because he picked up and I heard him breathing over the phone. He shows me his recent calls, and in fact, he had no calls or missed calls from me. This was almost three years ago, and I haven't been back to the cemetery or had any other paranormal experiences since then. The White House That Stands Alone I would have been 13 or 14 when this happened. And to this day, even remembering this gives me goosebumps. Thirty years is a long time to still be afraid. Where I lived when I was a kid, it was a pretty poor place. You sort of, quote-unquote, made your own entertainment, as people used to say. There was always little myths and legends about this house. People never seemed to stay there long. People were supposedly murdered there and all the other whispers that wrapped a huge malevolent ribbon around the place. And you knew, you knew if you walked past this house that it was there, looming over you, on its own, in the middle of the road, full of terraced houses. It just seemed to stare down. Me and my pals would walk past quite a lot over the summer holidays. One of the lads lived a bit further down from it, so we passed it every time that we called for him. So this is kind of how this all began. You see, there weren't many of us who'd walk past this place at night, like, ever. Even the kid who lived near it would walk the other way home. So that's where we decided enough was enough. We were going to go to this house. And go in it, to see what the big deal was all about. It was empty, and had been for some time. We looked through the windows round back. No furniture, no nothing and some druggies or whatever had already broken in the door around the back, which meant that we would be explorers and we'd be able to see for ourselves that there was nothing to fear. There we were, four of us, walking through the door like that we were afraid of nothing. Trouble was, I was already uneasy. The house itself was massive on the inside, and it seemed gray, the light, what was left of it, had a weird hue to it, probably the dust on the windows, but still made it feel like it was another place entirely. So, we went about the wandering, each in a different direction. So I climbed the stairs. All the while I'm listening to the sounds of my friends. The rooms were large, no furniture, and that weird colored light filled the room when I walked in. My sense of unease had progressed to real nervous tension. I was looking in the corners for signs of movement, looking for something here that would give me an excuse to leave. The light was waning, and the rooms got darker, and that's finally when I caught something in one of the doorways. Faint, dull red lights, like little dots, moved across the door, behind the wall on the landing. And that's when a random thought popped into my head. The house knows we're here. I called down to my friends and told them it was time to get out of here. There wasn't an answer to that. 
I would later find out that as I went upstairs, they'd be left thinking that it would be a laugh to leave me up there. I looked around as it was getting dark, and the stairs were steep. The red dull lights were there again, which again jacked up my anxiety to fear. The lights were in front of me, where the top of the staircase was. This to me, there, and then a problem. I don't understand that. This to me there and then was a problem, as at the time the words fey lights were not familiar to me, and of course I was now bordering on terrified. There was a bang. I'm not sure what it was, but it snapped me out of my reverie, and nearly made me soil myself. My heart was pounding in my chest and I stumbled down the stairs to the bottom. And when I saw an outline in the doorway to the living room and I screamed, only nothing came out just some sort of hoarse whistle. I ran from it and strategically retreated or withdrew to the kitchen where the back door was, jumped straight through, and it fell as I hit the ground. As I got up, I saw, and I swear I did, something at the window, and it was looking down straight at me, and I ran straight out of that garden, straight down that road, through the park, past my friends who were all laughing tears running down my face until I got to my grandmother's house. I told her what happened, and she just sat there and she simply said, There are some places that are just bad, and they always will be, and you'll always know them, because that's what they are. And places like that will always bring bad things to them. Best to keep away. In the years that followed, even if it took me out of my way, I never passed that house. Not alone, at any rate. And even with a gun to my head, I doubt anybody would get me to go through that door again. I still watch it come up for sale every couple of years. Maybe one day, somebody will pull it down. But even if they did, I'll still have it in the back of my head of what happened that night, whether I imagined it all or not. Ghost Bride in a Haunted Church Several years ago, I had an opportunity to help restore a hundred-plus-year-old church that's been vacant for roughly 45 years or so. The church is attached to what was once a primary school that had already been restored into office spaces. This was a no-brainer since it was literally a couple of blocks away from my house. Under the table and responsibilities were incredibly easy. Since the church had been empty for years, we only worked during the day since the electrical system had yet to be installed. But during the days I would work, I'd always see movement in my peripheral vision, but nothing was there whenever I would look in that direction. This happened a lot to the point where I'd become accustomed to it. This all changed a few months later when the building became operational as we converted the church to an event hall designed for any event that you'd pay for. Well, after business hours one evening, I get a call from a tenant saying that something was making noise in the basement of the church. Since the power hadn't been installed into the basement at this point, I made sure to grab my brand new charged flashlight and keys to see what was happening. As soon as I got into the basement, I could hear what sounded like power tools running. I go in and start making my way through a pitch black labyrinth of basement toward the noise. I find the cause of the noise, which was an air compressor. I know they bleed air at times, but I made sure I bled all the air before I left earlier that day and unplugged it. I looked to see if someone plugged it in after me, and it's still unplugged. At this moment, my brand new flashlight starts to flicker, and another unplugged power tool turns on behind me. When I turned around to shine my flashlight at it, the light goes out completely. I haul ass out of the basement through complete darkness towards the door. I get out and see the tenant is standing at the door with a puzzled look on her face. She asks 
what was it, you know, what was wrong? Because I'm out of breath and I'm freaked out. Tell her what happened. She smirks and says that that apparently doesn't surprise her. She's lived in the neighborhood her entire life. Tells me that as a child, she attended the school and church. She then tells me a story of a woman who held the last wedding in the church before it closed down. It was a sad story because the woman was stood up on her wedding day and ultimately committed suicide because of it. After that night in the basement, the paranormal activity happened more and more often. It got to the point where the co-worker fell off a ladder. This ladder was always secured, and he'd been up and down it a hundred times. When I asked what happened, he said it felt like he was pushed while leaning over to the paint. There were even times where the movement I had always seen sort of started to take shape. Instead of a blur, I started to see a person standing there, but nothing when I would look in that direction. What finally pushed me over the edge was the night that I guess you can say I met her. Since events were always held there, I'd always lock up afterwards. After an overnight booking, I ran into the guests as they were leaving. A gentleman asks me if there was any other people in the building that night. I said no, as we make sure that the office part of the building is vacant during overnight bookings. He proceeded to tell me that he heard yelling from the basement and footsteps on the balcony. I assured him that they were the only ones there and began locking up the building. As I'm locking the doors, I hear faintly what the gentleman was referencing. I could hear footsteps on the balcony, and I yell out, Anyone still in here? I did not get an answer, but at this point, I'm ready to go. What I hated most about locking up is the light switch was nowhere near the door. So you'd have to shut off all the lights and then walk about 30 feet to the door in darkness. I shut off the light and immediately sprinted towards the door. As I reached for the door, I heard footsteps behind me and a muffled voice say, Leave. I didn't stop to see what it was. I made my way to the glass entry doors and to the other side as fast as I could. As I'm locking the door, I see movement inside of the church. I look up and I see a ghostly or shadow-like figure standing where the altar once was. I quickly looked down to ensure I locked the door, and by the time I looked back up, the shadowy figure is now making its way to the glass doors. I honestly don't remember if I locked the door or not, because I immediately got the hell out of there. After that night, I made sure I never entered that building after dark again. I need help explaining something that happened while I was younger. When I was younger, about eight or nine, I had spent the whole day at a local fair. I was showing my 4-H animals, and because that shit was itchy, I had gone to my parents' car to change it. For some reason, there was just this old man next to the car, though. I hadn't put much thought into it. This guy didn't give much explanation, but he asked me to get into his truck. I hadn't really been educated in kidnapping and stuff like I knew it wasn't a good idea to trust strangers, so I quickly said no thank you and finished changing before running off. Skip forward several hours, and once I was done hanging out with some friends, I go back to the car for it to be gone. For context, I've never had a good relationship with my parents and I really shouldn't be living with them with all that they do to me. Of course I was worried, really didn't have any way to get home now but walk. But that old man was still there. He said that he knew my parents, even said their names, and said that he was going to take me home since they had forgotten me. Being a small town in Ohio, I didn't really take much for anybody to know each other, especially when your grandfather was the favorite high school teacher for forever, basically. So I really didn't question him and climbed in. 
It was at this time that I noticed the first weird thing besides him still being in the same spot as earlier, as if he knew it was going to happen. His face would almost change, if that makes sense, never appearing quite the same as it had only a few minutes before, yet still recognizably being him all the same. Of course he didn't take me home, but instead to his own home. Besides the normal kidnapping crap, there was many things off about this. Where we're seemingly phasing in and out of traffic, as if we weren't entirely there. Another thing of note is that when we finally did get to our destination, at first we had just turned into a cornfield before a small path just barely large enough for the truck made itself known. It was as if we were entering something otherworldly, and that I was witnessing something that I really shouldn't have. At the point of him shutting the truck off, I had understood that I had just been kidnapped, but something about him just made me feel so calm. Like I knew that nothing could go wrong in his presence. Like no harm could possibly come to me. My time there was, for lack of a more fitting word, perfect. I had no worry of getting hurt for my parents, no stress to be as perfect as possible. No worry that every little thing I did wrong or forgot to do would get to hurt me. I got to do whatever I wanted, play games with him or bake and help him around the house or anything else my brain could come up with. Eventually the time came when I realized that I really needed to go back. No matter how perfect it was, I couldn't stay here any longer, simply because I needed to get back home. Thus, I left as soon as I knew that he had fallen asleep, and just as we came in the corn parted large enough for me to pass through while some fireflies fluttered about as if to light my path, it took me what felt like days to get back home, though it was probably only a few hours since night had broken, or rather since night hadn't broken. The whole time it felt as if I was pulled in two separate directions. One down what I assumed to be the proper path home, and a lighter pull to that farmhouse. I kept trudging forward, and the moment I reached home, the moment of dawn broke. The tether to the farmhouse was now gone. After managing to somehow get inside, I learned something horrifying. I had been there for ten days, and just as suddenly as I disappeared, I had reappeared. Years later, around eleven this time, while out with friends, I noticed I was near that magical cornfield, and just kind of went over to it, expecting something to happen. But nothing did. The corn simply swayed in the wind, and even going deep enough into it that I shouldn't have found the house and there was nothing. No clearing, no beat-up old pickup, no kind old man. I want to say this was just the delusions of a scared child, and that trauma has made me misremember some or most of the details. But that doesn't feel right. Still to this day, I see him sometimes, but it's always out of the corner of my eye or passing by in the streets, only for me to turn around and Either the person have a completely different appearance, or that person just wasn't there altogether. Things and Moments to Share Early 90s. My old house definitely felt weird. I had always thought I had seen shadows in the corners but I just shook it off as I got older. There were two times I remember something sounding like it had fallen, a big bang or a boom sound followed by a clattering sound, only to never find anything that had fallen. It happened once when my mom and me were in the kitchen, and we went to the basement to explore what it was, but found nothing. Moved in 2000. A new house didn't have any weird feelings or events, other than the first night. I could have sworn I saw someone move my bedroom door. I thought it was my dad walking by, but 
When I got up to ask him, he was downstairs watching TV and said he never walked by my door or moved it. I always felt it was my dad's father checking up on him. Didn't have any real experiences outside of that. A couple people in the woods smoking a joint. I was hitting it hard and I felt like either a bear was coming or we were being watched. Got in the car shortly after. Then my mom passes away in 2010s. At the time, I wasn't religious, but a couple of weird things happened. The last word she told me was that I was a good person, which was weird because at that time I was always thinking about how I needed to work towards being a better person. Then she was supposed to be pretty much brain dead from a stroke. But the first day in the hospice, when I arrived, she had a huge smile on her face and looked right at me as I entered. I didn't know what to think at the time, but now I feel like it was her way of saying goodbye. She never did it again, at least that I saw, and she passed away a few days after. I remember distinctly having a dream with her a while after. We were at her old church, and she was in the foyer chatting with someone. I noticed her sitting talking to her friend, and I think I said, Mom? But all I remember is that she looked right at me smiling. I felt a bunch of positive emotions, just pure love. Later, I remember I was chatting with a woman, and she just happened to mention something about finding dimes left behind by her loved ones. What was so weird about that, is since my mom had passed, I had noticed specifically dimes popping up in weird places, and when this lady told me that, it felt like it all clicked. It even happens now, and I always think of my mom and dad. After my mom passed, I was more open to everything, since my mom was really spiritual. Some things she had told me before, just general stuff, started to come true, so I knew I had underestimated her teachings. A few years after that, my dad sadly passed away as well. Both were tough to let go, but I was more understanding this time than with my mom. Back then I was very angry. But now I realized this was just how things had to go. My dad didn't pop up for a while in my dreams, and I was worried. Then one day, I had an extremely vivid dream. I guess I should have mentioned that I usually don't remember my dreams, so these sticking with me means more, I suppose. Basically, in the dream, I'm in bed, and someone is coming to smother me with a pillow. But I see it coming, so I'm ready to explode when they do. As I do in the dream, I wake up. The lighting of the room is the exact same as in the dream, fairly bright and sunny. I'm a little shaken up by the dream because I couldn't see the figure in the dream, just the pillow. My room door was closed, and I hear my dog whining outside, probably to go outside. I open the door, and much to my dismay, my dog has shit everywhere on the main floor. It took me a while to put the dream and the dog pooping together, but then I realized someone woke me up and it had to be my dad. He was always funny about waking me up when I was a kid, and he was very close with my dog. I did see my dad in later dreams, a few times with my mom with his grayish hair, and then once looking much younger, which admittedly threw me off. I had only seen a few pictures of him from the 80s, and even a few were from the 70s. But it was him for sure. I did notice my mom in my first dream encounter, and she looked kind of younger too. That's it for the story today, guys. I apologize with my attempts at trying to pronounce Moroccan, which I admittedly have zero experience in. But I hope none of you wake up with your dog having pooped everywhere in your main floor. Till next time. Curious to know a non-skeptic's thoughts on this experience from when I was about 14, eight years ago. So it's 2 a.m. 
I'm very tired right now, procrastinating going to sleep, so apologies if this post is incoherent. I've never told anyone this story before, because they'd probably think I'm crazy. I myself am an atheist, though this memory sure raises some doubts. I've decided to believe it was hallucinations caused by anxiety, since at the time I had terrible social anxiety, along with generalized anxiety disorder. It was also during the same year that my depression came on suddenly and hard. My parents divorced, my mom moved into an apartment, and I spent every weekend in this old house with my dad. Now this was in eighth grade, and I remember middle school was when the vast majority of my nightmares were about demons and ghosts. So that would have also raised my anxiety surrounding that. So probably the easiest thing to dismiss was one weekend I saw a tall dark shadow moving out of the corner of my eye. Another time, as I was getting into bed, I saw a bald white man walk toward the wall only for a split second. Those are whatever. People see things out of the corners of their eyes all the time. Whenever my dad was out of the house and I was sitting in the bedroom upstairs, I would constantly hear footsteps downstairs. If I went downstairs to look, nothing would be there and the sound would stop. I go back up and into the bedroom and I would hear it again. You know the cracking sound of settling? I would hear it relatively frequently at night. Okay, so now I'll describe the big night that absolutely terrified me. My dad was out of the house, and I was in bed upstairs trying to sleep. I heard that cracking sound non-stop every few seconds. Then I started hearing the very distinct click of a plastic cap on the string curtains hitting against the wall. It was very regular, like it was tapping the wall once per second. At that point I was getting very anxious, and I put on my headphones and started listening to music to calm down. At the time I used Tumblr, so I was also scrolling through that. Suddenly a chill went down my spine, and I got a very strong feeling that I was being watched. I think this was because I subconsciously heard the garage door open because my dad did come in the room a few minutes later, but I'll get into that. Anyways, chills down my spine, feeling of being watched. Soon after that, I started hearing talking through my music. I couldn't make out any words. It was a man's voice, just sort of talking normally. First, I closed Tumblr in case it was an ad or something on there, but it didn't stop. Then I closed the music app. It still didn't stop. A second or so after I stopped the music, the voice turned deep and angry and honestly demonic and was yelling. At that point I ripped my headphones off, ducked under the blankets and started hyperventilating. Maybe a minute later my dad ran into the room asking what's wrong. I just told him I didn't hear the garage door open and thought someone broke into the house didn't want to say that I was hearing voices. Something like that's never happened to me since. A month or two later, my dad moved into an apartment, and I never had to go back to that house again, thank God. Although, in one bedroom in my mom's apartment, if I'm in it at night, I would constantly hear footsteps from the kitchen downstairs. But nothing extreme ever happened like in the original house. And now she's moved out of that and bought her own condo. So I'm completely free of haunting paranoia. I'm just sharing this because I'm curious what somebody who believes in hauntings has to say about my story. Oh, and another experience that I can't explain. In sixth grade, I heard the future. Though it's actually a pretty boring story. I had a male bus driver in the morning and a female bus driver in the afternoon. One morning I was on the bus and suddenly heard my afternoon female bus driver yell, Hey! I looked around, but no one was reacting to it. And I double-checked the driver, it was definitely the male one. 
That afternoon, I was on the bus home with the female driver. At one point, a girl on the bus screamed and the bus driver yelled, Hey! And it was exactly the same yell I had heard that morning. The first story is strange. That one, I think, was coincidence, sir. Or man. Something's living in our family home. A little background. This house was built in 1995 by my dad and mom. It's a big house with two floors and a basement. We're the only family that's ever lived there. My grandmother died in the bathroom upstairs in 2010. No one else has died in that house besides her. My sister and brother, who I'm going to be mentioning in this story, had moved out of the house before things ever started happening. I moved out about a year ago. Sorry for the grammar, English is not my mother tongue. It started a few years after Granny had died. We started hearing steps going up and down the stairs at night. We were spooked a little, but forgot about it soon because we just thought it was Granny's ghost, since she's the only one who died there and we had heard those steps very rarely. Maybe a year passes, and I'm looking through pictures of my relatives, and me having sent to each other on Messenger. I found a screenshot that she had taken when we were on a video call at night, and I saw some weird gray mass behind me. I zoomed in and was completely taken back. There was a gray torso and face behind me in the darkness, I put some filters on it so I could see it better, cropped it because I had an ugly face on the picture and showed it to my family and friends as soon as possible. Everyone except my dad was completely shocked. My dad didn't believe in paranormal at the time and kept denying when stuff happened. My sister said that the gray apparition looks like Granny, and I agreed. I think I may make a separate post for that picture and put a link here too, not sure yet. Anyway, a few years forward. My mom and dad are downstairs cooking something in the kitchen, and I'm on the second floor in my bedroom sitting on my bed. I hear exactly three knocks on my door. It's normal that people knock on my door first before entering, but this time no one opens the door to enter. I just stare at the door for a while and eventually ask, Who's there? I get no answer. I call mom on the phone because I'm spooked. She said that nobody had gone upstairs. I went on to Google about three knocks on a door, and I did not like the answers I found. I panicked a bit and just waited until I felt like enough time had passed that it was safe enough to open the door. I went downstairs and told my mom and dad what happened. Dad didn't believe me like usual, but mom was a bit spooked. By now, I've also seen shadows walk past my bedroom door. Creepy, but nothing special in my opinion. Again, a few years have passed, and I and my mom have moved out. It's a long story what happened and why we moved, but in short, domestic violence. Only my father lives in that house now. The house is empty and freezing most of the time because we live in Europe, and father travels a lot due to work. It's been also put on sale. Since I moved out, the activity in the house has increased. My father has told my sister that he's been hearing someone walking around, faucets turning on and off, doors opening, etc. He didn't believe in the paranormal before, but now he's experienced the spookiest of it himself. Yesterday, my sister, mom, and me had met up at the house while father was at work to just catch up. At one point, my sister informed me that her and mom were planning on staying the night there and asked me if I was staying too. I declined because I hate that house and it makes me have panic attacks. Well, fast forward to today. Sister called me and told me that she was absolutely never going to stay in that house again because of what happened that night, and I was lucky for choosing to go back home. 
Apparently, she had stayed up a bit late, and at one point she heard someone walking downstairs fast and going into the garage. She thought it was Mom up late, so she wanted to go check what she was doing. To get downstairs, she had to go past Mom's room, and when she did that, she saw that Mom was sleeping. She was spooked. The steps were fast, so how can it be Granny? She went back to bed and couldn't sleep anymore, so she stayed up. After a while, she heard steps again, but this time in the room next to her. It may not seem scary to you because it's just some steps, but after years of thinking that it was our granny and then hearing steps that fast, I would have absolutely obliterated my pants and woke up mom to invisible sword fight the ghost away. Ghosts of Carmel, Maine I found Kent's channel because I wanted to find real content capturing the paranormal side of the world. I found myself amazed at what Kent was able to capture showing the viewer's end, and just dove in watching his videos for him just being amazed. I soon caught up with his videos until recently. I remembered his channel and went to it, and I ended up watching a video called Portals into the House of Hell. At first it was the same normal video I remember watching, until it got to a certain part of the video. Stamp 4913. This raised an eyebrow. It 100% looks fake and reminds me of those fake ghost apps where you can make one appear. So I did some research on the photo capture, and I couldn't find a 100% match on it. Some similar, but Nothing is body-shaped as shown in the video. Moving on around stamp 5646. Kent expresses that he found or saw a book on his table. A book with six-digit fingers. A number three really got my attention. I opened the book and what I saw shocked me. While maybe Kent just didn't know where this book is from or the video is fake in that moment... The book, as some of you will see, is from the children's TV show, Gravity Falls. Kent goes on about how the inside of the book shocked him. While it was truly like any other children's ghost and spell book that you would find at a book fair or online. Following up, Kent then showed a picture of some evidence that he had found a while back. A knife and two runes. I was curious on the runes and ended up doing a lot of research on them, and their meaning, and to see if it had just maybe been a picture from somewhere. While I did not find the exact image online, I did find similar runes online for sale. Some wood, some stone, and some differently shaped, but none exactly like in his picture. What I found out about the rune symbol, in runes, X, the meaning, gift. Gabo, gratitude, exchange, receive, or sacrifice. Out of all of the research I've done, I couldn't find the second rune that he showed us. It was a mixture of X with another rune, meaning freeze or frozen. My guess is that either that rune is 100% fake, or just so out there that I couldn't find it. Unless it was also an X which was marked down in the center, which would mean freeze it, which would explain a series of bad luck on him and his family if it's real, maybe. I also want to point out that in the picture, at a quick glance, the black lines showing the symbol seemed like a thick carving or paint, while if you look closer, it actually looks like he or somebody else took a photo and they drew the lines. So either he got them mistaken because of them being old, or they're fake. Moving on. Kent also shared some photos of his family and things that he had that were happening to them. I also searched for those photos one by one. I did this not to be insensitive, but for research. For starters, let's go with the cuts and scratches on the legs and arms from the cat. That very well could be true, 
or they could also be from playing or falling somewhere. It's very easy to fake. I did, however, not find any matches online. Same for all the photos that he shared. Therefore, they very well could be 100% his photos that he's using or special effects maybe. I'm not sure, nor am I claiming he is. Moving on to the shadow people. I would like to have a conversation about the multiple shadow people Kent has captured. They are freaky, don't get me wrong, but the question is, are they real? From my own personal eyes and seeing these sort of things, I'd like to say both yes and no. Shadow people are very rare, especially rare to capture, let alone see. And when you might see one, they aren't what you think. They generally appear as a mist, a very dark blob, maybe a line. I'm not claiming that they can't form as a humanoid shape, but I've yet to see one like that. I have, however, seen a full body form before. A detailed older woman, clothed in all. Nothing I've seen from Kent's videos have been similar at all, as they're generally shown as shadows exclusively. I want to move on to voices from the videos, but I don't personally remember too much about each video to have a full talk. This will be the end for now. The Hat House Ghost A little background first. I worked for an agency who employs people to work with adults who have cognitive disabilities. We were to assist them with activities of daily living, things like bathing, taking meds, cooking, cleaning, driving them places. The house I was hired for was called the Hat House. Most of the houses were called by either a name of the street that they were on or an acronym that their house had. So that's why this house had the acronym H-A-T. At the time, we supported an individual. I'll just refer to him as Adam for the sake of confidentiality. Adam was nonverbal and could barely hold his balance while he stood. He would often fall down if he was standing on his own for too long. Adam's preferred mode of transportation was sliding across the floor on his butt. I'm not sure when this started happening, but things quickly began to get weird, and I think it was Adam's mother passing. It started with Adam going to his bedroom and shutting his door, something he would rarely do. Adam would sit on his floor and rock back and forth grunting to himself until eventually he would start screaming for joy. But then the jumping started. It was literally the sound of someone jumping on the floor, and it would make Adam laugh. Adam loved vibrations like that, so they would often make him smile or laugh. The jumping continued for a while. It was like clockwork, too. Every day around 2 p.m. he would go to his room, and this would happen. Things quickly started to get weird, though. There was talk in the house that other staff would occasionally hear footsteps coming up from the basement stairs when nobody was down there. I witnessed this as well. I'd picked up the overnight shift. Adam woke up at around 4 a.m., so when he came out of his room and say he was on the kitchen floor, I was sitting with him when suddenly there was the sound of someone rushing up the basement stairs and jiggling the door handle. My heart was literally trying to jump out of my chest at this point. All I want to do is go home. When suddenly from Adam's room I hear a deep voice go, mm -hmm, followed by the jumping sound that he would normally be having in his room at around 2 p.m. Another time I was doing the dishes and a supported person who lived at the house at the time, who was verbal, was sitting at the kitchen table. He had been talking to me, but there was a lull of silence in the room. I set down the sponge to get the heavy-duty pan scrubber when I heard the person I support start laughing. I turned to look at him, but that's when I noticed the chill in the air. 
When I turned back around, the sponge was on the windowsill. I asked the supportive person what happened, and he just kind of shrugged while laughing and says, It just floated. I got suckered into working an overnight again, so I'm sitting in the office, and it's around 2 a.m. All of a sudden, the living room light turns on, and since I had the office door open, I heard the unmistakable sound of the cord from the light being pulled. I kind of continued in the office thinking someone was awake and I just hadn't heard them, which didn't strike me as odd until I heard the beanbag chair in the living room being picked up. I went to see who it was when I hear the beanbag chair drop to the floor. Nobody was in the living room and the only way to get in there was through the kitchen or the front door to the house which was locked and deadbolted. Another time I had an encounter with the spirit of Hat House. And that was when I was in the staff office talking to a co-worker. It was around 10 p.m. The staff office had two desks, one with the computer and the other right next to the door to go outside. The co-worker was at the computer desk and I was at the other desk. As we were shooting the shit with each other, I went to go look at the desk when I noticed something standing in the window to the door of the staff office. All I can describe it is maybe just a shape of a human, but it was made out of smoke. After I saw the figure, I quickly turned around and looked at my coworker, who was looking at me wide-eyed. I'm sure I had some sort of look on my face, as the coworker said. You saw it too. I worked at the Hat House for six years. Adam was there for two of those years. After Adam moved out, the paranormal stuff stopped, as if it never had existed to begin with. Am I haunted? Or is my house haunted? Or can this be explained? After going to college and moving back in with my mom for the summer, I've noticed that some things in my house are off. My family moved to the Woodlands, Texas, around 2009 when I was eight. We bought this house from a family of four, and they were the only previous owners. Growing up here, I can only think of two main occurrences that were scary or just off-putting. Sometimes I would wake up in the middle of the night and feel that there was something else in the room with me. Another time, my brothers and I were playing our spin-off of hide-and-go-seek, where one person would hide and leave a clue as to where they were hiding. The other two would go around looking for the clue and then them. In this case, my brother was the one hiding, and I was the one looking for him. I found a stuffed animal on the door of our walk-in attic, the door was open and the chain at the top was undone. Whenever I had walked in, something with a deep voice started growling at me. So I ran out and slammed the door. I yelled to who I thought was my brother that I knew it was him and to come out. The preface, this attic was a hangout area that we had fixed up to where there were no actual storage things in it. We would go in there all the time and we had never had issues with animals getting in there. I called for my older brother to investigate, and he didn't hear a growl when he walked in, and then we found my other brother hiding in the toy room that was down the hallway. Flash forward to the present. My boyfriend has been in town with me, and we were moving my old yearbooks into the attic. I looked inside, and there wasn't enough room in there, so I closed the door and put the chain on it. Ever since I was growled at by something in that attic, I have always remembered to put the chain on that door. That night I woke up in sweats from a bad dream where someone was living in the basement of my old house, and my room was extremely hot. I woke my boyfriend up and we decided to go into my brother's old room, which was significantly cooler. But, when we turned on the light, the chain was off the door to the attic. 
We both looked at each other and were like, yeah, no. So we turned around and went back to my room. Later that night, I had another nightmare that people were trying to murder my friends and I. Today, we were talking to my mom about what happened, and she said that she thinks there's a friendly ghost. She said that our dog, on different occasions, has stared up to something on the staircase. The staircase leads up to both my room and my brother's. She also said that my other brother's lights to his room are just on sometimes when she knows she didn't turn them on. Nothing scary has happened to her, which is good. I feel that if there is some entity in our house, it only lurks upstairs. I also think, though, what if it's me that something is attached to? One time I was asleep at my college house, and I woke up at exactly three in the morning. I looked at my phone to check the time and thought, hmm, weird. And a moment or two after I set it down, a picture frame on my wall fell and shattered on the ground. I was freaked out and then cleaned it up and went back to sleep. On another occasion, I was laying in my bed and I heard a rustling underneath. I looked underneath it and a black cat dashed across my room. I was freaked out, but since it was cold outside, I let it stay in my room for the night. It was extremely timid and wouldn't let me near it. One of my roommates had accidentally left her front door open three or four days. This was prior to this happening. But in no way did I think a cat would have walked into our house and then camped out underneath my bed. None of us had seen it at all in the house throughout that timeline, nor had we seen it prior around the area. The next day I had to call animal control to get it out because it started growling at me, and once she released it, we continued to see it around her back lot and driveway until we moved out, January or June. I don't know if this was coincidentally superstitious or just a cat seeking refuge. I do feel safe in these things that have happened could be explained by some logical reason, but I feel it all lines up a little too nicely, especially the deal I've got with the attic. Ask Reddit Portland, Oregon, 1994 in the area of southeast Portland, just a hair south of Flavel Street, Flavel, Flavel, and 52nd, was an old historic mansion. It had that semi Adams family vibe to it. This place was haunted as fuck. The stories are already long, and each one could be on its own tail, so a bullet point below. If you'd like more details, ask in a reply. 1. We first heard the sounds of dogs barking, yipping, and whining in the basement the day my friends moved in there. They didn't own a dog. 2. Lights would constantly turn on behind you or off when you walked into a room. Faucets turned on by themselves. Random objects in locked rooms wouldn't be where they were left. 3. Many times my friend's family and I swear we heard a grandfather clock chime 13 times at 6.30 in the morning. 4. Many of us felt what could be described as a gentle touch, like a family member placing their hand on our shoulders. It had weight and pressure. We'd turn and nobody was there. This was made even worse when one of us had our back to the wall. 5. My friend, his older brother, and I witnessed what we had later believed to be a ghost of the original owner. An old man ascended the staircase beside me when I went downstairs to use the bathroom. There were no elderly men in the house. 6. Many times when driving up the long driveway, a dark figure could be observed watching people driving up to the house in the third story window on the north side. Almost every time this happened, nobody was home. 
Seven. The eldest daughter complained constantly. She'd at random times in her room hear the sound of someone behind her, sniffing her hair. She'd turn, and she'd be alone in the room. Furthermore, she'd constantly had her, or constantly had her door locked due to her brothers constantly bugging her. Eight. Twice while watching movies in the living room, we all heard the loud and heavy noise of something moving across the wooden floor on the second floor. Somehow, a near 200 pound wooden bed and frame had moved almost nine feet across the room without disturbing the contents of the bed. Nine. In my opinion, the second scariest thing happened one night while playing Dungeons and Dragons in the living room. At one point, Clarissa, the second oldest daughter of my friend's family, got up to do a little mild bit of body acting for a scene. She moved to the bay window and placed her hands on the little seat there. Her character was building up to some sort of loud outburst. She screams to the effect of, Lord Cavington, I've had enough of you. Without warning, three very loud, very sharp bangs came from the window, as if someone was beating their fist on the other side. Seeing as it was still light out, we could see nobody was there. This was followed by a voice screaming from the third floor, Keep quiet, you rotten girl! That made us all nope the hell out of that night. 10. Finally, there was the door to hell. In that third story suite, we discovered there was a hidden door in the wall. It was a hideaway closet. Behind that door was a second and smaller door. The moment we all discovered it, we were overcome with this utterly massive sensation of dread. We opened it. Inside was a smallish crawl space. The inner walls of the space were covered in claw-like marks as if made by human fingernails. There were darker stains in the wood when we washed it. And we tried to get a better look, really. On the inside of the door number two were weakly carved words that read, this is the door to hell. To this day, I and anybody else that day constantly have this door appear in our dreams. It appears randomly. Like, imagine you're walking into a classroom of your high school. You open the door in your dream, but instead of your classroom, it's the third story suite with the door to hell open. Each time you see it, you're progressively closer to the last. A feeling of predatory desire washes over you, like you're the prey. Outback Northern Nissan Ghost I'm in my late 20s. And last month, I had one of the most scariest experiences I've ever had. My family attracts spirits. As in the 18th century, some of my family dabbled in some spiritual stuff. They got blamed as witches, and they got burned at the stake. That's a story for another day. Anyway, I was on a four-wheel drive adventure with my dad, my mom, and my dog. We have a buffed-up Pajero. Not the best four-wheel drive, but it still makes it across desert tracks. It was on the 12th of December, I believe. We were crossing a track in the Northern Territory, Australia. We had just finished crossing a rocky portion of the track and was now on flat dirt. We started to set up camp for the night. As I stepped out of the car, I went around to the back where the water containers were to fetch some water for my dog. But as I walked near them, I heard a trickling and gushing noise. Sure enough, a rock had punctured both external water containers. I quickly went and told Dad. We had barely enough internal water to last us a day, so we made the decision to drive at night. You should only really drive at night if you most definitely have to. Otherwise, you should generally avoid it. We knew there was a small community just outside of... Yuendumu, around 45 minutes away, 
It was already 7.15, pitch black. We got in the car and started to go for the drive. This road was particularly dangerous, as it was long and straight. People often fell asleep and drove off the road going 110 kilometers an hour. We were about halfway there. I was sitting in the back with my standard schnauzer on my lap, and he was drifting asleep until his ears pricked up. He then jumped up, looked like he was trying to look behind us. I turned around and saw nothing but a black, empty, eerie desert. I turned back to the front to see my mom drifting to sleep and my dad wide awake. Then all of a sudden, my dog started to whine really loud. A really bright light was reflecting in the side mirrors and rear view mirror. My dad said, what? Is that a car behind us? I looked behind us. There were two extremely bright lights tailgating our car. At this point, my dog was barking and whining. My mom had woken up and immediately started to panic. The lights continued to tailgate us for the next two minutes. We then passed a tree, and all of a sudden the light had stopped. The car was no longer behind us. It had disappeared. My dad stopped the car. He turned it around, thinking the car may have crashed. We got near the tree. I got up on the roof, turned on the giant spotlight that we had fitted for this trip, and shone it all around us, searching for the car. There was no sight of it, just empty red dirt. We searched for another 15 minutes, even on foot. Nothing. So, we continued on with the drive, hoping to find some help in the coming community. Once we reached the small settlement just outside Yuendumu, we raced into the pub. The pub was empty except for the bartender. He immediately asked us, what's wrong, something up? My dad replied with, we were just driving along the track and we saw a car disappear off the road. Somebody could be hurt. The bartender put down his rag and said, You guys saw the northern Nissan. No one's hurt, at least now. I replied in a somewhat impatient tone, What do you mean somebody could be hurt? He then pointed to the news article up on the wood wall. It read, Nissan crashes into tree. Killed all two on board. What you saw was the ghost of the northern Nissan. It crashed a bit more than a decade ago. It was two brothers quickly making their way into town as one of the brothers were sick. They crashed into that tree at about half past 7 p.m. Many people who make that road at night see them at around the time you guys saw them. My mom's mouth had dropped. My dad sat down. We stayed in that small settlement for the night. In the morning, we decided to go look at the tree. What we saw was a scar from the crash, and exactly where we saw the car disappear the night before. It was creepy to think about. I got out on foot searching for a ghost car. Seconds after it had disappeared, my family had seen the northern Nissan. Ask Reddit 3. For purposes of this post, I'll call this first location the first location. I was at a paranormal investigation, sat up in an old house. I believe they mean set up in an old house. Won't give the name because it'll give my location away. You don't want that. There was five of us sitting in the addition on the first floor where the last owner took her last breath. We were listening to the history when from above we heard it. Footsteps walking back and forth. The light swinging overhead with a force. All five of us were in this room and nobody else was in the home. It was bizarre. We decided to head upstairs but left a bell on the bed. And we were hoping that this ghost wanted us, if she did anyway. She can just simply ring the bell. As we headed up the very narrow and steep stairs to the second story, what did we hear? The bell. 
We stood there in all the stairway, trying to decide either to search upstairs for footprints or go back to the room that we left the bell in. We didn't want to split up, because then any footsteps above or below would have to be discounted, as it could easily be us. We decided to check the bell, go up. There was other things that happened in that house. Some people claimed to have been touched or felt hands on them. We would hear scratches or whispers and footprints above us, if on the first floor, or below us, if on the second floor, and this was only sometimes. On the second floor, I did do an investigation by myself while everybody else was outside. I wanted pictures, but nothing happened. I went back here two times and got some EVPs, but the bell was the craziest thing from that location. The second location will be called the theater. This was the last investigation I had with this paranormal group before the tragedy happened. Car accident not related to anything paranormal. We lost 50% of the group in this. This theater still haunts my dreams. Something yanked on my necklace, and the boiler almost blew up. My voice recorder suddenly went off without me touching it, not once, but three times. The last time without batteries in it. I got separated from the others in the basement tunnels and found myself facing a shadow of a person standing before me. Could have been reflections. When leaving, I suddenly felt very ill and had to pull over to throw up as I left the city. I got suddenly blurry. There is an overall sense of dread. Like, if I didn't get out, something was going to happen. And back at home, my neck had scratches from where my necklace was pulled and my arms were bruised. I think spirits can feast on vulnerability. And during the theater investigation, I was very vulnerable due to the encounter with a man as I was walking from my car to the theater. So I think that shock, or sorry, I think that shook me so much. I opened myself to paranormal and the paranormal loves to fuck with weak individuals. So it chose me to mess with. At the first location, I wasn't stressed at all and I was able to keep my mental health strong. Therefore, the paranormal chose to focus on those who had open and vulnerable minds. I still try to go on as many paranormal investigations that I can get my hands on to. I managed to be part of a non-taped investigation with the ghost hunters in Kentucky. Went on ghost tours in London and Hawaii and Poland. I plan on visiting Waverly Hills and other haunted hotspots. But I'll never ever go back to that theater, even for a million dollars. I experienced what it had to offer, and feel satisfied that there is no further business I have with that place. However, with the first location, I feel we have become good acquaintances, and I can't wait for my next visit. I feel like I haven't experienced anything that that place had to offer, so until I do, I don't mind dropping in and saying hi. Was this a ghost or something else? This event takes place in my cousin's childhood home about seven years ago. My aunt and my youngest cousin still live there, but my cousin who witnessed this with me has since moved. For purpose of this story, I will refer to my older cousin as E and my younger cousin as R. I'm just going to call them Ellen and Rebecca the narrator's uh, choice here. It was early morning in July. On this day, we were packing up to go on a, on a trip to visit our family members in Oregon. This all takes place in the upstairs, so I will describe the layout. This is an older house built sometime in the 60s. The upstairs is a very long and narrow hallway. On one end of the hall, there's a bathroom. On the other end of the hall, there's a large bookcase. 
On the right side of this hall, there are two bedrooms, one by the bathroom and one by the bookcase. The bedroom by the bathroom was Rebecca's room. The other one was a guest room, and on the left side of the hall, across from the guest room, and next to the bookcase, there was a little door. And this little door would never open. We could also never find the key. My aunt said that she had never seen the key either. When we were younger, we'd like to pretend to be ghost hunters. On this morning, we were pretending to be ghost hunters, per usual. I had a weird interest with this door. I still don't understand why. Probably because you were curious and never been in there. However, I was very drawn to it. What's weird in this particular day is there was a scary old-looking key sitting on the bookshelf next to this door. I grabbed it and tried to see if it was, you know, the right fit for the lock, and it was. My cousins were scared to open the door themselves. We all had uneasy feelings. However, me being the oldest, I decided that I would do the ballsy move and open the door. When I did, nothing was in there. Just a bunch of insulation, spider webs, and it had no light. Very disappointing. We put the key back, shut the door, and went downstairs to go get a snack. When we went back up, the key was gone and the door was locked again. Very weird, but as kids, we didn't think much of it. Fast forward, and it was about time to go on the trip. My mother and aunt were outside in the van chanting chatting. <laughs> so they sent us inside to find Rebecca and Ellen. And I was just walking around the house calling for her, but couldn't find her. Keep in mind, Rebecca was 10 years old at the time and Ellen was 11. And I was 12. Rebecca was wearing rainbow leggings, orange Crocs, and a t-shirt. Rebecca had a very beautiful long brown hair had very beautiful long brown hair that went down to her waist. Keep all of this in mind. Ellen and I checked Rebecca's room. She wasn't in there. When we walked back out into the hallway, we both saw the exact same thing. We still talk about it today, and every time that we talk about it, we both recall the exact same events. When we entered the hallway, we saw a young girl around our age who was wearing a white dress with pink ruffles on the sleeves, as well as the bottom. She had on white stockings and a little white slip-on with one strap across the top. All we could see was the back of her. Her hair was beautiful, long, and brown, just like Rebecca's hair. And she had a pink ribbon bow tied to her hair, like half-up style. We didn't think that someone else could be in the house, so we went into the hallway. Ellen asked, Rebecca, when did you change and where did you get that dress? Once she asked that, the being started walking down the hallway to the guest room. We followed her, thinking it was Rebecca acting weird. When we turned into the guest room, no one was there. We even opened the closet. Nothing. After that, we went back out the back door. And there was Rebecca, sitting in the treehouse in the very back corner of the yard, still in the same rainbow leggings and red shirt as earlier. We were extremely freaked out and tried telling our mothers what we saw, but they did not believe us. We've never seen it again, but my cousin would always tell me that she would hear weird things in the house that were unexplainable. What are your thoughts? Was this a ghost or something else? Do you think us opening that door had anything to do with this weird experience? Ghost Child and Family When I Was a Kid So to start this story off, my mother was Catholic, and my dad, who knows at the time of this story, he never really talked about it. So when this occurred, we lived in Spring, Texas. I was three years old. Weirdly enough, I remember life back when I was around two. So we moved here when I was one, from Iowa. My dad got a new job and we had some family down the street. So let me start with the details on the house layout, so you can imagine it somewhat better. 
It was a blue square looking house, which was quite poor looking. Old paint, old wood. You walk into the front door and you're in the living room. To the right was a straight shot to the back door past my room and my mom and dad's room. My room had a door that connected the two rooms also. And by the back door was the washer and an open attic where you can look up into the attic back there. Okay, now that I explained the layout, when I was three, I remember I was going outside sometime in the morning and I looked up on the way out the back door. I'd seen a kid, about five I would say. He just had his legs hanging off the ledge in the attic by the back door. We made eye contact and I remember not being scared, but I was like, who is that? weird and just ran out the back door. Moving on to the next. My room freaked me out. When my mom read books to me, I would fall asleep and she would just head to her room through the connecting door. The night I had the worst feeling, my blanket was pulled down. I remember waking up in the pitch black looking down and then right when I looked down, it ripped my whole blanket off of me. Still to this day, I can feel the fear I felt as a child. I screamed so loud as my heart racing jumped straight out of bed and went to the connecting door to my mom's room, freaking the hell out. But I brought this up to her and she said that she didn't know I had that happen, saying I was just crying and panicking until I passed out asleep. So, when starting this conversation, she told me that she didn't believe in spirits, until that house. She told me about nights if my dad was working. He did overnight work. And she would hear someone walking through the wooden kitchen clear as day. Telling me that she understood that it's old. The house's creak, right? But the part that made this weirder. The back door would get opened. Easy explanation since the house was old, but... The door had two deadbolts and one chain lock, with the door handle lock as well. And while alone, my mom was just worried about people breaking in. She would lock all of them. And every night, all unlocked and open, and she wouldn't leave the room until it was quiet. She ended up telling my dad, but he didn't believe her until a night that he was off of work and it happened again. He said to my mom, do you hear that? Someone's in the house walking through the kitchen. And she just said, that's what I told you had been happening. He grabbed a bat and ran, opening their door. So that way you can see the kitchen in the back door. No one there. The door was still locked. I was told he looked through the whole house, checking locks and windows. No one was there. When they went to sleep and woke up, the back door was wide open, all locks off, nothing stolen, nothing in different places. This is where my parents started getting worried. After this experience, she said that the door still was opening. She was watching TV in the middle of the day, Jerry Springer. She heard the walking and she looked into the kitchen and said that she knew it was walking her way. When the noise stopped, she sighed, but she freaked out when an indentation of someone sitting down in the cushion right next to her appeared. When she jumped up, the spot stayed until she ran by it, and when she looked back, the cushion was slowly raising back up. She said she called a priest to bless the house that day, and said I stopped screaming, but still said I did. I did not want to sleep in that room, and that the door and the walking stopped after that. When my stepmom passed away. So my mom was married to my dad for 13 years, and in divorce. And until I was 21, she lived a very single life. Until she met Becca. She met her through a friend of her job and at the time and wasn't really interested in even meeting her, but 
she went ahead and did it for the sake of her friend and just ended up falling in absolute love with her. They were very much committed to each other for five years. The last two of them, Becca battled stage three lung cancer. After a year and a half, she was told her cancer would never be cured, but her tumors had shrunk to the point that they were almost gone, and the doctors decided to consider her in remission of sorts, but wanted her back in their offices every six months for follow-ups and check-ins. The next six-month check-in, she found out one tumor had grown back, and just as big, if not bigger, than last time. She agreed to more treatments, but she wanted to see her dad in Texas before she did. While she was in Texas, her blood pressure became unmanageable. She landed in the hospital for a short time. She decided to refuse treatment and left against orders. She passed away that same night. She was more than my mom's partner. She was my mom. She was my children's, my children's Becca. She was our protector and a beloved family member. She and I have had card conversations, and I know I couldn't have had with any other family member. She was that one person that you could tell. You could just tell it to him straight. The whole time she was with my mom, she would be the one to give me advice about my marriage and tell me how absolutely unhealthy it was for me and my kids. A couple of months after Becca passed, my husband announced to me that he had been in a relationship with another woman for eight months and he no longer loved me, didn't want to be with me, and he was leaving. Part of me was relieved because I honestly didn't have the gall to leave, and I would have just dealt with it and gone on with my life. Probably would have just let him continue on. This is not how I am now. But part of me was dreading that part. I was going to have to live alone. I'd be raising my kids primarily alone, and I hadn't been without him. Aside from a few brief breakups since I was 15. I didn't know how to be single. I stayed at my mom's a lot for the first few weeks after my split, even though I quickly got into my own and just rented a home. I just didn't want to be alone. So one day I was just having a horrible time. I was sad, crying all day. My kids were napping in the living room, three and six. I was in my mom's bedroom doing my makeup, trying to stop crying, and I looked up at this picture of my mom and Becca on the mirror. I asked her, Why didn't you stay? Are you okay? Where are you? Of course, I knew I would get no answer. My world was rattled for about another 30 minutes later when I decided to give up on makeup, just go take a shower and try to just de-stress. My kids are the ultimate bathroom crashers, and they know no boundaries when I'm showering or if I'm on the toilet. Still to this day, and they're teens now. So I was in the shower and my younger daughter, who's three at the time, came into the bathroom and had a conversation with me. Mama, I got to tell you about a dream. Me. Okay, baby, shoot. You know that place that Becca likes to go and you can eat whatever you want? Golden Corral. Me. Yeah. Well, I dreamed that Nani, Aunt R, and Uncle B, and all of our friends were there eating dinner, and my Becca came in. Me. That's awesome, baby. I try to go back to my shower as she continues poking her head into the shower. Yeah, and she sat down next to me because I'm her favorite. She told me to tell you something, Mom. Me. What'd she say? She said, tell your mama that I'm okay. She'll be okay, and I'm happy, and I'm still here. I just started sobbing. She knew I needed her. She went through my three-year-old to let me know that she was there and had my back. That's all I needed. Although I continued to struggle with my separation and everything in between, I no longer felt alone, and I'm forever grateful my daughter was able to relay that message to me. My Paranormal Experiences When I was around 11 or 12 years old, I moved into a new home which seems to be a tiny bit haunted. But, yeah, 
Anyways, some time at night, I had to come out of the shower and I left the bathroom. For some context, my brother's room is at the end of the hall. The bathroom is on the other side, so when you turn towards the end of the hall, leaving or entering the bathroom, you can see into my brother's room. As I was leaving, I saw a figure that I assumed to be my brother standing there. It spoke to me in a similar voice as well, but something was off about it. All the thing said was, Hello there. It was odd, so I gave him a weird look and just responded with a confused hello back. I moved away from the door and headed towards the steps. When I turned back, it had went into the bathroom and shut the door behind it. I was just thinking, okay, whatever, he's weird, and went downstairs. Nobody passed me. No one was behind or in front of me. When I got to the basement to put my clothes in the basket, everybody was in the basement as well, including my brother, who was in the freezer looking for hot dogs, and he hadn't been in his room for a while, apparently. Later, I told my mom about the boy that I saw, and she told me that she had seen the balloon that was in the corner of the dining room get yanked down as though someone was pulling on it multiple times. She said she was able to communicate to it through the balloon. I don't remember exactly what she asked, but I do remember her telling it that it needed to leave. After that, the balloon didn't move any longer. Although that's not the end of it. When I was home by myself later at night, I was eating at the dining room table when I heard the sound of someone running down the steps, then abruptly stopping. I looked over toward the direction of the stairs, and nobody was there. I was scared at the time and called my mom to ask when she would be home, which she said she would be soon, so I sat and watched TV until she did in fact get home. Another time I was home by myself. I was again eating at the dining room table, when I thought I saw someone running in front of me in the kitchen, back and forth. Could have been my eyes playing a trick on me or something, but it still scared me at the time. So I went and sat outside for a little bit before going back inside and watching TV to distract myself. When I got older, things didn't seem to happen as much. Mostly just things like sounds of someone following me or tapping me while I'm alone. More recently, I was awoken to the feeling of being yanked out of my bed in the morning which freaked me out especially even after I was fully awake. And seeing that there was nothing there, but I was still being pulled out of my bed. For some reason I didn't scream. I pulled myself backwards quickly, and whatever had a hold of me finally let go. After that, I had these nightmares for a week of a woman coming from my closet or from the hallway. She would be dirty, pale, dressed in all white, and had long, messy, dark hair. She would come to my bedside and sit beside me, then put her face as close as she possibly could to mine. I would close my eyes, count to five, open them, and she would be gone. I was able to move again, and I would simply go back to sleep each time until she finally stopped showing up. I'm not sure if it's related, or if I was even dreaming. For more context, the way it started would be me waking up, seeing her standing there, walking towards me. All I had to do was close my eyes and count to five. Then she would be gone. Another recent thing is when I was outside talking to my mom, we heard the sound of footsteps and something being dragged above us. The room above the porch is my room. We got up and ran to my room. Nothing had been touched, and no one was in there at all. My brother was in his room playing a game with his friends online, so it wasn't him either. Me and my mom went back downstairs. We continued to hear the sounds, and I still hear them sometimes at night, but I just ignore them now. I believe that is all. I may update if I forgot something or if anything new happens. Tales from a Haunted Apartment, Part 2 
A couple of weeks ago, I posted the most out there unexplainable paranormal phenomenon that occurred in the apartment that we lived in prior to where we're at now. I would link the post, but I'm a bit illiterate in the ways of Reddit posting. I'm more of an avid lurker. My apologies. I want to post the other experiences that I've had in that place before moving on to sharing my more recent occurrences. Story number one. To my recollection, this is the first experience I've had in the apartment, circa 2014-ish. My husband was working night shift, and I was laying in bed around 7 p.m. I was either reading or watching TV. It was just my cat and I, and she was sleeping on the bed in the far corner. It was early summer, but it was raining hard, so the windows were closed. My attention was diverted as my almost fully open bedroom door started to close slowly. I just watched in disbelief as it closed all the way, latched and clicked. Open again all the way until the doorknob hit the wall behind it. Close fully again, then open again to almost its original position. The whole deal lasted about 30 seconds. I was absolutely stunned. Nothing so visual or brazen had ever happened before. I tried to rationalize it as maybe the upstairs neighbor had stepped on the floor in a weird way, repeatedly. But we lived there for four years after this happened, and our upstairs neighbor was loud. All caps. It almost sounded like dragging across the floor whenever he walked, and I've had the incoming old lady moment bang on the ceiling different times when he was speaking, or arguing with uh, maybe a significant other. Super loudly, mind you. The point is, with such heavy-footed, loud neighbors, the door thing never happened again. Story number two. A few years pass, and my husband is now working day shift. I was doing shift work, and that particular week I was getting off at work at 1 a.m., Hubby would always stay up until I got home to make sure that I was safe. We would then smoke a bowl or two, and he would go to bed, and I would stay up playing video games. Nice. 4 or 5 a.m. rolls around, and I figure I would just crash on the couch instead of disturbing husband's sleep, and he would get me up at 7 when he awoke. And, as it would be, just send me to bed. I threw on the TV and I laid down on the couch, waiting to get tired enough to actually fall asleep. Whatever I was watching went to a commercial break, and I'm about to light up a cigarette when I hear a knocking on the wood floor, directly in front of where I'm sitting. I think I actually stopped breathing for a moment. We lived on the bottom floor, and this did not sound muffled as if it was coming up from the underneath, but rather as clear and concise as if somebody had wrapped their knuckles on the wood of our floor. There's a moment sometimes when stuff happens where you're just like, was that even real? What the fuck just happened? I was deep in that moment when it started again. It seemed to form a bit of a pattern on its second go. I think it went... One, one, two, three, one, two. I was just sitting there floored. Pun, absolutely intended, very nice. With an unlit cigarette in my hand and an undoubtedly dumbass look on my face trying to rationalize what I was hearing and how fucking close it was to me. Whatever it was knocked a third time. I believe two short knocks. That's when I get my ass in gear and said, Hubby's slumber be damned, and ran into our room and cuddled into him as closely as I could. That's another occurrence that never happened again, but somehow one of the most jarring. I'm pretty sure that's everything that's happened in that apartment, but I'm a new mom on low sleep, so if I remember anything else from this place, I'll throw it in the post. I'm really excited to tell you all about what's happened since moving into this place, but again, new mom... So, I'll do it when I have some time to write it cohesively. The 
Bulgarian Samo Divi by my grandmother. This is a story that's been told to me by my grandmother countless times. I finally decided to record it in an audio to transcribe it, also to keep it as a cherished memory for the future. To give you some context, we are in Bulgaria in the early 1900s. My grandmother was not yet born, and what she knows about the story was told to her by her grandfather, who was still quite young at the time of these events. Then I would add that I was also born in Bulgaria, but at an early age I moved to Italy and I remember little or nothing of the Bulgarian language. So any questions, even for you Bulgarians reading this, ask me in English. I don't have the skills to draw up a decent introduction, so I'll go straight to the story. Smiley face. I miss the village's name, where what you might be going is reading about. These days I will visit my grandmother and I'll ask her, and I'll add it in the comment. One night many years ago, while I was not yet born, my man was at home on an old cold winter evening. Since his home didn't have an indoor toilet, he had to go outside to pee. He didn't even bother to dress properly, wearing only his woolen socks on his feet, when shortly after eleven o'clock in the evening, he ventured out of bed and approached the door. As soon as he crossed the threshold, he heard a sort of melody and noticed dancing figures, all dressed in white, men and women. These mysterious figures, called Semodives or Semodives, noticed him and the two girls approach him. They grabbed him by the arms and said, Come with us, we're celebrating a wedding. The man, astonished, asked who they were, and the girls replied, We are Semodivas. We are celebrating the union of our sister. Now that you have seen us, you must come with us. In a state of enchantment, the man was compelled to go with them. For it was said that once a Samodiva called you, you could not oppose or refuse their invitation. He felt as if in a dream, devoid of will and unable to object, as if he had lost his voice. So, with the Samodivas, he began a long pilgrimage across the country dancing and celebrating, until he reached Clisura. On their way, they came to an artificial dam and shortly before, to an open well. Here the Samodivas wondered what to do with the man, whether to throw him into the well or something else. Since he was now so far from home and trapped in their dream world, one of the girls offered the man some wine but at that moment, a rooster crowing was heard. It was dawn, and the Semodivas immediately disappeared. The man found himself near the well, slowly beginning to wake up from his enchanted state. With the coming of the day, and thus of light, he lowered his eyes to look at the jug of wine that had been offered to him. He realized instead that he had in his hands was a severed head of a fowl, and a white wedding handkerchief. Bewildered and frightened, he decided to take this bizarre evidence of his experience with him to share with the locals. Thus, still wearing his woolen stockings, he began his return journey through the cold and snow. The villagers watched in amazement, wondering where he could have been and what had happened to him. The man divulged his extraordinary story, at some days past, though, the man lost his mind, but he lived for years before dying. Some speculated that he had lost his mind even before that event, thus raising the question, but where did he find the fowl's head during that strange night? The Burning Man 
This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late 20s, and so is my friend. It was around June in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets its coldest in Toowoomba. And that night, I remembered reaching negative 4 degrees Celsius or 25 Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark is a teacher there, and apparently his car had stopped working. I wondered, sort of wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block. I finally reached the block, and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what happened. He said in a shaky voice, He's here, a ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now, as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak it. Downlands is a boarding school, so I knew there was a small amount of people still here. However, the boarding block and the admin block is a far, far ways apart, and I was not about to wander through the dark pathways, with Mark spouting the stuff he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up at the office and cautiously walked out. As we were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers, the wind was making an eerie howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light, an orange light coming from behind us. All of a sudden it got very warm, and I mean a quick sudden boost in temperature. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see what was at the top of the hill. And this still freaks me out when I think of it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us when we turned around. He stared at us for about five seconds. Felt like five hours then. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over to the side of the path. The man on fire ran past us down the hill and into the forest. I got up, I looked down toward the oval. He was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running towards a road until him and the fire vanished. At that point, we decide to run to the boarding block and find another member of faculty. We reached the block. We found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told... It's a common thing to see if you stay in the admin block too late, or if you're walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, everyone can hear his screams, at least once a week, as he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. Apparently, the faculty member, whom was also a teacher, said he had only seen the burning man once. When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, he replied with, All the drawers started to open, and I heard a voice say, The fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they'd ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her 30s. She asked, Do you have an appointment, Mark? No, but we just wanted to ask you if you'd ever seen... Then the older lady, maybe late 60s, early 70s, came out of the back and said, You two saw the burning man, didn't you? Mark replied, Yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came closer and said, Yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many times. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late. If you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left. Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. The burning man at the Downlands College has been noted as one of Toombawoomba's most... just... malicious paranormal experiences. I'm finally ready to talk about her. This took place over a few years in a farmhouse 
in the desert of Arizona. It was newly developed land. We moved into the place when I was 15. At the time, I was going through a lot emotionally and smoking a lot of weed. That might explain some of my personal experiences, so I'll try not to dwell on them too much. The house was set up almost plantation style. It was very wide and narrow, a big wraparound porch and lots of awkward corners. The front room was a tall library with an open balcony to the upstairs, which ran into long, skinny bedrooms. My parents' room was closest to the stairs and attached to a nursery with a sliding and sweet door. My brothers, two years younger, and my room were at the end of the dark hallway. That side of the house never got sun, so it was bad vibes all around. Downstairs, there was a fucked up Harry Potter style closet, a sunken living room, a kitchen in the center of the house, and a sunken playroom for the baby. It honestly started the first day we moved in. My brother and I were the only ones in the house unboxing plates. The place was so empty, everything echoed. I swear it sounded like a little girl laughed, like a creepy track you could get off an app or something. Keep in mind, the TVs were not plugged in. We were on an acre of land far away from the dirt road, and my brother was way too stupid to pull a prank like that. I started hearing voices at night. This wasn't unusual. I honestly used to freak myself out badly. I think I made up noises to scare myself. My parents had raised me not to talk about things scaring me. To tough it out and to be a big girl. It was fine most of the time during the day. Everything came at night. I remember distinctly when it started messing with me in bed. In solidarity, my brother and I kept our bedroom doors open for the hallway's nightlight, and in case we needed to call for each other. We had a pretty fucked up childhood that might have contributed to all the codependency that I'll describe during this. I was falling asleep, but not quite out. I felt the blanket slipping off the bed and reached down to grab it. This was common, I didn't have a bed frame with a foot kept slipping no matter how I tried to tuck it. In classic horror movie fashion, the last time I pulled it, I felt tension. There was nothing that it could have been caught on. I feel like the second I went from confused to terrified, it bounced back to me. I don't know how to explain this well, but I was sure someone was under the bed pulling it from me. Later, I moved another nightlight into the bedroom. It was kind of a spooky amber orange, and I convinced my parents to let me paint the walls cherry red. Again, I was almost asleep, but not quite asleep, so I don't think it could have been sleep paralysis. I heard the carpet rustle, and maybe joints cracking. It sounded like my mom had come to check on me. I opened my eyes and I immediately froze. I don't think I've ever been more scared in my life. There was a woman crawling across my floor from the far side of my room to the foot of my bed. She was pale with stringy hair, like she was going bald. I couldn't see her face. I don't know how I fell asleep. I couldn't scream or move. I think she disappeared under my bed. Again, this could be a hallucination. My baby brother was about seven months old when she started coming out during the day. My mom was a teacher at the time and was able to stay home with us during summer vacation. I vividly remember stepping outside of my own body as a child. This is my earliest childhood memory. 
I do not know the exact age I was, but it's one of the few memories that I'm able to recall from my childhood as early as I possibly can. I remember waking up next to myself in my bed. It had felt like I was in complete and total control of my body, totally aware and conscious. I recall being extremely confused and worried about what was happening and stepping out of my bed. I'm unsure of what my motive was, but I like to assume it was probably to go and wake my mom up out of concern. Now this is the part that's never left me. I feel as if I can put myself back into the situation and see it just as clear as I did when I was a child. As I went toward my door, I turned back to see a tin garbage bin at the end of my bed. The lid started to move, and it illuminated. A fiery orange figure started to crawl out of it. It looked like it was made out of magma, or a personified fire. I remember screaming, but there was no sound to it, which scared me even more. I ran out of my room and down my stairs, when I looked out of these windows that surrounded the front door in my old house. I saw what looked like an animal, more specifically a dog. It was completely white and had yellow eyes. It was staring back at me through the glass. I completely remember how I reacted to this, with genuine panic and fear. I ran back up the stairs, and I felt like crying, but I couldn't. I was only able to hear my own thoughts, and was unable to make noises. The environment around me, my house, was, however, just very vocal. I recall the noises of my stairs and the sound of what a garbage made out of a tin would actually sound like shuffling around constantly. The ending makes no sense at all to me. I was at the end of the hallway facing my room after running back up the stairs. And I saw this garbage monster thing struggling to leave my room. Everything was almost completely dark around it. And I swear it's like I can relive seeing how the monster itself illuminated the furniture that it was close to. Just like how a fire or a flame would in a dark room. I clearly remember hearing, it's not real. This was the voice of my mother who was asleep. When this happened, a dream catcher that I had hanging in the corner of my room began to consume everything around me. My memory of this part isn't as clear as the rest of this dream experience, but I remember there being light, with the center focus being this dream catcher. I'm unsure of what happened at the end of all this. I don't remember waking up or anything at all related to the event from that point forward. The only thing I can recall after this feeling is just knowing that it wasn't actually real, and that it was in fact a dream. From what I believe, I'm confident that this was some sort of, I guess, an out-of-body experience or a lucid dream. However, I also firmly believe that this was the first experience I ever had with the feeling of raw, genuine terror. There's never been a time I can recall with such feelings of intense fear, other than this incident from whatever age I was when this occurred. I'm now 21 years old and have absolutely never encountered the feeling of fear like that. But some other times where my life was actually in danger, I did, but nothing has ever felt as intense as it did in this dream. I think that's why it's never left my memory. Something followed my friend up to the mountaintop. This didn't happen to me, but to a friend who went hiking to Mount Lawu in Java, Indonesia. Mount Lawu is considered a sacred place by the locals, and 
people believe it is one of, if not the most, haunted mountain in Java. Most people have gotten lost up there, and some have never been found. One case in particular, which I recall, is the disappearance of a young boy named Alvin, who went hiking up there with some of his friends on New Year's Eve a few years ago. He vanished without a trace. The rescue party gave up after weeks of combing the slopes trying to find him. He was last seen by other hikers near Pissar Diang and Pissar Satan, Diang Market or Devil's Market, an empty grassland near the top where many hikers have reported hearing mysterious disembodied voices, hence the name. A few years ago, my friend and two other hikers decided to climb the mountain. There are several marked trails by which to get to the top of Mount Lewu. The busiest one is Kandi Shito, because it's one of the easier trails to pick up and the scenery up there is breathtaking. But the ascent takes longer. It's a footpath that gradually ascends through pine forests, grasslands, and whatnot. He and two rookie through hikers took this trail. It was his first climb to the top of Mount Lewu. They had met on a hiker forum months before and decided to take the easier trail since the other two guys had never attempted a mountain of this caliber before. It wasn't one of those busy days when they arrived, and there were only a handful of other hikers around. Anyway, their trip went smoothly at first. Soon they were joined by two other hikers from a nearby city. But after they broke through the thicket and passed through Pesar Diang, my friend began to feel a little bit uneased. And then he noticed something a little off with their hiking group. There were now six of them. Somebody else had joined them unnoticed. He looked around and stared at his fellow hikers one by one, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. They all looked familiar to him, which was confusing. He couldn't seem to recognize the odd one out, no matter how many times he counted and scrutinized their faces. And to make it even worse, he seemed to be the only one who had noticed this. He asked himself if he was becoming disoriented due to exhaustion or the cold. He started seeing glimpses of blurry silhouettes moving around them. He wanted to quit. He no longer felt excited about this hike. He didn't feel like he was going to make it another hour. But there was nothing he could do. They were already halfway to the top, and he was sure that he had no choice but to return alone if he decided to turn back. He had lost his bearings, you could say. He had no idea where he was or who he was with. When they finally reached the top, he collapsed in a heap. According to his friends, he then became delirious and started to speak of random creepy things like them being followed by something, or someone watching them in the fog. He even told them to just leave him there because he was going to die anyway and let his parents know how much he missed and loved them. It took them a few hours to calm him down and for him to regain his strength, and they decided to set up camp for the night. But the other guys also couldn't sleep. They could feel a presence with them. When the first lights of day appeared in the sky, they quickly dismantled the tents, packed them away, and began their descent, which luckily only took a few hours down the slope until they made it safely to base camp. My friend had to be rushed to the hospital, burning up with a fever. He had made it through the night and down the mountain. Others like him weren't so lucky. Astral Projection Hey guys, so this just happened to me today. I have a friend who comes over all the time, sometimes even rocks up to my house unannounced, and my dog is obsessed with him. She has a special way of greeting him and everything. He has a few stories of strange, uncanny stuff happening to him. And this was all in his day in his life, and 
We would often just joke that he's like a wizard or a warlock, but it's always just been jokes. Today, however, something happened that neither of us can really explain, and we've been trying to figure out how to justify it since. We were chatting as we normally do over social media, and we're talking about ghost stories from his culture, and he was telling me about some supernatural beings to do with the same, a very common topic that we're both interested in, the supernatural. And I left my phone to take a quick break. And while waiting for him to respond to a message to install my new clothes dryer, had to move the old one first, so it was a process of doing that. Didn't have anything in my mind at all except getting the dryer stuff sorted. Wasn't even actively thinking about our conversation, really, as it's a very common topic for us to talk about. Next thing I know, while I'm struggling with moving the old clothes dryer, I see my dog eagerly running to the door, doing her little special little greeting the way that she only does for him. Couldn't have been more than three minutes since his last message, and he lives at least 10 to 12 minutes away, which was a bit strange, but I just figured maybe he was trying to fuck with me and decided to rock up unannounced. So I look to the door, which was one of those foggy windows, and I see him peering in the way he always does when he comes over, like I've seen the image like a million times and I know it's him. Same face, same build, same hair, wearing like a blue t-shirt or something. There was no knock, however, but the dog was already there doing her thing as she always did for him only. Eager for me to get to the door to open to let him in and I saw it appeared to be him and rolled my eyes, went to the door to let him in. Open the door and there's no one there, but I was greeted by a weird whoosh of wind. Awkward. Still thought he's just messing around and maybe parked down the road a bit rather than in my driveway as normal, and I just hid when I opened the door. Or maybe he just hid when I opened the door, but my dog is fucking confused as hell, starts whimpering and sniffing the door and then looking at me. Then checking the door again, just... What just happened? I'm also confused because it isn't like him to just hide and then not come out. I'm like, what the fuck? And I just shut the door. I was definitely a tad creeped out at this point. So I went straight to my phone and I sent him a message telling him what happened. And as it turned out, around the exact same time this happened, he had randomly dozed off for a few minutes. And he was actually wearing... A blue shirt, but a blue blanket on. And he sent me a picture of himself at home and the blue blanket. What the fuck? Who was at my door in blue then, looking exactly like him and peering in exactly like he does, and my dog sensed him? What did I actually see? Note. My dog is very perceptive. Had it been anyone else, she wouldn't have been barking like crazy and trying to eat them, probably. Also, she was unsettled for about four hours after this incident, hypervigilant, clingy, and staring at the door and whimpering, which is very unlike her. Anyway, the whole thing creeped me the hell out. As we were trying to make sense of it, he also confirmed that he was actually thinking about my place right before he dozed off, because we're waiting on some new furniture to arrive tomorrow, and he was just randomly thinking about how it would look once it arrives and all that. So the best we could come up with was some accidental astral projection or something. Sounds cooked, I know, but this is exactly what happened, and I'm shook. Am I being haunted? Somebody please help me. I can't do this anymore. Just now, I completely saw a man in my living room. I was crying in my room because of something going on in my life, and I went downstairs to get water. I felt like somebody else was in the living room, like another person was there with me. My initial thought was my dad, because he usually wakes up at absurd times because of his sleep apnea. I walked into the room and saw somebody staring at me. I thought it was my dad at first, but when I focused a little harder in the dark, it was not. 
I blinked and he wasn't there anymore. I got so sick to my stomach and literally just ran away. I ran into my room and I can't stop shaking. I'm so afraid of just what it was that happened. This isn't even the first time that this has happened. A few months ago, while I was alone at home for a week, I thought somebody broke in. From my room upstairs, I heard my dog barking. I thought he needed to go outside, and when I went to let him out, out of the corner of my eye, I saw and heard a kitchen chair move. My dog started to scream bark at it, totally freaking out, while I was standing there in this state of frozen shock. Both TVs turned on at the same time. I freaked out and made a sprint for my keys on the table, got in my car and called my parents sobbing. I wanted them to check the cameras before I dialed 911, and they told me they saw nothing on them. They thought I was being dramatic, and do not believe the full extent of my explanation that this chair had moved out from the table by itself. Aside from that, and what just happened not even an hour ago to me, a smaller thing happened to me too. A light in my room that has never once flickered started rapidly flickering, turned off, then back on again a few days ago. A door slammed in my face by itself not too long ago. Things are always being misplaced, lost, or randomly turning up after not being able to find it for a long time. Sometimes I think I see something move or someone out of the corner of my eye. I get these random feelings that someone is looking at me, or in the room with me when I'm alone, usually accompanied by full-body chills and goosebumps. At times I've heard fully audible words. The night terrors are so unbearable to the point of where I avoid going to sleep. Waking up screaming is a common thing for me, and my parents have to run into my room to wake me up countless times. These are all recent, occurring within the past six months. But I'm told by my parents that I used to talk to my dead grandfather, who I never met as a young kid. I was too young for me to have any current memories of him today. They say that I used to say I have a friend who quote-unquote brings me flowers and looks like dad. Apparently, when they showed me his license, I got really excited and told them that he looked like that. Another thing I happen to actually remember is seeing something, something in church when I was a kid. During a service, I had seen a thick golden blanket kind of a thing pass through the aisle. When I saw it, I remember turning to my dad and saying, Dad, I just saw God. And he laughed and said, No, you didn't. Ironically enough, I grew up to an abandoned Catholic faith. I wouldn't call myself agnostic, atheist, or a skeptic, but I do always try to think of a logical explanation for things. I just feel like I'm going crazy. I am so done with being afraid and feeling this way, and I have no idea where to turn. I'm begging for someone here to help me understand what's going on. My very own guardian angel, or so I thought. When I was 11 or 12, my family moved to a house in some woods pretty close to town. It was a lodge, a wooden house. My two brothers, sisters, and dad. My mom was in another similar house next to ours, as there wasn't enough space. In the first few days, it seemed good, safe, and even freer than usual. My dad worked on evenings, so we'd be alone in our room doing homework, chatting, and normal stuff. One evening, my dad was going to stay till morning, so me and my brother got his room. We were in the bed, trying to sleep. It was about 2 a.m. when I heard footsteps next to the bedroom. and thought it was my sister, so I yelled, Go to sleep, Sarah! No response. 
The footsteps got closer to the door and it slowly opened. There was no one there. Then I heard footsteps next to the bed. I wasn't scared. I felt safe. I felt like whatever that was was just checking up on me to see if I was okay. The footsteps stopped and the door closed. I fell asleep with a smile. I felt safer than ever. My dad came in the morning and I was already awake watching TV on the couch. My dad asked me, Did mom check up on you during the night as I told her? And I found it being a strange opportunity. I answered, No, someone else did. My dad was confused so he asked me who it was and I said I didn't know. We had a short laugh. The next night, everything over again. Dad stayed at work until morning. This time, I purposely stayed up to repeat like last night. I heard a loud bang on the other side of the wall to my left. I screamed and that woke up my brother. Josh, what the hell just banged so fucking loud? I don't know, just check. I was excited. Josh, are you sane? It's two in the morning. I know, but I really want to know what it was. Okay, let's go. I'm going to be first in case someone broke in. He grabbed a random broom from next to the door and we went there. There was nothing, and everything was in place. I heard footsteps coming towards Dad's room's door. Wait! I yelled, knowing my brother heard it too. Josh, who are you talking to? I don't know, but I hear footsteps coming to our room like last night. Whatever it was was next to me, checking up on me. Are you sane, really? No, no. I believe you, but there's certainly a ghost in here, something. We rushed to the room and went to bed. I suddenly felt unsafe, really endangered. I felt like a sniper scope watched me. I felt so wrong. I felt safe the last time, right? The feeling of fright went through my body and suddenly a smell of blood. Like something had just died. I fell asleep as if someone just strangled me. I wake up in the morning and go to make a sandwich as I was starving. I saw something run to the kitchen before me and I hear a thump as if someone fell. Sarah, Mike, Ian, Dad, who's there? Are you okay? Then I stopped. No one there. I heard the breathing of about five people around me. I turned, saying names of my family. My dad walks in. You called, bud? You need something? No, dad. Is mom here? No, she's over at her house. Okay, uh... Then I told him what was happening. He said he believed me, so we sold the houses and moved. Since then, I felt safe. I prayed every morning for three years. I was terrified. Now I'm 21 years old. Still talk with Sarah and Ian. Not Mike, he died in a house fire. Are shadow people following me? I tried to condense as much as possible but it spans most of my life. SP refers to sleep paralysis. And before 22, all of this takes place in Aurora. I have SP undiagnosed, but one of the first memories I have is waking up in my bed, probably about age 10-ish, and not being able to move, but seeing a very tall gray being resembling what most people would call an alien hiding in the corner of my room. I remember not feeling scared, but more startled that something was in my space. About four years later, we moved to this very old Victorian house, one of the first built in the city. Sometimes in the summer, I would play video games in the basement to escape the heat, and right above where my TV would sit, there was a hole in the wall leading to the crawl space underneath the house that was pitch black and very ominous. While down there one day, I went into a sort of trance, and when I came to, I was still sitting there, where I was, but staring blankly into the dark hole for an unknown amount of time. 
The house was so old that it had two sets of stairs, one for the people living there and the other for the servants. One day I was headed down the servant stairs, staring at my feet and looking up to see a girl at the end of the stairs in a white gown with black hair in her face. Almost exactly like the look of the girl in the ring. Another time I was home alone and I heard something upstairs run from one room to the other, and it was so loud that my dog stood up and looked at me. I did go upstairs to check every room, but as usual I found nothing. No issues for years that I remember. And then fast forward to about age 22. SP is worse than ever, and at this point I cannot sleep without having the feeling that something's watching me. It's interesting to note that when I would go somewhere very far, like being deployed to other countries, I would be okay for about a month, and it would start again almost like it took a while to travel and find me. Then I started seeing things while not or not having been asleep. At one point, I can't remember if I'd fallen asleep or if I was in the process, but I looked up and saw the same girl as before from the Victorian house on my ceiling right above my bed. I jumped up and turned on the light and it was gone. After that incident, I never slept without a light on ever again, and it didn't really help. At the beginning of 2021, 27 at the time, I would try to fight my body to try to get it to move during SP more and more. After fighting it so much, I would start waking up without being able to move, but also hear loud ringing in my ears and feeling extra dizzy, almost like being hit by a stun grenade. I also started hearing noises of something being moved or manipulated, like someone touching or moving things. Some things would fall randomly, but not very often. I also bought a townhome, and I always heard loud walking and scratching in my upstairs crawlspace while completely awake. My girlfriend also hears it, and refuses to sleep upstairs when it happens. I went to check when she begged me to go look in the middle of the night, and there was nothing there. Not even a place an animal could get into. I also had an incident where my girlfriend was crying downstairs in the dark while visiting me. Her dog ran away back home, and she looked up to see what appeared to be me standing there by the stairs, shrouded in darkness. Not being able to see the front of the form due to the dark, she called out thinking it was me. There was no response, and when she wiped her tears and looked back, it was gone. Extremely Haunted Donut Shop To start off, I work at a donut shop that's open literally 24 hours a day. Everyone wonders why we're open so late, but homies need their donuts, so it is what it is. I'm lucky enough to work late night shifts, which I guess is prime time for paranormal activity. When I first got hired, I was pretty indifferent to the ideas of ghosts, spirits, demons. I'm a college student, so I have a lot more important things on my mind, like drowning my ass in debt or just having a good time. Right after I got hired, one of my friends who convinced me to get the job asked me what position I got hired for. When he found out it was for the late night shifts, my guy busts up laughing and says, Good luck, bro. Hope you know how to catch flying donut boxes. He's usually a bit of a clown, so I really didn't think anything of it. The first experience I had came on my first night. I was being trained on how to ring up orders correctly and navigate the menu system. It was around 2 a.m. at this point, and I really wasn't too busy, so my trainer felt like he could leave me on my own for a bit and to call him over if I ran into any trouble. I pulled out my phone and started to run my playlist, when all of a sudden, I felt a cold finger tap me just under my shoulder. This made me freak the hell out immediately for one reason. My back was to the glass used to separate the customers from the register, COVID, 
which means nobody could be standing there. I immediately turned around only to see nobody there, and I called over my trainer to explain what just happened. He just nodded and smiled before saying, Yep, welcome to the job, kid. Surprised it took this long for something to happen, honestly. The rest of my night was a tale of donut boxes constantly being thrown from shelves. Lights turned on and off, my phone battery draining from 70 to 5 in about 5 minutes, you name it. One of my most frightening experiences to date, though, involved me actually seeing something. One of my duties at my job is to check the bathrooms to make sure that they're clean and everything is in order. One of the nights I had to do this, my manager was with me. We began wiping down the sink when all of a sudden the door swung open. We both turned to look at the doorway and a huge guy walks in. He was probably close to six foot five or six foot six with a beard that would give Gandalf a run for his money. When he walked a little bit closer, the room just filled with the stench of rotten, sour ass. It smelled like someone went to Chipotle, ordered everything on the menu, and decided to unleash the depths of hell on our walls. This guy looked at me and asked if the bathroom is open to use. Me, assuming the man needed to unleash the contents of his pants, grabbed my things and walked out with my manager to let him do his thing. We both waited right outside the bathroom door for about five minutes before my manager suggested that we go check on him. When we walked back in, it was completely silent and the stall door was closed. My manager and I just looked at each other in confusion and decided to knock on the stall door. No answer. I pushed it a little bit and it was unlocked. Nobody was there. This guy was nowhere to be found and there's only one exit out of this bathroom. I can say for absolute certainty that he did not walk out of that bathroom. Obviously, there have been so many more experiences that have occurred, not only to me, but everyone who works there as well. I will say, though, it's a lot more fun to be sort of a veteran of this place watching the new hires get freaked out at the voices, flying donut boxes, and physical touches. Because now I've been through it all, and I've seen it all. Ask Reddit. My best friend of my whole life, and my only friend for a good chunk of my life, died about a week before we found out my then girlfriend was pregnant. I still hadn't graduated college due to a requirement that was overlooked by both myself and my counselor. I had started working full time to help take care of my son before he was born, so my days were pretty much non-stop. Wake up at 4.30 a.m., get to work by 5.30, work until noon or so, drive back home to shower really quick, leave for school, get to school, depending, maybe about 40 minutes or an hour later, go to class, leave school around 9 p.m., go home, do whatever homework, and then sleep. I did this for months, and one day I was hitting my limit. I was so tired. If I could only do one of these set of things, then I would just have so much more energy to hang out with my son, be a good boyfriend to my girlfriend, help out more around where we stayed. I worked Sunday through Thursday, and one Thursday, after I had come home and didn't have class afterwards, I was laying down with my son. I had homework due the next day, and I was about halfway done with it. I was lying there, eyes closed, no one in the room but my son and I. Then a steady series of very hard and loud taps on my window woke me from my quasi-sleep. Sometimes when my neighbors were watering some plants, they would hit my window with it, and it sounded almost like that. But the window was dry. I thought maybe it was my father-in-law knocking on my window to say hi to the baby. I opened the door from my room to see everybody else who lives in the house, just in the living room and dining room. So I closed the door again. 
right before the knocking, I said in my own head, Hey, V. My friend's name was Long, so I'm just going to call him V. I think I'm just going to drop out. Once I realized there was no one else, no other cause, I sighed and I just said, Message received, bro. Grabbed out my homework. That was it. The other takes place about a month or so after my son was born. Roughly ten months after my brother's death. I'm still reeling from it. And I'm reeling from being a father. I was randomly out of a park near my house. It was obviously my son's first birthday. He was stumbling around being one, whatever. To my right, I hear my brother's voice. Hey guys, sorry I'm late. My head shot over to the sound of him saying something, and there he was. I was so excited and shocked, I just went and tackled him straight to the ground, hugging him and crying. My mom, sister, and everyone else also came over to him. I was so happy that he wasn't dead. He wasn't dead. Then it hit me. The sky had no color. Everything felt washed in the brush of a dream. I stopped looked at him, and then I said, you died. Previously, he was laughing with everybody else. He tried ignoring me, like a dog that knows it's done something that it shouldn't. You died! The rest of the party stopped. You died, didn't you? He looked away from me, defeated. He said, yeah, and it hung in the air. My dream paused almost as if you could hit a stopwatch to reality. With everyone else frozen, he hugged me and said, I love you, man. Tell everyone else I love them too. He vanished, and I woke up crying. C-H-I strange creature encounter when I was a kid. We moved into this modular home. I think a trailer, but on an actual brick foundation, in a rural area in Virginia in the summer of 2004. It was me, my mom, my dad, my older sister, her husband, and their child, which is my niece. I stayed home a lot after school and on weekends due to everybody having to work and my niece going to the babysitter's house. It was never that big of a deal, because my grandma lived right across the driveway. We lived down a long gravel driveway that was cut off from the main road. I can't remember exactly when this occurred, but it was after my dad died, in April of 2005. I was home alone after school one day, watching The Weekenders on Toon Disney with my little... Peking's P uh, Pekingese poodle mix, his name was Clyde, in my lap while eating some pizza rolls. All of a sudden, our huge, and when I say huge, this dog had no business being as big as he was, considering what breed that he was mixed with, a golden lab boxer mix, Rudy, that we kept chained in the backyard, started to bark. Not as usual, hey, I'm out of water, or squirrel bark, but it was a violent, scary bark. I looked out the sliding glass door that goes to the backyard, and I see him at the end of his chain, trying to break loose and get at something in the woods. I can't really see what he's trying to get at, until all of a sudden some creature walks out of the woods and stops right at the tree line. It was about four feet tall, walked on all fours. Its body was similar to a bear. It had brown fur. But its face? That was its most distinct feature. It was solid white and completely flat. It had two black slits where its eyes would be. No kind of nose to be seen, and its mouth just hung open. A black void, no tongue or teeth that I could see from where I was. 
it looked in my direction. And I remember just being overcome with fear and dread when it looked over at me. I started to shake, I was so scared. Before I could even get off the couch to get to the landline to call my mom, it just slowly backed itself back into the woods. Rudy was barking and growling the entire time that it was standing there, which was about two minutes in total, and for at least ten minutes after it had left my sight, and that was before he finally calmed down. I called my mom, my sister, my B.I.L., my aunt and my uncle that lived behind my grandma, and then my grandma before somebody answered. She told me to walk over to it, but I was too scared to go outside, so she came and got me. As a kid, I called it the white-faced anteater, and my family just dismissed me as seeing things, even though my dog had seen it too and was trying to get to it. My uncle told me it was probably a big-ass possum, but I knew damn well what a possum looked like, and that definitely wasn't it. To this day, I'm 23 now, I still have nightmares where all I see is this thing standing in my yard at the tree line staring at me. I always wake up screaming and sweating, and my girlfriend has to come console me. Has anyone else ever seen or heard of anything similar to what it is that I'm trying to describe? The Bone Pit. It was in the country, a small village, and the house was on a council estate. We had a row of garages behind our garden, where people on the estate could park their cars, with a few little secretive cubby holes and dens that were hidden by trees and thickets, a kid's dream. The very end garage owned by a local creepy bloke, and it had been vandalized. Somebody had spray-painted Red Rum Believe It onto his garage door. I never knew what Red Rum meant back then. One warm day, about a year after moving in, we were all eleven and my sister six, a small group of us consisting of me, my sister, my best friend Gemma, next-door neighbor Kiri and her cousin Michael were hanging out in one of our dens, shaded by trees just mucking around as kids do beside the vandalized garage. Michael, being a bit of a class clown, was just stood up doing an impression of one of our more larger teachers at school. My attention was drawn to the ground where he was standing. The solid, smooth dirt appeared to be moving like fluid. It looked like it was rippling like water. It was the strangest thing. I think it was only me that saw this, none of the others. At least none of the others confirmed what I was witnessing anyway. What came out of my mouth next was even stranger. We need to dig there, I told them. I couldn't explain what was compelling me to say this. Something's under there. I continued. They all just looked at me and just started asking why. I couldn't give them an answer. Besides, we just need to. Something is buried there. I think boredom and just looking for adventure convinced my friends and my sister. They just went along with me, so we found sticks. I had my sister go and pinch two spoons from our house, which was only yards away. We began digging in silence. This little circle of mud. They must have thought I was mad. I couldn't explain it. I just knew that there was something under there. Kiri stops because she's dislodged something hard a few inches long. We scrape the dirt off with one of the spoons. We can see it's a bone. One end is all sharp and jagged like it's been snapped. We look at each other a bit spooked but decide to keep digging to look for more. It's probably an animal bone, Michael tells us but this weird feeling had come over our little group. Finding more bones the deeper that we go and collect this little morbid pile and start digging a wider circle. But our friends start to dry up. I 
think there was about 15 bones, roughly. Some were a fair size, others small and broken. We gathered them up, and I remember putting them in a sandwich bag and taking them to school the following Monday. I plonked them on the teacher's desk and informed her that we had found all these bones near my house. I will always remember her face. Like, are these kids for real? Get these gross bones off my desk. She told us that they were probably just animal bones and to put them under her desk. I'm sure they probably went in a bin after we left that day. That's probably all they were. But I think it's curious that if I hadn't seen the ground moving like that, that we never would have found them. And the fact it was next to the creep's garage didn't help. I only learned a couple of years later that red rum was murder backwards. A bit slow to catch on. I know, but it does make me wonder if someone knew something about him. We never heard any more about it. Little did I know it was the start of something far more terrifying and long-lasting. Just wanted to put this out there. This was about a decade ago when I was a teen. We moved into a trailer out in the backwoods. It had a big tree in the front yard and a crawl space. There was a frequent sound that we would hear from the tree that sounded like rope stretching. It's the only way I could describe the sound. You could hear strange footsteps even when you were alone and we could see things moving and even thrown around. These were just the normal things in that home. There were bigger events that I would find notable, the first one being when I heard tapping slowly building up all around the trailer, and eventually the roof, and then you could hear goats, despite there being only cows. I eventually started praying until there was a loud sound, and then silence. The next event, which wasn't that big, was weird. It was a picture that my sister took. Everything seemed fine, except we noticed two faces behind my sister, about a foot and a half from the floor. The faces were very distinct and full of details. My sister had a flip thrown around this time, and fortunately the picture was stuck on there. But it creeped out my skeptical parents. Another big event was when my ex was with us for the night. My mom thought she saw her crouched on the couch and was silently moving towards my mom. She saw this feminine shadow shape and then she looked to the other side of the room and saw my ex asleep. She only spoke of it one time and still doesn't like to talk about it. After this, I saw a large shadow and a very distinct person walking through the reflection in the two large mirrors in the living room. The mirror rippled like water as it was walking. Another event. My baby sister began talking to a kitty who sleeps underneath my parents' bed. It seemed like an imaginary friend at first. She said that it was all black with red eyes and had sharp fingers. He would walk up the walls like a spider, and during the day he would sleep in the crawl space. One day, she said, Kitty's awake now. And the crawl space door began opening and slamming loudly while her dog began barking furiously. This also seemed to line up with the weird scratches that we were all getting at night. Another event is tied to a weird pattern that slowly emerged. Through the two years there, we were all getting angrier and psychologically worse. It culminated in my dad cheating on my mom with somebody a little too young. And he left. This led to great depression for everyone. Eventually, my mom said that we would have to move, despite me graduating in a couple of months. As we were packing, I saw a broken mirror in my sister's closet with bloody letters, non-Latin based on the lettering. 
on them, I heard very heavy stomping, chasing, chasing in my direction with some more slamming on the walls. I turned off the last light and locked the door, and that was the last time I stayed there. I left a note in my room for any family unfortunate enough to move in, but I have no idea what happened to the home to be like that. I know a thief lived there and was shot dead by the police. Not far from the home, but that's all I could find on the place. I just wanted to share my experience because it feels weird keeping it bottled up. What are your thoughts on that home? The little girl that took my hand and led me into the woods to show me where she laid down and died. This is a story about my mom's house. Her and my stepfather, we'll call him P, have been married for almost 15 years. I'm going to call him Peter. Peter is a fifth generation of his family to live on this inherited 150-acre property in a small rural town. He inherited a farmhouse that was so old it was deemed unlivable so they tore it down, buried most of it, and put a modular home on the property. Before Peter married my mom, he lived in an old farmhouse with an ex-wife that we'll call B. I'm going to call her Brenda. Brenda thought the property and the house was extremely haunted, and Peter didn't disagree. They decided to bring a psychic in to do an investigation, and she said that they were very many spirits, but that they were all good. Shortly after, at around 3 a.m., Peter's awakened by a light turning on outside his bedroom window. Living in the middle of nowhere, there was no reason for a light to turn on like that. He looked out the window and saw a little girl standing there. Brenda woke up and looked out the window and saw her too. But then they smelled smoke. They went downstairs to see if their kitchen had caught on fire. Everything in that kitchen burned except for these Christmas wax figures of Mary, Jesus, and Joseph. Peter still has them in the shadow box placed in the kitchen that he has now. They're lucky they didn't lose the whole house. Fast forward to a long time later. My mom and Peter get married and are living happily ever after and I'm living underneath the same roof of my early teen years. I loved living there. There was so much property to explore, but I remember this one part in the woods gave me the heebie-jeebies. It made me feel so overwhelmingly uncomfortable with so many bad vibes. One night I fell asleep, and I remember having a really weird dream. In my dream, it was very early in the morning. The crack of dawn... I get up and I go out my back door, and I remember the sky being a dark bluish gray, and the air felt refreshingly cool on my skin. A little girl, who couldn't be any older than seven, walks all from the woods up to the yard and onto the back deck. She has very pale skin, light blonde hair, and light colored clothing. She looks at me and smiles. I think to myself about how sweet, warm, and friendly she was. She doesn't say anything, but she holds her hand out and gestures to me to come with her, so I take her hand. We walk and walk for what feels like an eternity. Along the way, we pass many ghosts, but they aren't bothering anybody, and they're just there observing. The little girl led me to a spot in the woods that had always made me uncomfortable. Suddenly, the weather turns from summer to winter, from morning to evening. It was freezing. I'm amazed by how beautiful the scenery is, but I then realize the little girl wasn't holding my hand anymore. I look around and I see her body laying dull, limp, lifeless in a shallow creek. Her skin had turned blue and she was curled up like a ball. I had screamed and cried for help at the top of my lungs, but nobody heard me and nobody came. I then woke up. The dream really bothered me freaked my parents out very bad. I decided that I needed to do research and found that about 50 years prior, 
a young girl a mile and a half down the road disappeared. But nobody knew where she went. I asked Peter since he lived on this road his entire life, and he confirmed it. Was an atheist before this. I'm a 49-year-old male. By the time I had reached my early 20s, I was of the opinion that there was nothing to life but what you could see or touch and nothing else. If you're reading this, then you know that there's basically no longer the case for this. I guess the best way to start would be to tell you about a friend that I had in high school. His name was Todd. I had met him through another guy that I had known since sixth grade. Todd was just a really good guy, always upbeat, loyal, just a solid person. Looking back on it, it's probably the most genuine human being I would ever met, including all the way up until now. We were around the same age, and when I was around 19, it had been a while since I had seen him, and our mutual friend calls me and tells me Todd's house had caught on fire and he had died trying to save his younger siblings during the fire. I can't remember exactly, but I know he made several trips in the house saving at least two of his siblings, and went in again and the roof collapsed on him, and another one just five feet from the door killing them both. Just a horrible thing, couldn't believe it. It was the first person other than the elderly family member that I knew who passed. Fast forward four to five years and I'm in my car heading to a friend's house. They lived in the same neighborhood where all this happened. I may be a mile or so away from where I'm headed, and about a hundred yards or a little more ahead of me, walking towards me, there's a guy in jeans and a dark, kind of, dark goody hands in the goody pocket, and his head down like looked at the ground as he was walking. For one, this is how I remember Todd. Seems like I always remember him wearing jeans and a hoodie, and maybe a jean jacket. Narrator correction, it was not goody, even though it says goody, it was hoodie. Much more sense. Seems like I always remembered him wearing jeans and a hoodie, and maybe a jean jacket. What really caught my eye was his gait. I think Todd had one leg a little bit longer than the other one. Or something that he just maybe had sort of a limp. He could have picked him out of a crowd just by his walk. It was that unique. So as we're getting closer to each other, I just feel something is not right. Or just off. I can't really put my finger on it, but as I get to him, I slow down and stop right next to him. And he stops as well. As we both come to a stop, he raises his head and looks right at me. We were just about ten feet apart. One lane of the two-lane road anyway, when he looks at me. It's him, and his face is glowing the most brilliant green you could imagine. We look at each other for maybe four to five seconds, it seems like. And he had this calm, peaceful look on his face. I think I was in shock, I guess, I don't know. But I let my foot off the brake and coasted probably 30 or 40 feet down the road and stopped again. But I was too scared. I guess that's the word looking back, so I sat there for a few seconds and just pulled off and went to where it was going. I hear people sort of talking the colors in heaven being so much brighter or just more beautiful than colors here. And while explaining rides, I just think I get it. I think that's where this green was from. About a week before this happened, I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine. I explained to him that I was an atheist. True believer, Todd was on that road that day to let me know that there was something else. More to life than what we normally see. It changed my whole outlook on life in a split second. I think a haunted doll spoke my name to me. Summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha. 
with the main purpose of visiting the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic, and thought it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them. But walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness and families associated with many of these items, it was very heart-opening, for lack of a better way to word it. Some items I felt were very creepy, and that's where people associated the haunting was coming from when people owned them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just being afraid of an object. Same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grieve so hard they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but really made me feel a great connection to the people I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box was not giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We weren't angry nor disappointed. It was sort of a neat if we heard something, but understandable if we don't sort of a thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of items in there couldn't be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just typing her name, I'm not lying. And she lives in a chicken wire cage towards the back of the first floor of the museum. She's scary looking. Not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her. And this is in the building of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional. Though maybe they put her in the cage to sort of raise your apprehension. There's a sign above her. And it says if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye which of course you should do with any spirit, but Demas is apparently particularly malicious. I'm a pretty bold soul, so as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello, Demas, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask. Are you okay? And without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda. Extremely clear. My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. It said your name. I said above that, I'm brave, but I immediately filled with a sense of dread. Something about it saying my name and that we'd gotten absolutely nothing else out of that box the whole time was terrifying. And I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation. I just said, goodbye, Demas, and ushered my boyfriend away from her because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now, I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her and saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent-seeming photographs. That doll is the only item I've ever encountered that I am sure, 100% sure, is haunted, and maybe even malicious. Why am I being visited? Who are they? Since my childhood, I have had recurring and vivid dreams that I initially thought were just dreams. In these dreams, I encounter three silhouetted figures dressed in Native American outfits, each adorned differently. The one in the middle carries a staff, the one on the right holds an orb item, and the one on the left is empty-handed. Their faces remain obscured, appearing only as blurry shadows. These figures would come to my bedside 
and simply stare at me without evoking any fear or other emotions. Despite experiencing these dreams frequently, I never shared them with anyone due to the fear of being misunderstood. As I grew older during my high school years, I became curious, and I was determined to figure out whether these experiences were truly dreams or something else. I experimented by moving objects around me before waking up, hoping to observe if they would be remaining in their new positions. However, every time I attempted to reach out to the figures, they would step back and I would fall into a state of exhaustion leading to sleep. Now, as a 29-year-old adult with a healthy medical history and a flawless psychological record, essential for my job at the series field, which requires several months of evaluations before I could be employed, I finally mustered the courage to share these experiences with my mom while visiting my hometown. To my surprise, she was left speechless, getting goosebumps in response to my account. She then shared a fascinating story from our family's past. My family hails from Mexico, and I'm a first-generation U.S. citizen. My mom grew up in a poor village near Mexico City, where access to electricity and technology was limited. One night, my grandpa woke up agitated, cursing and screaming, demanding to know who the four silhouettes dressed in Native American outfits were and what they wanted from him. In response to his chaos, my mom and her eight siblings rushed to the living room, witnessing his distress. Grandpa described the figures as four silhouettes, one with a staff and two with orbs and one of them empty-handed. All dressed in the same Native American attire. Interestingly, he expressed that he felt peacefulness despite the encounter, a sentiment that resonates with my own experiences. Grandpa revealed that he had seen these figures since he was a child. Remarkably, my mom has never shared this information with me before. He was puzzled as to why the figures appeared as Native Americans, since the Aztecs were predominant in that region of Mexico. Considering our diverse ancestry with the Spanish, French, and Native Mexican Aztec roots, there seems to be no immediate explanation for the connection. To add a curious twist to the story, my parents moved to the U.S. in the 90s, where I was born. Remarkably, the same day I came into this world was a few hours after my grandpa passed away from a heart attack. While I understand that this tale may be difficult to believe for some, I'm genuinely curious about the meaning of these experiences. I was visited by an angel during my lowest moment. Over the summer of 2021, I was visited by an angel named Tibri. I know how this sounds, but I need to document this on the web in case anybody else ever comes across a similar situation. I was driving to meet up with my friend and go and have as much fun as we could in New York during peak COVID restriction times. I was depressed, driving and listening to all my favorite sad songs on my way to hang out with my friend. I park up around the corner of his house and just start crying, thinking about my future with school and my business that I'm launching this year. I light up a cigarette, and a few seconds later, after me begging God for an answer and crying about my future, out of the corner of my left eye, a random guy, who looks like a Greek god with golden, blonde, straight, dread-like hair, like Zeus, appears next to my car on the sidewalk. It's a one-way. He had a golden aura surrounding him, as if he was going Super Saiyan from Dragon Ball Z, but very light. I could not tell you for two billion dollars whether he was white or Mediterranean or what, 
but he looked like an actual representation of what churches make gods look like in their art. Even down to the halo part around the whole head. He walks up to me in a very casual New York kind of shit, kind of way, Queens. As I'm crying, he asks, this is the angel speaking, I got bud if you need. Me. Nah, bro, I'm good, I appreciate you. He starts walking away and comes back once more asking, You sure, bro? Take my number down, I'm always around here. And for some reason I responded, You know what? Yeah, man, you seem cool. I've been just been going through a lot. He goes, You shouldn't be sad. Everything's gonna be okay, you got this. I got goosebumps. I asked the angel for his name as he's giving me his number and he says, Tibri. I texted the number saying my name, nice to meet you, bro. And he walks away and responds exactly three seconds later. You too, my brother, I will see you soon. And walks to the corner of the block. Less than 15 yards. An immense light just shines down this one-way street and he disappears. I turn my car on, drive to the intersection. And there's only three places he could have gone. Straight, left, or right. He went none of the above. He vanished. In less than ten seconds, this man was gone, and he walked to the corner. His phone number no longer works. Goes straight to, we're sorry, this number has beep, beep, beep. Some of you may laugh, but I feel like if an angel were to ever approach you and send you a message, what's the best way you think that they could do that that won't make it too obvious? For me, being raised in New York, you always got someone trying to sell you weed and they take your number down, so I'm used to it. So instead of an angel coming down with its wings out and an obvious halo, what if they just pop out as a regular customer at your job? Or just someone that you let cross the street even when you have a green light? Or that homeless person who truly wants something to eat? What if that's why we're told to love each other equally? Because you never know who you might really be talking to. For all we know, this reality is all a test, and you need to pass the test by shedding kindness onto every soul you meet. If I caught my angel slipping, just know Tibri, I'm gonna make fun of you for eternity. I saw a spirit when I was younger, and other members of my family saw him too, at different times. When I was about 11 years old, I was staying at my grandma's house. I need to explain quickly the distribution of the house so you'll get the story. There were three rooms on the second floor. Two bedrooms were next to each other, my uncle's and mine, and at the other side, my grandma's. I used to sleep with my door open. I don't know why, but big mistake. One night, I woke up after midnight. Literally, I could see from my bed directly to the stairs, and thanks to the moonlight, it was a bit illuminated. I opened my eyes and I saw this figure, a bold man in a black suit just looking at me from the stairs. It was the most heavy shit feeling I've ever had in my life. Until now that I'm 27, I get chills only for remembering it. I closed my eyes and covered just my whole body in blankets, scared as fuck. Then I had the brightest idea to uncover and check. That man was at my door, just standing and watching me. In that moment, I just basically jumped from the bed and ran to my grandma's room. I tried to wake her up, but she didn't. I swear, I cried, I screamed like hell, I even moved her. I thought that spirit killed her or something. She used to have one of those alarm clocks that had the red lights, and it was making a 4 a.m. beeping sound, and it just, that was the last thing that I remember from that night. Now the weirdest thing. I'm pretty sure I was awake. I don't lie with this stuff because I've always had creepy things going on. But what I'm about to tell you is the most chilling part of this. 
Some years ago, I was already like 22. We had a family dinner and my aunt came to visit. She also lived in my grandma's house, but she left when she got married. I decided to tell them a ghost story. I always thought that what happened to me was kind of an astral trip. You know, when you leave your body. Destoblamiento in Spanish. And that was my own explanation of why my grandma couldn't hear me when I tried to wake her up that night. And that's also possibly why I could see that man. After I told the story, my aunt looked at me and told me that she'd also seen that man. In the same house and gave the exact same description as mine. Literally, my eyes started watering out of fear and started laughing nervously. We decided to call my uncle, who lives in Argentina, and ask him if he'd seen anything at that house. We just asked about ghosts in general at the house. So he answered. Yes, once I saw a man dressed in black at the common room downstairs, bold and just existing there. He was the third person that saw the exact same thing, and that's what I consider to be the proof of this spirit's existence. I don't know if he was a good or bad spirit, but he was creepy. He looked like Voldemort in terms of skin color, so you have an idea of how pale that he was. The suit was all black up to his neck, and his eyes were just opened, not blinking, just staring directly. I even asked my grandma about it. She told me that she remembers that once she was in the kitchen downstairs and the microwave just turned on, but that's it. This, this is pretty much the story I consider to be my worst. Mostly because this one I saw and somebody else also saw too and it's confirmed. We all saw that thing at different times in our lives. And we were all pretty serious about it too. Ask Reddit. This story is from a childhood friend who told me this, and it still unnerves me to this day. She was genuinely freaked out, and her family even backed up her claims. So here goes. Basically, my friend and her family moved into this rental property, which my friend said was haunted. It gave everyone an off feeling. Those who visited or stayed over would mention it for sure. I myself experienced this odd feeling of foreboding whenever I went over there and believed in the, let's just say, consensus that the house was haunted. It honestly felt oppressive in that house and you would feel this pitiful dread that was hard to compute into words and was extremely uncomfortable to experience to say the least. Anyway, this particular inexplicable event, that is the basis of this post, was enough for my friend's family to pack up and stay with relatives until they moved out permanently. On this fateful afternoon, my friend had arrived back home from the park and heard an argument taking place in the kitchen between her mom and dad. My friend thought this was odd, as both her parents should be at work, so she called out, Mom before unlocking the front door and going inside. My friend said the house fell instantly silent. An uncanny silence like all the air had been sucked out of the place and felt stifling and wrong. Then her mom says, Hey, we're just in here. My friend was just outside the closed kitchen door at this point and froze beyond opening. It was her mother's voice, but there was something off, like the cadence was missing, that made it her mother. It sounded flat and unnatural. My friend decided to bolt back out the front door and wait outside until her brother came home, but she said as she turned back to the house, she saw her mother peering at her from the lounge room window. But it wasn't her mother. The face was the same. Everything was the same but her face was devoid of anything that made it her mother. There was no recognition on her mother's face, 
There was no indication that she was looking directly at her daughter. There was no emotion in the expression. Nothing. The eyes looked unstaring and utterly blank. My friend screamed and ran down the street to her mother's work and confirmed that she was there all this time and had never been home. Initially, my friend's mother reasoned that someone must have broke in. But a later investigation proved nothing had been stolen and the back door was locked, as was the front door when my friend came home. No one could rationalize who my friend saw in that window and why it looked so much like her mother, but not fully human. So that was the deciding factor to nope the fuck out of there and find somewhere else to live. The landlord of the house denied anything like this happened when they lived there, but did admit tenants didn't stay long, saying that there was something quote-unquote wrong in the house. My friend also told me that she was the only one who actually saw anything definitively sinister in the house. But her family said they definitely felt an evil presence there, which ultimately manifested into the doppelganger experience my friend had. Utterly terrifying. The Fleeing Light in the Woods First off, I've never really had anything paranormal happen to me. And I've had a relatively short life so far, 25 years. Being a scientist never really made much sense to believe in something that can't be proven. However, that's all changed that one night. About four years ago, I was attending a college in southern Arkansas and I was getting my bachelor's in biology. My then girlfriend, and I didn't have much money, so we shared on-campus apartments so our scholarships would cover the rent. This complex was on the outskirts of the campus, right next to a rather large pine forest that some people went to smoke in, but you could always hear them. In between the forest and our apartment was a dirt parking lot. Our apartment sat on the first floor of the complex, on the side closest to the tree line. We came back to the apartment after grocery shopping one night. After bringing all the groceries in, I decided to sit out on the patio, looking at the forest and the night sky. It was a nice spring Arkansas night, with not a cloud in the sky. So this didn't surprise my girlfriend. She went inside and I sat down. As I'm listening to the whippoorwills, excuse my pronunciation, I notice a green light coming from just behind the tree line. It was blinking relatively slow and looked as if it was around somebody's neck and that thing was digging. Not digging with a shovel, but more animalistic, like a wild boar digging for grubs kind of digging. It was making no sounds and seemed to be minding its own kind of business. As I'm watching this thing very intently, a car pulls into the parking lot, briefly flashing its headlights over the light. At this point, the light stood up, turned solid red, and darted in a straight line through the trees away from the car. Not like a deer running through the trees, mind you, but straight without moving. I estimated that it probably moved at about 40 or 45 miles an hour. Needless to say, I did not sleep that night. The next day I got up early and went to go investigate where the light was. There was a small opening next to a creek where I estimated the light was coming from. However, there was no signs of digging or tracks of any kind. I walked in the direction of the light where it had flood to. The clearing quickly went back to being a thick sort of understory made of lots of shrubs and oak and greenbriar and limbs. I could barely walk through without getting cut up, and I certainly couldn't walk in a straight line. I did not know what I saw that night. I've certainly never heard of anything like this, and I've never seen that light again. I talked to some of the wildlife management friends to see if they had tagged some animals with an LED collar or tag or something that looked at me like I was crazy. 
Doing so would make no sense and would reduce the survival of the animal. So what was it? An extraterrestrial? A lost spirit? A person? Or an animal? I guess I won't ever really know for certain. Since then, I've seen many other paranormal things. I've stayed in cabins where the chairs moved by themselves. I've witnessed green orbs from the sky crashing into the earth. I've witnessed spirits vocalize and speak out possessions my friends have taken from them. It all started after seeing that light. Drunk, so telling my tale. This was around five or six years ago. I'd say I was a skeptic, but not adverse to the idea of ghosts. I worked in a nursery, kids, not plants, and the building itself used to be a hospital for tuberculosis. The baby side of the nursery was in the old morgue for the hospital, not my side. I'd never heard anything in that building, in the nursery, but numerous girls, staff, had said that they had seen a woman walking around the baby's nap room in the old morgue. But when they ran in, it was always empty. It had a video monitor so they would see her on the back and white screen. Black and white screen, excuse me. The older kids were in the old hospital. Anyways, I'd covered many times in this old morgue, and I'd worked in the old hospital side for three years without any incident or hearing of any incident. One night, though, when I'd moved to the office, not working with the kids anymore, I had a few things to finish up when the nursery was closing, so I spoke to the manager and got their keys so I could close. The owner lived in a house right behind the nursery, and there were houses all around. Also, again, I had worked there three years and was often the first person to arrive in the morning. So when I decided to close, I was not worried. It was also Scotland in the summer, so even though it was six at night, it was very bright outside. It was about 6.30 when I finished what I was doing, and I was in no rush. I was in a great mood because I had managed to finish something so important, so I was kind of swanning around the building. At the last one, I had to check every room to make sure that there were no kids or fire hazards. And as I was checking a room at the back with the glass, a perpix, just kind of walking, looking into the entrance, I saw a tall man dressed in dark clothes walk, and walk into the front door. I ran to the entrance to tell them all the kids were gone already and to check the other building, but no one was there. Very strange, but I figured I must have imagined it, because I was looking from the other side of the building. So I cracked on with checking rooms. I got to the next room, and I had a panicked feeling telling me to get out, run as fast as I could and not look back. I have anxiety, but I've never experienced anything like this. It was like a serial killer was chasing you. As soon as I got outside the door, I felt a wave of calm over me. I locked the door and cycled away. I actually met one of my colleagues just driving away. That's how quick I had been. Anyway, the next morning, I told the manager basically said I wouldn't close again, and I wouldn't want anyone else doing it on their own. That's when the girl who had been doing it for months said that she had seen the figure, the same as I had seen. Every night, either the door or the preschool, and she always felt that it meant her harm. She needed a pay increase with closing, and she was very level-headed. Just like me, we actually worked in the same room and got on for that reason and didn't want to think about it too much, but she did what she had to do, and get out of there as soon as possible. During the day, we had no problems at all, so we thought that maybe the entity was fine with day-to-day -day business, but once it was done, they wanted us out of there. Either way, that feeling and the clearness with it that I saw that man has made me seriously rethink ghosts. Not even sure if that's what it was, but honestly, that feeling was unlike anything I've ever felt before or since. Pure hatred in your heart. Mm. 
My black cat is the weirdest thing that ever happened to me. Back in 2011, I was having a really bad time health-wise. For the year before that year, and the one after, my lungs filled up with fluid as soon as the cold weather hit, and I was in the hospital for at least 10 days at a time. 2011 was the worst. For reasons yet unknown to me, the specialist in charge of my care incorrectly diagnosed me with tuberculosis and gave me drugs that would either kill or cure me. It nearly killed me. It reacted poorly with my diabetes, and the lung specialist was a douchebag who didn't care if I was throwing up for three days straight. I almost died from ketoacidosis, and I was in the ICU for three days. In hospital for 13. I also had a gnarly near-death experience, but that's another story. While I was in the ICU, passing in and out of consciousness, and completely unaware of the passage of time, I hallucinated a cat. I would be on the edge of sleep, and something would jump up on the bed with me, chirp and curl up so I could feel warmth and purring. Sometimes he would deed my leg through the sheets, waking me up. I saw him come into the room only once. He was a big, black, long-haired tomcat with an aggressively cheerful disposition and huge yellow eyes, such that I nicknamed him Lambert in my head. I even asked the nurses about him. Half out of my skin as I was, and that was when I realized that he wasn't a real animal. I made him a promise in my head all the same. He had kept me going by letting me think there was one creature there with me 24-7, keeping me tethered to life. So if we met again, I would return the favor and look after him, however I could. Fast forward eight years to 2019. My childhood cat Lupin had finally succumbed to old age. She was born in 2000. And to try and deal with the grief, I was on Facebook scrolling through local cat sanctuaries and rescuers. And who should I see but a five-month-old kitten who was the exact match to the hallucination, spirit, dream, whatever, that had been keeping me wanting to stay alive back then? I was sure the moment I saw him, and I was even more sure when we went to go meet him at the shelter, and I saw the same white freckles on his shoulders... I had had less than inches from my spate, or, excuse me, that I had had inches from my face as I drifted, and he purred in that hospital bed. Mom vetoed the idea of Lambert, so we called him Jet. He had chronic anxiety issues and no food security from being on the street for his first three months. And it kept me on my goddamn toes while I was getting over the death of my best friend. But he's got the softest fur ever, and he's a chronic cuddler, and I owe him a lot. He still chirps when he jumps up on my bed. Not exactly a gold star believer. My philosophy is weird shit happens, but I'm inclined to look for the logical explanations first. I know I was super sick and my brain was throwing up all kinds of nonsense. I know that eight years is a long time for memory and a change, especially of such a blurry and confused period. But emotionally, I can't shake that feeling that I met this cat nearly a decade before he was even born. Vampire Woman When I was a boy around six or seven, I lived with my parents and my younger brothers in this one-bedroom apartment in Pasadena, California. My brothers and I had the bedroom, and my parents would sleep on a fold-out couch in the living room. One night from seemingly out of nowhere, I began having these dreams. A woman would come to my window, I slept on the top bunk bed, and open my screen and turn me over to face her. She never said who she was, but I remember her being in maybe her early 20s. Really blonde, fine hair, and a very pale complexion. She had elongated teeth where the canines would be. I was instantly petrified. 
she would speak to me and ask me questions. I never answered, but she kept talking to me anyway. She told me to call her the scary head. She would eventually leave and would roll over and sleep, and I would just wake up in the morning. I told my parents about my dream, but when you're that young and have an imagination, all kinds of things are sort of just played down to, oh, you must have just watched a scary movie or stuff like that. Every night for a week, this woman would come to my window at night to visit me. It was horrifying each and every time. I would try to stay up and beg my parents not to send me to bed, but parents versus kids, parents usually won. The very last time I saw her, maybe the sixth or seventh night, she appeared to me again, but this time she wasn't alone. She had another woman with her, probably about the same age, but this one had long dark hair that was put in kind of like a stylized bun or something. She had a striped shirt on, with a jean jacket and a jean shirt. She was smoking a cigarette and had on thick sunglasses, even though it was like 2 a.m. She stood in the background and never spoke to me. After that night, the visit stopped. I never saw her again. I was pretty relieved. I went back to being just a normal kid and totally forgot about all of it. Then one night, a few weeks later, I have the same dream. This time, someone wearing a mask that sort of resembles Swamp Thing. It looked like a mask from what I remember. So it comes to my window and turned me to face them. This person, thing, whatever, told me that they are really the scary head and that they had scared the women off. They told me this woman wanted to be with me and that's why she kept coming back to see me, but that this head would keep me safe. Despite the appearance of the face and the mask, I was not afraid and I felt a strange sense of comfort. After that, they left and that was it. I never had another dream with any of them. The following morning, my dad was up early to do some work around the front of the apartment. He found the screen that covers my window pulled off and laid against the side of the building. I don't know what the dreams were really meaning or if they were even dreams at all. If this woman was real, then why was she coming to the window of a seven-year-old boy to terrify him every night for a week? One or two nights? Sure. Asshole teenager having a laugh, whatever. But this woman, I'm 35 years old now, and I've never, ever forgotten her face. The way her teeth looked, or how pale she was, or how she was totally absent of any color. And with my dad finding the screen, I was never really able to get any answers, but that experience definitely stuck with me. I don't know what I saw, but I thought I was going to die. Last night I was with my partner and our friend, and we were at a place called the Rafe Chasm. It's in Gloucester, Massachusetts. We got there at about 10 p.m. and we were just going to have a fire out by the rocks in the water. We had to walk through some wooded area to get to the rocks. And as we pulled up to the area, I had a bad feeling for some reason. And usually I trust my intuition, but I told myself I was just psyching myself out. Once we got to the spot, I immediately felt a weird feeling. But again, I told myself I was just making things up. Even so, I didn't turn my back to the open space. And I was turned facing towards the woods and rock area. As the people I were with watched the fire, I stared out into the darkness, feeling like something was watching us. I decided to go to a rock further away from the fire so my eyes could adjust to the darkness. And lo and behold, I see a translucent white figure about 50 feet away from us on top of the rocks. On the other side of the area, pretty high up, it was moving back and forth, and it looked about five or six feet tall. It started to scale down the rocks, and when I say scale, 
I mean fast, like faster than humanly possible. And as it's doing that, it gets smaller and turns into the shape of an animal, like a coyote or a wolf. Shapeshifters usually take forms of things like these. I say out loud, Is that an animal? And my partner looks over and immediately gets super sketched out, just as I was. The other person that we were with wasn't bothered for some reason. He said he saw it, but in the moment he was trying to convince us that it was a person, he was drunk. As I see it coming towards us, I get absolutely horrified that it's going to kill us. I tried to go up higher on the rocks to get away from it. I literally thought that was it. Thought I was going to die. I had the most horrifying feeling and it was genuinely the scariest, most terrifying thing I'd ever felt or seen. I pulled out my phone and shined my flashlight on it to make sure I'm not tripping and I think that I deterred whatever it was away from us because it ended up running into the woods and disappearing. My partner and I were completely horrified and my legs were violently shaking. I said that we need to leave immediately. The friend that we were with wanted to stay and finish his drink, but we wanted to go. He told us that he would prove that it was a human by trying to run down the rocks as fast as he could to prove that a human could be going that fast. But when he did, we couldn't hear him running around. And that's the scary part about what we saw. It was completely silent as it went down the rocks and back up them. We weren't able to process what had happened until we had gotten home after we dropped our friend off. When we did, we decided to do some research about ski walkers and the area that we were in. That's the end of today's selection of stories. That was an interesting read, and I was not ready for the Dungeons and Dragons accent there. Hope you guys have a great night. See ya. I need help possibly identifying this creature I saw. My family is pretty abnormal, I'd say. Either that or gifted. We see lots of things that people would probably call us schizophrenic or crazy for. Hence why I don't share these things with people outside of my family or inner circle. And normally when I do have other people with me, they can see these things too. My mother and stepdad had recently finished building their house, and when I was about nine or ten years old, it was kind of in the middle of nowhere. It actually was right next to a prison as well as a military facility. My brother and I all got to pick our new rooms, and I chose the room with the windows facing the front of the house. Since the house was brand new, we hadn't had any blinds installed yet. Really, the only furniture that the house consisted of was our beds and a couch in the living room. Before I experience these abnormal paranormal things, I always get chills down my spine. I can sense it before it happens. And it's as if the hairs on my neck perch up, and I can feel the direction the energy is coming from. I believe it was the first night of our stay there. I had my bed right next to the window. I was struggling to fall asleep. So I just stared outside at the single street lamp right next to our driveway. I instantly felt sick, nauseous, and just overall icky. Something was going to happen, and I was sensing it and I just couldn't look away. I have a bad habit of just staring directly into the direction that the energy is located. As I was staring, I saw this large humanistic creature thing. It was terribly skinny and freakishly tall. My heart just stopped. I've seen many freaky things before, but not like this. It's so tall just slightly shorter than the street lamp. 
with long, skinny arms that dragged behind it as it slowly limps across. God, I was so frightened that I was frozen. I probably was holding my breath from the fear, and it just encapsulated me. As I see it limp across my yard, it crosses that street lamp. It illuminates all of its features. It's just disgusting and horrifying. It has no hair. It's fleshy. It's tall and skinny. Its features and its face are sunken in, yet it has no eyes or lips. Its legs are slightly bent as its arms drag behind it. It's so vivid in my memory even now. I remember every detail, and I'm 18 years old. Anyways, I just stare at it in complete fear as it crosses slowly. And after it passes, after it passed that light, it just vanishes. I ran into my older brother's room after that and I just slept on his floor. Let's just say I basically stayed up the whole night making sure whatever that was didn't come in. The energy just located in that area in general was terrible. I never left that house at night alone unless someone was watching me. Weird Experience This is the weird shit. So four years ago, I didn't have a very good home life. My mom used to be an alcoholic, and had moved around my whole life from place to place, so I never really had any childhood friends to spend the night or lean on, really. I used to stay at my friend's place after school and ask to stay until dinner mainly because I didn't want to eat all their food out of respect for being the nicest people that I knew. I also kn knew that entire apartment property. This night was going back home and I just felt off and different. From the moment of going up the stairs, I was on alert, taking mental notes of everything that I was doing, from how I was walking up the stairs to locking the door when coming in. I locked both lock deadbolts and at the top lock, and I always remembered, because I had a fear of my dad stumbling in the house drunk randomly and harming us. I remember seeing a couple of six-packs in my mom. Knowing that she was drunk and almost passed out, I went into my room too, figuring I would just play some games. Just one problem. There was a giant-ass thunderstorm that had only gotten worse since staying at my friend's place. I didn't want to fuck up my PS4 if the power went out, so I instead laid down on my bed and scrolled through Snapchat. I started talking to one of my friends via Snapchat. I can't remember what we ended up talking about, but I remember opening up a window to listen to the rain. As I was texting, I heard footsteps outside. It sounded as if someone was pacing back and forth on the wet grass at night. I tried to reason in my head as to why somebody would be stepping on this wet grass and not be underneath the cover of the porch, but I just minded my own business. I was on the second floor, the top floor. So even if someone was trying to break in, they would need to be 12 feet or having a ladder or battering ram. That's when I heard a rhythmic tapping right beside my head on the wall. Tap, tap, tap. My skin instantly jumped. And before I could text my friend, tap, tap, tap. My head was by the window. Couldn't have been no more than a foot away. I wanted to look outside, but my mind was already racing with possibilities. Tap, 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 just as I was about to start recording. The taps turned into loud and long scratching. I know this is going to sound weird, but I swear it sounded like whatever it was had three long claws. Again, the scratching happened, and it was in a rhythm which weirded me out even more. After that, I literally stuck my head out expecting some sort of creature or asshole on a ladder. Poof. Nothing. No footsteps scurrying away. No tree branch. No animal. Nothing but rain. I had taken a video of my just window on Snapchat and sent it to my friend to confirm that I wasn't going crazy. She heard it too. 
I went to the living room. Mom was passed out and everything seemed safe. And that's when I had noticed the door was completely unlocked, even the top lock. I quickly woke my mom up and explained what had happened, and then grabbed a hammer to clear the house. I remember thinking I was going to have to bludgeon someone, but thank God no one had come in. I shut my window and told my mom I'd be staying up for that night to keep watch. I burned some sage, said a prayer, and just tried my best to make sense of the situation. Nothing like that has happened since then. My Paranormal Experience When it comes to supernatural things like ghosts or spirits or witches, magic or demonic possession, I consider myself agnostic towards those things. So I don't necessarily believe in them, but I don't rule them out as a possibility as well. Now my experience happened to me about three years ago when I was still in high school. I was a junior. I had gotten up to do my morning routine, make some breakfast before getting dressed and leaving for school. To get a better idea of things, the layout of the house is pretty simple. The kitchen has a clear view of the hallway that leads to my room on the end right at the right of it. But it also has a view of my great uncle's office where he does his work on the left side of the hallway, with my room just five feet down from it. With that, I had finished making breakfast and planned on eating it in my room. As I rounded the corner of the fridge with a full view of the office, the door was open and I saw this black round shadow thing that looked like a head peering from behind the door. No defining features or anything, just a shadow. Of course I was kind of freaked out. All I could do was stand frozen in my spot. I blinked and then it was gone like some cheesy horror movie. Being ever skeptical, I moved from my spot, hoping to recreate the effect that maybe it was just a shadow of an object, but no luck. Then I decided to investigate for myself, since I had to pass the door anyway to get to my room. Walking in the office, I had looked around to see if there was maybe any objects that might have had the same profile of what I had seen in the kitchen, in case my great uncle had just put something in there and I didn't know about it. But like before, there was nothing. I just decided to write it off as a weird optical illusion and went to go eat my breakfast in my room. I was in my room, I was eating, just trying to forget that whole experience but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I had my door open and I found myself constantly looking to see if someone was right outside my door, but of course there wasn't. I decided to just close the door, but that didn't help with the feeling of me being watched. Now what I'm going to say next, I swear happened. A loud knock came from the other side of my door. At this point, I was a bit uncomfortable and jumpy, but that knock was my last straw. I immediately went to open the door, not wasting any time, hoping that it was my great aunt on the other side. No one. Not a single person. My great aunt and uncle. Their door was closed, meaning they were still asleep. I was alone. The feeling of being watched intensified, and I was no longer comfortable being in my room. I got ready for school immediately, even though it was far too early before I was supposed to be there. I couldn't stand that feeling of someone watching me. There was something I couldn't understand happening, and I didn't like it, so I left. Ever since then, when I'm alone at home, I still get a feeling of someone watching me, but I can never see anybody. I despise it so I try to stay in lit areas and keep a TV on to drown out the quiet and the dark. Strange Ghostly Experience It was a Wednesday night, 
My dad was having his weekly game night with his friends. Throw darts, drinking beer, typical game night for my dad. And my mom and I went out to the garage where his man cave was to tell him goodnight. I remember telling my dad's cousin about the tooth I had lost and that I was so excited for the tooth fairy to come. I was about eight or nine years old. I usually slept with my mom on these nights, since my dad didn't want to disturb us coming to bed after midnight. She tucked me into bed and read me a story. Afterward, I closed my eyes while my mom read her own book. The click of her lamp would always wake me up for some reason, and I stared into the pitch black room. Only this time, I was met with a strange figure standing in the corner of the room, in between my mom's dresser and the door. It looked like a woman. Her head was looking over her right shoulder with her body facing forward. She did not have any features other than the outline of her body. She was solid green and glowing without any light shining on her. I was frozen with fear. The longer I stared at it, it would sort of float toward me. When I shut my eyes out of fear, it would be right in the same place it was before. When daylight came, it disappeared. Or so I thought. It was about a week later and I had avoided that room like the plague because I had an uneasy feeling every time I stepped into the room. I was eating lunch and watching cartoons on the TV in my parents' bedroom when I saw it again out of the corner of my eye. It wasn't green this time, but it was clear and in the daylight. It was shaped the exact same way and in the exact same spot. I was in a different spot in the room and it floated toward me. The same thing happened when I stopped looking at it. It was in the same corner as before. A couple of months went by, and my great-grandmother had passed away. My dad inherited some of her furniture, including her dresser, and my parents decided to move it into the bedroom. After the dresses were s dressers were switched, the figure never came back. My brother has the old dresser in his room and hasn't had any experiences like I did. I'm almost 23 now and I moved out of my parents' house. Their old bedroom has been transformed into a new guest room, and I stay in there occasionally when I come home to visit. The uneasy feeling that I used to have is totally gone, and I haven't seen anything since the figure disappeared years ago. I've told my mom about it, but of course she doesn't believe me and hasn't seen anything herself. I grew up in Russellville, Kentucky, which has a lot of history with the Civil War. My parents' house used to be a vet's office back in the 1800s, but I'm not sure what that has to do with the ghost. I still have zero explanation for what happened all those years ago. It never tried to hurt me. It would just move toward me multiple times at night. Weird event happened. My partner and I have been living with his grandmother for years now. Him before me. I've lived with her in her house for the past five years. She lived alone in a house after all her kids moved out and her husband dying in its mid-forties years prior. She has been a widow for over fifty years, but weird things always happen in her house. She's always raging out and in a bad mood, constantly complaining, and is very hateful, so much so that not even her own sons visit her due to her temper tantrums and negative attitude towards everything. She is highly abusive and unstable. Due to her age and chronic arthritis, she's always sitting in the same spot. She's practically immobile because she's in pain, so she's typically sitting in one place every day. 
Days and nights pass, and she sits in the same place during the day and night. It's sometimes really eerie because at times she just sits in the corner in the dark. Since we're at work and we aren't always around her. But she's always there when we leave and then we come back and she's there. I've always felt an evil energy come from her because she's so hateful and negative. She doesn't even like people touching her and some of the things that she says seem too evil to come from an old woman. I've read very negative, hateful energy, especially arguing and temper tantrums, which is how she communicates, attracts a lot of evil spirits. I think so because I think they resonate at a similar wavelength, but I never thought much of it. There's been some weird occurrences at her house. Once she was at a hospital due to a fever, and it was unusual of her not to be in the house since she's always here. The night her bedroom toilet blew up randomly around 2 a.m. We woke up and thought somebody broke into the house, but then find this out and have to call a plumber the next morning. It was the only time that she didn't sleep in the house, and this happened. Another time, we were all sitting downstairs, and we heard multiple things in her bedroom bathroom, and they fell on their own upstairs. All the windows were closed and there was no air ventilation where that could have even occurred. She had also been downstairs for hours prior, so no one had been in her bathroom for several hours. Last night she was having another one of her temper tantrums and continued yelling. I then was so exhausted after just all of that arguing that I... Sort of just left her area and continued arguing with my partner on how we need to move out. We were both exhausted from work and he worked overtime. And I also had a long two-hour commute after work. To then get home to the yelling and complaining. As we continued arguing into the night, around 1am, the TV in our bedroom began turning on on its own. Neither of us were near the remote. The other freaky thing was that the TV's backlight turning on and off on its own, which is unrelated to the actual TV being on or off. It's an entirely different connection, which requires its own separate remote and was sitting by the TV. This was also freaky and had no explanation. My partner just turned off the power from that side of the wall to stop the TV from turning off and on. Gumpy. When I was really little, I remember my great-grandpa playing with me. And I'd tell my great-grandma, Nana, and my mom all about it. I didn't grow up with my dad around, and I never really kept in touch with my Nana's ex-husband, but I remember my great-grandpa very well. My family would often just listen to my stories about him, and I recall his funeral even, and I even recalled the fact that he had an open casket funeral. I remember my Nana taking me to the funeral, getting out of the car, and when we got there, no one listening to me when I was trying to talk. I remember that memory of my family before any other memory of any other people living in my family. When I was probably six, my Nana took me, and I think either one of my uncle's or third cousin's houses, and I saw a lot of really good sketches of my great-grandpa. Some of them were sketches of very similar drawings. One of my great-grandma kept up all the time in her house. She asked me if I knew who it was, and I called him Gumpy. My Nana was shocked. That was not a name anyone had called him in a long time, and he had passed years ago. I knew he passed a long time ago, and I'd heard bits and pieces about that but it's not something people really discussed much in the family. Just that he passed from a heart attack in another country on a mission. The story still gets weirder. When I was younger, my Nana and Mom got T-boned by a big truck of some type. I've heard different stories of what kind of truck from my Aunt, Mom, and Nana. 
they can all only agree that it was a giant truck and the other part of a story. They said it was maybe two and that I had a sunshade in my window. Other people had scratches and broken bones, but it looked like somebody had picked me up and sat me down on top of the broken glass. Then set the sun shade on top of me. The paramedics were confused how I had not one scratch on me and how I had glass directly underneath me. My mom and Nana both saw a figure dressed in white across the street on a corner walking away that looked exactly like my great-grandpa. They asked the other driver if they saw a man in the white across the street, and he didn't see anyone, he claimed. It continues. When I was maybe nine, my mom used to ask me how I'd, you know, how I'd color perfectly within the lines, a skill I no longer have today. I used to tell her that Gumpy and Joey, my cousin who passed when I was maybe a toddler, they helped me. When I was about 15, we visited my grandpa's grave again, and I noticed something. The year of his death on his grave was years before I was born. I thought about that for a while. One night at my grandma's, I asked her, my nana and my mom, why they never questioned my stories about grandpa if he died years before I was born. They referenced the night when I saw the sketches and I called him Gumpy. I didn't understand. They told me that no one calls him Gumpy anymore. Only kids called him Gumpy when they were kids years before he was born. And it's one of the things that nobody talks about anymore. So it's not something I could have just picked up. So when I called him by that name, they just simply had to believe me. Did something impersonate my dad? Anyways, this happened to me when I was about 9 or 10. I was preparing to go to sleep on a weekday, and I got underneath the blankets when I heard someone walking into my room. When I was a kid, I always left my bedroom door wide open. But because of the layout of my bedroom, I can't see anything outside when I'm laying on my bed. I only realized it was my dad when he stepped into my room and stood by the doorframe. That's when I noticed something really weird about him. He had this expression on his face like he wanted to kill me, or like if I had done something terribly wrong and he was furious at me. His eyes were completely open. At first, I thought I had done something wrong, like I clogged the toilet or he had tripped on one of my toys and came to my room to scold me. But he just stood there with the most serious look on his face for about ten seconds without saying a single word. My dad is the least serious person I know, and he's really talkative, so this unsettled me very deeply. Then I asked him, What's going on? and he didn't react at all. Now that I think about it, I don't think he even blinked during this whole thing. He stood there for about four seconds after I asked him, and then he just straight up disappeared, like he was edited out of a video, like he logged off from an online video game. I was dumbfounded. I sat on my bed completely frozen, thinking of an explanation of what just had happened. Was I dreaming? I recall being wide awake with my bedroom lights on, not being tired at all. In fact, at that time, I couldn't fall asleep if I didn't have my blankets covering my head. And I also was playing with my PSP before I heard the footsteps. So, was he really in my room, and I just had suddenly fallen asleep, then I woke up and he wasn't there? If so, then why did he have that terrible expression on his face? I checked the time on my PSP, and only a minute had passed since I turned its screen off. I concluded that I couldn't have had a quick memory lapse, and he actually did leave the room normally. So I quickly ran to my parents' room to see if he was either in the hall walking to his bedroom or inside of it, preparing to go to sleep, you know. 
To my surprise, when I entered, he was sound asleep, snoring loudly. I woke him up and his eyes were bloodshot red as they usually were when he was been sleeping for a long time. His hair was also really messy, unlike when he came into my room. I asked him in a serious tone if he had gone to my room before going to sleep. He saw that I wasn't playing around, sat on his bed and answered that the only time he had gone to my room had been at noon. I literally cannot explain what happened to me. My dad thinks it's pretty weird and I stopped mentioning it because he's pretty scared of the paranormal and I don't want to stress him out. I don't tell the story often since it's so ridiculous. I know nobody would believe me, but it's been bugging me for so long I just want some sort of explanation. You can't make this shit up. I think my job is haunted. Help. My first experience was on New Year's Eve at a job party with myself, a female, 20 years old, and a few co-workers. Only me and my co-worker Kayla's sister heard the sound of a large metal object clashing. We went to look. Nothing was out of place. This was the earliest instance of unexplainable activity there. On July 25th, Kayla, female 22, closed down the store with one other co-worker, and she distinctly recalls everything being in place because it was the closer's job to clean up before leaving. The next morning, Kayla and I were the openers of the cafe. We work in a boba place, by the way. She started freaking out as soon as we got behind the counter because there is a whole pack four rolls of paper towels on the floor. She knows that the night prior, it wasn't there, and the other co-worker couldn't have done it because everybody leaves together at night. So somehow, something must have moved it overnight. And it's a fairly weighted pack. That was left in the dead center of the walkway. I just looked back on my text for the date of the next event. We texted the whole group chat because of how spooked that we were and just realized it was the same day. It was a very dead work day, slow. Kayla and I were the only ones in the shop. I was doing the dishes and then I heard the sound of the bathroom door slamming. It was loud. Kayla was behind the counter with me and we looked at each other and asked her if something was in the bathroom. She was like, you heard that too? And so she went to go check, even though we were almost sure no one else was there. You have to walk past the counter to get to the bathroom. We would have seen somebody go by. When she went to check, she knocked on the bathroom. There was no answer, and when she opened the door, there was no one. The motion sensor light was also on before she opened it door is pretty heavy, and so it just seems impossible for it to have been the wind or something like that. It doesn't just stay open on its own, and we have to use a door stopper to keep it open. The thing is, we don't know if the door was shut and then opened and slammed, or if it was not used that day and the door stopper was just in place before it shut. The door stopper works well, by the way. It's not likely that it moved on its own or gave up on the door. Kayla also heard footsteps that day, but all I know is, is that she thought it was me, but I wasn't near her at that time. What made me write this post is what happened today. I was again washing the dishes, and also again working with just Kayla. We were closing and doing the end-day cleanup, while I was doing the dishes, I very clearly saw Kayla in my peripheral. Not too or far off to the side, because it was so clear and I was just looking at the dishes, so it's kind of hard to explain. I saw the cheetah print headscarf that she was wearing today and everything. I saw her turn the corner to go to the back, but I did a double take because the last time I saw her, she was in front of the counter, and I realized it was still in the lobby area. She was there, sweeping. 
deceased family members saying one last goodbye. Now, before I continue the stories, I'm going to recite that they might not have occurred exactly how I described them, since both of the stories I'm going to tell happened when I was pretty young. Nevertheless, here are two stories that didn't happen to me, but happened to both my grandmother and my sister. Back in 2006, my granddad passed away, and at the time I would have been four, but as someone who has a terrible memory, I can still remember him pretty well. When he passed away, it hit everyone pretty hard, and my nan, for the first time in her life, now lived by herself. My nan used to have a queen-sized bed, which essentially had bedside tables connected to it, as well as a headrest, which was big enough to hold pictures and small ornaments. So basically, it was pretty big. On the two bedside tables, there were two huge lamps, which turned on and off whenever you touched the lamp itself. It didn't have a switch. One night, not too long after my granddad passes away, my nan was just laying in bed when the lamp next to where my granddad would sleep lit up and then turned off. She brushed it off as something possibly leaning up against the lamp, but then it happened again, so she was understandably pretty spooked. She decided to ask if it was my granddad, and the lamp turned on. My nan began to cry and began to say various different things, and she was getting a response as the lamp turned on and off. She recorded it happening, but considering it was 2006, and I'm unsure what she even recorded it on, I've never seen the footage, but both my mom and nan for both said that it exists. In the unlikely event that it ever gets found, I'm definitely 100% posting it. As a skeptic when it comes to the paranormal, I hope that it would possibly make me into a believer. Around 2011, my grand passed away. And at the time, she was not in a position both physically and financially to live on her own. So she lived with my dad right up until she passed away. My parents split when I was really young. So when we would go to see him, I would sleep in his room which was pretty big, big enough for an extra bed and my sister slept in another room. But when my grand passed, my older sister slept in her room from then on. One day she opened the door to go to sleep, only to find my grand sat on the edge of the bed. I clearly remember her running into my dad's room in tears, screaming, saying that she saw my grand. I remember my dad trying to calm her down, and when he went into the room himself, he saw nothing. My sister was terrified of going back in there and subsequently didn't spend weekends at my dad's for a very long time. I'm both grateful, but also pretty annoyed that I've never encountered anything like this. It probably really shit me up. I'm the sort of person who hates horror films, so I'd rather not have an experience like this, but then again, I always brush off stories because I myself have never experienced anything relatable in any way. Ask Reddit. My wife and I went on a haunted walking tour of quote unquote old town San Juan Capistrano. We enjoy the spooky stories and the history, but never really took the haunted part too seriously. At a stop at one of the old houses, the tour guide explained the history of the house and how she thought of it as her favorite stop. She said she'd experienced the former resident, Alice, and that she always felt welcome there. She said people have seen shadows cross the room at night and other times, but never threatened. She also said one of her fellow guides liked the house as well, but for the opposite reasons. He never felt welcome and always had a disturbing feeling at that part of the tour. 
as we were standing by the front door, the house was not open to the public, other people, two other women, on the tour were asking Alice to show herself and peering in the window and through the door. My wife looked on with interest while I stood back in the patio and leaned up against the railing. Nothing happened to them or for them, so they left that area and walked around to the other side. I stayed for a moment longer, looking inside the house from where I stood. It was then that I felt a gentle pressure on my chest, not like a hand, but still a gentle push of some sort, accompanied by my overall tingling sensation in my body. I also felt the intense compulsion to leave right away, which I did. As I walked around the corner where the rest of the group was, my wife saw me and must have seen something on my face, even through the darkness. I explained the sensations I felt and the tour guide said, That's Alice. We talked for a bit and wondered why I and the other male tour guide felt that way, when most everybody else felt welcomed. My wife suggested that perhaps Alice did not like men. About six hours later, around 3 a.m. or so, when we were in bed, I experienced the first night terror I've had in quite a long time and the only sleep paralysis I've ever experienced. In what I felt like a dream, I saw somebody come into my room, an adult-sized shadow. It moved around to my wife's side of the bed to lay down. It was at the time that the sleep paralysis occurred. I tried to move, I tried to talk, but all I could produce was a gurgling, rapid snoring sound. I was trying to form words, but just made noise. My wife poked me, she often does, when I snore, and I was able to form a raspy, almost words of a name and help. It was clear in my head, but I don't know how to... I don't really know how to make it clear to her. What I do know is she woke up and shook me, concerned for my well-being. And that is the thing that broke my sleep paralysis. I apologized, but she didn't want to go into details at that time. She drifted back to sleep fairly quickly. It took me maybe 15 to 20 minutes to calm down and go back to sleep. I'm a receptive skeptic, but that was the first time I've experienced anything like that. Ask Reddit. The house my parents currently live in, and the house that we lived in before they moved. The spirit or spirits in the house we all lived in never felt malevolent, more mischievous. It would do silly things like move stuff, turn on lights, turn off the microwave. We did see something once in the hallway. My mom and I had seen my dad go that direction, so naturally we assumed the shadowy movement that we saw was him. When my mom called over to remind him to shut the light back off, he called from a bedroom far away from the hallway, and the light wasn't on. Another time, right after my son was born, I heard it. He was about two months old and very colicky, and my mom would hear us sometimes and get up to check on me. I fell asleep, kinda, after he finally fell asleep one night, with him on my chest in the recliner. I heard someone walk across the carpet towards us. I asked who I thought was probably my mom if we woke her up and half opened my eyes to nothing in front of me. Both things were kinda creepy, and I was definitely a little... Well, there's an emoji here. I will try to interpret this emoji. It is a face with... It's a face showing teeth. I forget the name of this particular emoji. However, the text reads as follows. I will repeat. Both things were kind of creepy, and I was definitely a little... Mm, afterwards, but never felt scared there. Their new house is kind of the same, but you can tell it's not the same spirit. I don't know how to explain it. 
we've seen them multiple times, full-figured and very clearly. There's a younger woman in 1900s clothing with lighter colored hair and a kind face. The other spirit is a boy about eight, also in 1900s clothing with darker hair and a saddened face. Neither of them have ever spoken, but usually you can hear them walking around faintly. The first time it was me, my mom and dad, they were all out, and all three of the grandsons were playing outside. I went to come out of the bathroom and I saw a boy in the hallway out of the corner of my eye. I went to turn and yell at him to go back outside, but he was gone. I ran up to the front of the house and called out to the kids who were all three clear across the yard and couldn't have possibly been inside. The second and third times were both my dad. His first encounter was about two days after mine. I hadn't said anything to anyone, so he couldn't have possibly described the same boy unless he'd seen him. He was waking up and rolled over to the woman and the boy standing next to his bed. When he went to wipe his eyes, they disappeared. He thought it was my son, possibly my son and I, but we weren't in the house. The second time, it was only the woman, and she was walking across the house. They don't do much either outside of close and open doors and steal my mom's left shoes. We did investigate, but couldn't find anything about the property, and the house was built in the 70s, so the clothing doesn't fit the house. My dog came back for a visit. Cutting to the chase. In October, we lost her dog of 13 years. Her name was Bella. And no, I didn't name her after Twilight, though it was in vogue at the time. As a two-month-old puppy, she witnessed the murder of her then-owner. She was one of six pups. Ironically, her brother was adopted by my parents' neighbor. They'd ardently play through the chain-link fence whenever we visited home. I raised her in my first year alone at college. She and I were practically attached at the hip. She accompanied me throughout the six years it took to get my frickin' degree, marrying my best friend and moving across the country. I'm trying to express the depth of my love for her, and the words just fall short. Five years ago, I took up the notion that we needed to adopt a sister for her. I think this was a mildly telepathic moment, but she was eight, and I figured it would be a good kind of close out her last years with a companion. Then she started losing her fur and gaining weight. Six months after adopting her next dog, her name was Arya. Bella went blind. She had cataracts and undergone diabetes. We were told that the $6,000 surgery might not even work, and were too poor for it anyway. She was insanely intelligent, and after a bout of depression, coped swimmingly. One day her breath became labored, and I knew that her time was almost up. In the two days leading up to her death, we were literally attached to the hip once again, got a lot of experience with death and knew she was terrified. I held her in my arms as she took her last breath. After she died, I immediately started looking for a puppy. I wasn't trying to replace Bella. I knew that I never could. I'd raised Bella on my own, and Arya was two when we adopted her. I thought it would be good to raise a puppy together. It certainly tested my husband's patience. We adopted Lydia two and a half weeks after Bella died. She's, well, a puppy and a shepherd mix to boot. The only way to calm her down is to wear her out. Today, while I was at work, my husband took her on a walk, which sufficiently tired her. I'd just done yoga and I was meditating. This is now a rarity, since Lydia is always crawling on the mat, vying for attention. 
But today, she s- sort of sidled up next to me whilst I meditated. I laid down and with her on the yoga mat, she was the little spoon and I the big one. Bella and I always fell asleep like this together. I was telling Lydia that I loved her and that it was nice to cuddle her, like I'd done with Belly, my nickname for her. Then I talked about how much I missed Belly. As I talked to her and cuddled her, I felt the unmistakable feeling of a dog's nose nudging me on the thigh. I felt there, thinking it was Arya, but she was on the couch. It's nice to know that, even though I can't hold her, my baby's still there. A silhouette in the sky that hid the stars. This one happened to me when I was young, like elementary school age. Pretty sure like fourth or fifth grade. As I had mentioned in my previous post, there's absolutely nothing to do in this little town. At least there wasn't when I lived there. So more often than not, this led to kids being mischievous. This night was no exception. I waited until my grandparents fell asleep, and then I snuck out. Yes, at fourth or fifth grade, and met my friend up the street. We really had no plans, like, what the fuck was a couple of kids going to be doing out at night anyway? It wasn't the safest idea looking back. Anyway, I met up with my friend on his bike, and we just rode around together and teased each other, and did what typical fourth or fifth graders kind of do. Now at that time, my friend only lived a few blocks away from me, maybe two to three blocks total. Wasn't that far, and probably would have been too sketched out to go any farther at that age, honestly. So we were just riding up and down the street between his house and mine, and we both suddenly got a horrible feeling. I say both because he had to have felt what I felt at that same time. We both simultaneously stopped riding our bikes and just stared at each other for a second. I still really can't wrap my head around what happened next, but I have a few guesses. As we stood there with this horrible feeling in the air, it was almost as if the air suddenly had an electrical current. It's the best way I can explain it. All the hair on my body stood up, and there was this sort of tingling feeling, I guess you could say followed by a deep, deep primal sense of fear. As soon as this primal fear hit me and my friend, for some reason, we looked into the sky. Now, again, small town, not a lot of industrial lights. You can see the stars pretty clearly, especially on a night like this. What we saw, and the best way I can explain it, is this blacked-out rectangle shape extending for maybe a block and a half over us. It was a silhouette in the sky, and you couldn't see the stars through this thing. There was a perfect outline around it, and it definitely was a solid object. At this point, we realized that it was hovering over us. I'd say maybe a couple hundred feet in the air overhead, and was projecting a shadow over us. Now, I've experienced some scary stuff in my life, but I still don't ever remember feeling this primal amount of fear, sheer terror. My friend and I looked at each other and screamed, and I booked it out of there, riding my bike as fast as my little legs could go. The weird thing is, though, is I was only a block or two from my grandparents' house. It felt like it took an eternity to finally get back there, despite my pedaling as fast as I could. Now as an adult, 20 plus years later, I guess you could chalk it up to some sort of experimental craft that maybe we weren't supposed to see. I don't know. I can still feel that primal fear even thinking about this situation. And I still can't figure out what exactly happened that night. Sleep paralysis, something going on. Hey guys, 
I have dealt with sleep paralysis almost on a nightly basis since I was about 14. I'm now 30. It's always incredibly vivid and always feels like a visitation from some sort of presence. I've been convinced for decades now that there is something more to my sleeping condition. Something paranormal or spiritual, perhaps. I've spoken to countless doctors and psychiatrists about it over the years, and they all tell me that it's simply sleep paralysis. None of them have helped. A family friend who's a spiritualist told me years ago when I was a teenager to pray whenever it happened. I do most nights, but sometimes it's like a... maybe... Maybe it just aggravates whatever presence is in the room with me. I've been attacked. I've been thrown around. And I've even been convinced sometimes that I'm rolling around on the floor wrestling this thing. I hear it too when it happens. It shrieks and makes a horrible radio static-like sound. However, what scares me most is whenever I wake up from the sleep paralysis and look around the pitch black of my bedroom and I'll see things. Shapes and patterns of bright luminescent colors. Often like spiders or glowing... Somehow... Somehow glowing black figures. I'll stare at them and turn the lamp on in the room, on and off. They fade away when the lamp is on and come back when it's off. They often look like spiders or bugs, but if it's been a really bad sleep paralysis event, they'll be humanoid-shaped shadowy figures. I know they're there and I can see them. And no, I'm not a schizophrenic or someone with a mental illness. Last night, however, it happened again. I woke from a vivid dream and I felt something beside me in the bed. I'm so used to this that I know what's going on and basically lucid dream my way into a defensive position and say my prayers. I felt like I was being choked and mounted on my chest. Nothing irregular for these events. I managed to wake myself up and see it. A shadowy figure crawling up on my bedroom curtains. It's about the size of a child, but isn't shaped at all like one. It's built quite stocky and stout. Completely black, yet bright enough to be seen in a dark room. I doze off to sleep completely unfazed, as this is almost a nightly, weekly minimum experience for me. I wake up after what feels like a second and check my phone. An hour has passed. I can't explain how, but I remember hearing someone speak to me. They told me their name was Nokra. N-O-Q-R-A, or something like that. I've felt uneasy ever since. Probably sounds like rambling or someone who's insane, but I almost feel like tonight was some sort of breakthrough for my sleep paralysis, and that I've potentially met the thing, or one of the things, that's been bothering me for literal years and years. I met a woman I had had a vision of. When I was around 14 or so, I had two friends very interested in magic, Wicca, and the supernatural. I'll call them Abby and Brittany. One day, Brittany wanted to try something that she had read about, a massage that was supposed to open up the senses or something, like a spiritual type release. This massage was supposed to only be done with two people in the room, but we were young teens and didn't care. We decided to try in Abby's room, in what was basically an attic. Brittany would massage Abby first. We turned off all the lights so it was pitch black, and Brittany started on Abby's shoulders. I was sitting on the floor, unable to see anything, and that's when it happened. I began to feel weak and lightheaded, like I was about to pass out. I took a deep breath and was suddenly no longer in Abby's room. I had been transported somewhere else entirely. A bright blue sky, no clouds, no sun, all of this expanded above me. 
flat beige rock was as far as I could see. From the rock, people were growing, also entirely made of beige rock. Some were more formed than others. Some were just tall blobs. It was like the blobs were being shaped by an unfelt wind. I walked along the eerily quiet surroundings by these people until I came to a rock woman in the middle of my path. She was older, her hair in a bun with glasses on her face, and her arms had not yet been formed. I was just standing there looking at her, when just as suddenly as I had arrived, I was back in Abby's room. Abby was crying, and Brittany quickly turned on the lights. She told us that she had seen a dark place with reds and blacks. It had scared her badly. I didn't tell them what I saw. I had thought that was that. We never spoke of it again. A couple of years later, Abby and I were at the mall. I had to use the restroom, so I went and did my business and walked out of the stall to the sinks. And that's when a woman approached me. She held out her hands. They were wet from washing. And said in what I'm thinking was Italian, Scusi. She was dressed in beige from her glasses to her high heels, with her graying hair in a bun. I was shocked but showing her how to use the air dryer for her hands. She said grazie. We smiled at each other and I walked out. I never saw her in real life again, but a few years after our encounter I had a dream. The beige woman was lying in a canopy bed, surrounded by thick purple and red blankets, and her family. A window could be seen looking over a beige city with bright blue sky. It was clear she was on her deathbed. She told me something, and I wish I could remember what it was, but then she peacefully passed. That's when I woke up sobbing. For years when I would think about her, I would tear up and I would feel like I was having an adrenaline rush. When I finally was able to tell others about this, I couldn't speak without crying. I have this weird nightmare, and I know something is wrong. All my life, I've had paranormal encounters, especially between the ages of 10 and 13. And even though these have decreased since I moved from my old house, it should be noted that they never blessed it, for which we believe that it's the reason for everything that's happened. The story that I'm about to tell here today is more than anything to ask for help and find a name or reason. Well, this started about two years ago. I was very stressed since it was time for exams and grades, so I slept little. On one of these nights, I remember that in the middle of the night, I got up to go use the bathroom as usual. However, when I left, I saw a black shadow in front of me, to which my first instinct was to hit him. But my surprise was to see that the shadow had disappeared and the only thing that remained was a strange and heavy feeling in my hand. Clearly I was scared, but as it's something common, so to speak, I decided to go to sleep. In my dreams I usually know that I'm dreaming, that is to say I have lucid dreams, but I cannot control what happens in these. Having said that, I remember I was dreaming about something very silly. The truth, I would meet my favorite artist, and I would tell him that I liked him, and suddenly his girlfriend would arrive and begin to tell me that he was very sorry, but it was her boyfriend, to which I then realized that I was dreaming, and I made the mistake of telling the people inside my dream, quote, unquote, it doesn't matter anyway, I know I'm dreaming. And from then on, my dream turned gray, and people started attacking me as if to get me out of my dream and they succeeded. After that, many of my dreams were so, however, I didn't really know what was going on to become worse. Days passed after having those nightmares until one night, 
I began to dream of the same black shadow that I initially found. It would go to the roof of my room to see me, and I asked it to please leave me. I knew that I was dreaming, but I didn't want to tell him because I knew what was going to happen if I tried to scream to get up because no matter how much I wanted to, I couldn't wake up until one of those screams. I got up and saw the black shadow on my roof. It went away in seconds, but from there everything got worse. I started having dreams that, as I already mentioned, I knew they were dreams, and then at some point, they become nightmares so real that I want to get up, but I can't. When I think I've already gotten up, I give note that I could never get up, and I'm still inside my dream. This becomes a loop for which it happens to me from three to five dreams until I get up to continue sleeping, and then all of this is repeated yet again. It should be noted that all of these dreams are nightmares too scary and sometimes even real. I've been living this for two years and every time I tell somebody they can't find an explanation or they confuse it with sleep paralysis, I hope somebody can help me. Million Voices After Untying a Knot Spell This history was told to me by one of my aunts when we were talking about my grandma. My grandma died when I was eight, so I have not so many memories or a clear image of how she was. So talking about her with my family kind of helps me. Well, apparently my grandma was interested in some kind of Santeria. She learned that from... Who knows, while she was living in some random tiny town close to the Veracruz port. Years later from that, my grandma ended losing her wedding ring, so she ended sort of making like kind of a spell, where you were supposed to make some knots while praying I don't know what. It was a whole damn ritual. She was making knots while she was walking and praying around every corner of the house, so here she is walking around all the house, and she starts doing the same thing in the garden. And then I don't know how she found the ring outside on the grass. Then she kind of badly buried the cord with knots in her garden. Months passed after that, and my aunt, who likes gardening, was outside in the garden planting roses, when she somehow found the cord. She told me that when she saw the cord, she thought that it could be a great idea to use that cord to tie some tree branches together. So she started to untie the knots and use the cord to tie the branches. Everything goes as normal, as usual. Then, that night, she told me that she, a few hours after she fell asleep, she'd got suddenly fucking awakened by a quote-unquote million voices whispering and murmuring next to her goddamn ear. So she wakes up scared and screaming to the voices for them to stop. The voices were all different from male to female voices all talking at the same time. Close, almost inside of her ear. My grandma woke up by her screams and then she asked my aunt about what the fuck was going on. If she was having a nightmare or something... She told her about the million voices. Apparently, the million voices was enough for her to understand. Asking her about everything that she did that day. She told her about the gardening and the cord. Then my grandma sort of just made my aunt some tea in the next morning. She made her a whole cleansing ritual with herbs, eggs, and prayers. My grandma untied the branches and burned the cord while making another ritual. Honestly, I can't remember all the details about the ritual and what exactly my grandma did, but it seems like she asked something with the cord slash not ritual. She asked, in parentheses, the other people to help her find this ring. And no, I have no idea what the other people means. Ghosts? Demons? I have no clue. 
But yeah, if you've heard something similar or know more about this not magic, that would be interesting to know. Thanks in advance. Ask Reddit. When I was in high school, my family rented this house from a family that had owned the property, going all the way back to the 1940s. They didn't want to sell the property because they wanted to keep it in the family. Often after school, when I would arrive home before my older sister, who was heavily involved in extracurriculars, I would always see her bedroom window, which faced the street, and it was wide open. I would get mad at her. I would tell her that she needed to close the window and lock it, which she swore she always did. One day I'm at home, and at the same time as one of the neighbors is out, and he says, Hello, then goes, I didn't know your grandma lives with you too thought it was just you, your sister, and your mom. And I was like, What do you mean, my grandma? And he goes, The woman who always opens the window after y'all leave for school. Blood just went ice cold. I told him my grandma did not live with us. Same house, different incident. We had a large German shepherd named Fluffy. We kept him in the backyard, and we brought in when we got back from school or got back from work. Once again, I was home early, and I went to the backyard to play with her, and I'm about to open the back door, which has a small window and a small curtain built into it above the handle. To go inside when Fluffy freaks out, just growling and showing her teeth. She goes in front of me and stands against the door and is barking like mad. I look up past Fluffy to see the window on the door and a dark figure was looking out. Totally distorted, I noped out, ran away from the house to my aunt's, who lived about 2.5 blocks away. Our back door led to the kitchen, hence the little curtain and window to peek out into the backyard. Same house. Also had a small tuxedo cat named Maggie. And one day my sister is out at a friend's house, and my mom is working late, and I'm by myself. So I'm just chilling sitting in the living room, Fluffy is asleep in the kitchen, and my cat is playing in my room. When all of a sudden she darts out of my room all puffy and lands on my lap. I start to smell what smells like a dead animal in the house. I'm gagging and see a figure walk from my room. It happened so fast. Fluffy is growling like crazy and my cat is a puff monster. Luckily I still had my school bag near me and I put Maggie in my bag with the zipper partially closed. That way she could poke her head out. And I left the back door and I just ran to my aunt's house in the middle of the night. I was just sobbing, felt bad because if I was strong enough to control Fluffy, I would have taken her too, but fortunately she was a massive dog and was almost larger than me in height when she stood on her back legs. The Latino Community has very dark secrets connected to the supernatural world. Weeks ago, with some Latino friends, we talked about supernatural things through a podcast that we usually listen to while we have study groups at the university. Someone brought up the subject of strange inheritances left by relatives, in which a friend that we will call Gabriel spoke about how a sister from his grandmother a practitioner of magic, he inherited a couple of books with very strange information from his mother. With some curiosity, we asked Gabriel to see if he could show us one. He reluctantly accepted. He warned us that it was probably not a good idea, saying that his mother had tried to kill them. 
But for strange reasons, the task was never achieved. Fire. Went out. Throw them away. Return to the living room library. Give them away. Return them the same day and only explain that it was not knowledge that we should have. Even so, we pushed him to show it to us. I regret it. When he showed us one, it only seemed like a handmade book with the cover made of skin of an animal with grayish fur. I was the first one to dare to look at it, and I swear that just by taking it into my hands, fear and cold took over my body. It was quite thick. I just looked at the first few pages, and I must admit that I don't know exactly what I read. One of the pages explained in a very detailed way how to turn a house or farm animal into a black or white guardian. Depending on your intentions. The next one was about secret uses of certain incredibly common flower in my country in Latin America. In general. The next page? God, it was terrible. It was an illustration of a grotesque baby-shaped creature, black skin, insect wings, and legs that, I don't know what they were, looked like two spider legs bent backwards. This thing was watching a child sleep from his crib. I know there was text underneath that drawing. I did not read it. I dropped the book. A terrible fear chilled my bones and left me trembling. I almost cried and began to pray in a hasty manner. I repeated a certain well-known Bible verse. Something in my mind told me that it was better not to touch that book or read it again. My mind simply blocked the image of the creature. I can try to describe it, but I can't visualize it. But I know that my mind blocked it for a higher reason. I have to admit that I investigated later, and it was worrying to know that many Latino families have stories with these heirlooms of rare books and objects. Even so, I want to know if you or know somebody else who has one of these books in their possession, one of these relics, and if possible, to talk about it. The Radio Station In college, I had the entire basement to myself, and at this point, I had a beautiful black cat with green eyes named Tommy. I was getting ready for bed late, and I had a kind of basic black alarm clock slash radio with a red digital clock on it where it can plug in or have batteries. But really, I don't think anybody uses batteries in those. Hint. There's a reason I'm pointing this out. As I was getting ready for bed, I rolled over to face the wall. Suddenly, the radio turns on. Not from my giant stereo, but the little alarm clock next to my bed. I half rolled over and thought it was probably Tommy somehow. So I called Tommy and told her it was her bedtime. She came running in from the bathroom at the foot of my bed. Of course, I'm thoroughly confused and roll over completely to look at my alarm clock. I tried turning it off, but it didn't work. I tried changing the station. That didn't even change it. I changed between AM and FM. Nothing seemed to change. I decided to unplug it, but it still wouldn't turn off. This is odd, but convenient. I always found a screwdriver pretty useful personally so I kept one near my bed. As odd as that sounds, I like to play with technology, and my bed was where I'd do that. So I took my screwdriver and I opened the back for the batteries. Nothing. Hmm. I couldn't turn this thing off or change the station, so I was staring at it thinking of what else to do because I've tried everything I could. While staring at it, I started to zone out in my focus on fixing the problem, and I listened to the station. And I started to realize the station, which is consistent the whole time, was not the station I always kept it on. 99.9 The Rock. Instead, I started to listen to what was going on. 
It was both intimidating and funny at the same time. They were telling stories on the radio. The lady I was listening to was talking about how she experienced something similar to something that I heard about in family experiencing. Except hers ended differently. She said she had a picture fall, and she'd pick it up, but it fell again. When she picked it up again, it had a crack on one person's face. Shortly after that person passed, then I hear the radio host thank the person for their ghost story and tell them all the listeners to call in if they have any ghost stories. My mind was all over the place at that point. Do I call and tell them, Hey, I've never heard your station in my life, and apparently I needed to hear it according to my haunted house because my radio wouldn't turn back off. Would they even believe me? Another one of the things that I thought to myself, if this had happened to me, I wouldn't have been able to believe this happened because it just seemed so wild and hilarious, but also a little creepy because why it would turn to that at that particular story. What about any other story or any other day? Why then? Why with someone dying? What's in my house? My husband and I moved into this house almost three years ago now. And in that time, there have been only two very strange occurrences. And weirdly enough, I didn't connect the two until now. Now I'm wondering, is there something here? Is there a name for this thing? The first incident happened around 2.5 years ago, I believe. It was shortly after we moved in. I actually posted about this on Glitch, the Matrix sub at the time. The way our house is laid out, it's a semi-open concept, where you have to come down a hallway from the front area into the kitchen and living room area, which occupies the same space. But there's a wall that partially obscures one side of the living room if you're in the kitchen. So I was cooking dinner, and my dog was lying at my feet hoping for me to drop some food. My husband came down the hallway and went around the corner into the living room without saying a word, and my dog got up and followed him into the living room. I started talking about some work gossip while I cooked, basically droning on for a bit with no response from my husband for several minutes. When I put the food into the oven to cook, I went to the living room, planning to sit down with him and wait. Except, when I stepped around the wall, he wasn't there. Our dog was on the couch alone. A second later, I heard the basement door open. It's a noisy door, so there's no way that he got up and went down while I was talking to him. Also, it would have been impossible for me not to see him go, since he would have had to walk back through the kitchen to go literally anywhere else in the house. He comes into the living room, and I immediately asked if he had just been in here a minute ago. He looked genuinely confused, and said he had been playing video games in the basement for over an hour. It was creepy and unsettling, but we both just kind of shrugged it off and embraced the spooky story as one to tell friends who came over to visit. Then the second thing happened. This was maybe six months ago, so about two years since the first. I tend to sort of startle awake from dreams and then be fully awake. So, I jolted awake and it was still dark out, but early morning. We have two dogs now and they sleep in the corner of our bedroom. My back was to them and I heard my husband's voice clear as day, unmistakable, in a very quiet whisper praising the dogs saying things like, you're such a good boy, and I love you so much. This is 100% in character for him, so I didn't think much of it. I just rolled over towards the sound, about to tell him that I thought he was sweet. But when I rolled over, he wasn't there. He wasn't in the bedroom at all. It was just me and the dogs in the dark. I couldn't tell if the dogs were awake, but they were lying down calmly. The fact that this thing thing keeps impersonating my husband freaks me out. What could it be? 
It doesn't scare the dogs, and it's never done anything other than just be there. Should I be worried? Haunting at a house I lived in. Was it demonic activity? I experienced some strange and freaky things living in an old house when I was 16. My parents had bought it years ago and sold within six years of living there. I'd get home from school, and I was on the computer room downstairs, and there were a few times where I'd randomly hear someone call my name in my mother's voice. When I used to get up to look around the house and respond with, What? I was completely alone in that house. My sister used to hear my dad call her name from the first floor of the house, while she was in the second floor in her room. When she went downstairs, she was completely alone in the house. That day, she just took off in her car and left the house because it freaked her out that much. Another night, I fell asleep in my parents' room, so my parents would sleep in my room. Around 3 a.m., they heard three hard knocks at my bedroom door. My dad responded with, Come in. No one did. So we got up and looked around to find us all asleep. When we first moved to this house, my dad found a collection of bowling balls in the garage that he immediately threw out after moving. You know, to clear out the space. Months later, my brother and grandmother used to hear bowling balls falling down the attic staircase. But there were no bowling balls in the attic. And this is when my father shared with them that he found those bowling balls in the garage when we first moved in. The creepiest situation that happened to us was a night when my parents saw me walk into their room in the middle of the night. I was wearing a vintage-laced black turtleneck dress, and I stood at the end of their bed. My mom asked what I was doing up. I suddenly stared into her eyes and stood there in silence. She asked me to go to sleep and dozed off. When she opened her eyes again, I was missing. She then asked my dad if he had ever seen me leave the room. He said no. So he then got up to check on me. I was asleep in my room wearing a red pajama t-shirt. During this time period, I went through a serious, rather serious state of bulimia, depression, and isolated myself often. I felt too self-conscious and insecure to go out and show myself. After selling the house, the new owner also experienced paranormal experiences, like getting her legs pulled down the basement staircase one night. We eventually did research and find out an older woman had passed in the house previous to us moving, but we didn't know what kind of spiritual activity happened while she was alive with her family. The experiences that we had are connected to demonic activity. Demons are the only ones capable of imitating human voices or taking on human forms. I always wonder if something sinister has attached itself to me since living in that house. As life has gone into a very dark, endless spiral of bad circumstances and bad luck for me since. Possible time loop. Any explanations? Roughly four years ago, my sister came to my flat one night to spend a bit of time with me, as we had both been working like crazy and hadn't had the time to catch up. It was just the two of us, and she suggested having a game of cards. Something we've always done since kids. It's a favorite pastime in our house. Once I'd gotten the cards out and started shuffling them, she asked me to look at the time on my phone, as she had work the next morning at 7 a.m. and needed to be home for a reasonable time. She had lost her phone on a night out a few days previously, a terrible habit that she has. I told her it was 10 past 6 in the evening. She replied, Okay, well I'll have to be getting off around, you know, quarter after 8 to 9 to get my uniform washed and dried, so keep an eye on the time for me. I agreed, 
and we started playing a bit of rummy to start with. Now we weren't drinking alcohol or taking drugs. We were just having a relaxed game of cards, chatting about guys and work. The usual stuff, I suppose. Everything was normal. We played cards for what felt like two hours, easy. I mean, you can't mistake that length of time when you've had about 16 to 18 hands of rummy, and we were in the early stages of playing a game of poker, having gotten bored of the other game. I remember having the weirdest feeling come over me, like the light in the room dimmed, and I distinctly felt an electrical crackly feeling start in the bottom of my spine and creep all the way up to my skull. I looked at her, and she was looking at me all wide-eyed and silent like she knew something was up. I blurted out, Something's wrong, really wrong. Without blinking or reacting to any which way, she just says to me, Look at the time. Which I thought was strange. I picked up my phone, looked at the time. A mixture of shock and dread creeps over me. That can't be right. It's not possible. I mumbled out loud to myself, if anything. My phone must have glitched out or something. Getting up to turn on the telly to see what the time's on there. She's looking at me like, what in the hell is going on? What is it? What's the time? She asks me again. I just repeat that it can't be right. And as I switch the telly on, the time flashes up in the corner of the screen. It says 1829. She sees it, and now just as freaked as I am. Amy, that can't be right. Did your phone say the same time? I tell her it did. I pull out a laptop to check the time and even get a watch out of my drawer to see if they're all matched, and sure enough, they did. We just sat there in a bit of a fog, like, what on earth just happened? We tried to discuss it, but we couldn't make any sense of it. To be honest, it felt uncomfortable. Even to this day, to talk about it doesn't feel right. She breaks the silence with a joke, something like, Oh, well, at least I have another couple of hours to chill with you. We just tried to forget about it. I just wondered if anyone had any ideas as to what it was. A Haunted House I Lived In I was about nine when this happened. Me, my mom, and my sister moved into this old house that was made before the Second World War. My great uncle, who was a veteran, told us stories about when it was in the old glory days. Well, everyone in our town said that this place was haunted, and that just sent off signals in my head, especially when I remember driving past the front of the house and seeing a girl in the attic window. I eventually rubbed it off, but still hated the house. I always felt like I was being watched and never felt alone. I was always uncomfortable, and I just hated it, and begged my mom not to move us in. Yeah, that didn't happen. Whether you believe in mediums or not, both of my grandmothers had a hardcore belief that we had medium blood or something stupid like that. But it skipped a generation or something. My room was the worst to be in. Always freezing, always felt heavy, and always had something weird going on. My sister just hated going past my room to go to the restroom. And I always hated being in my room. When we first moved in, I would knock on the floor and something would knock back. I would grab midnight snacks and see shadow men, women and children from the corner of my eye. One time I was even making a sandwich. I saw the shadow woman in the hall. I just said hi, then made my sandwich. I turned for some reason and I saw a shadow man maybe a foot from me. It took me a minute before I ran to my room. One time I was sleeping in the living room. I felt a hand pressed against my back. I heard light footsteps. It felt like a male's hand. 
My parents are divorced and no one had their boyfriend over. Another time I had a few pieces of paper on the table in the living room and I made the joke that the ghost should move it. It took a moment before it shot across the table. It just stopped on the edge. I jumped up and ran. Another time I woke up in my room and saw a girl in my doorway. And not like skin tone and hair color, she was translucent. She was gray with gouged out eyes with blood going down her face. She had a dress on with a coat. I stayed frozen before I jumped up and moved past her. My sister rubbed it off until her boyfriend stayed in my room while I was at a friend's house. He saw the exact same thing, but rubbed it off until he heard my story. But what made this so much weirder is it's the same girl from the window before we moved in. And as the narrator, I must say I've never heard this term rubbed it off. Interesting. Ghosts at Fort Benning. My brother, who I'll call John, he's an 18-year-old male, for the sake of this post, called me, a 20-year-old male, yesterday in a panic while I was working. He called me to tell me that he saw a ghost on base. He doesn't usually call, especially not when he knows that I'm busy. So I know that this was serious. He said that he was driving near Harmony Hill when he saw a man walk out toward the road wearing BDU, which when I looked it up, it said that it stands for Battle Dress Uniform, which was used from the 80s to the early 2000s with blood all over his face. And he says the man asked him for directions to the main post. John pointed him in the right direction but when he looked in his mirrors, the man was gone. John also shared with me that he had spoiled his pants after realizing what he had seen. The only other times I've heard him sound that upset were after he crashed an ATV with both of us in it, and when he was under investigation for a serious crime that he had no involvement in. He's usually very level-headed and reserved, when John was younger, around three or four, he used to talk a lot about paranormal encounters and other metaphysical things. But as far as I can get out of him, he has no recollection or desire to recall those scenarios. We went to see a few mediums and psychics who talked to him about his experiences, but I don't know whatever came of those conversations. He never brought them up. I used to mention auras of strangers and family members, but the only specifics I can remember were him saying that he couldn't see mine because something was blocking it. He also mentioned another spirit that he thinks he saw while he was on Firewatch one night. He says he saw a man in a UCP. Had to look it up again. This one is universal can... Excuse me. This one is Universal Camouflage Pattern, which was used from 2005 to 2019. And they were crying on a bench somewhere in the B Company barracks at or near the Airborne School. He says that this could not have been real person because the lights in the room are motion activated and the lights were not triggered by the man's presence. He says he was watching cameras and no one came in or out feel like it's relevant to disclose that he recently sent, or he was recently sent, for a psychological evaluation because he reacted violently to a minor inconvenience. And I was recently sent to a psychiatric hospital for PTSD and depression, as well as possible bipolar disorder. I say this not to discount his encounters, but rather to try to fully understand all of the contributing factors to our situation.
The ghost in my house who protected me from an uninvited spirit. Ouija board used. My childhood home had an odd history. There was a very old camera system on the house from the 80s. We were told that a man had lived there once who was running from the FBI or something. The conclusion was unknown, but the house went to his family who later sold it. As soon as we moved in, we noticed the basement was super strange. It was completely unfinished with skeleton keys jammed into the borders between the wall and the floor. We'd hear strange sounds occasionally at first. I started having dreams of gatherings of men in the basement, having business meetings or something, drinking, smoking cigars. I would often experience the sensation in my sleep like someone was ripping my door open and rushing in, but I'd wake up immediately to nothing. We moved in when I was five. Flash forward to about 17 years old. My grandmother passed away. I was very close with her and hurt by this because I didn't really get to say goodbye and I had a lot to tell her. I ignorantly decided to make a Ouija board, which turned out to be a really stupid idea. Of course, it still affects me to 25, so don't do it. Anyway, I had lit some candles and I tried to communicate with my grandmother, but had no luck. A few nights later, I'm sleeping soundly in my bed, facing the wall. I suddenly get woken up by being shaken. I wake up immediately scared because I hear somebody in my room, walking back and forth. I refused to turn around because of how freaked out I was, but I could see this person in my mind almost. I could hear the walking back and forth and the mumble and the worry in this woman's voice. And I could see her in my mind walking back and forth and she just absolutely looked crazed and distraught. She shook me again. I could tell that she wanted something from me, but I couldn't understand her and this was beyond me. All of a sudden, all the ways from downstairs, I hear an absolutely roaring statement to the effect of go away that echoed through the entire house. As I'm laying there still frozen and facing the wall, I noticed that the woman in my room was gone. I said thank you sir, went back to bed. I felt protected by the spirit of this man on a few occasions, and he even showed me an experience that made me face the reality of suicide once. Totally freaked me out, but he taught me a lesson during a period where I was depressed. But that's a whole separate experience. That's for a later time. I tried cleansing the house to release him. But unless he didn't want to leave, I hope his soul's at peace. Grandfather at the end, and interacting with deceased relatives. My grandfather is unfortunately at the end of his life, riddled with dementia and having strokes weekly. He's on hospice and our family's made peace with his last few days. He's unable to recognize any of us, and it's clear that he's no longer perceiving the world around him coherently. He's mostly non-speaking now, and will only grumble sometimes when he's in pain or has a primary functional need. I live very close to my grandfather and drop in regularly, although he does have a 24-7 caregiver now. Last Tuesday's caregiver called me and asked me to come over. As she smelled like smoke and my grandfather was acting odd, she felt like it might be the surge or terminal lucidity right before death. I came straight over and as soon as I walked in, the smell of cigarette smoke hit me in the face. We have cameras on in the house at all times to check in, and none of the caregivers smoke. It smelled like an old pool hall. 
Sure enough, my grandfather was talking completely coherent sentences. But he wasn't talking to us. He was talking to Jack. He was talking directly to the corner of the room, giving full details about the plans for the weekend. The lawnmower he had been working on, the plan for the new pool that we were going to have installed. Issues he's been having with my grandmother. This went on for 20 minutes. We would attempt to speak with my grandfather, but it was like we didn't exist. He couldn't take his eyes off the corner of the room. The scary part for me is that Jack was a very real person who died about 15 years ago. He was my grandfather's brother-in-law, and they were the best of buds. This by itself wouldn't have been that scary, but the smell. Neither of my grandparents were smokers, ever. But Jack was an absolute chain smoker. He would never be caught, really, ever without a cigarette. And he didn't eventually pass away from lung cancer. We checked every possible option in the house that could cause the smoke smell with no avail. The smell was only in this one room. Not outside, not in the next room over. Thirty minutes of this went by and then it stopped. My grandfather became incoherent again and the smell subsided. It wasn't the surge because almost a week later he's still with us and it hasn't happened again. I don't believe in the paranormal. I like the stories, but I've never had an experience that made me a believer. But I do feel that my grandfather is somewhat on the threshold of life and death, and maybe he's able to meet some of his loved ones in the middle. That one shift too many. Through the early 2000s, I guess I worked a lot, usually seven days a week, sometimes 12 hours and above. I think my longest run was 17 weeks working seven days without a real rest. It's that particular run that I'm writing about. So for anyone that's read my previous posts about the cat lady, I mentioned some sightings that happened to me in the place I worked. Here's my own. I was coming to the end of a particularly long stint of working overtime. I'd been going on for about seven weeks. It was Sunday. It was getting late. I was doing shut down and lock up, making sure everything was safe before leaving. This usually meant that I was the last man standing and the last man out. I went through my usual routine, which was kind of like a circuit first sign of things being off was a movement that I caught on the edge of my peripheral vision. I turned to see what had caught my attention. Nothing there. My first reaction was something that, maybe I guess something was just a miss. So I did what any other 23-year-old guy does and picked up something large and heavy. I shouted a couple of times that I would phone the cops. I'd try to scare the guy if there was a guy. Adrenaline was high. No reply. So I carried on shutting down, going about getting home, and then I saw him, just stood there, 30, maybe 40 yards away, tall, black jacket, bald head, just stood there. Only problem was, is that he had no face, no nose, no eyes, no mouth. Now I'm super tired at this rate, so even though I'm just kind of blind panicking, I screwed my eyes shut. Rubbed them hard, shook my head. Because that isn't possible, right? But he's still there. So I turned and walked pretty much as fast as I could the other way, but not run. But I was walking quick enough to maybe break into a run if I needed to. I got downstairs pretty quickly, grabbed my coat and bag, set the alarm, and out I went. Locked the doors and went home. Now I know what you may think. He was tired, worked too many hours, and seeing stuff. I didn't feel threatened by it, just to be clear. But it wasn't friendly. And it definitely didn't want me around. Now fast forward three months. 
old colleague of mine walking down the stairs from the canteen one early morning. Just me and him there, as usual. He's white as a sheet, stuttering. I looked at him and said, Black coat, bald head, quite tall. He nods, and we go outside for our coffees. And I calm him down a bit. There was a few sightings of whatever it was after that. Mainly when people were on their own. Mainly getting a feeling of unease. I'm glad I'm not there anymore, as it wasn't the last time I saw him either. Seeing Shadow People When I was a child, I always got a weird feeling from my grandmother's house. Specifically at night. It was just always so hard to sleep for some reason. One night I had a nightmare. It scared me so much I had to get out of bed to walk to my grandmother's room. My grandmother's room, however, was on the complete other side of the house. I walked down the hall past the atrium and saw my shadow on the wall. This didn't frighten me right away because I figured it maybe could just be the moonlight shining on me through the glass of the atrium reflecting a shadow. But I noticed the shadow was extremely tall. I knew shadows could look distorted, but this didn't look like my shadow. I turned around to find a seven-foot-plus tall shadow figure standing clear as day in front of me. Being a child, I reacted the only way I knew how to. I kicked it in the private area and ran away. I went to my grandmother's room and told her what had happened, and she just waved it off. Now, I would just say that this could be night terrors, but growing up, I told my siblings about it, my sister had seen the same thing. Years had passed, and we started to get kind of too old to spend weekends at my grandmother's house. My brother lived there for a short while, and one of his previous girlfriends had seen it too. To this day, I wouldn't spend the night at her house. It's unsettling. I've even woken up to my grandmother staring at me while sleeping once while I was there. This hasn't been the only time I've seen shadow people, though. I've seen them in the reflection of my TV, in the back seat of my car, out of the corner of my eye. I choose to ignore them. To me, it's not so consistent for me to think that it's hallucinations. I've seen so many shadow people, felt presences, and just recently seen a full-body apparition. One time I felt something watching me sleep so strongly. I was paralyzed in fear because I knew it was there. I've had sleep paralysis before, and this was not it. At one point, I swore I felt my shirt riding up while sleeping. I tried to ignore it, but when I felt something touch my back, I told myself, oh, hell no, and got up find it strange. I see these things a lot while others don't. I do believe in ghosts and the paranormal, but it honestly scares me. I don't invite that energy. I don't want to communicate with them. I just want to be left alone. However, I can't help but be curious. I've heard shadow people are mostly negative, and that just frightens me more because I've seen so many of them. If anyone has more info on them, I would definitely appreciate it. Shadow being plays with me on some nights. I woke up, but still in my bed, and I was kind of between sleep and a lucid state. There are two pillows which I used to sleep in my bed, the left one and the right one. When I woke up, I was really close to the pillow, the left one, but I slept on the right one. My head was turned towards the left side. So I felt a strange sort of feeling, because I felt the same type of energy I feel when the shadow being comes. I also felt that this being was here again to play and have fun by himself. 
The being pressed and pushed my head onto the left pillow. It was really hard to resist. And to go against his own maneuver. Sorry, this spelled wrong. Go against his own movement. Of course, I tried to push my head backwards, but quite difficult. In the same time, I felt my mouth was opening on its own. I was shocked and thought that maybe he wanted to go inside. I resisted with great difficulty, but I did it. After that, I remembered nothing. The second one that happened to me was this night. So I slept normally, but woke up at 1.30, an hour after falling asleep. I dreamt about a creature creating pictures with an AI night cafe, but in real life. It was odd and strange. I went to the toilet, and after coming back to my room, I fell asleep. Before going to sleep, I prayed for Jesus Christ to protect me. But after some time, here they are. They're coming again, and the prayer did not work. I woke up again, but I had to have my eyes closed, and I felt a pressure on my chest, like someone was sitting on me. I tried to breathe with difficulty, but after... Somebody was doing pressure movements on my chest, like if someone is needing help for the heart. I opened my eyes and saw a black figure with feminine silhouettes standing and watching in front of my bed. She was wearing a hat of the 50s and looked at me. With confusion at first, I thought it was just like my model figure, because I have one in my home and sometimes put the clothes that I made on it. But this was impossible because I don't have a hat like this. I did not put my model figure in front of my bed. I then knew something was strange, and it was probably the shadow figure. I closed my eyes and then felt my left arm going up without me controlling it. I tried to put it down, but again it went up and again I put it down. And finally woke up, but when I opened my eyes, I saw that my arm was still next to me and was never pulled up. I then think because it happened some other times that in fact... We are waking up with our astral body and our physical body so the entity can move our parts of our astral body because of that. Well, sir, that story was slightly confusing to me and I thought it needed a not-safe-for-work warning. But that's just the narrator. That's the end of today's stories. Have a great night, guys. See you tomorrow. A bad feeling while at Domino's. I, a 21-year-old man, with my friend, a 21-year-old female, were out shopping stuff. She needed a mirror for her room, and it was night around 9 p.m. Shops usually start closing around that time in my area. We bought the mirror and were on our way back, but we decided to stop at Domino's for pizza. We were very hungry. The Domino's was located on a narrow alley, which was very sus, according to me and my friend. On our way to the Domino's, had a small encounter with a man who got angry at me for not moving aside on the road so that way he could go on a scooter. The alley was narrow, but wide enough for a scooter to go around a person, even if they're close to the center of the road. He honked at me, but I wasn't paying attention. Then he yelled at me, and I was already far ahead when I turned towards him. By the time I heard him, he was easily able to go around and on his way, but he stayed there, yelling at me. When I turned to him, he asked me if I was deaf. I didn't like the tone, so I replied, saying that he could have just went around me if he wanted to, and there's so much space for him to go around me. He started yelling in his local language, which I couldn't understand. He went ahead and stopped at some point and turned back and he was waiting for me to get near him so that way he could tell me, once again. My friend was walking ahead of me so he didn't understand what had happened. When I reached near him I asked if he didn't want to go now as he was just waiting for me. He asked me where I was from and I'm with my girlfriend and asking if she was my girlfriend pointing at her. I said I don't need to tell him shit and asked him to be on his way. By that time, a car approached behind him and started honking at him as he was blocking its way. And then he did, in fact, go on his way. Me, <clears throat> me and my friend went inside Domino's. 
and she asked me what all this was all about, and I told her the whole thing. As we were waiting on her food to arrive, suddenly I have this very bad feeling inside of me. And I just couldn't understand why. It felt like something bad was about to happen. And after a while, my friend turned to me and told me that she wasn't feeling good either. I told her I felt the same, and it really felt like something bad was around us. We didn't know why it was happening. We had our food, and as it was raining too, I held my bike keys and palm as if I were ready to punch someone if somebody jumped us. I was walking alongside my friend towards the parking where I parked my bike and we were soaked in rain. We're only thinking about getting home as soon as possible. We never knew we had such a strong, bad feeling around that place, but it really felt like something bad was lurking around. The fact I felt that feeling and didn't let my friend know, and then she herself telling me that she feels the same, it sent chills down my body. Chasers by the Wind Escape from Mugger's Tunnel So we're going to go back around 25 years ago. And again, this is a moment in my life that's burned into my head with cold, hard clarity. Just because it scared me so badly. That night I'd been spending time with my girlfriend, and we'd been out for some sort of function. And it resulted in me having to walk her back to her house, which was a ways away and certainly pretty far from where I lived with my parents at the time. It was well past midnight, but the roads were well lit, and it was straightforward getting her back to her house. I left her there and said my good nights like a gentleman, and I'm starting to walk home. Now this is where it kind of gets sticky. To get to where I lived, it's necessary to go through a tunnel under a bridge that is literally two people wide. It's poorly lit, and if I'm honest, it's absolutely terrifying. That tunnel is cold, like bone cold all year round, and people have been murdered there, plural. Robbed and murdered over the years. So just going through there in daylight is awful. You can actually feel how horrid that place is. So I decided that the detour in this particular evening wasn't worth the hassle and I had a little bit of an old Dutch courage in me. Three steps into that tunnel, and the cold hit me through my jacket, like enough for me to catch my breath. Halfway in, and I was sure that there was someone in there, behind me, to the stage that I thought I heard footsteps. Everything in me said, turn around, but for some reason I wouldn't. It made no sense at the time, but it felt like the right thing to do. In the end, just before reaching the staircase, I bolted. Don't ask me why. I felt like if I didn't, something was going to happen. Like I'd spent too long in there. That damn tunnel. I got to the top of the steps and the street lamps, and literally as soon as I did, the wind picked up. Like ridiculously high wind. My jacket whipped up, and I had to sort of shield my eyes. So again, I don't know if it was panic or instinct, but I took off running, and it felt like the wind followed me. And all the way, I just felt like something was paying attention to me, like it was following me. I ran as fast as I could for what seemed like an eternity. All the while, I kept thinking if I stopped, that it'll have me. Please bear in mind, I know that sounds totally irrational, and I was 19 years old, But I got to my parents' house, and I locked that door, and I didn't sleep that night. Because I sat there, and I just listened to the wind at night till morning came. It really did feel at the time like it was trying to get to me. Westminster Chime So I live in the tropics of Australia. My house is situated in a remote part of the Daintree rainforest. I live on a house that sits on stilts, a Queenslander. 
and from my bedroom window it's about three to four meter drop. My closest neighbor is about one kilometer away, 0.62 miles. I don't live on a main road. However, I'm close to a creek. There's literally no one near me. This only happened around two nights ago. I was alone in my house, except for my cockatiel. I was sitting in bed watching some TV. Nothing out of the usual. I then got that all too familiar feeling of someone watching me, or something about to happen, a feeling that I've gotten accustomed to over the past 20 years. At that point, I heard the tap running in the kitchen, which I thought was strange. So I got up and went to the kitchen with my phone torch as my only guidance. Didn't want to wake my bird up by turning the lights on. I've gotten used to these types of things happening and I'm not really all that scared of them anymore. However, as I turned off the tap, my wall clock did its Westminster chime. I looked over and the time showed 12.38 a.m. This straight away caught my attention as I only set the clock to chime every hour. Then, as I was near the clock, the tap turned back on full force. I jolted quickly looking in its direction. I went to turn it off and there was condensation all over the handle and all over the window that sits above the tap. The tap was freezing cold even though the water coming out was boiling hot. My bird at this point was now awake due to my clock as it had just chimed a second time, roughly 1244. I quickly got my bird and brought him back into my bedroom with me. I left the kitchen and the clock as I just couldn't be bothered to put up with what was going on. My poor bird was scared shitless. I admit I kinda was too. As I sat in my bed, there were three knocks on my bedroom door. When I ignored them, they moved to my window. I got up and opened my curtains to nothing but trees and black as ink sky. I opened up the window. And my god, I'm getting goosebumps writing this. I heard whispers at the bottom of the ground far below me. I couldn't understand what they were saying. Then they stopped. As soon as they stopped, three knocks yet again hit my door. I slammed my window shut and locked the door. I yelled out, can you please just leave me in peace? They stopped. Nothing else happened that night and I finally got some sleep. It was really creepy, not too scary, but scary enough to give me some trouble sleeping. Paranormal experience that's happened to me. My family went camping over a weekend down in Wyoming in the Yellowstone area. It was my immediate family and my cousins. One night during that stay, it began to rain, and my cousin and I decided that we really didn't want to get soaked in the tent, so we moved into my mom's red suburban and put the seats down, and just stayed up and talked. I'm not entirely sure what time it was, given I didn't have a clock, but I'm assuming sometime around 2.33. We were talking for quite some time, to the point that even the forest was quiet. I sat up and looked out the back window of the vehicle and stared deep into some trees. Before anything bad happens, I always get a feeling beforehand. I remember staring down this line of trees and just getting an overwhelmingly bad feeling. Anyways, that feeling had caused me to just lay back down and continue talking to my cousin. I really didn't have the time or energy to see anything that night, because I knew if I kept staring in that direction, I would have seen whatever it was. As I was laying next to my cousin, a blue orb swiftly passes around the car that we were in. It was about the size of a basketball, maybe bigger. It was incredibly fast. So fast it shook the car. I jumped due to it surprising me, and I quickly grabbed onto my cousin and asked him, Did you see that? He 
gets a little startled from my sudden grab of his arm, and he just says that he didn't see anything. I brush it off, and assume it's just my lack of sleep messing with me. Anyways, fast forward about two minutes. A mass of light blue, a glowing orb start to surround the vehicle that we're in. It's making a noise that I will never forget. It's sort of like when a car at high speed passes you. It gets loud, then quiet, then loud again. The whole car was shaking as these orbs continue circling this car at this insanely high speed. This time, he's experiencing it too, and I'm clenching his arms so hard and screaming while he's screaming with me. This happens for what feels like forever, but in reality, it was probably just a matter of seconds, maybe ten. After the orbs vanished, we kept holding on to each other for a couple of minutes while shaking. Neither of us wanted to open our eyes. He says he saw something different than orbs, he described it as a tesseract triangle absorbing into each other, like a dolphin swimming through the water. But he described them as light blue and glowing, just as I. Ghost Dog When I was around five or six, my grandma's dog, Bosun, was diagnosed with cancer in his leg. Me and Bosun were best friends. My grandma had him since before it was born, so I spent lots of time with him. And out of all of my siblings, I was the closest to him. My two older siblings were scared of him, and my little sister was a baby. Bosun and I always played together and cuddled. He also let me fall asleep on him. He was a large dog, like a Rottweiler and a Great Dane mix. So don't worry, I wasn't squishing him or anything. When I was told about his cancer, I was sad. But I was still young, so in my head, he would be better soon. And it was no less than a stomach bug, perhaps. Obviously, that wasn't the case, and Bosun died a few months later. I was absolutely devastated probably the most I've ever been. I remember when I was first told, I ran up to my room, sat crying for hours. It was like that for a few days, but my parents brought me a life-size dog Teddy that I just thought looked just like him. So that helped to calm me down and cheer me up. Naturally, it was a while until my grandma let people stay over again. She was grieving too. But when she did allow people to go over, the weirdest thing happened. I was sitting in the living room watching TV. My granddad was there too. The weather wasn't bad, no wind, no rain. You know, just bland weather. You may not think this is important, but it is. All of a sudden, the living room door flew open, as if a massive gust of wind has just hit it. But like I said earlier, there was no wind, and the back door, front door, or any of the windows that were in a close area to the door were shut. So it couldn't have been the wind. I also thought that it could have been one of my grand's cats. So I looked down into the hallway. There were no cats, no people, but there was something. It was transparent, but it had color as well. It was the figure of a sitting dog. Not just any dog. It was Bosun. Sitting at the end of the hallway, a very faint blue outline surrounding him. I was in shock. And as I looked at Bosun for around ten seconds, I felt a comforting feeling. But then the door slammed shut again. I didn't want to say anything to my grandparents, as I didn't know if they would be upset or how they would react to what I had just seen. So when my granddad asked what it was, I said I didn't know, and that it was just really weird. He agreed, and we went back to watching TV. Huh. 
hunting lease experience. Currently, I'm at my family's hunting lease. Last night, I was in the bedroom that I'm sleeping in. It has two twin beds and isn't the biggest, and it was just me. My parents are two rooms down. At 11.44, I woke up suddenly, but I had an eerie feeling. Looking up, there's a small rack with hunting clothes and two small backpacks. That's when I see a tall female-looking transparent yet black figure. It was quite tall. As soon as I noticed her, she said something along the lines of, Come on, take a backpack and come with me. Unsure of what I was looking at, I say, What? Who are you? She repeats her line. Come on, take the backpack and come with me. I reach down to my side and grab my phone, turning the flashlight on, and immediately facing it to her. She's gone. Immediately, my heart starts beating out of my chest. I'm having trouble breathing. Keeping the light on, I begin to pray. After sitting for a while and calming down, I decide to try to sleep again. Not long after I wake up, I have my back to the wall, and that's when I see a figure in the bed next to me. I freeze and they sit up, staring at me. This made me sit up quickly and then see another figure next to the rack on my left. My heart is beating out of my chest again, so I run out to go to my parents' room and I tell them. They know I love paranormal things and I have a deep belief for them. I was shaking almost uncontrollably and my voice is trembling as well. They say I could sleep in their room, full and twin bed. My dad says it could be easier to sleep in the bunks outside their door, just leave their door open. I set myself up to sleep in a bunk by our dog's crates. Still uneasy, I'm constantly looking around in fear that they're still there. Suddenly, as I'm about to fall asleep, I hear my dad freaking out and my mom consoling him. Apparently, something was trying to rip his blanket off of him. Found out this morning. I wake up at around 5.30 a.m. before leaving for our morning hunt to the sound of a banging noise. Like someone hitting wood in the room. It happened three times and three different times too. Three minutes, five, then three. It was never together. It was normally three bangs. I'm not sure what happened, but it definitely is... It just has me spooked. Even just writing this, I'm totally uneasy. I'm a huge paranormal fan, and I guess you could call me an enthusiast, you could say. So I'm trying to think if I could have done something to anger whatever it was, but... Soon our lease is ending since the owners want it for themselves. Seance Around age 16 to 19, I was watching my youngest sibling, just doing homework, 12 years younger than myself, but very bright, so we'd print out advanced homework for her. Probably closer to 18 or 19, I suppose, given her cognitive ability at the time. My middle sibling, Jade, was out with a friend at a sleepover, and my mom and stepdad were out working. Now keep in mind, it wasn't uncommon for us to be watching things like Ghost Hunters or other paranormal shows. But often when we did, the doors in the halls would slam or lights would turn off and on. I avoided those shows for that very reason back then, because I used to be uncomfortable with the houses that we'd pick. While I was in the upstairs front room with my youngest sibling, home alone, watching TV on the couch... She's sitting on the floor doing homework on the coffee table. Randomly, the lights flicker in our 1940s house, while the TV remains stable, and I hear, Where's Jade? I'm freaked out, but I stone face it, with my heart beating a million miles a minute. I was thinking, that can't be good, is she okay? If it's asking her about... What she means, maybe she got into an accident? Am I the only one that heard that? 
After a little bit, though, my youngest sibling turned around from homework and asked me, Where's Jade? Like this has to be something from a horror movie or something. If I hadn't lived this stuff myself, I don't know if I'd ever believe that this could even happen. I'm not sure if my eyes actually widened when I asked, but I tried to play it off as to not scare her, but I asked why she asked. She told me that it was because she heard somebody else ask, which of course did not make me feel any better. But it did make me more concerned, so I called out middle sister, three years younger than myself, Jade. She didn't answer, and I didn't know if she was ignoring me or couldn't answer for me. But I knew that she'd answer for our mom, so I called our mom and asked what Jade was doing. She told me she was sleeping over at a friend's. I told her that the lights flickered and we both just heard, Where's Jade? So, we weren't sure if that she, maybe she was in an accident or what had happened. My mom was now panicked and she called Jade, but called me back and told me that she was having a seance with her friends. So this seance my sister had elsewhere caused a spirit in my own house to come looking for her, and many of the ones in that house did not feel friendly. The portal in that basement scared me any time I passed it to go upstairs. Something is haunting me and my sister. Ever since I can remember, I've had some scary experiences with things I can't really explain. From things falling off counters to seeing people that weren't there. It became a norm for me and my family to the point of us ignoring things. I believe it's all connected to the house that we were living in at that time. Because as soon as we moved out, these unexplainable things hit a plateau. But this experience was too stunning to ignore. First, a little bit to know before I start the story. It was a pretty chill night at my house. Everyone was asleep except me, my sister, and my baby's brother. Oops, and my brother's baby. Avery, who was about ten months at the time, Avery was very attached to my sister, so she often slept with us. Me and my sister shared a room with a bunk bed. And of course, being the youngest, I got the top bunk. This bunk bed was worn and creaky. If someone was moving or doing anything at all, it would make a noise. Anyways, on this night I was watching TV while my sister went out to do something, leaving Avery sleeping on the bottom bunk. She had been in a deep sleep for about 30 minutes, and usually when she hits the 10 minute mark, we know that she's out for the night. To my surprise, my sister came back to the room pretty quickly and sat down very aggressively on the bed as well, and she left the door open. Her heavy sit caused a very loud creak to come from the bed, so loud that it made the baby wake up. I heard a quiet shh come from my sister from the bottom bunk. Avery started crying heavily. I've never heard her cry so hard, but I chose to ignore it because my sister was with her and would hopefully calm her down. But after 20 minutes of this going on of constant crying, I couldn't take it anymore. I wondered what my sister was doing instead of comforting the screaming baby right beside her. I was annoyed beyond belief. Are you see? I bend my head down to look at the bottom bunk and all I see is Avery, sitting there, tears running down her face, alone. My heart completely drops. Felt like I couldn't breathe for a second. My body went completely cold, although I was in a well-heated house. My sister then bursts into the room, screaming at me for not doing anything about the crying baby. I was absolutely stunned. I seen my sister come in, I heard her sit down, and the door was still wide open from when she first came in. She asked me why I wasn't doing anything, and I simply replied, I thought you were in here. Story 
stories from my old house. I'm currently 18 and I've been living in my house for I'd say about eight years now. My family, which includes at the time my two sisters and my mother, moved in with my Nana because of a few reasons I wouldn't want to bore you with. But for the first 10 years of my life, we lived in a house where so many unexplained things happened. Even since us moving, a few horrible things have happened there, which I won't go into detail about, possibly later. Firstly, this was before I was born, and when I was a newborn. My elder sister, who was three when I was born, had a friend that she played with in the house. She described her as a skinny, blonde-haired girl. She distinctly remembers her having a mole on her left cheek. My sister is also blonde, so when my mother saw a young blonde girl dash past her doorway, she would assume it was my sister. Only until she realized that my sister was in the same room as her. My sister would just blabber on about her friend to my mother quite frequently, saying how much she liked to play with her. Another time, my mother was asleep on the couch. She said it was around 9 or 10 at night, when she was awoken suddenly by a man she'd never seen before, screaming her name in her face. She still says it was the most terrified she's ever been, and has called the police as well as my dad, who's at work at the time, to come home. The house was searched, but no sign of anyone. There was even times where my mother would lose her keys or phone or whatever, check somewhere, for example, the kitchen side. They wouldn't be there. She'd go look somewhere else and then come back into the kitchen to find whatever she was looking for sat in a place she'd already searched. In my own experience at that house, I'd hear tapping on the walls, footsteps. But I'm a person who thinks rationally and logically, so I pass these off. Yeah, I can't explain my personal experiences, but not as clueless as to immediately say that it was something paranormal. I agree, Gecko. A few years back, however, my mother got a message on Facebook from the people who moved in after we left, asking if anything weird happened there when we lived at the house. So some weird stuff must have happened to them, too. It's pretty depressing because everyone in my family has some memory of that something strange was happening at that old house apart from me. Well, if you don't count the tapping and the footsteps. But being in the house did feel unsettling. And I even thought of the idea of cold spots and a haunted place as a bit of a cliché. But there would be times where you'd suddenly feel cold. A story for dog lovers. Eight years ago, I lost my dog. And if I'm honest, a piece of myself. Fundamentally, anybody who's ever had a dog in their life knows how special they are, how individual they are, what they do for you, and in the end, what you lose when they're gone to go to the beyond. Everyone thinks that their dog is special, and they're not wrong. And with that in mind, I'll tell you a bit about my dog, how we found each other, and what led to the events in the first place. I first met Baxter at a rescue center. I'd walk around the place twice, as it was the time that I was just looking real hard for the dog that we would agree upon with my wife, until we found some enclosures that we'd not yet seen. As you can imagine, all the dogs in there were going crazy and barking, yelping, bouncing up and down, all save one. Right at the end of the enclosures was a large, skinny black dog, silent, and sat still just staring. Of course, I walked over and stared right back at him. Just as I turned to call my wife, he barked at me. Don't ask me why. But he has me right there, and I have to say it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. He was the epitome of a man's best friend. Even though he was a Heinz 57, a Labrador Doberman Cross, 
He was sweet-tempered, yet fiercely protective. He was smart, but goofy. And he so loved my little boy. When the time came as it does to take the last walk with him, it broke me. Down to the pit of my soul and hurt me in a way I'd really never thought I could be hurt. The bond I had with him was so strong, he knew my moods, he knew everything. Hell, he even cried with me when my grandmother died. Which leads me to the last bit of this cathartic tale I'm telling. I brooded a lot after he passed, and it was a long time before I felt like myself. So eventually I started to feel more like myself when every now and again it felt like he was around. Sometimes it felt like something was sitting on my feet, or I'd feel something brush up against me. Things I wrote off in my head. However, what I couldn't write off was the day that I was walking to the shops and a little girl said to her mom as I walked past her, Mommy, look at that dog walk behind that mister. I nearly choked and burst into tears as obviously no dog that could be seen was following me. So the entire reason for this, to all the dog lovers who may read or hear this, they go on, and they do hang around. For a while, at least, anyway. My boy did, and maybe I'll see him again one day. Creepy Damn Experience I was 14, so maybe my memory is foggy, but I swear to God it was real. Spirits and ghosts were always a joke to me until this moment when I legitimately felt like something happened. Warning in advance, this may be long and it's on my phone. Noted. So three or four years ago, when I was around 13 or 14, I was at a close friend of mine's house. Me and him always hung out, and I would stay the night and all that jazz. As one would do as a 13-year-old, I trusted him. His house has kind of a big backyard where we would always play soccer. Now, if you're standing flush to his house looking at his backyard, there is a normal wood fence straight ahead and a normal one to the right. To the left, there is only a two cinder block high little wall. He would always tell me that he saw big black figures and shit in his neighbor's house windows and yard and the porch. Meanwhile, might I add, nobody lived there at the time. I would always write it off as him just jokingly saying these things to mess with me. He would describe them as these eight foot tall black masses, just pitch black things standing there or existing there, and when he would look away, he would go away or move closer. Keep this in mind. So me and him are in the backyard messing around, playing soccer, kicking the ball, eating whatever you do at 13. We have our goal set up with shoes against the cinder block wall. Dumb as hell. I shoot a couple and they bounce off and come back. Then I hit one and it goes over the wall, into the neighboring house's yard, and rolls to the furthest corner of the other yard. Of course, my friend being him said, You kicked it, go get it. Willingly, I jumped over the little wall and head to the ball. As I walk over, yes, walk, I don't know what I was thinking, I feel the only way I can describe is my stomach drop like a roller coaster. I turn my head toward the neighbor's house and standing against the wall is this massive, at least eight, maybe eight and a half foot tall black mass just there, existing. I froze ball in front of me and all I could do was stare. I felt like I was holding my breath. I wasn't focused on anything but it, its entire body. I heard my friend tell me to hurry up and I finally snapped. I grabbed the ball and looked away for half a second and when I looked back it was gone. But I said, fuck that, and I grabbed the ball and ran as fast as I could back over. I went inside and got a drink and just didn't mention it. The next morning I asked my friend and he said, Yeah bro, I see him all the time. It never does anything, it just is kind of there. Sounds 
650 Old Hull Road. Not safe for work, I warned you. Let me start by saying I'm not a skeptic, but I wasn't much of a believer either. That is, until I had worked at 650 Old Hull Road. It's a building the company I work for had rented for an extra room of our Walmart holiday candy orders. The first night there was an ordinary night. We started setting up for the day shift orders and pulling things that were, you know, just to get ready and they were going smoothly. The second night is when things started to get strange. The second night while I was working, I smelled the scent of woman's perfume which was weird because there were no women working with us on the night shift. After I smelled the perfume, I started hearing whispers, like the ones in the second Ouija movie. But I just said to myself that it just must be homeless people that walk the railroad tracks at night. Then I thought if that were true, how could I hear them inside? The building's walls were made of five inch thick bricks and I remember the train rolling by. Which brings me to the third night, when I locked myself out of the building. Yeah, I did that. Like I said, I locked myself out of the building. Since I couldn't get back in, I went to lunch. Now there's a side door that we use for truck drivers to go in and out. There was no outside, no handle on it, so if it shuts, someone has to let you in from the inside. And that's kind of how I got locked out. I went outside to throw out some trash. Now the door did have a latch that holds the door open, but the second I turned my back, the door slammed shut. Honestly, it damn near scared the shit out of me. That's how I got locked out. So I drove to the nearby McDonald's, got me something to eat, headed back to the 650. That's what we all called the building for short. Once I got back, I see the side door from the parking lot, and that sucker was wide open. The latch was locked, and I'm standing there scratching my head. Which brings me to the fourth night. The fourth night is when the lights on one specific aisle started flickering. One by one, the lights would flicker off and on, like someone or something was walking down the aisle. When the last light went off, once it came on, so did one of the building's heaters. When the heater lights up, it looked like ten eyes staring down at me. That's also the night I saw it. I don't know what it was, but it had a man's body and its head didn't look human. After I saw that, I was never a skeptic again. Ask Reddit. Well, when I was 16, my family was temporarily staying at my aunt's house. This was while we transitioned from out of state to the area. My aunt lived in an old family house that had been part in our family for generations. The house was super old. Everything was made out of real wood and creaked like hell. Doors, windows, stairs, and floors. It was summertime. And me, being 16, was up around 2 a.m. in the living room chilling by myself on my laptop. All the lights were out, because I didn't want to disturb anyone else in the house. The house had the basic main floor, upstairs, and basement. It was also an old row house in D.C., so you could just turn your head in either direction and see the entirety of the house. So it wasn't the largest of spaces. Well, anyway, I'm chilling, hanging out, super attentive to whatever the hell I was looking at at my computer. I was laying on my tummy with my head in the direction of the front door and the stairwell that led upstairs. Then out of nowhere, I hear someone say my name from right behind me. I mean right behind me, as if someone was standing or sitting right behind me. The voice was crystal clear, not a muffle or anything sounded like a man's voice, although there were no men in the house. I also have an extremely unique name that isn't easily confused with other words. 
Instantly, I smiled, thinking it was one of my sisters or cousins playing a prank on me. I whipped my head around to catch whoever thought that maybe they were just being funny, and there was absolutely no one there. As I began to think of how someone could be pranking me, the humorous feeling I had quickly faded to terribly petrified. I realized I was the only one on the main floor. Everyone else was either upstairs in the bedrooms, or my mom was sleeping in the basement turned temporary room. I began thinking that the proximity the voice came from, literally right behind me, was too close for someone to sneak up behind me to not hear them approaching. Literally everything in this house creaked loud as hell. Literally impossible for someone to even tiptoe around without being heard. Before this moment, I was facing the staircase. So if anybody came downstairs from one of the upstairs bedrooms, I would have seen them. Within a matter of seconds, I hopped up and went off to the basement to join my mom as she slept. One of the most horrifying moments of my life. Never experienced anything remotely similar since. Thank God. The Mimic A little background info. Two years ago, me and my family moved across states. We moved into my current home. We always have a lot of people at our house, and my family is usually outside on the porch. Some family was supposed to be flying back to the state that we moved from that day. I was getting home from school last year, and I was walking through the door. My mom was walking past into her room, and I called out to her. She didn't answer me, so I brushed it off, because she was probably just having her selective hearing. My dad was outside smoking, so I went outside and gave him a kiss and a hug to let him know that I got home. I sat down and told him that I saw my mother walking into a room and joked that she'd ignored me. My dad gave me a confused look and told me that she was at the airport dropping people off. I thought that he was joking with me and laughed, saying that she probably forgot something and was just getting it. I pulled up my phone to look at her location to, like, I don't know, prove she was here, and it said she was 45 minutes away at the airport. My dad looked at me weird and said, I told you so. But the thing with my mom is, it's that she's kind of short. My sisters and I are all a couple inches taller than her. She also dyes her hair like an orange color. One of my sisters has black hair and the other one has a dirty blonde. No one really looks like her. What's really the kicker to this story is that a week ago or something, we were all talking out loud about ghost experiences in like a group of me, my dad, and my mom. I retold my story and my dad got this look on his face. He does that face when he doesn't want to say something scary. I pressed him on it and turns out something similar happened to him. My dad's from Morocco and his mom visits from time to time in the States. One time when she was supposed to be in Morocco, he saw her walking up the steps to go upstairs. He was home alone, like me and my sisters were at school and work, and my mom was at my aunt's house. He chills on the couch a lot, and from sitting where he usually does, you can see the top portion of the stairs in our house. He, being the man he is, walked up the steps after he saw, and she just disappeared upstairs. He gets upstairs and see her walk into the room that she would have used to live in when she'd lived with us. My dad walked into the room, and obviously no one was in there. So apparently we have an entity that likes to mimic mothers. Oh, and I saw my mother completely solid. It looked like my mother even down to wearing what she wore that morning. Little man wanted to marry five-year-old me and take me away. This happened when I was five years old. My dad had just passed away. 
barely get sick, even till this day. But I had a fever then. I remember I'd be lying down on the bed and see two little people. Now they weren't like dwarves or gnomes. They were basically like Barbie dolls, but as big as water bottles, like Nestle bottles. They'd appear on my bed and basically entertain me. I don't remember what they wore, but it was a man and a lady. The lady never really spoke to me, but the man did. They do all sorts of things to entertain me, such as cartwheels, dancing, backflips, and so on and so forth. Now, my mom wasn't really home much, but she was at the hospital where my dad passed away, sorting, sorting out death certificates or whatever she did. So I was home with some relatives that I barely knew. So I kept to myself, and I would just talk to these little people. But a time came where the little man would talk about marrying me and taking me away. I don't remember what in details that he was saying, but he did freak me out so much that it caused me to have a manic episode, and I was screaming, I don't want to marry you, over and over and over again. I was at home with my aunts and my cousins, and they had no idea what to do, so they rushed me to the hospital where my mom was. According to my mom, she tried to hold me and calm me down, but I had this distant look in my eyes, like I didn't know who she was or who anyone was, and then suddenly I recognize and then forget on and off. I remember a nurse giving me an injection. I don't know what it was exactly, but I was able to calm down. I still had a fever for two weeks after that, but eventually I was able to recover and never see the little people again. Years later, I hear my mom talking to her friend about the things that I was saying. I said things like, I don't want to ring. I don't want to leave here. Don't take me away. I don't want to marry you. I don't know if this is parent. Oops, excuse me. I don't know if this is a paranormal experience, but my mom did have a priest who said that there was a female entity living in her house. But the one I encountered was a male, so I'm confused. Do kids have hallucinations while having a fever? Yeah. Even if it was hallucinations, I knew nothing about marriage to that extent. Do I have a mental disorder? I haven't had hallucinations since then. My mom recently told me about a little man that she encountered during her childhood. I'll narrate that another time. Could it be the same? My 7-Eleven is haunted. So a while back, roughly around mid-November 2021, I was working night shift at my local 7-Eleven. My co-worker was in the back cooking chicken, and I was out front taking care of the customers and making sure all of our write-offs were done. And then I heard this alarm telling me that the door opened and a customer had entered. I spun around to greet them, and as I did... I saw a black blur rush through the door and dart down the nearest aisle. At first, I thought it was a customer that really needed the washroom or something, but then I noticed I didn't see them pass by any other aisles leading to the washroom. So, I decided to take a quick look around the store to make sure they weren't trying to steal anything. However, I couldn't find anyone in the store. They just disappeared. Roughly five to ten minutes later, a woman entered the store and walked down all the aisles, seemingly looking for someone. Then she called out their name, Wesley. She only said it once before leaving the store. After that strange night, up until three days ago, things were normal. Nothing really seemed out of the ordinary, but the only incident I found, being slightly strange, was hearing a banging thud on the walls. This was in the kitchen one day. However, one of the bathrooms is on the other side of that wall, so I was cooking at the time, so really didn't know if we had any other customers in there at that moment, which is completely possible. There could have been countless things that they were doing. We've had extremely high people banging around the bathroom before. Teens will sometimes decide to have sex in there. Ew. Needless to say, that washroom's definitely seen some shit. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was a customer. 
Anyways, on Thursday, January 20th, I was once again working the night shift. And while doing my end of the shift, paperwork and printing off everything I needed, I was standing in front of the window facing all the gas pumps, when for some reason pump number one popped up on the gas till, saying that someone clicked the request help button. But when I looked out the window, there was no one anywhere near the pumps. The entire lot was empty, except for a couple of cars belonging to other people in the area who also work night shifts in the neighboring stores. Later that same night when I went to the washroom, the door handle jiggled when I was inside. This was an employee washroom in the back. Customers don't have access to it. And when I came back out, I asked my coworker if she was trying to open the door, but she was getting cookies boxed to sell to customers and never left the front of the store. Ask Reddit. Once when I was about nine years old, it was late at night. I'm asleep in my room, and my younger sister, who's eight, is asleep down the hall in her room. It's not uncommon for us to run into each other's rooms if we have a nightmare. You know that whole trying to outrun the demons, just run into the other's bed? Well, this night, I literally woke up out of a dead sleep. It's dark, the moon is high outside my window, and my sister is standing in my doorway. It's not debatable that it's her. Her height, her stupid haircut, down to the new kids on the block oversized t-shirt nightgown from my mom's youth. But she's just standing there, one hand on the doorknob, other hand on the doorframe, staring at me, silent. I look at her for a minute, and then, just kind of annoyed, I throw my blanket open. Come on, if you're coming in here. She doesn't move, doesn't say anything. She's still staring. And I'm not even creeped out at this point. I'm just annoyed and sleepy and white trash. <laughs> so I get up to go hit her. I know, it's a garbage pail kid kind of thing to do, but I'm just being honest. Our parents didn't teach us self-regulation. It is what it is. I'm better now. I jump out and stomp over to where she is and stop at arm's length in front of her. She's still silent, still staring. Now, I'm a little bit creeped out at this point. What are you doing? And I swipe at her overhand. She disappears as my hand falls. Not like dissipates into nothing, like straight up is just gone. I look back at my bed. I look in the hallway. Nothing. So now I run to her room down the hall because it's that time. Nightmare time. Zoom, jump, wrestle into her covers. And when I get there, I notice that she's there, thank God. But she's shaking violently. She's having a fucking seizure. So then I go into a full tilt alarm, run to my parents' room, turn on all the lights, yelling that my sister's having a seizure. We go to the emergency room, and she gets her diagnosis of childhood epilepsy. I also didn't even know what a seizure was when I started yelling about this, which was also weird. I honestly think to this day, that she astral projected or something. That bitch found a way to come get me because she was in trouble in her bed. Was this an angelic intervention? When I was five years old, my much older sister offered to walk me and my six-year-old sister downtown. The walk from her house to the store with my 19-year-old sister, she was intent on taking us, and it wasn't very far. This I do recall. She made me and my six-year-old sister hold hands as she walked ahead of us by a good way, since we were dawdling as young kids as they do. The incident occurred when we walked in front of a garage that was very close to the street. 
As we approached the short driveway, it outbacks this long car. We didn't see it until it was approaching, without any indication that it would stop. And my six-year-old sister says, Lay down! I was obedient, and neither of us screamed or yelled out to our eldest sister, while we immediately took a horizontal position. Kids who think they have a plan might just consider the whole thing adventurous. I don't know. I can still see the car rolling back, and just when the fender was at our chests, the car stopped. The driver opened the door and he walked to the back where we were lying on the cemented driveway. Half of each of our bodies visible. He simply gave instruction, me first, then my sister, to put out her hands above our heads, and he bent down and took both hands in his, and gently lifted us both until we were standing upright behind his car. The whole ordeal was over in mere minutes, but enough time for our eldest sister to become aware that something was amiss, and she walked back to where we were all standing. Weirdly, the gentleman reached into his pocket and gave us each a quarter. We then set off on our way again after our eldest sister told us to say thank you to the man. I'm now 55 years old, but my partner in that odd happening will bring it up to this day, and we muse about what could have happened if we hadn't have stopped. Tragedy. And what reason could have been for him to have been alerted to two small little girls under his moving car? Neither of us heard any loud voices or alarms, nor did our eldest sister, as she's since attested. Another strange thing about it is that I've always asked my sister, the six-year-old at the time, where she even got that split-second idea of laying flat rather than running. She can't remember. If he'd had seen us when looking in his mirrors, he would never have put his car in reverse and stepped on the gas. What or who interceded that day? Demon Encounter Oh boy, the stories I have. The most recent one was about a year ago. So we live in a two-story home. That's important for this story. When my husband gets ready for work, he walks up and down, into the restroom, into the closet, and I know the sound of his boots upstairs. So I'm making myself a coffee downstairs, and I can hear him walking and getting ready. After he left for work, I started hearing his boots again in my closet. So I looked out the window. His truck was gone. I went upstairs, and of course, nowhere in sight. I kept it to myself, thinking maybe it was just the house settling or something. This kept happening for a month. Then my daughter and I were living in the living room, and I heard the boots again. I looked at my daughter, hoping I wasn't going crazy, and she had heard them too. She looked at me and asks, Is Dad still here? I'm like, No, you heard that too? Then I went on to tell her all the times I'd been hearing someone walking. Now, my daughter is a medium, even though she doesn't want to use her gifts. I asked her, can you please use your gift to help me cast this thing away? She immediately said yes. So we went on checking every nook and cranny, all the rooms, mine being the last one. We go one by one, and she's like, nope, nothing here, or here, and so on and so forth. When we went into my room, she stopped. She said, I feel something really bad in here. She pointed at my bed, on my side, then said, it's in the closet. We walk into the closet, and my daughter starts crying hysterically, and her face shifted into fear I'd never seen on anyone. Mind you, this is the first time she's actually confronted anything with her gifts. I helped her calm down, and before we decided to cast it out, we prayed so that God would protect us and cover us with his presence and his precious blood. Once those prayers were done, the war began. 
we prayed and cast that thing back to where it came from. And I could feel it fighting, and she could see it laughing. When my daughter told me he was laughing, I got so mad and prayed harder. She then said, It looks scared, Mom. I'm like, he should be, because we have the power of God. Eventually, he left. We felt such a relief, and my daughter's face changed back to peacefulness. Sleep Paralysis plus OBE OBE stands for Out of Body Experience. This happened a few years ago when I was 17. I was a senior in high school at this time. I wasn't on drugs, medication, or alcohol leading up or during this experience. I went to bed late that night. Only my dreams started and I was on the ceiling looking at my sleeping body below. I saw a dark figure on the side of my bed. It was blacker than the pitch black room and seemed to be very hairy, furry. I don't know how to quite describe the appearance. Most of it was just a dark blob, but I know it was hairy because it kept reaching over and touching my face. I felt it tickling my face and my sleeping body would instinctively reach out and touch the spot it just did. And I could feel it. I could feel the tickling sensation and I could feel my own hand brushing my face off. It did that for an unknown amount of time. Just reached out, messed with me, retreated and repeated for presumed hours. But eventually it looked up at me. I could see its eyes and its mouth somehow. I don't recall there ever being a light that showed its face, but I could see it was looking at me on the ceiling. And it was smiling. It then focused back on my unconscious body and sprung onto the bed, its arms swinging wildly as it attacked me. I was dragged down from the ceiling back to my unconscious body and woke up, I was shaking all over. How I would think a seizure would feel like as if I was vibrating. Of course, when I woke up, the entity was gone. Important to notice I have a gray cat. He often sleeps with me, right on my chest, or against my neck. That night, he was on the opposite side of the bed in the far corner. When the thing jumped onto the bed, I watched from position on the ceiling that the cat was running away. When I woke up, the cat was gone, which is out of the norm. Not unheard of, but typically the cat wakes up when I would get up in the morning. I would post this elsewhere, but it's important to state later in my waking life. I was out in a state park way too late around 4 a.m. and I saw the entity across a clearing in another tree line. Again, I could see its face, but I knew it was beaming at me with a smile. I don't know how, but I just knew it was smiling. I have not seen the entity since then. These incidents were only a few weeks apart, too. I saw a white slime climbing a tree tonight. So basically, I was with a group of friends, and we were walking from one condominium to another. There was a forest between these condominiums, with a fence dividing it from the sidewalk. I was behind the group with my friends, and we were walking through a slightly dark part of the street. Both of us saw some white thing in one of the trees. It looked like a slime, and it was moving in a really weird way. It had no legs, no face, and it was a really powerful white like there's no chance it was a light or something else. I called for the other guys and as I shouted, it started climbing really fast in a really bizarre way, as if I scared it. I turned on the lights from the phone to see if I could find it, but honestly, I was too scared and my heart started beating so fast, so I just started running away with my friend. It was so good to have him there, because we talked later, 
and both of us saw the same thing, and even complimented each other as we talked. So I was sure I was not hallucinating. Of course, none of our friends who were in front of us believed in what we said. Some of them got intrigued, but I wouldn't blame them for not believing it, as I wouldn't blame you. It was really strange. It was like that venom slime, but white. It's my only encounter with something like that, and I just can't explain what it was. It really looked like it was not from this earth. Edit. Just thought as the post got some attention, I figured I should give an update. First off, I wanted to thank everyone that participated. I didn't know this subreddit, and I never participated, you know, participated that much on Reddit at all, but I've read some interesting posts here, and I'll probably stay around. I don't think I'll ever post any other story here again, at least I hope so. Wanted to thank in special the two guys who shared their stories seeing this white thing. I've talked to other people about this, but people either don't take it seriously or just have no idea what it is when I describe it. I went back to my place today around 2 p.m. to see if there's anything there, but unfortunately just found nothing. I still have no idea what it was, and I may never know. All I can do now is wait if more people from these condominiums will notice it. Because I swear on everything. That thing is not an animal. That is just beyond science. A dream that was kind of not a dream. So a little context. This happened about 10 years ago. I was 17 at the time. I was a little psychopath back then. Dreams of me going on mass killings and fantasies of burning down my school. Please keep in mind, I'm nothing like that anymore. When I was in this state... I had a few experiences with the demonic that I can't explain. I was being awakened by loud stomping and being shaken awake. For some reason, I hated when anybody said the word God. I would hear whispers in different languages in my own room. I might make a separate post, or edit them in, I guess, about these experiences. But eventually I started to get back on the right path. I started developing empathy. I started changing for the better, and I had two dreams during this phase. One before, which I won't talk about because every time I try and tell the story I get incredibly sick, but I will say I met an actual demon in the dream world that looked absolutely horrifying. And one after the phase. So one night I slept and I was having a normal dream. Can't remember fuck all about this part of the dream, but this normal dream did a complete transition. It went from a normal dream to me in my bed listening to footsteps of something coming to my room. I turned to look at my door, and the second that I felt this presence get close, what I saw was a dark entity of myself. I had a fight-or-flight response, and since that door is the only exit, I threatened it. If you don't leave right now, I swear I'm going to. Before I finish, it teleports right to my bedside and holds my arm and shoulder down. I feel excruciating pain in my shoulder. I jolt awake and I realize that I'm in the exact same position I was in that dream. There are other dreams I could share and I might edit them in within the week. Out of most of the paranormal events that I've experienced... With the exception of a few, the dreams of them are the ones that are most interesting to me. As it is said, you aren't capable of dreaming somebody that you have never seen before. Yet I have seen dreams of horribly disfigured creatures with horns that I certainly have never seen before in my life. But anyway, if enough people are interested, I might share more stories that don't cause me physical discomfort. Sorry for the bad writing, it's late and I need to get some sleep. A 
attachment. This story starts with a boyfriend, a boyfriend of one of my friends that they had a few months back. They dated for about a year and their relationship was always rocky. They lived together for a period of time and while he was living with her, weird things would happen. Prior to him living there, there had been no strange encounters. There were situations that I didn't personally encounter, as I wasn't at her apartment at the time. But a few things she had mentioned were things that, like items would go randomly missing and turn up days or weeks later in places that she had previously checked. She would call me late at night and tell me how she would hear knocking in threes on her walls. There were also times that she would feel like she was being watched. It got to the point where she wouldn't be at home alone anymore. There was a specific time where her boyfriend saw a dark manly figure smile widely at him, in quotes. This was from outside the open bedroom door, a bit after 2 a.m. My friend, however, didn't see this, but she did hear the bedroom door slam, and when she went into the room to check it out, she found him sitting in the bed, eyes wide and unable to cough up a sentence. That said, they came and stayed with me at my place. After they had left, I started having weird things happening at my house. One night, I heard what sounded like breathing, but I had my music on, so it wasn't very audible. Once I turned my music off, I didn't hear anything right away, but after a few seconds of sitting there listening, I heard and felt a loud breath right against my left ear. I was startled so badly I ran out of my house into the neighbor's house. Another time, my bedroom door stared and it's kind of just slowly opening. Sorry, they wrote stared. I assume they meant started. But no one was there, not even my cat. Thankfully, a couple of months after, I had moved into my new place, and since I have no experiences like that in my new place, there was another time her boyfriend at the time would zone out, quote unquote. During these zone outs, weird things would occur. One time while I was there, I noticed him zoning out, his eyes were widened, and he began hearing what sounded like walking coming from the other room. When he focused his attention back to us again, he stopped hearing it. Ever since he left, my friend has had no more experiences. Which leads me to wonder, was something attached to him? My friend moved in the night and nobody knows how. I grew up in a house that was well over a hundred years old when we moved in. For years, I never experienced anything remotely paranormal. But when I was 13, I moved into the basement. On the first night, I didn't sleep. This isn't uncommon because I'm an insomniac, but this was different. My room was pitch black at night because the only window was tiny. I rolled over in the night and heard my inflatable chair. Yes, it was the early 2000s. And I heard it move as if someone was getting out of it. I felt that someone was standing behind me, watching me, and the feeling didn't abate until I started to see the sunrise. I lived in that basement for seven more years and had a myriad of experiences. I heard a man and woman arguing in the laundry room when no one else was in the home. I'd set three alarms. Again, I'm an insomniac. And all three would be turned off in the morning. I'd hear whispers in my ear when I was lying on the couch trying to nap. I saw a shadow figure going up and down the back stairs which led to the basement. But the creepiest experience happened when I was 14. If you hadn't gleaned it yet, I have trouble sleeping, and this is mostly because I'm a light sleeper. Literally anything will wake me up. One night my friends and I were having a sleepover in our basement living room. My two friends and my sister slept together on our fold-out couch. 
I slept on the recliner, which was in front of my bedroom door. When we woke up in the morning, we found that my friend Kirsten, who'd been sleeping in the middle of the other two, was gone. My parents were still asleep, and we didn't want to wake them, so we searched the house ourselves. All of her stuff was still there. When we didn't find her, I decided to go into my room and call her parents. I moved the recliner, which was still in front of the bedroom door, propped up against it with no wiggle room. There was no other way into my room. I opened the door and there was Kirsten, asleep in my bed. She had no memory of getting up in the night and she wasn't a sleepwalker. People have tried to tell me that she must have gotten past me, but that's impossible. I would have woken up if she'd even walked past me, let alone she moving the recliner that I was in to open the door. My sister and I still get chills when we talk about it. Holiday Hauntings So I thought the readers of this Reddit might find this story interesting. This is going to be a rambling and pretty long, so apologies ahead of time. I just got back from a week's stay at a beautiful country manor. This place was built somewhere around 1540, so it had some real history behind it. I was there with my partner, my two kids, and my parents. It's situated in a fairly remote countryside region, so very, very quiet at night. We've stayed there once before, and on that occasion, there was one slightly strange encounter where both me and my partner heard one of the kids come to the bedroom door one night, only to find no one there. Otherwise, there was just an odd atmosphere at night, but nothing else. This most recent stay, however, things intensified. It started with me being woken around 3 a.m. to what I thought was my partner tapping me on the waist. He, however, was sound asleep facing the other way. Never mind, I thought. So I rolled over and went back to sleep, refusing to think too much on it. This happened a few nights in a row. Also, the bathroom light had taken to hissing and flashing whenever I went in there. But I put this down to the age of the place and that it was prone to power cuts. Anyway, one night I had this very intense half-sleep, half-awake dream. Someone was calling me. Really calling me. And something else was with me telling me that I absolutely shouldn't go to it. Like it was insistent I shouldn't go and even thought I really needed to pee. I shouldn't go and I should just hold it until the sun comes up. Freaked me out a little bit, but I kept it to myself as I didn't want to scare the kids. So the next day I'm talking to my mom and she tells me that the night before she'd heard someone calling mommy. She'd checked around and on the kids, they were asleep. And she couldn't find what was calling me. So I then told her about the dream and yeah, we both found it to be the, let's just say, a touch unsettling. Then on my last night there, I was sleeping on one side slightly off the edge of the bed. Something clearly ran a finger over my shoulder and down my arm. Again, partner sound asleep facing the other way. So I tucked further into the bed and went back to sleep. Something was haunting me when I was a kid. There was a time of my childhood where a lot of strange things happened to me. During that time I used to have nightmares every night. Some of them were so disturbing that I woke up sweating and with my heart racing. One night when I was sleeping, I woke up because I felt a hand tickling on my neck. The hand was cold and it tickled my neck very quickly and hard. So when I woke up, I still had the sensation in my neck's skin. I thought that maybe it was just a dream and I went back to sleep. It didn't go away. The tickling started happening every night 
And during the day, I would ask my family if it was them pranking me. But none of them took me seriously, so it definitely wasn't them. A couple of days passed, and one night I realized I'd left my jacket at my neighbor's house, which was across a little park in front of my house. It was dark outside, but I didn't feel scared to go because it was only five minutes away, so I decided to go as quick as possible. Everything was going all right until I started crossing the park. Suddenly I felt uneasy. This place was extremely quiet and lonely. I felt like something dangerous was watching me. And that's when it happened. I heard a deep, long moan come from between the bushes. Something that sounded like a zombie. I turned around and looked into the bushes. I will never forget what I saw. It was a tall, completely red man. He looked like he was covered in bright red blood. I started screaming and ran to my neighbor's house. They let me in and gave me a glass of water to calm me down. My heart was about to come out through my throat. I was shaking so hard that it took me a while to calm down. and I was telling them what happened. After that, they took me home. I told my family what happened, and they told me I just imagined it couldn't cross that park anymore from the fear. It felt like it was just... It's just too much from seeing that. I had to cross it a few times after that happened and I heard the noise again. Just heard the noise. I never saw the man again. But no one seemed to hear it, just me. Luckily, one day it just stopped happening, as well as the tickling and the nightmares. I still don't know if it was my imagination or not, but it felt pretty real to me. I think my husband was visited by a fairy. Tonight, my husband took our dogs out for an evening walk in our yard. We live on two acres of wooded land in the country. After a few minutes, he came inside and tried to explain to me what he saw. He stated that something large and glowing flew in front of him, stopped, then flew back off into the woods behind our home. He swore it looked like a human with wings. We looked up moths and tried to debunk it and found nothing that looked anywhere near similar. We went back outside to see if we could see anything else. While outside, it reminded us that we have a couple of security cameras pointed in our backyard. We ran upstairs and had chills watching the video back. First thing we noticed, one of our dogs suddenly stopped with his tail pointed and was staring into the woods. A second later, you see something fly, basically flutter in my husband's direction from the same place. It was large enough to be seen on a camera a good distance away. Unfortunately, it wasn't visible on our other camera. I was too shocked to record the footage, but plan to first thing tomorrow, and I can share that here. But what does this mean? Why did it show itself to him? Is there something that he should do? ETA footage. So I uploaded the whole thing so you can see how my dog's acting. My husband didn't say a word, and her dog was not even looking in his direction. You can see my husband's shadow in the bottom right as he's heading back to the patio. I didn't upload the camera that showed my husband's reaction as he didn't want to be shown. And you couldn't even see the figure in that camera. Around 2158.44, is when it first appears in the right corner near the third tree from the right and then flies towards my husband. Also, I trust what my husband saw. He said it was a fairy and I believe him 100%. It was larger than any flying bugs that we've ever had around here, glowing green in color. Not a moth, definitely not a lightning bug, as he was able to see its body, rounded head and wings. Also, no drugs or alcohol were involved, in case anybody was wondering. 
I wasn't posting to make anyone believe what he saw, just looking for advice from others who've had more knowledge to make sure our home, animals, and children are safe. Male Voices Chatting So this story isn't very scary, but my family and I, female 41, we found it entertaining. Already before this happened, my mom and I were sometimes called the family witches, more as a funny comment. So that weekend, my family met at my parents' place. My husband and three kids, my sister plus husband and daughter and my brother, by the way, my parents bought the house almost 40 years ago, and I think back then it was a fairly new house, and only one previous owner. Except for my brother, who lived a couple of streets down. We all spent the night at my parents' house on the upper floor. After a nice day with barbecue and chatting, and having a good time together, the larger room upstairs used to be my room when I was younger, and the five of us slept there spread across three beds. Everyone was in bed and asleep already, but I could not sleep. I heard two men chatting, and chatting and chatting, and it kept me awake. It wasn't loud, I couldn't really make out what they were saying, but it was clearly a conversation by two men. So thinking that it must have been my dad and my brother on the porch beneath one of the windows, I decided to go check. I opened the roof window a bit and expected the noise to become louder, but nothing. No one was outside. I also checked the two other sides of the room that had no windows, but opening them did not make the voices louder or clearer to hear. I only heard them when the windows were closed and the outside night noises were quiet. So my next rationale was that somebody left the TV on downstairs. I opened the room's door. As the house's floor plan is very open, you can hear everything from downstairs when you open the door. But it was very quiet downstairs. I went downstairs to be sure everything was indeed quiet. No one there. Everyone sleeping. So I went to bed and eventually fell asleep. The next morning I came downstairs to a nice family breakfast, but was still quite tired from the short night. When I was asked if I didn't feel well, I told them the story. My dad shook his head in disbelief and in German said something like, not again, laughing at my mom. She immediately said, see, I told you, I'm not imagining this. Turns out my mom heard these voices a few times already, but my dad brushed it off as nonsense. She was excited to be validated by what I heard. She had never told us about these voices. How to get rid of a demon from a Ouija board. Let me start by saying I did not know what this Ouija board is until one of my girlfriends brought it into my room. I live in a woman's shelter right now, so I'm close with everyone in my zone. So we all gathered to my room and one of my friends brought the damn thing over. We play and we play, but it doesn't last long because obviously everyone believes that at least someone is moving the damn thing. So we just continue playing other games. There were five of us. Once everyone leaves and I'm ready to go to bed, I turn off the lights and go to bed. My light switch is on. I don't care at first, it's a woman's shelter, so shit happens a lot and I'm just new to it. Whatever, I get up, I turn it off. I get back down on the bed and I hear a thud at my window. I don't believe in paranormal stuff, so I was kind of pooping myself at this point. The thud sounded kind of like somebody slammed themselves into the window. I got up, obviously turned the light on and opened the window. Nobody's there, so I close it and I go back to bed. All good, I wake up in the morning and straight away I hear something messing in my bathroom. The messing sounded just as if someone was moving stuff around and angrily fiddling with it. I was shitting myself. 
I left my room and called the bodyguard outside, and he locks and just looks in the bathroom. Nothing was there. Nothing was misplaced, and he was so nice about it, but I am very paranoid. My kid is about one month, so no way he can go into the room and start fiddling with shit. At this point, I'm up and awake, making food in the kitchen. And this is the point where I was like, okay, let me search what this Ouija board shit is. I turn around and I see a shadow of some sort of a human-looking thing in the corner. It's diarrhea at this point in my pants. I look around and there's literally nothing that can make a shadow like this. It's a rainy, dark day, obviously, you're going to see a shadow on this day doesn't really move so I turn around and when I look back it's gone. I'm staying at my friend's room for the time being but I wanted to know how to get rid of it and how do I make sure nobody else in my unit gets possessed. This is the single mom unit so I don't want to potentially put kids in danger and recovering moms into more stress and fear. Lightning electricity person came out of my TV. My 32-year-old husband and I were up late tonight. I work nights from home, and he was keeping me company but has since gone to bed. I can't stop thinking about what happened and what it might have been. and couldn't find anything online, so I figured I'd come here. A few hours ago, we were watching some cringe YouTube videos about 90 Day Fiancé, our guilt pleasure show. And while work was slow, talking, and nothing really out of the ordinary. The living room TV is on the wall across the room from my desk, and the open concept kitchen is to my right. I can see the whole living room and kitchen in our apartment from where I'm sitting. And he could from where he was standing in between my desk and the TV. As we are watching a person talking on the very bland background, no fireworks or anything bright, there is a white, sparkling, sparkly ball of light that appears out of the TV and silently zooms super fast through the air toward the kitchen. It stops at the far corner and materializes the dark outline of a tall person with white light sparkling around the edges facing us. I'd say a bit over six feet tall and a male or an androgynous build. Not really any curves and slim to average in build. It looked almost like it was spinning in that ball and landed on the balls of the feet like it had jumped from a height, slightly crouched with arms bent and a little outstretched for balance. It straightened up and disappeared as quickly as it had appeared. The crazy thing was that you could almost feel, or maybe the better word would be sense, in the air the very slight crackling or hair-raising effect that touching a staticky old TV would give you. Or maybe being outside during a thunderstorm right before lightning strikes nearby. We both saw the exact same thing at the same time, felt that same static charge in the air, and looked at each other and said, did you see that? What the fuck was that? At the same time, I would 100% call an electrician or maintenance to check on the wiring or something, if not for the clear person shape. There was no storms or lightning outside either. I feel like a crazy person and wish I could have caught something on camera as proof. Nursing Home Haunts I work in a nursing home that's also attached to a hospital. Lately, there had been a lot of death in the nursing home, and it's so weird, like it comes in waves. They say death usually comes in threes, which I've found to be true. Sometimes it comes in clusters of threes like we'll have a group of three die within one to two weeks. A few weeks later, another set of three. Then go a while without anyone dying. 
If you've read any of my posts before, you'll know that I have a lot of stories about patients and residents seeing children. As of the past month or two, I have a lot of new stories and I'm not sure why things have been so active all of a sudden. When I was still working night shift, we were doing 2 a.m. rounds and my fellow coworker froze in her tracks in the hallway, turned completely white. She suddenly looked sick. I asked her what was wrong and she said that she saw a full body apparition of a little boy. The little boy looked at her and then he walked into the wall between two residents' rooms. Within a week, both residents died. Another thing that happened was this lady rang her call light. No big deal. We go to answer it. It's about three o'clock in the morning. The resident asked us why there were children buried in the backyard. Down the hall, they had adjacent to her, another resident was banging her head in the wall at the same time talking about children. She died shortly after. This one really creeped me out big time. But we had a resident ring, and yet again we go to answer. She tells us that we needed to see the lady across the hall because she's dead. We didn't believe her and thought she was crazy, but we went to check on the resident and sure as shit she was dead. Another story. The nurse's station at the nursing home has very high counters. So when someone walks by when you're sitting, you can only see the top of their head. We were sitting there in the middle of the night and we see the top of what we assumed to be a woman's head. She had short curly black hair and she was walking very fast with a purpose down the hall. Come to find out around the same time on a different unit, another resident who fit that description passed away. Super freaked out, disembodied laughter. So I live alone. It's never been an issue. I've had boyfriends say that I should at least live with a roommate, but I never felt the need. I've lived in the apartment for almost a year and a half now. It's old, but not super old. Maybe 60 years at most. Anyway, I was at home yesterday after work, winding down for bed. I turned off my TV, all my lights, headed to brush my teeth and clean up. At this point, everything was off. I did my usual routine, and as I was heading out of the bathroom to my bedroom across the hall, I heard a small thump in my living room. I figured it was one of my cats, so I went to go check and see if everything was okay or if it was damaged, as my cats tend to be mischievous. I walked in, flicked on the light, saw nothing. Nothing was out of place. However, my cat Loki, in theme, was losing his mind and all squared up at the corner of the room. He was facing the direction of my room, the way I had just come from. I know my cats very well, and yes, they sometimes stare at walls, but he was freaked the hell out. Very out of character for him. My other cat, Odin, was spooked, but not nearly as much. After a couple of seconds of assessing the situation, I heard crystal clear a laugh come from my bathroom. It didn't sound evil, but it certainly didn't sound nice. I live in an apartment, so I know sounds happen, but a few things got my skin crawling here. First, I know what my neighbors sound like. It was definitely not them. Second, I'm located in the corner of the building. The direction the sound came from would be either the stairwell or outside the building. But it wasn't muffled, it was clear. And finally, it was obvious where the sound came from, inside my apartment. I live on the second floor and there's no way to get that clear of a sound in my apartment without it being in my apartment. And finally, today at work I thought I heard the same laughter in the bathroom at work, very faintly outside the door. I'm incredibly distraught and freaked out.
mysterious woman in the antique shop. When I was in my 20s, I used to live in this apartment on the edge of the city. I used to walk around to explore, because if you would go down the main road, there was a long stretch where there really wasn't much except woods, fields, and things like that. If you kept going, though, it would become another subdivision. I should say that many weird things happened to me and my friends in this area where I lived. I'm pretty sure it was built on a burial ground or something. Anyways, one day I was walking down the side of the road, away from the city, and I saw a sign at the end of a little gravel road that said Antique Shop. I don't remember really the name of the shop, but it's irrelevant. Anyways, I remember that I had been looking for a specific item, so I decided to walk to the shop to see if they had it. As I walked down the gravel driveway, there stood what looked like an old log cabin, but it was the antique shop. A little behind and to the left of the shop, about 50 feet away or so, stood a house. The house was inhabited by the woman who owned the shop, which I found out later. Anyways, I walk into the shop and it looked very old and rustic inside. I was the only one there, except behind the counter sat an older woman with gray hair. She immediately started talking to me and was very friendly and welcoming. Felt like I'd known her forever. We chatted for a while and I remember asking her if they had that item that I was looking for. She said no. We talked for a while. I felt like I'd lost track of time like we were in our own little world. After chatting with her for a few minutes, she told me that I could go up to the house and ask the shop owner if she knew if they had the item. I walked up to the house and knocked on the door. A different older woman answered, and I asked her about the item. I told her that an old woman in the shop had told me to come up to the house and ask. She immediately got really wide-eyed, and a look of fear came over her. She explained to me that no one else worked in the shop except her. I guess she was taking a break from running the shop and relaxing in the house. Still looked scared and in shock. She quickly tried to shoo me away and told me goodbye and closed the door quickly. I just walked away not knowing what else had happened. Still gives me the chills thinking about it. The Tickling About eight years ago, I was dead asleep. I woke up feeling my covers half pulled off of me, my light on, my shirt pulled up on my back, back facing the door, and feeling my back being tickled. My back arches when it's being tickled, but also, I was the sleepiest I think I'd ever been in a long time. Like, as if I had taken five Benadryl or something. Not that I have, I just felt like I had been hit by a tranquilizer. I was so sleepy. I woke up, saw my light on, felt a cold chill on my back, and felt like my back had been tickled. But I thought I was dreaming. I pulled my shirt back down, blankets back up, and was too tired to turn off the lights. So I just went back to bed. It happened again. Blankets pulled off, shirt on my back pulled up was cold and my back was colder. It felt like I was being tickled again. I really thought it was weird because no one was there. I pulled my shirt back down again and staying awake with my eyes closed slightly. Again, blanket rips off, shirt pulled up from my back, more tickling. This happened probably ten times. Me fighting harder and harder each time to stay awake until finally the blankets were pulled off the bed. So I knew it really wasn't just me doing this in my sleep and imagining it anymore. I was partially still awake. I sat up, glared towards the door and yelled, Knock it off, I'm trying to sleep, leave me alone, go away. I haven't had that same issue again, which makes me feel bad. Later my family told me a similar incident that occurred around the same time to my mom's husband. I lost my stepsister at age 8 to cancer shortly before this event. Everyone used to tickle her back in the same manner. 
but of my biological siblings. My mom thinks that she felt closer to me, and that's why she felt sort of uncomfy. And she'd come talk to me because I was the oldest between her sisters. Also, I'm very ticklish on my back, and I'm a very light sleeper. So I'm sure that it just made it easier. I was initially writing it off as one of the other mischievous ghosts that we have always had just was telling me about my family having the same thing around the same time, but I felt guilty ever since, in case she no longer felt safe to be near me in the afterlife. Do you think all hospitals are haunted? Probably the one that I worked at was, when I saw the ghost of a patient and wasn't going to back off. I was told by the supervisor of nurses not to mention it to anyone who wasn't working with me that night. Then there was the fire in the trash can. Nobody was in the bathroom when it started. We nurses had our own smoking area, and the patients had their own as well. We had to evacuate the whole wing, seven floors, and guess which floor I worked on? You probably got it. Seven. Then there was the witch. She was blind, long gray hair. Her eyes were a cloudy green. This all happened on the third shift over a four-year period. Every nurse on the floor was afraid of her. She rang her buzzer one night. There were eight of us nurses on the floor. I was elected to attend to her. One of the other girls went with me. When we got to her, she said to me, You're not afraid of me, are you? I told her, No, I wasn't. She then said that the fire department's on the way. I asked, Why would she say that? She then informed me that she could see them. I told her that they weren't coming because there's no fire. She told me again. She could see them. About three to four minutes later, fire engines, about six of them. I have to admit she creeped me out a little bit and there was no fire. A silent alarm went off, mysteriously. I went back in to talk to her about how she knew. She told me that she was born with a veil over her eyes. If you're familiar with this condition, you know anyone born like this can see things other people can't. My great-grandma was born with it, but she wasn't blind. The lady told me that there were people who died in the hospital but weren't at rest. While she was there, I and my friend went in and talked to her every night. She was a very interesting lady. We then started finding out nurses and doctors on the other floors also would occasionally see people who weren't supposed to be there. But we couldn't talk about it. So yeah, some of them probably are. Footsteps and Missing Items Recently, we bought a home that was built a few years ago, and it's two stories. We're the second occupants. The original owners divorced and sold it to us. At least, that's what we were told. Nearly every day when I'm in the office, I can hear loud, and I mean loud, footsteps on the second floor. My son's room is directly above my office, and that is generally where we hear these footsteps though randomly we hear footsteps upstairs in other sections, like when we're in the kitchen or in the living room. Every time it freaks me and my wife out and I run upstairs to see what's going on, but there is never anyone upstairs. I've even explored all of our attic spaces multiple times just to see if we had a squatter. There's no evidence anyone is secretly living in the attic. I've checked more times than I'd care to admit. I thought it was our son when he was taking naps, maybe running around. However, he's a young toddler still in bed that he really can't get out of. 
I've tested him and it multiple times. He sleeps with a full sleep cover, so if he could get out of that bed, it's completely covered. And any time that he's up there, I run up to catch him, but he's always still asleep. We have old school baby monitors, and they too pick up the footsteps. Now, if this were not crazy enough, since we've moved in, multiple items have come up missing or moved. For example, we finished up a wine bottle one night, and when we woke up in the morning, it was gone. And when I say gone, I mean we checked every inch inside, outside, and all the trash containers. It was gone, gone. Randomly, items will come up missing and show up in places that we would never put them. Some of this is really likely attributable to our toddler, but most of the time, items disappear and reappear in places that he physically could not reach. We're at a loss. Maybe we're haunted. Maybe we live at a nexus point. Either way, we're looking to sell soon because living in the twilight zone is annoying. We cross-posted this with the glitch in the matrix because we're just at a loss at what the hell is going on. Felt like I got pushed down the stairs. Some cash that I had set aside was taken out of a closed drawer and strewn across my floor. Nothing was taken, though. I count it, write it down every time I add or take from it. Then I come home and my fridge magnets are all out of place. I organize them into a heart because I think it's cute. But they were just a jumbled mess. The noises are less common, but louder now. Now it sounds like someone is running toward me every few days. And I constantly have this strange feeling that makes me keep my bathroom door shut because it just has this awful, creepy vibe coming from it. My older and more intuitive cat is terrified to go in there. He loves sitting with me while I shower or bathe. But since moving in, he struggles getting through the doorway and his tail fuzzes up. Also, some small noises come from my bathroom a lot. It ranges from sounding like breathing to sounding like a faucet is running when it's not. There are also no leaks underneath the sink or kitchen sink, nor are there any cracks in the windows that something could get into. And then, day two, as I'm making my weekly trash run, it felt like I got kicked down the stairs. I have pretty good reflexes, so thankfully I didn't fall many steps, but I did land pretty harshly on my butt and have a huge bruise there. Like I can barely sit down huge. There's another less big but still pretty darn big bruise on my leg that only hurts when touched. But still, it felt like someone kicked me in the back of my thigh while I was walking down. There's still a few marks there, but I have quite a few unexplainable bruises across both legs and arms, so I just don't know. I'm not even scared by this, since I do have an amazing price on my rent compared to literally every other person on my street. But it's still a little unnerving. And I'm starting to experience a similar paranoia that I had as a child, like I'm being watched. That's the end of today's stories. I'm trying a different microphone today that might discourage my gecko from screaming into it. I hope to see you next time, and as usual, always a pleasure. See ya. Past Weird Encounters When I was about 8 until 17, I lived in a house that we had built in a development. My mom was convinced it was haunted, but I'm the type of person where I need conclusive evidence to really believe it. There are two times, though a lot of that experiences that I was having, I can't really explain what they were, but they are the closest thing to evidence that I have. One day around Christmas time, when my youngest brother was about three, he was in his high chair in the kitchen eating. 
because we were all eating dinner. The rest of my family were cleaning up and he was just babbling to himself like he usually did. This time the babbling was weird though. He was looking at the ceiling and it seemed like he was actually talking to someone. Then he started to cry and say, don't go, don't go, hysterically crying while his eyes were just trailing towards the ceiling about where my parents' bedroom was. Two seconds later, the fire alarm started blaring. Nothing on the first floor was on fire, so we all rushed upstairs to see what was going on. Every Christmas, my mom would light this Christmas candle, and she would decorate it with all this stuff. The thing with the candle was, is you leave it lit until it goes out on its own, and it's supposed to give you good luck. The decorations were on fire, and the flame was really high. We got it out before something happened, so we're all good, but that was the biggest thing that I can ever really say I experienced that would make me a little bit less skeptical about paranormal experiences. Now on to number two. It wasn't as big as the first thing, but one day I was taking a shower by myself upstairs, and it was only my mom downstairs. I got out of the shower and dried off and put the towel around my waist to my head and just go to my bedroom, which was right to my right. As I was walking out, though I heard so clearly and vividly from my sister's room, a young male voice that went, mm. I immediately smiled, and I was about to laugh because I thought it was my best friend at the time. Maybe they were hiding there to surprise me and acting gay or something to mess with me. I turned to my left and no one was there. I was all alone, yet it sounded like they were right next to me. The Day the Cat Lady Vanished Around 10, maybe 15 years ago, I was working around an industrial estate as a machine operator. I'd pulled a Sunday shift, a 7 to 3, standard one really. I'd worked the full week, and at the end of that shift, I'd just, just about gotten my limit, so I was feeling tired. I locked up after a couple of the other guys had left and started walking up to the bus station. The layout of the estate was fairly open. You could see pretty much everything, and everybody, as you were walking. To this day, and believe me, it's really the still as clear of a day as it was in my mind then. I have no idea where she came from. A woman literally ten feet away from me as I'm walking with a large ginger tom in her arms. And she looked like she was in her nightwear, barefoot. So I stopped, because it fell off. Hairs on the back of my neck off. I asked her if she was all right, to which she replied, Kitty is sad. Kitty's not got a home. Can you take Kitty? I think it took me a second, but I said I already had a cat. She repeated it all again and looked up at me. Now, I said it was off, the entire look of the situation. But soon as I got a look into her eye, my entire body felt like it had ice water all over it. I can't really put it into words, but the word crazy and loony were pretty predominant in my mind. So, I'm apologizing, and she's repeating, getting louder. She was a skinny thing, and I'm a big guy, but I was getting afraid. Again, no idea how or why I'm reacting like this. So the fight-or-flight reflex is in full swing. I was backing up and sort of sidestepping the entire way. And I was also apologizing all the way. And I was basically walking backwards, toward where the bus station was. But here's the thing. She was out of my eyesight for maybe 30 seconds when I crossed onto the side street. I still had a full view of her, and she was gone. In the middle of a wide open space, no place to go. Still gives me the willies thinking about it. I 
I want to ask about something weird that happened to me when I was 10. I used to live in Libya, in Tripoli, to be exact. Libya is a really rural country, but I lived in the city, which is like the suburbs in America. My mom's aunt lived in the street next to us. I always went there with my sisters to play with my mom's cousin's children. There were three girls, 12, 11, and 2 years old at that time. I was 10, and my sisters were younger than me. I remember we were playing hide and seek. When we were about to start, the oldest of the girls just stopped talking. She looked at us and said, hide, but not as in the game, but in real life. She said we have to all hide together. It was just me and my sister and her and her younger sister. We hid behind a car and said that we have to peek at the rest of the street. We all looked, and then out of nowhere the whole area we were in was empty with no people or cars. To be honest, it always didn't kind of have a lot of people, but at that time of day, which was the evening, it should have a bit of people and cars, but there wasn't any. We waited for a minute, and she said that we have to make no sound. And then a yellow Camaro came and started doing donuts. I know this might sound kind of weird. To make it even weirder in Libya, we don't have expensive cars and a Camaro was really rare to see. After that, I remember me and my sister running home scared. I told her parents, but they didn't think it was weird or anything. What made me scared was how the girls I was playing with, especially the oldest, was acting. She was looking at the car and was waiting for it like she knew it was going to happen. Now the thing that made me post this and made me like, remember this whole thing is she was the oldest and she died yesterday because of a car accident. A yellow Camaro hit her and killed her and the car ran away. My sister and me remembered this story and we were really spooked. I'm 16 years old right now. If this has any importance, magic was and still is somewhat popular in Libya, especially in family fights with other families and love spells. That is indeed spooky. This is going to be hectic, but here's the beginning of the past few months. Just to start off, yes, I believe in the paranormal and all that. I also practice craft stuff, so it's fairly well a part of my life, not to mention that I've dealt with more than my share. As of recently, I moved states to live with a family in an attempt to disconnect from the other side of my family and to basically start a new page in my book. The house I moved into has been in the family for like 40 plus years, and a few years back my great-grandmother passed. It was sad, and I miss her much. However, I'm still unsettled about seeing her trying to get into her old room, my now room. She hates doors and had to put one up for privacy deals. While I was rearranging and taking some old things out of my room, I moved a brass photo frame that holds the Last Supper, the one with Jesus and his crew. Not Christian, please remember, no respect to those that are. I had set it on the floor to be hung up elsewhere. I think it looks kind of cool, and like da Vinci, it was kind of chilling while I was putting books on the shelf and whatnot around my room when I hear loud thumping from the living room. That wouldn't be an issue if there was someone else in the house, even my cat, but it was just me. I firmly believe that that was my great-grandmother telling me to put it back up. I did. Two to three months after I moved in, her husband, my great-grandpa, passed also. They both still kind of roam the halls here and make sure that things are in check which is fine and all, and I'm just getting used to seeing them so often. This isn't just a few things that happen here and there, though. The past three-ish months, there's been a figure that wasn't invited into the house. 
that seems to try to spook me and my boyfriend as much as possible. Going as far as scratching me a few times. There hasn't been a night since my boyfriend moved in with me that we've gotten a full night's sleep because of this thing. I know it upsets the great-grandparents to a degree as well, as really goofs with the energy of the rest of the house. I've tried cleansing, removing, even going to someone with my more experience than me kind of thing for advice. Odd Experience in Cornwall Farmhouse so first post here, as I've been doing some thinking after reading some of these, I wanted to share one of my own experiences that I'm unsure about. When I was younger, I lived in a cottage in an extremely rural part of Cornwall in the UK, until I was 10. I'm 22 now. And I had a horrifying encounter. To this day, I'm puzzled as to whether it was a dream or not. Basically, I was sleeping in the bottom bunk of a bunk bed. I'm an only child, but I liked to change from time to time. I was trying to get to sleep, but I couldn't. Suddenly, I saw a dark figure poke its head over the top bunk, and it started staring at me intensely. I froze. My heart began to race. Seconds later, it threw what looked like a barrel at me, and I felt it hit my head, and I thrashed in my bed and hit the wall at the end. This is probably the most scared I've ever been in my life. I then jumped out of bed and ran to my parents' room down the corridor and could hear footsteps on the floorboards behind me chasing me. I could see stars from how hard I'd been hit. Like you know when you're about to pass out and your vision goes all blurry and fuzzy? Kind of like that. For years I've put this down as sleep paralysis or something along those lines, but recently been having doubts. I had so many other less intense experiences in that house that I have been wondering whether it was haunted. For example, I remember once my dog being extremely afraid to enter the living room of the house, and my mom, being very spiritual, asked a witch to douse the house. She told her no information, just that she wished for it to be cleansed. The lady stared at my mom and said, Your dog is afraid. I can sense it. He is not going into that room, right? We were shocked. How did she know this? She then explained after doing some investigating that there was a ghost of a large black cat who used to reside there, and my dog was quite afraid of them. And so it did make sense. Suffice to say, after her work was complete, my dog entered straight away and was content with being there for the rest of his days. I think something is following me. So for some background, I've recently moved house. I used to live in a big old manor house. I'm not sure what year it dates back to, but it's next to it, like a twin. The main house which dates back to 1781, so I'm assuming it's around the same time frame. Obviously with a building this old, it's very daunting, and you'd assume that it was haunted. It also got turned into an old person's home at some point in time. But I've recently moved to another house that dates back to the 1800s. Whilst I was in the manor house, me and everybody else living there would experience weird things. Nothing dangerous, but weird nonetheless. And we'd all brush it off as just it being an old house and me being a kid. Things that would happen frequently. Doors closing, opening, electronics, light bulbs turning off and on, doors locking, loud noises coming from inside the bedrooms. Like banging noises. I don't want to drag this on longer than it needs to be, but I have a lot of experiences in that house. So if anyone wants a more depth or in-depth explanation, feel free to ask questions. But to the point. I've always having these extremely vivid dreams that feel and look real, 
to the point where I wake up and I still believe I'm dreaming. Since moving to this house, the same things are happening. Lights turning off and on. We had a weird experience with our Alexa playing music randomly. Old-timey music. But the thing that's making me feel crazy is the dreams. Just before I fall asleep, I keep hearing a man speaking in my room, as if he's right next to me. It's that clear, but I'm always on the verge of sleep, so I just brush it off as a dream. But what really got me was I got on a phone call the other day from my mom whilst I was out, just asking where I was. I had been out all day, and it was 2 a.m. at this time. She called me and she told me that she had called out my name, and when I got home, I responded. And she had a conversation with me, but it wasn't me because I wasn't home. She realized when she went to my room and I wasn't there. My Imaginary Friend Charlie Back when I was a kid, I had an imaginary friend named Charlie. From what I remember, Charlie was around from the time I was about four years old up until I was nine when my family moved to a different house. So I spent five years talking and playing with Charlie. My parents encouraged it because I didn't have any real friends or siblings, and it wasn't uncommon for a lonely kid to create an imaginary friend to play with. I was a loner, and still very much am today. Charlie told me that he used to live in my house before my family moved in. I believed him, because we often played hide-and-seek, and he knew all of the best hiding spots. He knew things about the house that even I didn't know at that time. A couple of times I asked him where his parents were and why they didn't live in the house with him, and he never gave me an answer. After a year or so, he started asking me to do strange things, like stealing change from my mom's purse, or hiding my dad's car keys so he wouldn't be late for work, or so he would be late for work. Random mischievous stuff like that When I refused, his requests became much more sinister, telling me to push my mom down the stairs, start a fire in my parents' bedroom. Of course, I again refused. Charlie became more cold, and instead of wanting to play, he only suggested doing things to hurt me or my parents. I was scared of him. I never told my parents what he said, only that I didn't want to play with him anymore. When we moved out of that house, I didn't bring Charlie with me. I forgot about him for many years, until a few days ago, when my mother asked me if I remembered having an imaginary friend growing up. That's when all of this started to come back to me. I did some research into this history of this old house and found that there was indeed a young boy named Charles whose family lived in the house about fa- uh, excuse me, about 15 years before mine and apparently died at a young age, but I couldn't find any info as to how or where he died. The Weirman This happened to me and my then roommate a few years ago, somewhere like September, October 2019. We were just chilling on the couch and listening to the rain outside, when at one point we started talking about how the rain sounded like the sea, and how we pictured a lighthouse on a windy shore. I know this sounds like we were high or tripping, but we were absolutely not. We were completely sober. Slowly but surely, the conversation between my friend and I started to shift to visualization, or perhaps a hypnosis. It's unclear to me how this normal conversation about a lighthouse turned into the shared vision or dream that it did. But at one point, we were both there, in the lighthouse. We both saw a man there, 
dressed in a yellow raincoat. He had a weathered face and a gray beard, but his most remarkable feature were his eyes, or actually the lack thereof. In the place where his eyes were supposed to be, there were two black holes, as if they had been kind of gouged out, and only some rotting black skin remained. We both felt this intense urge to get out, so we ran away from the lighthouse to the woods as he followed us. I'm not sure about how we woke up from this hypnosis, dream, vision, whatever it was, but I remember realizing that this was bad and we needed to wake up. So I urged my roommate to do so. After I returned to my body, I gently woke them up and we discussed what happened. They were completely freaked out, as was I, and I was grateful I woke them up. We both caught our breaths, and then we had finally processed what happened. We checked the time. When we had entered this state, it was around 12 midnight, but when we woke up it was about 3 a.m., yet it felt like we'd only been doing this for about 15 minutes. The next day we both separately drew the man that we saw, we were both illustration students at the time, and without having discussed what he looked like. We drew the exact same man, had both colored the space around him black, and had also given him the exact same name, the Weirman. The Bin That Moved By Itself a few months ago, I had an unusual experience that was completely new to me. Although I had always believed in the existence of ghosts and the paranormal, I had never encountered anything of the sort before. My room is fairly small, and one morning as I hurriedly got out of bed, my foot accidentally knocked over the bin, causing it to fall on its side. Pressed for time, I didn't bother picking it up and I left the room. Later that evening, feeling a bit tired, I entered my room and lay face down on my bed with my head buried in the pillow. At the opposite end of my room, there was a radiator next to a large plastic tub. Earlier, I had stepped on the tub to reach something in the wardrobe, causing it to collapse and shatter. However, I had left the broken pieces there without bothering to clean them up. While laying on my stomach with my head buried, I suddenly heard what seemed like a cracking sound, as if something was walking over to the shards of plastic. I clearly heard it, but dismissed it, assuming it was the sound of the radiators heating up and the plastic cracking. I didn't move and continued to rest, and as I was, the sound ceased. I reconsidered and told myself that if I heard it again, I would quickly get up to investigate. I remained awake and in the same position, and it wasn't long before I heard the cracking sound again. I swiftly turned around and moved toward the foot of my bed and where I witnessed the bin, which I had knocked over in the morning, writing itself. It was completely unknocked over. I was shocked, but not frightened so I grabbed the bin and shook it. At the time, I didn't think much of it. There was another freestanding radiator near the spot where the bin had fallen. I rationalized the incident by assuming that the bin had been squeezed by the other radiator and somehow propped itself back upright. However, the more I think about it, the less plausible that explanation seems. I'm not well versed in physics or anything like that but it doesn't appear possible for there to be enough tension between the bin and the radiator to cause it to spontaneously return to an upright position. Does anyone know anything about friendly or passive spirits? My old house was really creepy. I could go on about the experiences I've had. I'd be happy to tell some in the comments, but I want to focus on a few experiences in particular. I used to see shadow people all of the time, 
between the ages of four and six very frequently. My siblings also reported them at the time, and we all stopped seeing them around the same time. I believe in spirits. However, I can agree that some experiences can easily be explained away. For example, a lot of shadow people can be explained through either sleep paralysis, which is being frozen, or the feeling of dread and fear that you get around them, or just a trick of the eye, in the way most people report them, disappearing in a split second. But my shadow people were different. I remember they'd always be around in the landing space between two staircases in my house. They were really tall, having to bend their necks to fit under the roof, elongated arms and legs and fingers like a shadow they were black and see-through. One of my most vivid memories is me running up the stairs when I realized that they were literally all crowded on the landing. I'm talking 10 to 15 of these things. They turned to me and sort of just stepped aside to give me room to go upstairs. They looked a bit shocked that I could see them. I wasn't scared, more just wary. The other time I think is more compelling. I was like four or five maybe, and I was coloring at her art table. I got this strong feeling somebody was behind me watching me. So strong I actually thought it was my mom. So I turned around to talk to her and it wasn't her. It was a shadow person watching me draw intently. It was kind of bent over like how a parent or teacher watches a kid play. It was a bit parental like... And I wasn't scared. More just confused. So I turned around and started drawing again. It's just weird since most reports of shadow people have them either disappearing or just peek out at you, or have them bring intense fear to you, which these things didn't. I promised my 13-year-old self I'd kill myself at 16. I turned 16 and I think I'm being haunted. When I was 13, during lockdown, I became chronically depressed. It wasn't overly severe, but it was noticeable. I'd never had a real goal in life, and my relationships were abusive and manipulative. You know the type of relationships where you want to satisfy the other person so you do what they say no matter what? And then you realize it's bad. Yeah, those ones mostly. But anyway, things have gotten so bad back when I attempted twice that year, and after that I promised myself that day that when I turned 16, it would be the last day here. I turned 16 two days ago, and I completely forgot about the promise. The party was amazing. I'm not from America, so it was a sweet 16 type of a thing, but it was still enjoyable. I spent time with my friends and we had a few drinks after. Nothing special. Another yesterday, when I was messaging my boyfriend, the promise came back to me, and it felt like I was hallucinating. It will sound weird to some people, but I saw my 13-year-old self standing by my door with a mad look in her eyes. I've experienced seeing spirits and hearing things that weren't from this world, but this was different. I was seeing someone who hasn't yet died, so how could this be? I wasn't panicking because, as I said, I was sort of used to this, but she kept trying to get my attention. She stayed on my bed, and as I kept ignoring her, she grabbed my wrist and started digging her fingers into my wrist. I still showed no sign of fear. I knew I could control her because, well, she was me, right? Usually when I see a spirit and I'm busy and just not in the mood to keep them company... I tell them in my head, please leave me alone, and it usually works. I've done it many times, although she refused. I tried telling her to leave, but my thoughts kept getting changed. Leave clearly wasn't a part of her vocabulary. After ten or so minutes, she left my room, and minutes after, my brother started crying next door. This was a snap point for me, as I care about my brothers more than myself. I rushed to my brother's room and calmed him down, 
Then after that, she left. Odd ongoing experience in parents' backyard. My parents built their house in 1974 in a very small, very old subdivision in upstate New York. Next door is a three-level, three-family home that was built long before theirs, sometime in the late 1800s. This past fall, my son and I were raking leaves on an unusually warm Saturday afternoon. I enjoyed telling my son about all the trees that are still up and how my friends and I used to use them as bases while playing wiffle ball or kickball back there. My parents don't have acreage, but they do have a pretty sizable backyard. While clearing an area by a tree found close to the back corner of the yard, I came across what appeared to be a small broom. It was severely rusted and seemed to literally be coming out of the tree as the tree seems to be shedding some of its bark. It was very strange. I couldn't believe that it was there for a long time. Someone would have seen it somehow. Anyway, I picked it up and started to feel the bristles. They literally fell out as strings of dirt and just became part of the ground at that point. We took the remnants of it inside to show my mom. She and my dad, who passed away nearly 10 years ago, used to live in that house next door when my grandparents owned it. During that time, she said that the Wheelers, a family living in the first floor of the house at the same time, used to work on cars in that exact same spot before they built the house and put a fence up and so forth. We chatted for a while, threw the old broom away, and finished raking the yard. Ever since that day, my two to three year old garden doodle, golden doodle, literally sprints beelines like there's a squirrel there back to the same exact spot as soon as we get to my mom's house, barks when she gets behind the tree, stops abruptly, wags her tail uncontrollably, and then nonchalantly strolls through the yard to find a stick, do her business or whatever it is she feels like doing. Never happened prior to that day, and now we just laugh because it's her thing to do when we get there. Kelsey Davies feels so fake. So for a while now, I've been watching Kelsey Davies' videos on YouTube. I don't know why I keep giving her more views because she actually annoys me so much. She's a self-proclaimed medium and used to live in a haunted house and says that she's been seeing spirits her whole life. She owns two haunted dolls and a haunted painting. Now you'd think with all this stuff she'd be a seasoned paranormal investigator, right? But... Every time Kelsey goes to a haunted location, she pulls the same tired stunt. Oh my god, I got like a vision. Girl, if you're so experienced, why does every vision startle you like a jump scare in a B-grade horror movie? Brace yourselves for the most exaggerated reactions you've ever seen. Whenever there's even the slightest sound, Kelsey leaps up three meters in the air like she just saw a ghost. Oh wait... Isn't that the whole point of her ghost hunting videos? And let's not forget her ear-piercing, cringe-worthy American girl accent when she uses a spirit box or EVP and gets the exact answer that she was fishing for, then proceeds to go, Oh my god, ew, and that scared me, ah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not only is this annoying and screaming fake, but this is also where things get downright disrespectful. She's once made a video inside of a house where a young boy was murdered, and supposedly his spirit still lurks in the closet, hiding from the murderer. So what does Kelsey do? She asks the poor spirit to make itself known by doing something like moving a toy or playing with the lights. Lo and behold, a ball rolls a few seconds later. And what does she scream? Ew, that's so creepy. I'm guessing. 
Even if we give Kelsey the benefits of the doubt and say that her content is not staged, she still went to that location to capture evidence, right? So if there really is a little boy's spirit seeking assistance, picture being scared and vulnerable only to have a supposed spirit lover like Kelsey scream, "Eew!" They're writing E-E-E-E-W. I'm assuming they mean E-U. Never seen this girl. It's not just fake. It's straight up heartless. Weird, manipulative powers guy. When I lived in Austin sometime around 2015, I went to the Verizon store to pay my bill one time. And when I was in there, there was this middle-aged guy getting set up with whatever the newest Galaxy phone was at that time. Not sure which one it was, but it was expensive. And this dude comes in that looks sort of like a human from Ratatouille but if he hadn't slept in weeks and was bleach blonde. He had really dark circles around his eyes and just generally looked sickly. He gets up beside the guy and tells him, You should sell that to me for 20 bucks. And the guy laughs, thinking he's just joking around. Then he looks up to the guy and he's holding a $20 bill between his fingers with his arms straight out. The second the creepy dude locks eyes with him, the middle-aged guy starts to slowly hand the dude his new phone, but his arm is shaking and it looks like he's trying so hard to not do it. Like he's fighting his own body to prevent himself from doing it, but failing while locking eyes with this guy with a horrified look on his face the whole time. Well, eventually, creepy guy gets the phone and starts to walk off in the middle of the aged guy freaking out, regretting it and panically going, Why did I do that? over and over again. I thought he was just scared of the guy or something. So I went after him to try to get the dude's phone back and eventually I find him outside. And he looks me in the eyes and says, you should get out of my way. And I'm not kidding at all. I felt like I got transported to somewhere else. And the only way to get back to reality was to just obey this guy. Like when he talked to me, the whole world around me just got dim and sort of blurry and it's like I was in a tunnel with just him in front of me. That was the one clear thing and normal looking thing. And my eyes were ringing. The longer I didn't listen to him, the worse it got. And the more I felt like I was like away from where I actually was. It was then that I realized what this guy felt and why he did what he did. It's one of the few unexplainable events in my life. I've met sociopaths, master manipulators, and creepy people like that, but this guy was working on a whole different level. It was absolutely creepy. Dream hopping or dimensional travel? For years, my best friend and I have collected an array of stories from minor encounters with the paranormal to the almost horrifying. To make this story a small step into the weird will be easier to understand my best friend and I. It was a late Saturday. We were both passed out in her full-sized bed. She liked to sleep against the wall while I liked to be free to move by the edge. I remember my dream so vividly, like if I could fall asleep while typing this, I could be right back where we were. There were stacked rows of desks, like the classic college class auditorium. At the front was a solid light wood desk. It looked yellow in the scene, contrasted against the green Berber carpet. There was a small board with a presentation. I don't remember the exact words of the slide that well, but I do remember after I read that slide, and it was my boyfriend's turn. I clicked the next slide and turned to her, indicating her turn to present the slide. As she began reading, I awoke halfway through her sentence, but when I woke, she was lying beside me, still reading the next slide. I freaked out. How was she reading the slide? I'm awake and she's still asleep. How? I started slapping her arm trying to wake her up. 
She groggily slapped me away and said, I'm not done reading the slide yet. I was freaked out even more. I ran to the bedroom light and flicked it on. I bounded into the bed and declared that she and I were going into the kitchen to drink coffee and talk about this. She was confused at first, but while the memory was fresh, I had to ask her what she remembered. She told me the layout of the room, the desk, the carpet, the smart board. She even pointed out that I had read the slide before hers. We both kept tossing back and forth about how there was no way. I think at the time we remembered the topic of the presentation, and she said that she had no idea why she would know that stuff. We still reminisce on that scary dream hopping. And every time we do, I always wonder if we really had transported ourselves into each other's dream or somewhere else. Who is the girl? A little background. My parents built this house in 2008, and we moved in then. The land before was most likely a field for a farm down the road. The mistake my parents made while having this house built is having mirrors in their bathroom that face each other. I've always been afraid of their bathroom, but this incident scared me so badly as a kid and honestly still does. I was probably seven or eight and I had just gotten out of the shower. The bathroom is shaped in a C. Mirrors at the top and bottom of the C and shower on the side and the bath on the gap. I was in the far side, furthest from the door facing a mirror with the other one behind me. I was washing my face, brushing my hair and all of a sudden I looked up and to the left of me was this little girl. She looked to be about my age, long blonde hair, and she looked like she was almost see-through and very pale. I remember her having a rainbow glow to her. As a child, seeing a girl behind you randomly was definitely scary, so I whipped around. She was gone. She isn't the scariest spirit in the house, but that encounter I definitely remember. Even writing this, I feel nauseous and like I'm about to faint. The whole encounter traumatized me. Something that made me, or I guess this really might be completely unrelated, is I used to sleepwalk a lot and talk to someone while sleepwalking. One night I walked and I was trying to go outside. I was halfway through the yard when my parents came and got me. I still don't know how a seven or eight year old could unlock two doors in her sleep, walk down a flight of stairs and halfway through a swampy yard at midnight. We haven't really brought up this incident up in a real long while, and it's more mischievous of a spirit that roams the house that came after a Ouija board incident when I was ten. But I haven't seen this little girl since, and I hope she was able to find some sort of peace. Does anyone have any idea what might have happened to me? So I was laying in bed last night, trying to fall asleep at around 5 a.m. And suddenly I got the weirdest feeling. I can't even describe it, but it was like a dead center in the chest kind of a feeling. After a moment, I have a realization that this feeling is my grandpa. I have no idea what made me realize that, or how a feeling can represent a specific person, but I somehow just knew. For this next part, it's worth noting that I was laying facing away from where I climb into bed from. So, after a minute with this feeling, the birds that are chirping outside, and every other noise goes dead silent. It was like somebody just shut the sound off. As soon as this happens, I get the distinct feeling that someone is standing behind me. 
that there's a presence there, standing in the space between the bed and the wall on the side of the bed that I get in on, which, as I noted, I had my back towards at that time. It's also worth noting that none of this felt scary at all. It just felt strange. I can't even describe how it made me feel. At this point, I was absolutely convinced that my grandpa had passed away over the night and was simply visiting me before moving on. After a few minutes, probably, the birds start chirping again and the building starts making noise again, the AC turns on, etc. I turn over and the feeling that's there, that presence, goes away. So, I grab my phone and shoot my parents a text, describing what just happened, and asking them to check on my grandpa. Now, this is what confuses me the most. He was totally fine. So I don't know if I'm just crazy or what, but I was convinced that it was him. Too weird to explain. For context, I do home services for work. I drive a shuttle bus that's been revamped on the inside so I can do my job. While I'm working, I usually listen to podcasts or music. However, I only use one earbud at a time in case the homeowner comes knocking on my vehicle. Maybe they need something. Yesterday, I get to my last house of the day. I make contact with the homeowner and I get into my vehicle to do my job. I get an earbud in and realize I need something, and I have to exit the vehicle. I take the earbud out, and I place it on my workstation. Being that I just arrived at this home, my workstation is cleaned off and void of anything but my lone earbud. Doing what needed to be done, I get back into my vehicle, grab my earbud, and turn my grab, grab all my tools. Upon turning back, I see something small and white on my station. I pick it up and it's a cushion attachment to my earbud. I immediately thought how weird it was that I didn't realize it was missing. Have you ever used an earbud without one of these? Very uncomfortable. I pull my earbud out of my ear and see that it isn't missing, this cushion piece. This is why this is unexplainably weird. The second cushion attachment, not even sure if that's what it's called, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. It went missing months ago. I'm talking four to six months ago. Each of my earbuds had its own cushion attachment, as they're supposed to. One day while I'm working, one goes missing. I looked everywhere for that piece. After a couple of weeks not finding it, I just accepted it as lost forever and would transfer the sole cushion attachment that it had from that earbud to the earbud, other one, as needed. I was super weirded out, kind of got the heebie-jeebies and called my husband to tell how this piece to my earbud magically appeared on my workstation. He's a bit of a skeptic, so he said that maybe it was just stuck somewhere and got dislodged and fell onto my table. I said, fell from the roof of my vehicle? I can't even imagine how his explanation could even be possible. My near-death experience Okay, so other people in the other thread were asking for this, and it's way shorter than my other story. In 2011, when I was dying from ketoacidosis, they brought me into the ER in a wheelchair, and I was more or less conscious, if extremely weak. I remember seeing my reflection in a mirror and thinking that it wasn't a person. It was already a corpse in my clothes. If you don't know what ketoacidosis is, it's when a diabetic's blood sugar has been too high for too long and lowers the pH of the blood to the point where it becomes acidic enough to start eating your veins from the inside, 
You burn up. I was starting to hallucinate when they laid me down in the bed so they could get insulin and fluids into me. I thought I was lying in the Mediterranean courtyard, alone in full sun, and I was too weak to move. The sun was so hot and bright my skin began to burn like a cigarette end, turning to white ash and floating away to reveal glowing coals inside. I was so thirsty. At the same time, I could hear the nurses around me. I could hear them talking, but I couldn't speak. My mouth was too dry. I remember hearing one of them say that they would have to open my, car my carotid artery because all my other veins had closed up and shut down. I remember the horror of that and still not being able to move or react to it. After a while, I couldn't hear them either, but there was a roar like machinery or a huge plane coming down. I felt like something was above me, but I couldn't see anything because it was too bright. I was burning and peeling away, and it was sucking whatever was left of me up into the sky. After that, there was blessed darkness, and eventually I woke up in the ICU with my mom on my bedside. They told me later that if my dad had brought me into the ER even 20 minutes later, I would have been taken straight into resuscitation. It's not as close to death as some people have been, I guess, but... That courtyard and the feeling in sight of my skin burning away like that's really stuck with me. Creepy Babysitting Experience When I was 17, I was asked to babysit for a family friend. She has four kids, ages 11 to 4. They lived in a really old house, and the three girls shared a room together. I babysat really late at night because my mom works night shift at like 8 p.m. to 2 a.m., so I was mainly there to put the kids to sleep and then wait for their mom to come home. Their house always made me feel a little bit uncomfortable. It was old and made a lot of noises. After I put the kids to sleep one night, I went back to the living room sat on the couch and was just scrolling on my phone. Their dogs started barking towards the back of the kitchen. I was confused at what they were barking at, so I thought maybe the wind outside was spooking them. It was really windy that night, after all. They stopped barking, but then started to run back and forth down the hallway, between the living room and the kids' room. I was trying to calm them down because I didn't want them to wake up the kids. They finally settled down, but I heard the girls scream. The three girls share a room. They came running out crying and saying, The man with red eyes and no arms is back in the closet. The oldest said, He was staring at us again. I was also scared, so I told the girls to stay in the living room until their mom came home. I realized their little brother four years old was still sleeping in his room next to the girl's room. I couldn't just leave him by himself, so I told myself I wasn't scared and went to go get him so that way he could be in the living room with all of us. As I was getting him, their dogs started running back and forth again, and I could hear the girl saying, He's here, he's here! I got their brother, ran back to the living room, but didn't see anybody except the girls crying. That night, they all fell asleep with the lights on in the living room. The mom was upset at me for not making them sleep in their rooms, so she never asked me to babysit again. I still shudder thinking about that night. I think I met myself. I saw someone who looks exactly like me, and she was wearing my lost earrings. I was sober at the time because I was driving, and I was hydrated, so the possibility of it being a hallucination is ruled out. I was at the mall a little over a month ago, and I went to this one store because it was having a huge sale, and my mom said that that store, or I guess she just seems to like that store, so we went in. 
It wasn't too crowded at the time, but there was a decent amount of people there. On our way to the checkout, my mom gets in line and tells me to see if there's any remaining things that I want. So after surveying all the other items, I grab two candles and I turn around, and I'm almost face to face with someone who looks exactly like me, but younger. When I was younger, I'm talking like 13, 14, and I'm a senior now, so not too long ago. I had curly hair with blonde highlights, natural, and used to dress a lot differently. She had the exact same hair I had before, and this was before I dyed it. I first dyed it around 8th grade, curl pattern and all. Three piercings on each ear, just like I have, and this same pair of distressed jeans I wore religiously. What really made me freak out was the earrings. I lost a pair of earrings that my mom gave me. They were her birthstone, and she was wearing them. She was fucking wearing them. Earrings I thought I would never see again right in front of my eyes on someone who looks just like me. I don't even remember the rest of the day I was pinching myself on the way out. I've been thinking about it this whole summer. I have a photographic memory so I remember seeing the exact same birthmarks I have on my face exactly the same as hers. I heard that it wasn't a great idea to make eye contact with the presumed doppelganger. So I just noped the fuck out of there. I'm not sure if I met my doppelganger or if it was possibly a younger version of myself. All I know is that I have this gut-wrenching feeling that I'm going to see her again. Does anyone know what this means? Ask Reddit First was the most recent, give or take, 2009-2010. The house I lived in was definitely haunted. I would hear knocking above my bedroom coming from the attic. Every time I went to check, nothing there. And it wasn't as if it was something banging against the ceiling on a windy day because it happened on absolutely mild days also. It was always three distinct knocks similar to ones that you would see in movies. I kind of talked myself into not believing it to be paranormal, until my mate, his girl, and their toddler were sleeping in the room next to mine. I woke up the next morning to find them sleeping in the living room. Apparently something had tried to attack the child at night, so yeah, shit was haunted. I lived in the UK at the time, so go figure. Second is something that's been told to me multiple times, but I remember vaguely because I was like five. I was in Pakistan, in the back of a truck and a van. The back door of the van or truck was broken, so it wouldn't stay locked. This is an important part of the story. So I remember falling asleep in my aunt's lap. I remember closing my eyes and being in the back of that van and truck, when I woke up, her and I were sitting in the exact same position, in the middle of a busy intersection. It was like we had been lifted out of the van and just plopped in the middle of the intersection. Neither one of us felt it, as you usually or hopefully would if you'd fallen out of a moving vehicle. I don't remember much else from the experience. The driver stopped the van and truck once they noticed and we weren't in the back. But on the fucking floor, we were surrounded by people just staring at us in disbelief. If I had not been told this story multiple times by different people, I wouldn't believe the story either. But it did happen, and I can't really explain either one of those stories away. I heard a voice call out my name in the woods. 16-year-old male. This has a not safe for work warning, just so you guys know. I'm a Nepalese guy living in Norway. A couple of years back when I was 14, there was this trail between my neighborhood and the school I used to go to. It took about 10 minutes to get across it. 
covered full of tree branches and a deep valley that you need to climb with a little creek running through it. This one particular autumn day, the leaves were falling off the trees and the temperature was getting lower. It was like 8 degrees Celsius, roughly. And this was one time that I experienced this hyper-uncomfortable feeling that I was getting watched by something. I don't know how that feeling is unless you've either been hunted or been looked at with strong feelings. I had the feeling that I was being watched and me being paranoid and curious, and I kind of still am. I took a glance back to where it came from. I saw nothing and I kept walking. I hear someone yell my name, and I look back expecting one of the kids from my neighborhood, wanting to walk with me back home. No, I saw nothing. There was nothing behind me. I even stood there for what felt like a solid minute, but was probably more like five to seven seconds before I bolted it. The problem was, someone could have been yelling my name as states due to the valley being there, but at the same time the yelling came from this rock a little bit to my right. Whatever was calling my name was behind the big rock. I believe there was a reason our ancestors were wary of the woods. I've heard of skinwalkers and wendigos, or flesh gates, but the problem is I live in Norway. How could this be? Telemark County, to be specific. The Kimono Girl When I was growing up, I was living in a pretty rural area in western Washington, completely surrounded by woods in a little one-story house. My parents had picked the plot of land to build on, about a year or two before I was born. I was raised there for the first 11 years of my life. Starting when I was around three years old, I vividly remember that any time I had the sensation of my ears ringing an incredibly high pitch, I associated it with the sight of a little Japanese girl. I remember her red kimono with black patterns, gold lining, and her scraggly long black hair. Oddly enough, I don't even think I ever had seen a kimono at that point in my life. I didn't think much of it at the time. I was just like the girl who makes the ringing sound when she opens her mouth. She would often be standing in the corner of whatever room I was in at the time, but always looking in my direction. That is, when she wasn't sobbing hysterically. She never felt threatening, so I never talked to my family about her. I was also an incredibly shy child, so I never tried to speak to her either. As I got older, she eventually stopped appearing when my ears would ring. Later, when I was about 15 years old, I was looking into the theories about ghosts for fun, and learned about the whole idea that when your ears start to ring for no reason, that means a ghost is trying to communicate with you. Upon reading that, I was met with the deepest chills. I had never experienced these kind of chills, never before. My eyes started just streaming tears uncontrollably. I've always been skeptical, but fascinated by the paranormal, and that really hit me hard in that moment. I'm 30 now, have no signs of tinnitus but still feel an overwhelming sense of unease and even sadness when I recall that little girl or tell the story to others, like now. My old apartment had a friendly ghost cat. In 2021, I was living in an apartment with a couple of friends. We had nothing weird happen for the first nine months that we lived there. Then one day I'm in the kitchen doing dishes and generally cleaning stuff up. We had an open floor plan where you could see the kitchen from the living room. I walked over to our couch because it, I had just gone to the store earlier and bought some sponges. 
I had left the bag on the couch, and I needed a new one. I grabbed the sponges and I turned around to walk back to the kitchen. When right there on the counter, I see this little black shadow, cat-sized. I looked at it for a second when it appeared, and it jumped off the counter, moving a stack of plates I had on the counter. So it did make noise, and I heard the thud of it hitting the ground. I immediately walked to the kitchen, and there was nothing there and no place it could have gone. I checked the cabinets and everything, and there was nothing. I didn't get any bad vibes from it, and I didn't realize that it may have been a ghost of a cat till a few hours later when I was telling my roommates about it. I do have a dog, but he was asleep on the couch by the bag that I was getting the sponges from. That, and he's 70 pounds, so he would have definitely been visible and not just a little black blob. My dog is the only pet that we ever had in that apartment. The following week, one of my roommates and her boyfriend came up to me in the living room saying that they saw a ghost cat. Their room was upstairs, and the night before they were coming downstairs, so they flipped the light switch for the stairs. There at the bottom, they swear they saw a little black cat sitting at the bottom of the stairs, and it just disappeared. We ended up naming the cat, and the other roommate got some toys for it. I tried to ask it to come with me when we moved, but fortunately, I have never seen the ghost cat again, and I do hope it's doing okay. A mashup of short paranormal experiences. So me and my friend were talking on the microphone, and we shared some of our paranormal experiences with each other. I thought it would be nice if I shared some of these stories in this subreddit. So, without further explanation, let me share these stories with you. So for this first story, I was in my bedroom doing my own thing, and I decided to look out of my window to see if any of my friends were at the nearby park. Turns out that they weren't, but when I was looking outside, in the corner of my eye, I saw a shadowy figure. Well, that's all that happened. All these stories are pretty short anyway. Now let's move on to the next one. So this story is about my mom, and she has mental issues, so I won't go into that. And it could have been the actual cause of this, but we don't really know. So anyway, she was casually laying on her sofa watching Netflix, as she does, and she took a glance toward the living room. She told me that she could see a young boy in the window of the door, and this young boy kept appearing in the window of the living room door. So whenever I used to come downstairs, she would get freaked out because she thought the young boy was in fact there. So this is the final story of this thread. And this one's a little bit of a longer one. So my friend was sleeping, as we all do. And then he got sleep paralysis. This is the first and only time thus far that he's gotten sleep paralysis. And I can't remember what he said it looked like, but... It was the usual shadowy figure, and I believe it was wearing a black cloak, and his cat sat there meowing at him, and then he woke up, and then her other friend recalled seeing the same figure in places that I can't quite remember. But he thinks he's actually being possessed by something, and whenever somebody talks about his demon, he starts tearing up. Breaking news, not every spirit is a demon. Put yourself in the shoes of a lost soul wandering around, unable to communicate properly with the living. You've been stuck chilling in a place for years, decades, maybe even centuries, and you have no idea why you're still here. Wouldn't you be a bit pissed off and acting out in unsettling ways? I know I would. Sure, there are some spirits that are malevolent or downright evil, but that also doesn't automatically make them demonic. 
being evil and being demonic are not the same thing. Let's not throw around the demonic label so freely just because a spirit did something creepy or unsettling. Not to mention the fact that if you've never set any clear boundaries with spirits, how can they possibly know what's acceptable or not? Before coming from their necks on Reddit and screaming demon, consider that they might not even be aware that they're making you uncomfortable. They might mean all of the best and just need some guidance. So let's talk about using tools like pendulums or Ouija boards to communicate with spirits. News flash. They're not encrypted phone calls to your grandma. Just because you asked a specific spirit to move your pendulum and got a different spirit responding doesn't mean you've opened up a demonic portal. It could just be a mix-up or a misinterpretation, and everybody can touch a pendulum after all. If it really was this easy to open up a portal for demons to come through, every single girl who's ever been to a slumber party would be possessed by now. I'm not saying that there aren't genuine cases of demonic activity out there, and portals can be opened if you fuck around too much, but let's not jump to conclusions and automatically assume the worst when someone says that they hear taps in the corner of their room. Although, I think it's pretty harmless to comment this under every neath, you know, every post. It's also unhelpful and very annoying. The spirit world is a complex place, and not everything that goes bump in the night is a demon. My Neighbor That Didn't Age There was a family of four that moved into our neighborhood. I couldn't figure out where they were originally from but they look like they're Asian and Hispanic at the same time. They're very good-looking people. Can't explain, but you can say that they're very attractive. I haven't seen them out or talk with other people. I think it's odd that they go out all together almost every night. The two members look like a couple, and the other two look like a mother and her teenage kid. I wasn't quite sure if the teenage kid's a boy or a girl, but they, he or she, look very attractive in a way I couldn't explain. They have short silk black hair, but not very short with pitch black eyes. And a sad body posture, like in a weak demeanor. At that time, I thought that he or she was a bit weird. It was night and I was practicing running around the block preparing for school competition. On my way home... I saw the weird kid sitting in their front yard, and they were holding a water bottle or a tumbler. I said hi, and they just nodded, so I didn't try to make conversation, and I headed home. I never really talked to the family, but they stayed in our city for at least five years. Not quite sure. Then I heard from my parents that this family are moving to a different country due to their jobs. I didn't ask my parents a lot about them, because I guess I was just too busy with teenage stuff, sports and girls and all that. But looking back, I wished I asked more about them. So fast forward to this day. I moved to this country, and I'm not going to disclose this for my anonymity, and I saw the kid sitting alone at my local coffee shop. Again, I'm a rational, logical guy, but when I saw them again, I got the chills all over my body. Same posture, still very good looking and still young but dressed maturely. I don't know if he or she remembered me, but I looked older now. The Wall So around a month ago, maybe two, I made a post on this subreddit about some ghostly encounters with me, my family, and a friend that we all had. So I'm making another one, but this time regarding my mom. So to give context, my mom has been encountering a young boy in the corner of her eye, usually seen in the window of one of our doors in the house. So I got home and went through the hallway upstairs to go to the toilet, and in the corner of my eye I could see some drawings in chalk on the wall. 
Also, my sister was at her dad's house. So I saw a ghostly face with dead black eyes, a son with a smile, a book with a torn out page, and finally, a man who was beheaded. If you think you know what these mean, please contact me. I got my mom's attention and she took a look upstairs and she was mortified. She immediately went back downstairs, but I sat down and I started pondering what it could mean. I can't really figure out what it means, but I think during the boy's life, he was blinded by the sun and got beheaded, but I don't know what the book could mean. I went in my room and I started my research, and I came to the conclusion that it's a poltergeist. And my conclusion came because apparently they can pick up and drop things. So it could have picked up the chalk in my old bedroom and wrote on the walls with it. So I went downstairs and I told my mom. But she said, No, it's just a little boy trying to get my attention. I thought she was talking about me, but she then said, The boy who watches me through the door. Once again, if you think you know anything about this, please contact me so I can try to figure out what's going on. Also, I will keep you all updated with this if anything happens. Ask Reddit. I was out for a walk early one morning in a forest preserve and it's usually pretty empty. I start coming around a corner, and I can see a car that's parked in the grass, just outside of the parking lot. I think it's strange, but I keep on walking. I'm probably like 50 feet from the car now, and suddenly the trunk pops open. The car alarm starts going off, and the driver's side door opens. I'm coming from the passenger side and I can't see the driver, but I get a bad feeling about the situation. I still keep walking on the path and come around where I can see the driver's side of the car. A guy is sitting in the car in the driver's seat and starts to wave me over to him. He throws up his hands and says, I'm not sure what's going on. Could you come help me? I tell him, nah, he's on his own without breaking my stride and I keep moving. He throws his hands up again and turns off the car alarm and gets out and shuts the trunk. And then he gets in and drives away. I'm creeped out, so once he's out of sight, I double back and walk the opposite way, just to be safe. I walk back probably like 30 minutes. That's where it takes me to get to where I parked my car. When I'm getting close, I hear that car alarm going off again. I'm freaking out now, but I didn't want to walk back into the woods again, so I keep going to the parking lot. When I get there, that same car is parked with its trunk open, car alarm going off, and the driver's door open. The guy is already talking to someone else in the parking lot. He sees me come into the lot, looks at me for a minute, then shuts off the car alarm, closes the trunk, and drives away again. I just booked it to my car and called the park rangers, but they didn't believe anything was weird about it. I'm like 90% sure that dude was trying to kidnap someone. I wouldn't have told anyone if my wife had not seen it as well. It was July 19th, 2016. I remember the date because we had our annual Christmas in July at my in-laws. And it was a crazy full moon. We had left to head home. We took the back way. We live in a somewhat rural area, so the back way is very dark. No traffic at that time of night, and the speed limit is 60 kilometers an hour. As we're driving along, it's about five minutes from home. Out of the corner of my eye towards the forest on the passenger side, I catch a glimpse of something moving fast. The moment my foot hits the brakes, my wife's hand grabs my leg, getting goosebumps as I type this as it was a crazy experience. 
we come to a screeching halt in the road, and whatever it was stopped dead in front of us. It cocked its head to look at us. We both at the time said, Do you see that? It was huge. Best guess, seven feet tall. It had yellow eyes that glowed from the headlights. And it was muscular and skinny at the same time. The most memorable feature, though, were its legs. It 100% looked like a dog walking upright with the cocked angle in its legs. No sooner did it stop and glare at us did it continue to bolt across the road and vanish into the forest on my driver's side. The only way that we've ever been able to describe it was werewolf-like. And like I said, my wife and I both agreed. If we had not both witnessed it, I'd have called myself crazy and never mentioned it. But we both saw it. No question about it. Ghost? Werewolf? No idea, but whatever it was, it was huge. Mean-looking and fast. Great Grandmother It was back in 2008 or 2009. My great grandmother had passed away. Fortunately, I had the chance to see her one last time, the week before she died, and she told me that she had left us with a smile. With that, I knew that seeing me was really delightful for her. So it was early in the morning, getting ready to go to the nurse before going to school with my little sister. We're both sitting at the back of the car, still a little sleepy. While I was looking outside the window, I saw a humanoid figure forming. I immediately recognized this face. It was my late great-grandmother wearing the same flowery purple blouse I've always seen her with, both hands on her stomach, looking at me and saying something. Today I still don't know what she wanted to tell me. When it happened, I thought I was the only one who saw this. I told my mother about this the next day and she almost told me I was kind of crazy until my sister also told me that she had seen the apparition. I was kind of disturbed by hearing that. It was thrilling and frightful at the same time. The only person who believed us without saying we were crazy was her grandmother, actually the great-grandmother's daughter, because she was also seeing her in her dreams, in her prayers, and she kept talking to her for maybe five years or more, until one night my great-grandfather didn't visit my grandmother. More recently, this didn't happen to me but to my sister last year, she was sleeping at one of her friend's places and she had a sleep paralysis episode. Not really a sleep paralysis, it was really strange, and during that, she was wide awake. She could walk, but not talk. Trying to wake up one of her friends, she scratched him. She also saw her great-grandmother saying something to her, but still, we don't know what. When I was left home alone, I'd hear thumps, noises, and feel a horrible presence, to the point that I would cry and scream for my parents. I couldn't move off of the sofa and enjoy any time that I had alone, mainly because it felt like I wasn't actually alone. I heard someone crawling on all fours down the stairs, stomping near the pet cages walking around our bedrooms. It was disgusting. And I'd still have to recover for about half an hour when my family got back each time. One time it turned my radio on and started playing a very specific song that I'd never heard before. I used to question it. Was it friendly? Was it a person? Or at least shaped like one? Was it going to peek around the corner and stare at me? At one point I even thought that it was a man. A toddler or a mutated child my age that was just using her house as a hiding spot. One evening my nose just started frantically bleeding. 
Being the weird kid, I was left with a handprint on the wall from it, next to the cupboard. I highly suspected the thing would sort of use that as a hiding spot. Decorative purposes? I honestly couldn't tell you. What I can say, though, is that I wasn't expecting another one to appear next to it about a week or so later. It was also in blood. Way smaller, but in blood. That's when I kind of thought that there could actually be someone or something stalking me. I've always wondered if it was a specific spirit or a curse, but to no avail. Neither of the handprints were mentioned. I tried to show it to my sister, who was convinced that she did it, but her hand was far too small. Whatever it was, I hope it's not watching me now. Weird, ghost-like thing in my dream attacked me last night. What do I do? Not safe for work, slash, trigger warning. You've been warned. This has only been happening for a few days, but it's never been bad like this. It started out as just this lady with pink hair, pure white skin, and a yellow shirt. She would just appear in the corner for a few seconds, then disappear for like half a second, then jump scare me. She never did anything else, and it only happened once per dream. Until last night, that is. She appeared the first time. I was actually able to talk to her this time. I asked her if she was trying to scare me, and she nodded, then jump scared me. After that, I saw her out of the corner of my eye. She didn't do anything, I guess, but I didn't fully look at her. Then the final time that I saw her in the dream is when I get attacked. So this part of the dream had actually happened in my room. I look over and she's hiding in a pile of clothes. Then she disappears and this weird thing appears and runs towards me. It looked like it was ten years old. It had gray skin, black eyes, no hair. Everything in its mouth was black. It also looked strangely like my sister. Burn. And it was trying to bite my hand. So after that, I wake up and the palm of my hand actually hurt. It actually scared me this time. My friend says that his mom had similar experiences. And she prayed... Then it stopped. The same friend thinks that I might need a priest. My grandma thinks that it could be from stress and that I might need a psychiatrist. But I don't know how to explain why I woke up with my hand hurting. I'm kind of a weird shit magnet. And I'm pretty sure this is something I inherited, too, from my dad, ironically, who claims to not believe in any of that stuff, and gets kind of cagey when I asked him about it. But it's fine to talk about weird shit that he's seen after a couple beers. I guess it's a side effect of being from a family of agnostic Australian clever bastards. It's eased off a lot as I've gotten older. As it did with him, but I've seen a lot of weird shit for someone who's been brought up as a godless heathen in a household of equally godless critical thinkers. There's plenty of stuff I can rationalize, but just as much I can't quite shake. The big stuff that stands out for me are three times where I've seen UFOs. When I say UFO, I really do not believe aliens from outer space visit us. Space is too fucking big, okay? A couple times I've seen shadow people and beings that I can't identify, but really do not like. Probably ghosts, but I doubt they're conscious dead people. I really hope they're not conscious dead people. Sleep paralysis shit that was just too real. That's just the cliff notes, and I might expand on them later when I've got the energy. Besides that, I've got the semi-regular thing with true deja vu or I'll often visit a place in dreams that I've never visited before, but inevitably will within the next couple of months, and I'm 
oddly sensitive to the feel of the place. That last might just be a neurodivergent side effect, though. I've also kind of fallen into being the witchy one of my group of friends. They usually come to me for advice on WS, and at least three times now I've been invited to new digs, specifically to vibe-check the place. I don't know. I'm not really a gold star believer, but I also know the universe is too huge and strange for us to have all the answers yet. Did I predict a death through my dreams? It happened around last year. It's been in the back of my mind for a while, and I haven't really shared this with many people. I'm not a frequent dreamer, but whenever I dream, it's usually relevant to my real-life situations. So when this happened, it stuck with me. I went to sleep one night, a normal day, normal night. I went to sleep as usual, but I had a vivid dream. I was in a hospital bed, and I could hear the sounds around me. Quiet chatter, distant coughing, beeping. Everything was blurry, but I looked down and I saw I was wearing a hospital gown. And I had some things on my arm. Only it wasn't me. I felt like I was physically losing a battle while I was doing nothing. Laying there trying to figure out who, what, where, then, why, how all this was even happening. Then everything faded as I closed my eyes. I heard fast approaching footsteps and I opened my eyes. I was in my room, in my bed. I sat up to check the time and any notifications that I had. You know, those annoying Instagram notifications like so-and-so made a post on Instagram or something. I had received one of those since I was pretty dormant in my account there at the time. And I clicked on it accidentally. I say accidentally because of what happens next. A post of people sending their regards to someone, someone who had passed away of a fatal illness. I'm not saying who just out of privacy and respect, but I felt like I experienced his passing with them. I was acquainted with this individual, and I had a very good impression of them, but never knew them quite well. But I feel their presence, oddly enough. I'm just wondering, why me? Why me if I didn't really have a strong connection with this individual? I lived in a flat built on a mass grave. I experienced quite a lot of paranormal activities in my life. But there's this one encounter that when I think of it, I get goosebumps. I was a kid, maybe nine years old, and I was spending time in my room playing video games on the computer. I was very focused. The desk with the computer was on the wall, and behind me was a bed and a closet, and a hole between the end of the bed and the wall. In that hole I kept my toys and a big mess of other things. Among these things I kept there a feather duster. It was very big and quite heavy based off thick metal stick. So I was playing the game with this feather duster and it flew above my head from one corner of my room to the other, bypassing my head maybe by 15 centimeters. I froze because it almost hit me, but at first I thought it was my mom and I loudly said, Mom, you almost hit me. And I turned around and there was no one here. I quickly stand up and run to my mother to ask her if she was in my room. She denied and asked what happened. What do you think about it? I have many stories from this flat. We believe that the block was built on a mass grave. I mean, there was a lot of battles and killed people in this area during World War II that never got to have their own graves. In fact, their bodies never got to be found or recognized for them to be put in a cemetery. And as the world was rebuilding after World War II, destruction their bodies just kind of resorptioned. 
later we even got a priest to cleanse this flat from Brad's souls, and we also heard a lot of unexplainable stories from our neighbors. So it wasn't only our flat. My experience with the Grim Reaper. This came to me in the form of a dream, but I'm not sure what to make of it. This happened a couple years ago, but it still haunts me, and I never told anyone about it. One night I had a dream. I was in the bathroom, a bathroom I did not recognize. I was just standing there looking at myself in the mirror. A ghost came out of the wall and said, Come with me. I followed the ghost and it led me out the front door and what I saw was myself and the Grim Reaper sitting on a bench, surrounded by a foggy mist. The Grim Reaper and I stared at each other for what felt like forever, but he did not have a face. He had his hood up, of course, but where his face should have been was nothing but complete darkness. It was darker than darkness, I could say. He then turned his head away from me and looked straight ahead. He slowly lifted his arm and pointed straight in front of us. I looked in the direction he was pointing. Then my dream ended. The worst part of it all is within a year after having that dream, at least a dozen people I know passed away. My grandfather died unexpectedly within a month. My aunt passed shortly after. My 13-year-old cousin passed away when he was hit by a hit-and-run driver. My 30-year-old cousin died of a heart attack, and her mom died a week later. Two members of my boyfriend's family died. My son's father lost both of his grandmothers. My grandmother lost two siblings. My stepfather lost a cousin and two family friends. My boyfriend also lost a friend. It was crazy, so much death, and that was all in a year. I had that dream in January. Ask Reddit. Back in the early 2000s, I was working at a medical practice. Our office manager at the time seemed nice enough, but she would sometimes give off a weird vibe, almost like big dick energy. On rainy days, she would wear a fedora and a type of coat that prompted us to nickname her Indiana Jones, behind her back, of course. One day I was sitting at the nurse's station, which shared a wall with the front office. Her office was in the far corner of that area, so she would have to walk past the nurse's station to access the rest of the facility. I was sitting on the far left end of the horseshoe-shaped nurse's station, so my back was to the front office area. There was the usual office chatter, along with the sound of a centrifuge running in the lab across from where I was sitting. Suddenly, I felt a cold chill all over my body. I felt uneasy. I looked up just as Indiana Jones was walking past to my left side. When I looked up at her, it wasn't her, but rather a dark, almost smoky, opaque silhouette. Of course, my eyes almost popped out and immediately she returned to normal. But when our eyes met, she had a smirk on her face as if she was saying, I know you saw the real me. She kept walking and I started feeling panicky, as though I needed fresh air. I then went to the bathroom to settle my nerves. The second worst part of this completely true story is that one of my co-workers was leaving the bathroom just as I was entering. Apparently, she'd eaten roadkill because her post-bowel movement odor was horrendous, so I immediately went outside to get some fresh, fresh air. Childhood memory that has stuck with me. When I was about four or five, I was at my grandmother's home. 
several stories from there, in parentheses. And it was a rainy spring day. I remember playing in the living room since I couldn't go out, but the front door was open and the screen and glass exterior door was closed still. I noticed an old man dressed in a black suit and a white shirt, large brimmed hat, standing at the end of the walk facing the door, 30 feet out. I remember he seemed out of place at that time, and it struck me, even at a young age, as being disturbing. I ran to get my grandma because everything about it scared me, and she sensed the terror and ran back to the front door area with me. When I looked down the end of the walk, the man was nowhere to be seen, but chills ran down my spine as my grandmother placed a hand on my shoulder, proceeded to back up slowly, and started yelling, You get out of here! When I looked up at her, she had a glare in her eyes, locked on the door, and repeatedly yelled, Get out of here! while pulling me back. I then looked at the upper half of the door where she was pointing and saw the old man standing, what would have been inches from the glass portion, the upper half of the door. But I had just been inches from the lower half of the screen and I saw nothing. He only appeared in the upper half of the door. My grandmother backed us up to the hallway, and when we got there, she turned quickly and darted us off to the kitchen. I remember this so clearly. There were many other experiences in that home, but that one stands out and has stuck with me my entire life. And that was scary. Worst feeling I've ever felt. This happened years ago, but I still remember that night. My bed was in the space next to my door. The hallway light was on at this point, and I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the dark, as I was still fairly young. So the room wasn't as dark to the point it was pitch black, but it was only as bright as the hallway light would go. I was sleeping on my side, back facing my room and front facing the wall. I remember being in a deep sleep, honestly a peaceful one at that. I heard whispering. I remember I couldn't understand what was being said, like they were talking in tongues or a whole different language. When I was younger, I wasn't bilingual at all, so I really couldn't have known if it was a different language. It was like it woke me up immediately. I remember my eyes being forced open by shock. Not the kind of shock where somebody throws you a surprise birthday party or something that you weren't expecting. It was that shock that makes your stomach hurt. I knew someone was at the top of me because I could see their outline. I didn't dare to move. I was so scared. At one point, they stopped speaking and slowly started to move to the side of the room. My eyes were stuck to where that thing used to be. And I remember having to talk myself up trying to gain just one bit of courage to even look. I eventually did look, but as you could guess, nothing was there. I don't remember much about what happened afterwards, I just know that I eventually did fall asleep. I haven't experienced something so terrifying since then. Every time I talk about it, being reminded of that dreaded feeling. Ask Reddit for. These are the most memorable. One house I lived in was, was when I was a teenager. We had stuff go flying off a wall shelf unit. Helium balloons that we had all over from a party would somehow teleport around the house, despite having no path of getting ahead of you. It would be in one room, then, on the second floor, it'd be in the laundry room in the basement, bobbing up and down like it was being tugged on. I was alone there one night. I decided to go out. Locked the house up and the parents were over at a boat, about an hour's drive away. I 
came home to the dining room chairs stacked up along with other kitchen items in a magnificent way. It was all leaning up against a ceiling fan. I would routinely see the light in the hallway just turn on and just feet and shadows under my closed door walking back and forth at night, despite hearing both my parents snoring in their room. The worst one was one night I had a couple of friends over, and I lived in the basement department of this house at this time. We heard the doorknob to the outside start jiggling. Not expecting anyone, I just went over, flung the door open to find no one there. This doorknob jiggling kept happening, and all of us being too freaked out really to ignore it. After a while, there was pounding in all the walls around us, just going in a circle around us. My friends decided to leave. I was left alone for the rest of the night hearing footsteps walking up and down the stairs to the basement department. Later on, we just had a tenant take up that basement. He would say that he would routinely see an old lady just standing and staring at him down there. Ask Reddit One night in my house out in the country around 1 a.m., I was doing some dishes. Over the sink in the kitchen is a window that overlooks a wooden patio in the backyard. And about five feet away from the sink and window is a large sliding glass door to get out onto said patio. The window over the kitchen was open, but the patio door was not. It was so dark outside, on the other side of the window screen was pure black. I had minimal lights on in the kitchen, but nevertheless, one could definitely see my head and face in the window looking from outside. I reflected on this thought in silence when directly ahead of me, at about ten feet of distance, I hear a cell phone ring. I freeze and stare out into the blackness of the outdoors. The cell phone continues to ring, concealed in its distance from me, but clear in its closeness. It rang maybe three times before slowly I hear the creaking of the patio wood. One footstep, another footstep, crick, crack, crunk, then clunk, clunk, clunk down the steps of the patio, away from me and onto the grass of my backyard. I hear the soft but threatening footfalls on my lawn and the cell phone ring grows fainter and more distant. Then at what seems to be at the edge of the property, the cell phone is stifled mid-ring. Silence. Silence as I stare into nothing. A nothing that is not only probably staring back at me, but I suddenly realize with horror had been staring at me for an hour without my knowing. Ask Reddit My unexplained story involves an old dog who passed a few years ago. I adopted her from a shelter when she was already ten. She was there because her previous owner had passed unexpectedly. When I received her medical records, it was very clear that her previous owner had loved her very much and taken excellent care of her. Over my six or so years owning her, several spooky things happened that spanned different apartments and cities, but always when she was there. The most notable was when she and I were visiting my then boyfriend in a different town. We were all getting ready for bed, so all the lights had just been turned off, and I was nearing the patio door that opened to the parking lot. I bent over to pick something up, and I hear something whiz past my head, softly thunk against the glass, and rustle all the blinds. My immediate thought was that my boyfriend was messing with me and had thrown some balled-up socks at me. I stand up and prepare to tell him off a little bit, 
but the light coming from the parking lot, I can see he's frozen. His eyes are as big as saucers. He heard the same thing and saw the blinds start to move. So we turn the lights on to investigate and find no evidence of anything that could have made the noise and nothing disturbed despite the still swinging blinds. I was about seven feet from the door and he and my little old gal were about ten to fifteen feet away. We never came up with an explanation, but I like to think the previous owner was keeping an eye out to make sure I was taking good care of her. Ask Reddit Lived in my grandparents' old farmhouse for a few years with my family after my grandmother passed away. Three crazy things happened while we were there. One night, my wife and I were hanging in the back screened in porch, just talking, and we both immediately stopped. We saw through the old glass door a larger shadowy figure walk through the kitchen. It seemed to appear from the kitchen table middle of the room, and walk five feet to the sink before walking out the opposite door from us into the house, very much like my grandpa used to do when he was done eating. He passed away in 2001. No one else was at home at the time. The kids were hanging at the movies, and the grandma, my mom, was there with them. The second thing was a wet, bare footprint on the concrete front porch by the front door. My wife was home alone. She said she heard something at the door, and when she opened it, she saw the footprint. Took a pic of it, sent it to me. Crazy thing is, no one else was there, and it was a dry summer. No water anywhere. The third thing that happened was my wife was in the kitchen cleaning dishes at the sink, and felt someone shove her in the middle of the back. The kids were at school and I was outside working. When she told my mother about that one, she told us that my grandmother had told her something similar had happened to her before, too. Mom thought it might have just been my mother's ghost, or her mother's ghost, because she was an angry person before she died. I didn't like my mom's, or my mom's stepmom, my grandmother. I think a shadow person revealed its true form to me. I've always had sleep paralysis from a kid and always saw shadow people. Anyway, for a few years now, it all stopped, and I felt that phase was gone. But something happened recently. I started having sleep paralysis again, but this time was different. I was half paralyzed. I could move, but very weak. I started getting a visitor whenever I'm in the state. Unlike the ones in the past, this one wasn't humanoid. It was always shaped like an animal. A dog, maybe, I don't know. I would feel it climb onto my bed. So anyway, I decided that since I can actually talk a bit in this state, even if it was weak and I slurred, I would ask it, when next I see it, what it wants from me. Fast forward to a few days later, it came again. I felt it climb onto my bed as usual, so I proceeded to ask it what it wanted. It was as if this entity stepped out from a shadow and approached me. Our faces were almost touching as it stared into my face. Its face was like a mix of a person and a robot, but super creepy with large, owly eyes. It didn't talk to me anyway, just stared at me for a long time. I dragged my bedsheet and covered my face when I couldn't bear it anymore, but I knew it was still there. I weakly peeped a few times, and it stood there just staring. It eventually vanished after a long time. Glenn 
Glitch in the Matrix, Mandela Effect Story. So when I was younger, I had two of my aunts come into the country and staying with us over the summer. Can't remember what year it was. And they were happy to be here, and I remember them teaching me how to play Parcheesi. And after some time, one of them left and another one stayed a while longer. So then I believe a year or so later... I go out of the country, and I'm there for a while. And then I'm visiting some cousins. My aunts are with me, and we're all having a good time. We decide to play board games. The games are going, and we're all playing shoots and ladders, checkers, etc. Then we decide to play Parcheesi. Game's going, and after a while I'm winning. And one of my aunts says something along the lines of, Hey, you're pretty good. Who taught you to play so well? I smile and glance at her and say, You taught me when you came that one time to the United States. Room gets quiet, and they go on to tell me that it couldn't have been her. They've never been there before. I assured them that they did, and to this day, apparently that never happened. I can't say it was a dream, because I'm talking like in a span of a month. That's impossible. I can't recall any significant events on TV since it was summer vacation and everything was just reruns. And I never watched sports, so I don't know. Key things I remember was I did never see anything in the room in the basement. I just never went down there. And I don't really remember leaving the house. Nicely dressed man in my room. Just to rule this out, nope, there is no gas leak in my house. So here's the deal. I've been having visions of this old man in my mind. They're short but vivid flashes. He's always dressed in a nicely tailored suit with black and white stripes and wears a fedora. I can't say that he looks evil, but his presence leaves me feeling confused and unsettled. This started a few days ago. Since it first happened, whenever I'm in my home, I have this constant feeling of being watched. It's as if someone is observing my every move, even though I can't see anyone physically present. Last night, things took a more chilling turn. I woke up abruptly to the sound of doors banging. Assuming it was just someone in the house using the restroom, I could even hear footsteps in the hallway. But, to my surprise, they stopped right at my bedroom door. When I opened my eyes, there he was. The man from my vision standing in my doorway, just staring at me. He didn't make any sudden movements or say a word. He was just there. And I couldn't move or react. I was scared but just because I didn't understand what was happening. I have no idea who this man is or what his intentions might be. It's an unnerving experience, to say the least. And although this is a very stereotypical story, I believe stereotypes exist for a reason. Do you guys know if he's trying to tell me something? Why is this happening now? And why did he give me those visions before entering my room? Ask Reddit. I don't think this person falls under any of these supernatural categories. However, I really need to tell this story to somebody because I can't help but think about it from time to time. I ran errands with my mother a few years ago. And there was this woman who kept looking at my mother and smiling at her. However, my mom didn't notice her while I did. I didn't think much about it. I thought it might just be a work colleague, so I didn't say anything. My mom often meets relatives or her work colleagues as we live in a small town. However, at some point the woman approached us and hugged my mother, complimented her and all that. The woman was really kind and told us that she'd been living here for about three years. 
However, I have literally never seen her before. Neither has my mother. Here comes the strange part. The woman told us where she lives, apparently near my grandparents' house, which is really weird because we would have seen her if she really lived there, but okay. My mom once wanted to stop by the woman's house, however it turned out that nobody lives there at the address that she gave us. It's been a few years now and we've never seen her again, which is so strange. It's as if the woman has never existed. I'm so glad that I was with my mom that day because otherwise I would have never believed her. I really wonder what happened to that woman. I mean, she told us that she's been living here since about three years, and if she had any plans of moving, she probably would have told us. Ask Reddit Two stories stick to mind from my childhood that still creep the fuck out of me. One of my earliest memories is of walking past my parents' bedroom. I froze in the doorway as I looked into the bed, and I saw what looked like the shape of a person kneeling on the bed, but underneath the bed sheets. As I stared at it, the bed sheets kind of floated down so it looked like the bed was perfectly made. The shape just sank into the bed. I was freaked out. Two. It was a short walk home from primary school. I was about 9 to 10 years old. I'm walking on my own, and a car pulls up. It has my nana, granddad, and cousin inside. They say, Hey, we've just been over to your mom's house. Do you want to lift home? I said, No, it's only around the corner. But they were quite persistent. I remember a hand coming out of the open door, but I just remembered being quite flippant and just like, no, it's okay, I'll see you guys later. And I ran around the corner to my house. I said to my mom when I got home, I just saw Granddad and Nana in the car. They said they'd been over here to see you. My mom said that she hasn't seen or heard from them all day. I was adamant. She made me phone my grandparents, who then confirmed they hadn't seen me all day and just or been over to my parents' house. So who the fuck were the people in the car? Still creeps me out thinking if I was having a weird trip of some kind, or if I almost got snatched and just saw the people as my grandparents. A German ghost spoke to me at a former Hitler youth camp in New Jersey. So I'm about 21 in this story. I live in Pennsylvania, and I have this great friend whom I met at a concert. She lives in New Jersey. This girl and I haven't seen each other in a little while, so we had planned to go to an event near her, and I was invited to sleep over afterwards. So we did just that, after the night had come. And that night came to an end. She had showed me to her brother's room whose bed I would be sleeping in, and we go to bed. In the middle of the night, I get awoken by a woman speaking to me in German right next to the bedside. She's rambling and frustrated. I'm good at recognizing languages, and I'm fluent in Russian, so I knew that it was German straight away. Not only that, but I had heard my name a few times in the beginning of her speaking, I was super confused and obviously rather creeped out. I just said something to the effect of, I don't know who you are and you're bothering me. I'm trying to sleep. Go away. It stopped. I woke up the next morning and immediately asked my friend about it as soon as she was awake too. She looked at me a bit shocked and said that her mom claims to hear German in the house and that her house had apparently been part of a nearby Hitler youth camp. She didn't know much about it, but doing research on the area myself, I found it to be true. Ask 
Ask Reddit. There was a kid I knew in grade school. This was in sixth grade. Anyway, we were both the kinds of kids who were really smart, but also terrible students. So we were in a special program in the mornings to make sure that we kept our grades up so we wouldn't get kicked out of our other stuff. One Friday morning, he explained to me how he liked the first part of the Pokemon because things were simple. He'd just play the first bit and reset his file over and over. I told him I liked the middle because it still felt like there was a lot to do and that he should play through it with me. He reset his game again that day. It was a weird conversation and I only realized that, that there was subtext much later in life. The next Monday, he wasn't there in the morning. But right after I left the room and I was in the hall, I ran into him. I asked where he was, since he was always there and was basically the only friend I had there. We talked for a couple of minutes before the bell rang. I headed off to class, but he just kind of waited there. He seemed really, I don't know how to describe it, just off. Anyway, that night I get home and my mom tells me that he's killed himself over the weekend. She worked with his mother and since that we were friends, thought I should know. I tried to explain that that was impossible since I'd just seen him at school. She thought I was just confused. I still wish he decided to play through damn Pokemon with me. He asked why I was waiting in the rain, and I told him what happened. Halfway through my explanation, the porch light goes back off. We approach the door, knock, and again no answer. He accessed the key in the agent box and we go in. We check the switch inside the front, and it's the one for the porch light. And once it was back on, we looked for a sensor. There was none. First off, creepy vibe, and no lights on. As we work from the front to the back, we turn on the lights and turn them back off again on the way to the front. The upstairs is accessed in the front of the home, so when we go up, all downstairs lights are off, except for the front room. We go up, start looking at the rooms, and a knocking starts. Three at first that make us both give us, what the fuck did you just hear, that kind of looks at each other. Then after a bit, three more, but louder. We started to nope out of there, and as we got the lights out and headed back downstairs, we heard three poundings from the hallway, top of the stairs, now dark but clear in sight. We head for the door quickly, but just as we're getting the key ready for the box, we notice that the light in the very back room is now on again. My friend asked if I want to go with him to shut it off, and I convinced him to leave it on. Seemed very sus, like a trap. And as a grown-ass man, I was feeling a fear that I'm unaccustomed to. As we left, the porch light came back on. Never went back, but have driven by several times. Unexplained Occurrences Recently For context, on my new apartment... It's a part of a duplex apartment thing that sits atop a three-car garage in the backyard of my landlord's house. The property is very old. I want to say the house was built anywhere in the 40s or 50s. Same goes for the apartment. The apartment attached to mine is to the left of mine, whereas my front door is to the right of the apartment, and their front doors is to the left of theirs. So ever since I moved in, there's been these very unexplainable noises like I hear someone knock on my front door quite frequently. And I know it isn't coming from my neighbors because it's too loud and clear, and it comes from the right side of my apartment. I also hear footsteps walk through my apartment to the bathroom, which once again is too loud and clear to be my neighbors. Another time the cage door to my cat slammed shut and rattled super loud, 
the cage is elevated on a shelf and the cats can't get to it. They were also next to me when this happened. The most recent occurrence, and quite honestly the weirdest, is when the middle of the night I heard my front door slam shut and footsteps walk across my floor. I know for a fact that it was my door and not my neighbor's because my door gets caught and so you have to slam it to get it open or closed. Plus, it sounded like it was in the same room as I was. My cats also look up to the ceiling a lot these days and randomly get distracted by nothing. And this is out in the living room as well. Ask Reddit. I went with my best friend during high school for summer vacation to his grandparents. They live in the countryside in Japan. I stayed in his mom's old room, which has a small wall closet. Just above this closet was a smaller closet door, like a foot and a half tall and about three feet wide. Just above it, weird design, but their house is old. The first couple of weeks, I was pretty jet-lagged, and Japan is hot and humid, so I didn't really sleep at night. If my light was off at night, though, I always felt uneasy about that small closet space. Something about it just felt darker than the rest of the room. Toward the end of the second week, I started to adjust to the time difference. One morning I woke up and that small door was open was unsettling, but I closed it and just thought maybe it was closed all the way and just came loose. A couple of nights later, I woke up feeling uneasy. It was dark and I could kind of see, and I could see that this was the first and only time that I was perhaps experiencing sleep paralysis. I was too scared to move, say, or do anything. I just felt this darkness coming from there. I don't remember sleeping that night, but I told my friend about it, who said his mom told him about something like that too. When we got back home and I talked to his parents, his mom kind of joked with me. So I heard you met the ghost. Is this paranormal? I was watching Sam and Colby when I remembered some weird stuff that happened when I was young. When I was little, I used to wake up and find things that I never had before at the edge of my bed. Some things that I would find are bags of little toys, stuffed animals, and other small things. I didn't think anything of it, since I just thought my mom gave them to me. And the stuffed dog that I still have is very cool. But... When I asked my mom about this, several years later, she was confused and said that she never did that. We both found it weird, but we both brushed it off as well. Skip to a couple years after that. We moved, and at that time, I didn't have curtains or blinds on my window. I don't know why. So one night, I laid down to go to sleep. I was used to car lights going by since we lived near people, and I knew what they looked like. I was laying with my face looking toward the window when all of a sudden, a flashlight. The light of a flashlight turned on. I froze. I pretended to sleep while thinking, what should I do? After like five minutes, it didn't go away. So I ran as fast as I could into the living room where my mom was and screamed, there's a flashlight in my window. I was screaming while my mom checked and found no flashlight and then checked outside. No one was there also. I made my mom put up a blanket and I made her lay next to me till I fell asleep. Ask Reddit. This didn't happen to me, but to my parents. My mom going off the deep end and on a crazy train isn't that out of character. But my dad doesn't do that ever and he swears the story is legit. When I was around two-ish, my mom woke up from a nightmare 
and she woke my dad up too. He tried going back to sleep, and she told him not to because his mom was going to call soon, because not using their name had been decapitated in some sort of accident. My dad, of course, thought that this was nonsense, but my mom was hysterical over it so she couldn't sleep. Sure enough, a few minutes later, the phone was ringing. It was his mom letting him know that his friend and the friend's little brother's girlfriend had both died in a car crash coming home from a party about three miles away from us. My dad's mom and their family were very close, and my grandma, my dad's mom, shouldn't have to explain, but it's getting a bit all over the place, and the mother from that family were lifelong friends and died at just six months apart. Anyway, later learned that my dad's friend had been decapitated when he lost control in his ragtop Camaro. Camaro. <laughs> Hit a tree, flipped the car upside down, and slid a ways on down the road. Neither he nor his younger brother's girlfriend were wearing seatbelts. This would have been back in maybe 1981-ish. Ask Reddit. This happened a year ago. It was me and four other co-workers, and we just got finished with a 16-hour shift. Headed home from the Shasta Trinity Forest area of Northern California at around 3 a.m. Now, if you've never been in that area, you'd know that it could easily be an area for an inbred cult of cannibals to call home. There's absolutely no civilization in at least a 2,000 square mile range. So we're driving through the mountains on these crazy, creepy back roads. Tired as fuck, and while the area is beautiful during the day, it's spooky as fuck at night, so we're already feeling uneasy. As we're driving, some big fucking dude in a jumpsuit comes stumbling onto the road holding some kind of dirty, stuffed animal and just looks right into our headlights. Again, this is hours away from anything. We just swerved around him, but my heart was racing the rest of the night. We were discussing whether or not that we should call someone, but decided not to. It looked like some kind of setup or a trap. Afterwards, no one wanted to even talk about it at all. No one ever brought it up again for the remainder of my time working with those guys. I'd mentioned it, and they'd pretend I was crazy or something. Fucking weird, man. Ask Reddit. The only thing close to a paranormal activity that I've had was about two months ago. I've been living in this house for six months and my bedroom door doesn't fully close, so it's always ajar at night, or about as closed as I can get it. I was watching something on my TV in the middle of the night, and suddenly my door opens halfway. I assumed it was my cat, but when I looked, it looked like there was something standing there. My eyes were adjusting, and I was just looking at its face, expecting to hear my mom's voice saying something like, Why are you still up? but after about five seconds, the figure faded away. I was pretty confused and scared, and I wasn't really sure what to believe, so I got up to try to see. Maybe my cat was still in the room, but she wasn't. I found her out in the living room, curled up and fast asleep. There was no way my door could have just opened because all the windows were shut, so there couldn't have been a draft. I'm still not exactly sure what it is that I saw. My mom also had an experience in this house. She was tidying up a bit around the house, and apparently the corner of the big rug flipped over. Same thing, no windows or doors open. She also assumed it was the cat, as she likes to play with the rug corners for some reason. But my cat was with me.
The Strangest Moment I was a kid, maybe twelve, sleeping in my bedroom. I woke up in a normal dark room sometime after midnight, needing to pee. The bathroom was just across the hallway from my room, but my bedroom floor was covered in Legos. As I'm sure many know, stepping on Legos can be incredibly painful, especially in the middle of the night when you need to go pee. I agree. As this agonizing thought struck me, the light in my room turned on. Instinctively, I turned my door, thinking somebody had flipped the light switch. The switch was indeed flipped, but I was alone and the door was closed. Despite being fairly freaked out, I simply couldn't fathom anything paranormal. Now that I could see the floor, I went to the light switch, confirmed it was on, opened the door and looked around, thinking perhaps, weirdly, someone was playing a trick on me. But no. If after midnight and everybody was asleep, this couldn't be possible. I went to the bathroom and returned to bed. The moment has stuck with me ever since. There's a lot of outlandish ideas I'm willing to believe, like the light switch not being properly turned off to begin with, and just so happening to turn on at that moment. Which seems like the most probable, but the odds are pretty extreme. Ask Reddit when I was living with one of my brothers, but still felt too awkward to have sex with my then-girlfriend at the house, we would go to my mom's house, because it was pretty much empty except for my bedroom stuff that I couldn't fit at my brother's house. We were leaving one night, and once we got in the car, she said that she saw a kid standing in the room across from the bathroom on her way out. Pretty creepy, but what's even more creepy is what my other brother said when I told him about it. He lived there for a little while, after we had all moved out, and he said he had come face to face with a kid standing in the doorway of that room, and that was when he got out of the shower one day. That was also his room growing up, and he also said that he would wake up sometimes to something breathing and walking around his bed. I never saw the kid in that house, but my drum set was in that room for like a day. The one time I went to play it in that room, about five minutes after I started, I suddenly felt like someone was standing right behind me, very menacingly, and wanted me to leave. So that's exactly what I did. Never played music in that room again. I have other stories about that house, but those are the most notable that happened to me. Ask Reddit. When I was six years old, we moved next to my father's parents' house. Suddenly, my mom saw me talking to something that wasn't there. She didn't pay too much attention since she's tough and it was just maybe an imaginary friend phase, as she calls it. After a few days, my friendship, in quotes, started to freak my mom out, and I started asking why my friend always said, why he was allowed to stand next to the stove and I wasn't. She then tried to explain that he was just imaginary. He lives under the sink, I said. My mom told me that I could tell her the exact actions and emotions that this boy had. She struggled to make me understand that he wasn't real. and She thought it was just a phase until my grandfather said he found out a boy sitting on the backyard door backyard was a common area between my house and my grandparents' house. He was sitting there in the middle of the night. When he asked if he was okay, the boy said he was waiting for his mom and he couldn't leave. My grandpa called his wife and when he came out, the boy wasn't there. My grandparents said that whenever they were outside to take out the trash at night, they could see the boy sitting in the backyard for a few minutes and then he would just vanish. I have a question on how to deal with this. I 
have what I call the stalker, a being that follows me throughout my house late at night. And lately, it's turned sinister. When it manifests, I feel like something is afoot behind me, like following while watching me. Usually, I just run to my room and burn sage to rid the feeling, but this time was different. I went downstairs to make popcorn, and he manifested outside my room as I left. Due to the last incident, I didn't pay it much attention, but it did freak me out. When I came back up with my food and needed to turn off the lights, the feel of unease turned to immense danger the moment I turned the lights off, and I quickly shut my door and burned sage. The other spirits, even one that's mischievous in my house, have all run to my room where they know it's safest. I don't know how to keep the stalker out or how to get rid of it, how to get rid of it from this house. I'm not the only person who's felt its presence. My brother also froze due to his presence and then texted me repeatedly. Come in the game room, come in the game room now, please. How do I rid this thing from my home? Glitch in the Matrix It happened today. I was watching the movie Nope on Amazon Prime along with my mom and her dog. There's a small ottoman that sits on the floor in the living room, circular in shape with a lid. As I'm watching the movie, the ottoman lid begins to lift by itself and closed abruptly. It made completely out of wood, the dog, myself, and mom proceed to just stare at it. The ottoman is woven and you can see through it. I thought maybe a small animal was inside. I get up to lift the top off the lid and see nothing inside. It's empty. The lid has some weight to it, too. I proceed to fan my arms at it. I'm checking to see if maybe a gust of wind lifted the lid. The air wasn't on. Windows weren't open. I thought maybe the vibrations from the sound bar lifted the lid. I rewind the movie back 20 seconds to see if the same thing would happen. Absolutely nothing. We proceed to finish the movie. Nothing has happened since. Tales from a Haunted Apartment I've been experiencing paranormal occurrences since I was seven, and while most things were still absolutely weird and almost impossible, they were also theoretically explained by something, however unlikely. But a few occurrences were completely impossible, and this is the story of one of those occurrences. It was a Saturday in 2015. I was in my early 20s, and my boyfriend, now husband, was at work. Saturdays were always my cleaning days, before he got off and we were relaxing for the weekend. I was washing dishes at the sink next to the stove, separated by a small section of countertop. I would line up the dishes that I would wash in order on the stove on the top. This is relevant. And I had a spatula up against the back of the stove, just under the dials. A rerun of Dr. Phil was on. I would go watch between commercials and return to dishwashing during the commercial breaks. The only other living thing in that apartment with me was my cat, Lulu. Lou was perched beside the open window in the living room, snoozing. I heard the show come back on and raced back to the living room. As I'm standing there watching, I hear a clatter of plastic hit my fridge, then a second clatter as whatever it hits the floor. Going back into the kitchen, I see the spatula that had been against the back of the stove lying in front of the fridge. The fridge was directly across from the stove, about three to four feet away. When I heard the spatula hit, it sounded like it had hit pretty high up on the fridge. 
maybe around the freezer area. I've spent eight years trying to figure out how the hell a plastic spatula could spontaneously launch four feet across the room and have come up with nothing. There have been other weird-ass things happen in this apartment. Saw another real estate agent story post. Back some 20 years ago, I had a guy I knew from college that was getting into real estate. And I asked him to show me some homes for experience. And we were actually looking, so win-win. I get to the house but don't see his car, and it's pouring rain. I wait in my car for a few, and after five minutes the porch light turned on. I figured he must have drove a different vehicle and parked along the road. I got out and went to the door, but it was locked. I knocked, but no answer, and I was starting to get soaked. Just as I start going back to my car, my friend pulled in. <laughs> 